Audiobook title, Villainous and Grimoire, 01-41, by White Sculptor, Chapter 1, It is so warm, it feels so good, for the first time in my entire life, the temperature had never felt better, allowing the comfort to keep my entire self satiated. That was when an unclear voice popped into my mind, waking me from the drowsiness and unnatural state I was in, what was that? Who? I wondered about the mysterious unfamiliar words, swearing to myself that they sounded strange, far from what humanity once did, but with no time to think about it, I felt a trembling yet ticklish sensation around my body. A pulsating, tremendous strength kept me locked in place, pushing me up and down. What's going on? While I struggled to understand what was happening, a chilly breeze touched the top of my head. No. It's so cold. Whatever it is, please stop. Leave me alone. Despite my distress and confusion, it only grew worse. Mercilessly by the second, muffled voices slowly becoming clearer approached from some place nearby, along with sporadic, thin screams. Right after, a rougher, masculine shout reached deep inside my tiny ears. I can see the head. Just a final push, you're almost there. The cold sprayed through my body, obstructing me from the pleasures of being inside the best place my skin had ever felt. My body sought after such pleasantries, which made me feel cozy, warm, and even safe. No. Despair flew inside of me as I remained reluctant towards everything that was happening outside my control. This time, it felt clearer to the point of understanding a familiar language, yet I stood clueless about its source. Somehow, my eyes were unable to see anything around me clearly as pitifully. My skin tried to spread apart from each other, giving up moments after. Having miserably failed to do so, a numb sensation traveled through them as if the gift of sight had been stolen away from me. It's a girl. The surrounding voices grew exhilarated by the news. Something partially touched my skin, creeping me out. A weird, slimy sensation made me feel bewildered. But, above all, the fluids that permeated my skin kept flowing in the same direction which was. It certainly didn't feel like I was upside down, meaning gravity was likely doing its work. This feels kind of sticky and disgusting. A rough elderly voice followed my inner complaints as the gentle touch of two unknown, yet rough, hands held me firmly. Congratulations, Rosalyn, Luke. In return, they thanked him, unexpectedly. I soon sensed the cold dissipating from my body as a different warm substance nibbled at me. This feels like... water? Everything would be much easier if I could see. Why can't I? Gently, hands patted me with what felt like a soft piece of cloth throughout my body, allowing the strange smell to dissipate a bit each time it passed. It feels ticklish. Stop it. What's going on now? My questions and doubts remained. The fabric caressed my eyelids, allowing the viscous substance to fade away. A moment later, after being gently smacked on my back, I cried. After enduring a lot of struggles, my eyes finally opened, but much to my surprise, everything was blurry, I think I opened them. Didn't I? Why can't I see? I attempted to recall everything that had come to pass, but wistfully, there was not much flowing from my deeper memories. However, minutes later, everything became clearer, my vision became less blurry allowing my focus to come across a strange old-looking person staring at me with a creepy, big smile. Who are you? Why are you touching me? Where am I? The realization of my words not coming out frustrated me. It enhanced the confused state within me as more questions kept popping into my mind. What's wrong with me? Why can't I speak? After some minutes, his figure finally became completely clear as translucid water, allowing my attention to lay on the elder's hair that resembled the snow, greatly merging with his long beard. Wrinkles embraced his face, alongside heavy bags which pulled down his dark brown eyes. Softly, he placed me in a large yet cozy place that resembled home. There I noticed twin mountains rising on my sides, leaving a pinkish tone at their top. It looked just like a caramel pudding. Her eyes connected to mine displaying how exhausted they were. This woman is beautiful. But who is she? Her hand touched my face, caressing it kindly, allowing me to take notice of a happy yet faint smile on her lips through the open gaps between her sleek fingers. She looks happy. Her palm. Why is it so big? Could I be the small one? From her kindness, my body grew relaxed, allowing my mind to calm down deeply, 
almost falling asleep. I fought the sensation to remain awake, as something strange was happening to me, my mind came across a potential solution. Yet somewhere within my heart, I longed to hear the truth from someone else. Not too long after, a feeble, sweet tone reached my ears, enlightening me about everything my brain wished to know. Our daughter is so beautiful, don't you think so, Luke? Her hand left my field of vision, allowing me to take a peek at their faces. That's when I took sight of tender brown eyes, allowing my heart to race. Indeed, dear, she even inherited the bright golden hair from you. My mother giggled happily at the comment before my father resumed his words. Rosalind, my love, congrats on becoming a mother after such a long and arduous struggle. The best one this world will ever have. Upon the flattery, I noticed the woman's cheeks blushing. She further smiled as the man's hand, bigger than hers, passed softly on her right cheek. In response to such love, she leaned her face comfortably, as if it was a pillow. Thank you, and congrats on becoming a dad, my dear Luke. I had never seen so much happiness in one spot before. To me, this was the greatest surprise. To think, I was born again. At the very least, I no longer felt doubt within me about this. My new parents relieved me of such confusion, which my heart felt immensely grateful for. They celebrated with a soft kiss, sharing a love that at a different time felt feeble and non-existent. Through the course of my past life and from what I could remember, such memories were tainted in dark tones, sparkling hints of darkness within my mind. The more I felt them, the faster they came to life, awakening my old identity and reminding me of who I truly was. Soon after, my father adjusted his position and noticed something peculiar. I could tell that from the way his eyebrow raised, astonishment loaded his expression. My sight was no longer blurry, not perfect yet, but it was getting somewhere. Abruptly after, he lowered his head, closing in on me, causing my heart to race and causing me to feel uncomfortable, as I couldn't do anything about it. This reminded me of the fear portrayed by my past father. Hum? Strangely, our baby has green eyes. I have never seen such a color before, other than, he gulped, the saintess, his statement brought a new emotion to my body, suspicion, I reckoned they would hate me for it, causing me to follow the glance he shot to my mother and the elder, surprise and consternation spread through them, forcing the woman to utter words of her own, knowing nothing good would come from such uneasy thoughts being left unsolved, do you think so, darling, I don't remember anyone from my family having such a cute tone. They look like little emeralds. My heart melted from another compliment, allowing my mind to once again calm down. There was now a big chance that they wouldn't loathe me for it. My eyes used to be like that, but no one liked them. I tried to tell her the reason why, willing to solve their doubts, but despite all my efforts, they amounted to nothing. Thus, sadly for me, words didn't come out, but at least for my father, they did. I'm not too sure either, upon my parents' conversation. The doctor added some positivity, there's nothing wrong with her eyesight, plus, having green eyes, the same as the saintess, can only be a good omen, thank you, Vicent, the old man shyly smiled, happy to soothe their worries, causing relieved expressions to follow, soon all their six eyes gazed upon me, saintess, what does that mean, what looked like my right hand involuntarily passed in front of my eyes as they moved randomly, causing the adults to chuckle, are these mine? They are so tiny, I can't actually control them, added some more attempts without success, it's like they have a will of their own, I can't seem to handle them at all. Suddenly feeling the remaining of my limbs, I attempted to move the different parts of my body, failing miserably one time after another. I still remember how to walk, but why is it a problem now? Rosalind touched my cheek softly with a finger, followed by a kind smile spreading on her lips as she attempted to calm my shaking body with a delicate and sweet maternal tone. There, there, everything is all right, my sweet baby. She said as my father intertwined his fingers with her free hand, displaying a similar expression to hers. Within my vast darkness filled with sorrow, looking at them gave me a tiny light ray of hope. They look really happy to of me. I despised many of my old memory whose anguish gave birth to a rather sincere thought. It truly wasn't my fault that she died. Back then, my mother passed away soon after giving birth to me. Ever since that day, my father's heart turned into ice, hating my existence on a daily base. Once I reached a certain age, he forced me to call him by his title, Duke. The last thing I remember was trying to get into the mansion's attic 
and then. My brain tingled, making me disperse from such thoughts. I then allowed my eyes to hover over the lightly tanned skin of Rosalind and then, in the same manner, finding a darker one belonging to Luke. Despite my effort to pull in some memories, a tingling haziness took over whenever I tried, I guess something must have happened. My gaze lowered, finding a shelf with very few, but familiar items on it. Further away near the wall, situated opposite to what seemed to be my parents' bed, maybe someone used magic from the stories of my books, and I ended up here as a baby. Would that even be possible? My eyes voyaged through the room, attempting to look for clues, but to no avail. Perhaps the most logical explanation would be that I was just born again. The old man glanced at us before interrupting my chain of deep thoughts, startling me. Everything's done on my side. Your wife just needs to rest now, Luke. He lowered himself, disappearing out of my sight for a moment. Shortly after, he rose, causing his figure to lumber over us, his hands holding a dark bag a bit below his waist. I am glad there were no casualties. I saw him rushing with lengthy steps at the other man, going as far as to give him a hug. Thank you so much, Vincent. My dad added gratefully, filled with warmth in his fuzzy heart, smiling handsomely and prideful at his newly formed family. Thank you for not letting Rosalind die. My sorrow yielded at the good things this old man granted me. I heard a muffled slap, causing my gaze to notice the elder hand hitting my father's back. You welcome Luke, just be good to her, along with your lovely wife. I'll be taking the dirty clothes, you can handle the sheets and as promised, I'll be keeping the little one birth a secret, the elder smiled while receiving a nod from my parents, then my mother threw him some friendly words of her own, thank you very much, Vincent, I'm truly grateful for everything you've done for us, she cried up happily and relieved, placing both hands in front of her mouth, unable to add any other word, take good care of yourself, Rosa, I'll be taking my leave now, Still have some appointments to do. I'll be waiting for you two at the shop soon. New potions will be coming soon. As the elder was leaving with a smug on his face, he ended up stopping halfway, stealing a glance in Luke's direction. All right boss, we'll meet you as soon as possible. He replied eagerly to go back to work and then turned back to me. Seems like they work for this old man, Vincent, but if he's a doctor, then what a potion shop? Some words remained in my mind as I tried to make sense of them. Why would they keep my birth a secret? Suspicion grew within me, as this didn't feel right. Rosalind. Luke looked at his wife, with a stern expression at his wife causing her tired eyes to sharpen slightly, clearly curious about her beloved next words. Yes? What's wrong? He swayed his head to the sides, relaxing her. Nothing is, but... What are you naming our daughter? My eyes saw how his own brimmed becoming full of expectation upon noticing a small yet caring smile from Rosalind. I wonder which name would be cute enough. Leaving my mother to think about it, he reminded himself of their agreement out loud, gesturing accordingly by raising one finger as if both hands blabbered in synchronization with his lips. Remember our deal? I'd name the baby if it was a boy, but if it was a girl. So it's on me, is it? Ultimately, my father crossed his arms over one another while sealing his mouth waiting patiently as he watched over us. After some time passed, Rosa's eyes fell on me as she came up with a decision. Hey, Luke, I've decided on one for our daughter. I'll name her Iris. She smiled while holding me comfortably, without thinking too much, as the name insisted on replacing all others inside her mind. My bewilderment went up a level, causing my arms to move in disarray. How is that even possible? What are the odds? She picked the name I had in my past life. It's hard to believe. This to be a coincidence. Abruptly, Luke complimented her choice. That's an adorable name, honey. A joyful tone resounded from the man, soothing his wife and especially my body, which seemed rather energetic. Some more time passed, allowing the tiredness to grow in me, forcing me to fight to keep my eyes open. I'm feeling rather sleepy. It seems like babies have little energy, not like I had much back then, always being starved by those maids. Sadness swelled inside me from such thoughts, making me want to cry but unable to. My parents kept me in their tender gaze. Iris looks comfortable in your arms, dear, with a lower tone. As Rosalind noticed my eyes closed, she added carefully, Indeed, Luke. She looks so adorable. System, welcome to the world of Artana. 
We have gifted you with two random skills from the Divine Library. They will remain sealed till the human ceremony upon the contract. The unfamiliar and fresh voice that entered my mind without my consent forced my body to be more energetic. Wait, who are you? What do you mean by skills? A ceremony? They quickly became surprised, causing my mother to hush me with a soft mutter. Was worth a try. It seemed my attempt at communication failed. Too bad it didn't work. What do I do now? My eyes gazed upon the couple while extending both arms in the air, unable to control them, causing their hands to gently hold on to my fat, tiny fingers. I suppose I can't do anything as I am now. I'll have to wait till I grow up. 25, Chapter 2 Year 5007 After the System, Day 1 of the Flowering Season For seven long years, the sun rose in familiar ways without minding who it hit. Today was yet another one of those times where its rays aimed at the window of the division I now partook of. Close to the frame, there was a black curtain that used to cover the glass. I spread it fully open one day, as my gorgeous and gentle emeralds enjoyed staring at the stars during the night in order to fall asleep. It also helped me many times to wake up basking in the sunlight on such delightful mornings. Below the bed, rested a wooden floor, oak type. My father had mentioned it to me two years ago. Everything else was clearly dyed white, the walls and the ceiling. The continuous sound of birds chirped at the window, whereas one of them attempted to peck at it a couple of times. The noise ended up waking me up. Is it morning? I rubbed my eyelids and then looked around opening them slowly. First, they moved towards my right, finding a small window on the white wall glued to my bed. For better or worse, it showed me the road that led people towards the north, enabling me to notice who approached the house entrance, along with a magnificent view of the green plains outside. In front of my bed, I could see the typical small-size wardrobe where my mother stored all the clothes of my size. Some were secret gifts from Vicent, once used by his granddaughter, and other ones my parents would buy as I grew up, replacing my old ones as necessary. The sun sure is blazing strongly today. I placed myself on my knees and narrowed the black curtains, darkening my entire room as this was the sole source of light. Without time to waste, I jumped out of bed, doing a considerable bump on the light wood floor, causing a creaking sound to propagate. Hey Iris! Are you awake? Like a cat, my head moved towards the door, noticing the familiar tone of my mother. I started wondering what was going on as my parents usually wouldn't call for me this early in the morning. As my soft and light steps reached the exit, my mum's beautiful voice arrived in my ears once more as my feet hit something silky. If you are, come here and have breakfast with us before your dad goes to work. I lowered myself, bending the knees and curving my back, picking a bunny black doll and reverting to a normal position right after. I almost hurt you, my little one. With utmost care as it was a significant birthday gift, I positioned it on top of my bed, pulling the white linens on top of it all the way to its neck, leaving the head and its long ears out. At that, I patted the top of it, enticed by the soft fabric and the pleasant touch it gave my skin. To that, my expression beamed, happily satisfied with how comfortable it looked in my place. I shouldn't make them wait. I stretched my arms upwards while yawning, then dressed in a white set of clothes. Once I finished, my hands quickly folded the pajamas as best as I possibly could. It took some time to do so, leaving them on top of the bed carefully afterward to not cause wrinkles. Otherwise, my mother would complain once she noticed them. All right, that should do it. As soon as I turned to the door and walked there, my left hand turned the handle, pulling the door to me so my body could go through. Suddenly. As the gap opened considerably, in unison, two voices echoed loudly in front of me, causing me to get startled. Happy seventh birthday, Iris. Tears hastily ran down my cheeks. Ah, I had totally forgotten about it. I placed my sleeves on my face, drying my eyes, and tainting them, and then I muttered loudly and with great gratitude. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Mum. My heart, unable to handle the burst of joy within me caused my smile to widen to the max while I attempted to hold back my tears. To that, as if corresponding to my feelings, my parents hugged me tightly. In return, I did my best to reach my arms out towards them, but tiny as they were, they didn't reach the entire waistline of either of them. These past seven years have been the best years I've ever lived. Interrupting me from merry thoughts, 
My mother lowered herself almost to my height, staring deeply into my emeralds. We have a surprise for you, baby girl. To those words I made a curious expression, opening my mouth a bit while raising my eyebrows, and spreading my pupils wider. A surprise? I wonder what it could be. I giggled softly, making my parents chuckle. Wait a minute. Don't move. Sure. My eyes took a glimpse of what looked like a black cloth. It soon reached out for me as I felt my father pull me closer to him. Then he halted, encircling me, stopping at what felt like my back, turning my hair in a ponytail. I could tell from the pulling and the way his fingers attempted to get hold of every ounce. Without having doubt about whatever they were doing, I responded merrily, waiting patiently for what they must have planned. If you need help to tie it up, let me know, Dad. At my words, I heard him chortle almost as if it affected his pride or resolution of solving the issue at hand. Don't worry. It can't be harder than magic. I faintly smiled at that, responding with a muffled sound, nodding slightly enough to make him understand. My parents have been truly kind to me, and I've recovered a lot from that. I just hope it stays like this forever. As diverse thoughts of an optimistic future went through my mind, my ears took notice of my mother's voice. Can you see anything? My head quickly swayed to the sides as my vision was now null, devoid of light, making me feel surrounded by darkness itself. I can't see anything. I stretched my arms, trying to find something to grab onto, taking a step forward carefully. Yes, my dear daughter, we've used a little blindfold. I heard them laugh merrily at this occasion. If there was anything that differed from my past birthdays, was that they never blindfolded me before. I wonder what they're hiding from me. Suddenly I felt my hand being grabbed. From the softness and size, it had to be my mother. Come, we have a surprise for you. Her words soon corresponded to a soft pull that made me take another step forward. Let's go, my dad's voice came from behind, feeling my hair falling naturally to the back all the way to the waistline. Rare were the times she cut it since my mother loved it long the most. A detail I grew fond of thanks to her. I felt my feet taking me outside the house through my mother's guidance, a path I did plenty of times on my own to head outside, to the vast greenery of the visible fields from within my room. Soon after, I heard the door close on my back, and my mother's grip disperse, leaving my hand entirely in the air alone. Thus, I allowed it to fall softly close to my left leg. Are you ready? Baby girl, I heard what sounded like a whisper mixed with a blow of air and a bit of warmth that touched and tickled my right ear. To that, I nodded in agreement, allowing my father to remove the forced blackness. For a little while, the sunlight annoyed me, as it directly hit my eyes. By instinct, they closed on their own. Consequently, I placed my hand in front of my forehead, causing a brief shadow to support them. Happy birthday, Iris. I could hear a lot of voices shouting in unison. These people had been careful not to stay in my room's window sight. To my left side, I heard my mother's low tone. They're from the nearest village where we work. They came along to celebrate your special birthday. This was, without a doubt, the first time this had happened since I was born. What's so special about today? I wondered as my eyes took a glimpse at everyone's faces that focused their gazes on me, causing me to grow shy and red. Some were adults, and a few children strolled around. From all of them, I noticed a familiar elder face, the doctor who once took care of me and my mother some years ago. He looks even older now. I chuckled a bit, causing some of the tension to cool down, and gaining some courage to add some words as my parents' education taught me. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I shouted with all the power in my lungs, surprising a few of them. Soon and unexpectedly, I heard clapping sounds and took a glimpse at most of their smiles. To my right side, a tall man who appeared to be of the same age as my dad patted his back merrily. Would you look at that? Such a lovely young girl. It sure doesn't look like your daughter, Luke. From such a comment, I noticed my dad placing his left hand on the back of his head, scratching it softly while laughing awkwardly. Despite being his daughter, I wasn't physically similar to him. A lady bumped into the man, who added to the conversation with loud words and even noisier snorts. That's true but she resembles her mother. They're both beauties. At their comments, we blushed, causing those around to laugh and nod in agreement, making me pout slightly, and forcing my mouth to open. We might not be alike, but he's the best father in the world. Without a chance to regain my breath, 
I felt my heart skip a beat as dad grabbed and lifted my body, causing me to fly, as he spun his body in a waltz around me, the people seemed to dance along with the green nature, thankfully, it wasn't super fast, so I didn't feel sick, instead, I could tell joy basked in his expression, possibly from my words, I also took a glimpse of the surrounding people, who seemed to have similar complexions, seems like he appreciated me protecting him, I giggled cutely, causing my further to return me to the grass, my feet soon landed safely on it, and I rubbed my little brown shoe on it to make sure it was stable, despite the great sunlight, the day before was raining, and it wasn't uncommon for it to be slippery from the wetness that resided on top and below. A lesson I learned from my mother, who didn't enjoy seeing me land in the mud, as it meant that the clothes would become harder to Washington. The woman who complimented us before approached with a big smile on her face. She extended her arms toward me, presenting a blue box. I stared at it innocently, filled with curiosity about what could be inside. Here, dear, a little something from the three of us. Hope you'll enjoy it. She smiled while lowering herself along with the gift box in her hands. The three of you? She pointed at the man from before who was close by to my father. Then I followed the tip of her finger that moved a bit to the left, leading to a girl a tad further away, who appeared to be talking with a boy of her stature. I returned my gaze to the gift and extended my own arms, turning the palms towards it. To that, she let it fall softly on my hands. It's a heavy box. I replied enthusiastically, finding myself surprised by its weight. I began alternating my gaze from the gift to her, causing a momentary smile to appear on her expression whenever my eyes met hers. Thank you. Can I open it? She abruptly nodded in accordance, in a way showing more eagerness than me. You're very well command. Of course, my dear. Go for it. After I opened the box, I took a glimpse of what appeared to be a rectangular shaped item inside carefully taking it out, my nose quickly picked a nostalgic scent, almost bringing tears, but I persisted and enjoyed the smell of paper and glue momentarily, my emeralds noticed a little awkwardness in the woman's expression as she saw me sniffing it for a bit, but I quickly disregarded it and stared at the book in my possession, reading its title out loud, The Tales of Artana, I looked back at the woman, who was now confused, she seemed oddly surprised at me for whatever reason, but ignoring this, I proceeded with my own doubts that I hoped she'd be willing to clarify. After all, I was just a child filled with curiosity, one with great needs in this matter that needed immediate answers. Hey, what's Artana? Without batting an eye, she ignored my question. Girl you. You can read? Confusion took hold of my mind, but what else could I do other than ask her? Yes, I can. Is there a problem with that? I replied as naturally as possible forgetting that my parents hadn't taught me how and also because I wasn't much of a liar, nor good at it, they would read a bit during the night to help me fall asleep, most peasants don't learn to read till a lot of years later, if they do at all, the woman shifted the gaze from my person to the side, allowing my eyes to follow it, meeting my parents, who were speechless with dumbfounded expressions, seems like you have been teaching her rightfully, as I returned my gaze back to the book, a girl appeared in my field of sight, at its top corner, still a few steps further away. Is that your daughter? Innocently, mainly out of inquisitiveness from the early appointed direction, I questioned her, as I had yet to make a friend of my age in this world, and by all means, my heart didn't want a second share of the loneliness that my first life was. Yes, she is. William, please bring Elise closer for a moment. My eyes followed the man, who looked to be heavily weighted size, taking a few large and slow steps as he called out for the girl. A little while later, they arrived together. Here she is Olivia, a black-haired girl with dark brown eyes who looked just like her parents, except she was far thinner and young. I'm here. What's wrong? She tilted her head cutely while looking at her mother. Say hi to Iris, dear. She's seven years old today, three less than you. Our gazes met and then so did our hands. Olivia forced a handshake between us by picking our hands and placing them on top of each other as the woman held on to a big smile, despite the awkwardness between us, she waved at me. Hello, Iris, I'm Elise, nice to meet you. The cute looking girl answered shyly, blushing from her cheeks as everyone stared at her. Hi, Elise, nice to meet you too, 
I giggled at the discomfort we both felt and then as if forgetting about everything around, my stare befell on the book and its brown cover. I heard her take a long breath, mustering the aptitude for a natural speech. I picked it up when I was shopping with my parents in the village. While I'm not the most skilled at reading, there's a certain tale in it that's my favorite. She pointed at the gift in my hands. Do you like it? I chuckled happily, nodding in agreement. Yes, I love books. Thank you so much for it. Elise blushed further while averting her gaze away from mine, filled with happiness deep inside. You probably still can't read books too well without the help of your parents, but I hope you like it when you do. I noticed the kindness in her reply. Yes, you're right. Thank you. My words came out a bit stiff as writing and reading were things they forced me to master in my past life, in order to raise my importance as the Duke's daughter. I shouldn't tell anyone about my memories. It would only cause people to grow sad about hearing them. I didn't want to bother anyone after all. My head lowered, causing bits of hair to move between us as I replied in a lower tone than usual. I'll be sure to learn fast, so we can discuss it the next time we meet. At those words, Elise nodded with a small smile. Compromising with me, if one day you drop by the village, you can find me playing in the garden that surrounds the fountain. It's close to the south entrance, you'll certainly not miss it as a lot of kids play there. Feeling like she didn't abandon me despite my change of mood, I returned my gaze to her. Sure, sometimes I go there to get groceries. I looked at my parents with a cheeky smirk. They still held some surprised expressions from earlier. Whenever the next time they take me, we could have fun. Elise glanced over at them and then at me, extending her hand once more. That's a promise then. We nodded at each other with refreshing smiles, mouthing these words to one another. 19. Chapter 3 A long while passed, and a voice popped into my mind, making my insides tingle as I felt something flowing. It was more like a ticklish sensation, harmless, and by all means exquisite and unique. Had it not come as a surprise, laughter would have escaped my inwards. System, skills status and system library are now unsealed. Notice. You have unlocked achievements in status. The early series has now been completed and locked. The rewards are updated. Notice. You have unlocked disgrace and fame in status. After seven years, you finally decide to talk to me system and a new buddy. Notice. I looked at the living room ceiling, protesting about whatever that could mean in my mind. Rosalind quickly grabbed my attention, feeling excited despite being tired of standing the whole day. Did you like it? Yes. It was very fun. I smiled brightly, remembering everyone's faces, despite spending most of the time chatting with Elise and two other boys. So, my dear daughter, is there anything else we should know aside from you being able to read? Dad questioned me with a serious expression, causing some nervousness to grow inside of me. Ah, I tiptoed to the sofa, took a seat there, and then placed my hands on the lap, rubbing the thumbs against one another. Unsure. I remained, not knowing what to reply while feeling a tad scared. It's obvious to us you're trying to hide something, but we're your parents you can trust in us. My mother knelt in front of me, getting hold of both of my hands, softly pressuring onto them. We're here for you. I gulped some saliva before letting out some trembling words. I may be able to read, write. My body started shaking because of feeling anxious. And before I could tell them about possessing memories of a different life, my parents interrupted me with a shout. What? How is that possible? I cowered, lowering my head in surprise and filled with fear from their high-toned voices. Usually, I'd even go as far as to defend myself with my arms had my mother not been holding them. I took a glimpse of my dad, who hid his face by turning around, and then he started laughing in a weird tone. To my surprise, she started speaking proudly, her eyes beaming with exhilaration, to think we gave birth to a genius, Luke, the goddess must have blessed Iris, I remained in a mix of anxiety and nervosity, keeping myself silent, allowing my dad to keep going with the conversation, I researched madly about her green eyes these past seven years, but to no avail, to think it was truly a good omen as Vicent mentioned, he fixed his posture while facing me, sighing. What a relief. My mother, who stared cheerfully at him, nodded in agreement and then abruptly changed her gaze toward me, shouting in my face, Iris. I blurted, a tiny moan of surprise from my mother's excited call almost causing me to pee a bit, and then to not keep her waiting, 
I added a question, confused as she didn't continue speaking. Yes? Her hands left mine, grabbing my cheeks kindly. Since you already know so much, we could start teaching you swordsmanship and magic instead. Rosalind looked at Luke, waiting for approval, to which he consented quickly by crossing his arms and nodding in favor. Then his lips started moving. That sounds like an excellent idea. Without saying anything out loud, my mind began wondering about their confusing conversation. Since my birth parents used to talk in secret with one another about a thing called magic and skills, but, I stared at them with some distrustful eyes conflicted within me. What was the reason they kept quiet about it? Were they waiting for something? My expression turned into a serious one unbefitting of a child, and voiced my insecurities and doubts, why now? My parents' happiness vanished momentarily as they stared at me with awkward faces, to kill the silence, my mother's lips joined the dance, what do you mean, daughter? Despite the fear, I got hold of some courage, bracing myself for whatever could come my way, looking at her in the eyes, you and I wouldn't tell me anything before, so why do you want me to learn magic now? Oh. That's because only when a child reaches their seventh birthday, that the system allows them to use skills. Otherwise, they remain locked so that accidents don't happen. She explained while hinting at the close sat door, closing, locking, unlocking, and so on and so forth. As much as I wanted my distrust to disappear, the lack of knowledge and confusion remained within me. I struggled, and thanks to that. My brain figured throwing more questions would be the only way out of this annoying situation. What do skills have to do with magic, and what are they? I tilted my head in confusion, making a cute expression resulting in them chuckling briefly, with the atmosphere slowly returning to normal between the three of us. My father started explaining. In this world called Artana, like the gift you received mentioned it. Every individual requires mana to practice magic. It is like the energy required to do so. Luke made a blue shining light sprout out of his right hand as he knelt next to Rosalind while making a serious expression towards me. Now here's something important. Unlike the other races, we humans can only have access to skills once the age ceremony arrives. I opened my mouth, surprised, widening both eyes and then voicing out a precise question about something my father said in specific. Other races? What do you mean by that, Dad? My parents exchanged glances, and then nods, returning to me as if acknowledging something. We in the village don't tell our children about this, as it could inflict fear on them. As I made a resolute expression and was about to contest him, he continued, There are many kinds, and despite being significantly knowledgeable about the world as I like to read, there are only a few that I know of. He smiled mysteriously and then whispered happily. Would you like to know more about them? Filled with enthusiasm and also with a childlike expression, I responded merrily. Yes, of course, father. Please tell me. A satisfied look appeared on dad's face, who then started solving the urges within my mind. Other than the humans who belong to the goddess area, the almighty one whom we owe our lives to. He raised one finger in the air, showing that was the first on his list. There's a kingdom of red looking and evil creatures, the demons far to the north. I murmured lowly learning about the new word, and appreciating its uniqueness. Demons. This action caused my parents to giggle lightly as they looked at me like I was acting silly. My father then showed a third finger, leaving the remaining two closed, resuming his explanation. Towards the south, there are many types of beast races, they usually have a mix of an animal with a humanoid appearance. My mind started wondering about what things those would be and how strange it sounded. Would they look like a bear or a boar? Maybe there are some cute looking ones like a fox or a cat. I thought of these names thanks to an animal book with figures from my past life. I nodded in agreement while remaining expectant to learn more about it, and my father didn't hesitate in broadening the explanation. While these are in the south, they're not the only thing we can find. He raised one more finger while remaining serious and resumed the explanation. Monsters also exist there. Something important to mention. These races are dangerous and stronger than humans, so utmost cautiousness is a must as they attack us, usually on sight. I gulped, surprised, hiding my trembling hands. Understanding how serious Dad was with his cold looking gaze, it felt like the long metal fork they use in the oven pierced my eyes as if to make it clear for me to stay as far away as possible. In my old world, 
there were only humans, so this one is something else. I'm now certain. I started gripping my hand tighter, causing an uncomfortable sensation in my mother's one, who mentioned nothing about it. Instead, she took the chance to return to the earlier topic. Baby, would you like to learn swordsmanship with me? Rosalind waved her index finger in the air back and forth from me to her before resuming the conversation. It would enable you to defend yourself against such creatures to some extent, possibly even allowing you to kill some of them. I gulped, unsure if I was against such a proposal. In a way, I wanted to learn magic from the books of my former dad's library. There were stories and tales about grand wizards who created miracles wherever they went. But I wasn't sure what my mother had in mind. Is it normal to study things like that? My mother muttered a lowly sound as if gathering thoughts. For nobles, the rich, famous, and important people of our kingdom, it is, but we are peasants, so. We could say that the normal future for us would be to farm fields or some other common job, unless we join the army to fight such creatures and aid to keep the peace. In there, we'd undergo harsh training where we'd learn how to use two or three weapons. I tilted my head to the side. While being able to defend myself could be nice, I don't think joining the army is one thing I'd like to do. Reminded of the war stories that a few books had, I knew many people died and ended up injured during such conflicts. Is there any other job I could go for to put such knowledge into practice? My mother let go of my hand, scratching her rosy cheek. Hum. How should I answer this? Upon noticing his wife having issues explaining, my father intervened, adding some words to help us both. Dear. We used to do quests for the guild as adventurers, a place where you can help others. However, before that, your mother learned how to wield a weapon called a sword. He pointed at her with a proud, smug on his face. What's that? With a smile, Luke got up and went to his room. In the meantime, Mom added some words, grabbing my interest. While your dad returns, you could also learn magic with him. She made a kind smile upon taking a while before replying possibly recollecting some old memories of their past days. Between the two of us, he's the one who knows the most about it, since he was an adventurer for a longer time than me. Unsure of whether to accept it, I took their willingness to teach me into account, along with my free will, to make them proud. I don't mind learning both things if it ends with you two being happy with it. As soon as I finished my words, my mother hugged me tightly while whispering in my ear. We shall do our best so that you can become stronger than us one day. After that, Rosalind got up from the floor as her knees were hurting her. My eyes glimpsed her right hand rubbing one of them. Seems like I'll have a lot of fun ahead after seven years of not doing much. My father then returned with a half-wrapped case in his hands. Upon getting closer, he gave it to her, who removed the white cloth showing a short sword about 80 centimeters, almost my size which was about 120 centimeters. They would measure me from time to time with a long wooden ruler. Rosalind then took some steps away from me while speaking. In this world, thanks to the knowledge of those who appear from time to time, we ended up getting things like these that help us defeat those powerful foes. My mother, with a big smile, extended the sword in front and did a few slashes while imbuing a blue light around it. The weapon shone beautifully, surprising me. What's that mother? It looks like Dad's shiny hand. I replied expectantly, reminded of Luke's own aura, even though in his case he made nothing glow with it other than himself, which by itself was quite a feat. This is a skill, it'll be the end goal of your training. With this, you'll definitely be able to become a bit stronger. I held down the excitement that grew vastly inside of me. That glow looks amazing. I can't wait to learn magic. With shining eyes, my parents glanced at each other happily. Having succeeded in making me interested in becoming their student, for now, you can go play in your room. We still have a lot of cleaning to do from the birthday party. With a frowning expression, my father nodded in agreement. All right. I headed towards my room, closing the door behind me. Then my feet took me close to the bed where I laid next to my doll, casually facing the window on my right side. 18. Chapter 4 as I stared through the glass, the remnants of the conversation with them danced within me. My parents mentioned skills, didn't they? The system earlier referred to them too. Supposedly I should be able to use them now. No? Much to my surprise, something appeared in front of my eyes. It scared me, causing a squeak to escape and my hand to go against the rectangle. Skills. 
active skills, status, system library, having failed to touch anything in concrete, yet having my hand halted on something, I peeked back at it, regaining my composure, my hand doesn't go through? It looked transparent, but a bit more to the yellow tone. Seeing as it wasn't harmful, my finger hit the different words one at a time, trying to understand what I was dealing with. Notice, system consumed two mana. System, you have received the achievement, mana. Notice, you have unlocked mana, wisdom, and titles in status. Status, mana, 4, 6, wisdom, 2, titles plus, achievements plus, skills plus. After hearing the different messages and grasping the pieces of information that they delivered, I stared curiously at the new window in front of me. Since it consumed two, that should mean I have six max and four left. My brain remembered once more the recent conversation with my parents, whereas they described its uses. In order to use skills, energy is necessary to fuel them. Strangely I offered it to the system of this world, whatever that meant. These were my parents' words very summarized. This could only mean that I had successfully used it without draining. The one mom mentioned I'd undergo with my father. And so, both out of curiosity and from doubting that I actually needed to learn such things from the proof in front of me, my hand raised to chest height, leaving the palm face to the ceiling. Then I attempted to pour out this so-called energy on it. I muttered a few times, feeling incapable of even sensing anything within me. I struggled and attempted various things, making funny gestures and silly expressions, but to no avail. It seems like using mana through skills differs from what they did. Quickly, I grew bothered by failing. Thus, there could be only one thing I could do while waiting for my parents to finish. At that, my gaze returned to the screens, and I attempted to see what things were possible with them. First, I tried to hold one of them by grabbing it on the side where it was thin like a page of a book. Once I felt my fingers putting pressure on both edges, I pulled it to the side, making it look like it slid through thin air. My lips smiled happily at it since the transparent yellow window actually moved. Now I had the screens next to each other, enabling me to sight both freely in a more organized way. This is amazing. Titles. Reincarnated. Skills. Active skills. Status. System library. I voiced out happily, completely forsaking and forgetting the not so good inaptitude to use mana from prior actions. To be fair, Anything that wasn't a book, my mind just flew away, always looking for other things to keep my attention on. Without understanding how wisdom affected my status and since touching it or the title didn't lead to anything, I realized that the only thing that actually mattered was the skills. I wonder what this one does. Pondering on the issue didn't last long, as my curiosity didn't allow me to wait. Without thinking twice, my finger touched it. And once again I felt a part of me being stolen, possibly the mana, but it also felt painful and before I could do or say anything, my mind blacked out. A while went by, allowing me enough time to wake up and regain control of my body. What happened to me? Was it the skill? I believe some voices echoed in my mind, but I can't seem to recall them. I started stretching and bending my arms and legs whilst lying on top of the bed. Weird. It felt like my body was extremely tired, but I can move it just fine now. After changing into a sitting position, I looked for injuries around my body and realized there were none. I seemed to be alright. Filled with braveness, curiosity, and naivety, I voiced out, there's only one way to find out what happened. Skill status. Notice, system consumed 2 mana. Status, health, 7 eighths. Mana, 37 39. Vitality, 8. Wisdom, 13, Fame, 800, Disgrace, 500, Is that my health? What happens if it reaches zero? Do I possibly die? I felt a chill down my spine, becoming frightened at the thought of losing my own life. Once my mind focused on the screen, I shouted while placing both hands in front of my mouth to reduce the sound. What happened to my mana? Is it normal to be that high? After scratching my index finger with the thumbnail for a bit, I started comparing the different values and occurrences, health and vitality. I received both the same way I did with mana and wisdom. A wide smile lifted my cheeks. This can only mean they pair with one another. After realizing this new piece of information in it, I tried to recollect bits of the words that resounded in my mind after I blacked out. I think I received new achievements, right? I focused intensively on the word, opening a screen with new information next to the previous one, 
achievements, early series 1260, before the ceremony. Plus, mana, first time using the world's energy, reward 1 wisdom, mana exhaust, first time reaching 0 mana, reward 10 wisdom, damaged, first time being hurt, reward 1 vitality, so that's where all this mana came from. Ah, uh, was I damaged? Wait. Unless, emptying mana might harm me? I did a small smile containing the anxiety inside, realizing that my health was indeed 7 out of 8. With some confusion, I stared at it for a moment, eventually noticing the value change. I got this. My health is full again. It seems like resting recovers both of them. To avoid any injuries, all I have to do is track the mana. That way, I won't get hurt again. Satisfied with my little understanding of the matter, I felt like I gained some confidence in it which allowed me to keep going. My beautiful green eyes gazed upon the status screen scanning the skills, and changing the information on the achievements screen. Skills. Active skills. Status. System library. It seems like the maximum windows I can have at one time are two. I nodded lightly with a faint grin, content with my newest discovery, but alas, there was more to know. Therefore, I couldn't help myself but mutter innocently with a soft tone causing my mana to be expended once again, system library, notice, system consumed 2 mana, system library, world of atana eye, fishing eye, baking eye, cooking eye, do I have to choose one, I was quite a fond reader in my past life, if these are books, then I'll have a lot of fun from here onwards, my finger approached the one on top, let's try the first one, world of atana eye, Notice, system consumed 15 mana, world of Atana I, author name, Wise John. Long, long ago, many injustices and strife across the world existed. This came to be as each god created a race as they seemed fit. The problem started with the races seeking world domination. Many kings surged, many kingdoms and armies raised, a world covered with wars making the weaker races lose the most. With our human race, the one loved by the goddess Arya. There was a day where we came close to coming to extinction. Hearing the constant prayers and pleas, she proposed a certain deal to the other gods. Once they accepted, they created a system that made the world more balanced and their meddling restricted. Thanks to that, each god kept a different race which they helped from time to time. In the divine's place, the system began taking care of everyone by its laws. From what I know, at the beginning of the world, Four races came to be humans, beasts, demons, and monsters. Despite the balancing of the system, some races were born stronger than others, very few individuals were naturally better than most, thanks to everyone being ultimately different and the humans are the very weakest. Our goddess Arya began summoning heroes from other worlds every 100 years to help us, so that humanity can prevail longer, so that we won't die. Page 1430, Notice you have unlocked trace and name in status system, you have received the achievement, beginner reader. After reading for a while, I ended up on page 14 where messages popped and it even allowed an achievement to appear. My mouth opened and closed a few times before I could speak again. I don't think I want to live in such a dangerous world. A fearful expression came through as I dreaded the possibility of my family's death. Even if the goddess summons heroes, I don't think they'd be able to crush beasts, demons, and monsters altogether. Don't they have like a vast territory of their own and are stronger than us? I took some deep breathing, calming myself down and attempting to relax from the unexpected information. It seems way too many things to handle. It could depend on how many heroes she summoned to, but even then, I don't quite know how strong these individuals are. The strength of my grip increased, making the knuckles turn white with a hint of red in the middle of each one. Sounds like I should take the lessons extra seriously and become strong as fast as possible to protect them if it comes down to it. After gaining some sort of goal, or the beginning of one, my eyes quickly gazed back at the book, looking for a date. I wonder when they wrote this book. All the information I can find is the title and the author's name on every page. He could very well be dead already. I then remembered the system voice opening the screen by thinking about it. Let's see what that achievement gave me. Achievements. Early series 1260, before the system unlock. Plus, mana, first time using the world's energy. Reward 1 wisdom. Mana exhaust, first time reaching 0 mana. Reward 10 wisdom. Damaged. 
first time being hurt. Reward 1 Vitality. Begin a reader 1 100th. Read a set of books. Reward 1 Wisdom once complete. Sounds like reading books will allow me to check more of them. And by doing a ton more, it'll even reward me with more wisdom. That's amazing. After realizing there was some sort of early series to it, my finger touched it unknowingly to me. My eyes sparkled with this new information. Achievements. Early series 1260, before the system unlock. Dash. Early reader, read a book. Reward 10 fame. Early merchant, make any type of trade. Reward 10 fame. Early killer, killer creature. Reward 10 disgrace. Early friend, make a friend. Reward 10 fame. Early pet, get a pet. Reward 10 fame. Early thief, steal something. Reward 10 disgrace. Early trickster, trick someone. Reward 10 disgrace. Early chef. Cook something. Reward 10 fame. Early brewer. Make a suspicious looking drink. Reward 10 disgrace. Early rider. Ride an animal. Reward 10 fame. Early planter. Plant a seed. Reward 10 fame. Early crafter. Create something useful. Reward 10 fame. After reading it for quite a long time, laughter escaped my lips, arriving at a conclusion. It seems like the system kept track of everything I've done till now. Rewarding me with disgrace and fame based on my actions, I wonder what they're for. Giving it no further thought, my mind quickly recollected the prior thoughts from the most recent tale I had gone through. That story was very interesting can't wait to read more of it. I let out a yawn while getting myself comfortable on the bed. In my old world, despite everything, my father was quite rich, so he had his own library, the wealthiest duke and also the coldest one. Two hours went by and I found myself to be stretching my arms and legs, making a little noise with the snapping joints of the bones. The bed below me, tagged along with the melody by creaking the wood that supported the cushion, and then my eyes and lips opened about the same time. That was a good nap. I'll try to not sleep more, otherwise, I'll have trouble at night. I smiled cutely and then remembered the skill from before. Guess I'll read a bit more, nothing else to do. System library, notice, system consumed two mana, system library, world of Atana eye, fishing eye, baking eye, cooking eye, I wonder what these symbols are after the books, I've read a lot of them in my past life, but I'm pretty sure it didn't have these, I place my right hand between the window and myself in order to block the sunlight, creating a brief shadow. Could it possibly be the various series like how sequels and prequels existed for famous authors? Soon I reminisced about the past. I believe mine had normal numbers for them. This could be an original method of numbering things. My shoulders shrugged, and my mouth opened. I want to read the fishing eye. Might as well see what the others will bring. Notice, system consumed 15 mana. Fishing eye. Author name, the fisherman Felix. In the world of Artana, there are many things to learn about. For example, jobs, and on that note, mine was called fisherman. It's one of the benefits in this world that anyone can get. It allows us to use their blessings in our daily lives to make a living, earn money and level up while gaining certain abilities that make it easier to some extent. But, as any beginner must start, I'd advise by buying or making your own rod, one made of bamboo as they're flexible, unless you have a robust physique for something better. The next thing would be to afford either a wire made of horsehair or finely woven flax, as they're very consistent and durable. Regarding the bait, one can buy worms from the store. Also, do not forget to get a hook. Once you have all the materials required, you can ask a blacksmith to fuse them for you with one of their skills. Now you should have a fishing rod and lots of worms. Procure a small river which will equal to tiny to mid fishes. No point going for greater prey as you're bound to lose your tool. Once you find a spot you like, find some big stones, so that you can stick the rod there. That way you'll be able to avoid staying lots of hours holding the rod by yourself, which can be tiring. The moment the bamboo bends, you'll have to pull the fish with a lot of strength out to get it out. Or at the very least, to go passive at it, allowing for it to suffer eventually getting tired. Don't forget a basket with long leaves to cover your fish with once you get one, if you can even add some salt to avoid getting it rotten. Page half, notice, you have unlocked level and job and status. In a way, it's a good thing the books aren't all too long, it'll allow the achievement to be done in no time. The screen disappeared when I waved my hand left and right, I wonder if the library is being mindful of me for being young. I'm used to read enormous books, so skill, do your best. 
My hand fell on the lap alongside the other one before resuming my inner thoughts. I'm truly grateful the language is the same, otherwise both skills would have been useless till much later. My eyes took a glimpse through the window on my right side after finishing the second page, which talked about fish names and what a few looked like. I didn't get to leave my mansion in my past life. I had read everything there was in my former father's library, but the knowledge I had differed to some extent from this world's. For example, there were a few books related to wars, and they showed records of diverse human kingdoms fighting one another. The focus of my stare changed to the door. Since I haven't received a gift from my parents and they usually tell me to wish for one, I'll ask them during dinner if I can get a fishing rod. Once more my vision went through the window, but this time to check the weather. The night wasn't too far off, as the sun was sinking behind the forest to the northwest. Now I'm curious about the rest of the books. I couldn't have asked for a better skill, since that was all I loved in my past life. Let's see what my parents are doing while the mana recovers, just in case. My feet took me close to the door, allowing my hand to open it by rotating its handle. My room entrance connected directly to the hall, which led both to the bathroom with a door to the left and the living room further ahead. The exit of the house resided to the right. Thus, after a few extra steps forward, I found both parents resting on the sofa talking to one another. Baby, come sit with us. She gestured with her right hand for me to approach them with a big smile on her face. So what were you doing this long in the room, dear? Unsure if I should divulge my skills, I replied simply. I was reading a book. How about you two? Mother made an unsure expression but then nodded slightly, possibly realizing the gift earlier. We finished cleaning the leftovers of the party a few minutes ago, so we took the chance to rest here. Rosalind's hand approached me, patting my hair eventually stripping it off the knot, allowing the many golden strips to flow freely, could I request a present? I smiled happily, melting their hearts as they tilted their heads curiously, a gift? My parents asked in unison, surprised, as I had sought nothing for these past seven years. Yes, I'd like a fishing rod. Eh hey, what? Once more they asked me in harmony, baffled about my strange request. Yes, I'd like to fish. We've gone on a stroll near the river a lot of times already. It wasn't far, so I could do it whenever I'd like. My parents looked at each other as if trying to mind read one another. Oh, before I forget some wire in case it breaks. With sloppy behavior, I added, feeling guilty. Ah, worms too, please. Otherwise I won't have bait for the fishes. Dad found my behavior funny, patting my right cheek softly. It's not something out of my budget, so I'll get you one. I smiled happily ending up giving him a hug. Thank you, father. My mother hurriedly added that she didn't want to feel left out on such a unique occasion. If there's anything else you'd like, I'll gift it to you. That way, you'd have a present from both of us. I nodded in agreement, giving her a hug too, so she wouldn't feel bad. Yes, I'll let you know once I have something in mind. Thank you very much. We stayed in comfort for a while, speaking mainly about those who appeared at the party, so that I grasped who everyone was from their names to professions. 13. Chapter 5 Later that day, a bit more than an hour before dinner was ready, I opened the system library skill to check the diverse stories. Notice, system consumed 2 mana. System library, world of Atana 1, 2. Fishing 1, 2. Baking 1, 2. Cooking 1, 2. With a joyful tone, I shouted inside my room, new books, hooray. All the titles seemed interesting. It made me ponder between them before deciding on one. Very willing to progress, my lips opened, allowing a piece of my excitement to flow. More of that interesting story, please. A while passed and then I muttered, embarrassed, finding myself to be clumsy, and still not used to the way of the world. Right. I need to specify what I want. World of Adana 2. Having finished the first volume along with the fishing one, I aimed toward the sequel with big hopes. Notice, system consumed 15 mana. World of Adana 2. Author name, Wise John. A very interesting topic about this world is what I've found out from the system. They composed it of nine laws, possibly more, but these are the ones I've figured so far. Together they make me realize humans will always be the weakest race as we're born naturally inferior. Those who are strong will become stronger. They can serve themselves of the weak by crushing them and consuming their experience, gaining higher levels. 
the leveling law where everyone starts at level 1, the experience law, where everyone can level up by killing other beings, including their own race, the status law, where they can select what they wish to improve on through point distribution, the skill law, where they can gain skills through different methods, the class law, where everyone can get one of their own and improve it further. They're usually, and mainly meant for combat. The job law, a profession for those who do not seek to put their lives at risk, but to be part of society through distinct contributions. After all, without farmers, most of us would starve to death. The title law, where everyone receives a reward for completing many achievements, which by no means is advisable upon the church standards. The grading law, where every item, armor, and weapon receives a grade based on their quality and rarity. The language law, where everyone can understand each other with enough intelligence and wisdom, even among other races. Thanks to these laws, when the other races build large enough armies, we're sure to be wiped out as compared to them our population grows slower and weaker. Not to forget our lifespans may very well be the shortest. For those of the next generations, if you can, don't hesitate on growing stronger. Otherwise, you'll lose everyone you love during your life. Page 112. Notice. You have unlocked experience, status, class, rank, and intelligence in status. As soon as I finished reading, my hands shook where there was great hype mixed with happiness and excitement. In its place, it got replaced by a blend of anxiety and dread. This author sounds angry and serious. In the sentence where he mentions that we're born inferior, does that mean that other races are born with higher statuses than us humans? My thumbs rubbed onto one another, slightly frightened, ruminating on about it. Is there possibly a way to surpass such natural growth? I wonder what humans are doing to prevent such invasions. These books must be in every library through the Lumen Kingdom no? My eyes looked around my room as if looking for an answer, fully knowing there wouldn't be one. I somehow have a bad feeling, the pace of my breathing increased by the second. What if in this world we don't get strong enough? My palm landed on top of my chest in a failed attempt to calm down my loud heartbeat. We'll likely die, won't we? My family came to mind, and with their safety in case, I started thinking about the oppressors. Does that possibly mean that I will have to level up a lot? I'll have to kill, won't I? I started panicking further, accelerating the friction between my slender fingers. I ended up gripping the hands against each other fiercely as nothing else worked. It might also mean that I'm bound to die early. A feeling of revolt grew within me, I want to live a long and happy life. I don't want to die again. I stood up and then began walking in circles, concerned about my family's future, and, of course, my own. I'll have to kill, but can I? Will I be able to achieve it? I raised one of my hands in the air at shoulder height, squeezing it tight. If it is to protect my family, then I inhaled and then exhaled deeply to relax. Best to think about something else for now. My butt landed on the softness of my sheets and I reached out for my doll, embracing it. I can't allow myself to be so frail. Despite what I told myself, there was little to nothing that I could do to change my cowardly and damaged self. Recollecting the changes in the status, I opened it to investigate more about it in hopes of further development. Notice, system consumed 2 mana, status, level, 1, experience, 0 100, health, 8 eighths, mana, 2239, vitality, 8, intelligence, 0, wisdom, 13, status points, 10, class, job, race, human, name, iris, fame, 800, disgrace, 400, titles plus, achievements plus, skills plus, 0 intelligence, does that mean I'm dumb? I fretted at my own words, feeling like the system was having fun mocking me with such a value. Believing that I could become smarter by reading books, I reached out for the book list screen, checking what was left. Baking. This could be fun. The moment I imagined myself making desserts made me believe I could replace the days I ate the leftovers of my maids and step-siblings, which was still rather better than the times when there was nothing on my plate. With a cracked grin. The tip of my finger softly touched it, still trembling from such terrible memories. Notice, system consumed 15 mana. Baking I, author name, Bakers Yuxu. The art I make is baking. I use a skill that allows me to make a lot of different food. My job is baker, one of the easiest choices when we're peasants. Personally, 
I love it. I make the most delicious bread, cakes, pastries, pies, cookies, and other things. I can also cook many meals a person with a chef job would be able to. The difference is that I receive experience by doing bakery things and my skills level up faster, unlike doing proper meals. I also can learn advanced skills from doing so, while chef ones I don't have access to. However, I can learn how to make it with a chef or even create a recipe on my own. Still it won't profit me. It'll never be as good as a real chef, but it'll still be pretty delicious. I'll be passing some of my recipes to future generations like the ash cake whenever I save enough. The first step is to build a fire and let it burn down to a thick layer of coals. We'll know it's ready once they become white ash. Then we must make a thick dough made of flour, adding only enough water so that it doesn't stick in the hands. We can add wild fruits that you can find in the forest, as well as chopped nuts or even wild berries. Then roll the dough into small balls and smash them so they become plain circles. Place them onto the hot ash, not on the coals. Then it'll slowly become cooked and brown. Once it's brown, you can lift it, clean the rest of the ashes, and use butter or some jelly to eat it. I hope you'll enjoy this recipe, and the achievement it shall bring to you. Page 11, Bake Exuxu Her name sounds so adorable. I imagined the woman being a bit like an old lady, perhaps a grandmother like the ones from the village. She would give the sweets her aged hands made to the children with a radiant smile and a big heart. I did my best to hold back my tears, realizing once more that this person was probably gone from this world. It also made me realize she didn't sound strong at all. Kind was how my heart described this lady, which possibly meant the job itself didn't quite grant power. Perhaps I'd be able to make some money if I became good at it, despite wishing to increase my combat expertise in any manner, for the time being. Fulfilling the achievements seemed like the best and safest bet. I crossed my arms, feeling refreshed by the kindness of Xuxu's words. To think I'd find such information in a baker's book. The pair of skills I received upon birth by the system turned out to be quite valuable. They allowed my mind to experience stories of others which I wouldn't be able to otherwise. Not only that, but it motivated me to do more. Hopefully one day. I could bake something to surprise my parents. Iris, speaking of the devil, a yell pierced my thoughts as I heard someone calling out for me, the source coming from the living room. With small and fast steps, I headed in a rush through the room entrance. My hand quickly opened the door, and I kept going, colliding with my dad. He felt a minor bump into his soft belly that felt like a cushion. Ouch, didn't expect you there. I rubbed my nose while chuckling a bit watching how my father's expression didn't seem unbothered, almost like he expected this to happen. In fact, it wasn't the first time, as I always rushed to either of them upon their calling. Hey princess, I wanted to know if you'd like to tag along to the store, maybe they have a rod. He gestured by waving an invisible rod which made me confused as I'd never seen one before. Of course, I'd love to. My voice filled with energy made him smile instantly. After all, this meant I could visit the village. Few were the times my feet stomped on such barren ground where men, women, and animals lived by. As soon as he traded glances at my passing mother, his face changed to a more serious look and inevitably he added, I always tell you to not go so fast through the house. You're bound to end up hurting yourself. I lowered my head, feeling guilty, and consenting to such words. I'm sorry. I'll try to be more careful. He placed his right hand on my left shoulder and, with a less stern voice, his lips danced, good girl. I raised my chin up, looking at him with expectation. I don't get many chances to go to the village. In all these years I had gone there about seven to ten times despite how close it was. My parents had their reasons not to show me to the world, not to make appearances and much less to take me there. My seventh birthday was the sole exception where others were invited to the nearby field. Yet, they didn't dare set foot inside our house. He gestured with his head by turning it, quickly nodding in the door's direction, very much like cows do when they're annoyed. All right, let's see what we can find there. Hopefully, something promising for you to become a master fisherman. We started walking towards the exit. Yes, a magical fishing rod capable of pulling any type of fish, no matter how big or fast they are. Luke laughed at my wish, causing me to giggle. My mom shouted at us with a serious yet happy expression making sure we would understand the idea, otherwise, a punishment was all both of us would get for dinner. 
Don't take too long, you too. I'll be preparing our meal. Yes, mom. All right, mom. I waved back at Rosalyn, stealing a grin from her. After 20 minutes of heading northwest, we arrived at the village. This wooden sign says, I started reading it filled with nostalgia. Something I would do every time I came to this place. It had become a sort of tradition between the three of us now, as it was one of the few words they taught me. Astia Village. It truly is a pretty name. Further next to me grinned, possibly from the wonderful memories he had in this place. Indeed, it's a cozy place to some extent. We walked for a bit more, reaching closer to a small building called the General Shop. What an odd name. Upon entering. I noticed a woman behind the counter in the furthest center end, which faced directly to the exit, conceivably to force people to go through the middle of everything she had to sell, but possibly, it was also to avoid thieves getting their way without the owner noticing it, I like how everything is inside either small bottles or boxes with a name labeled above them, to my surprise, the woman explained as she heard my tender comment, it's to make things easier for the customers, if someone doesn't know how to read, they can still check the products by their appearance or smell. Asking me is also fine, sounds like they'll easily find what they need. At my rebuke, she grinned proudly, Dad added calmly and educated, smiling while looking at me, good afternoon. I added a greeting faintly, gazing at everything while mesmerized without knowing what most things were. Welcome, Luke, how may I help the two of you today? We walked closer to the counter, going through the middle of two tall wooden shelves, with four shelf brackets dividing the different products. We'd like to know if you sell utensils like a fishing rod, perhaps? It's fine if they used it before. She raised a finger in the air before speaking as if to announce herself or perhaps grab our attention with a positive result. I have different kinds. Yes, from kitchen pans, clay pots, and some basic tools for farming, forage, fishing. Well, for the diverse jobs basically, I'm sure you get the gist, my father responded loudly, unlike before, surprising me with the abrupt change, that's fantastic Elizabeth, the woman smiled happily, feeling proud of her wide stock, yes, it wouldn't be possible without a deal that I have with a sibling who works in a blacksmith shop in the capital, and some of his friends from diverse areas, Luke responded after remembering the things he noticed, like spices, sugar, salt, alcohol, and what looked like farming seeds, that explains the variety and quality of the things in this place, her hand changed to an open palm face to the ceiling, besides all of this, she grinned cheekily, I also do hair deals, since some farmers have animals and sometimes what they produce isn't enough, Luke quickly nodded in agreement, fair trading I'd say, recollecting something he heard about, he added, Weren't you the one who also negotiated with the Adventurers Guild? She giggled and then responded effortlessly. I'm surprised you remember that. Luke smiled happily at his feet. Well, it has been a while since I last took a quest, but I remember a few friends from the village selling monster parts to you. What was that all about? She stared at him with a smug making Luke smile uncomfortably. The guild doesn't need all of it and I ended up figuring that they had some use for herbalists and alchemists. I noticed how a drop of sweat fell from my father's eyebrow, causing me to giggle softly at how hard he tried to justify himself. In my defense, I only enchant the potions at Vicent's shop. He's the one who makes them. Elizabeth started laughing upon hearing such words, since she didn't know he wasn't an alchemist but a healer, and an assistant at that. Fair enough. Dear Luke, with that said, I take basic ingredients for potions, from monsters and beast parts. She looked at me, noticing my features, and added some more words, causing me to blush. Will that adorable daughter of yours follow through in her parents' footsteps? My father glanced at me as I looked at them with an innocent like face. If blood doesn't tell, time will. I tilted my head, confused about the complex way he responded. Huh? What do you mean by that, Dad? He smiled faintly and then lifted his hand all the way to his hair, scratching it a bit behind his left ear. It's something my dad used to say, but don't worry about it, dear. The adults traded a glance at each other. What your father meant is that children often pursue the same path as their parents. I opened my mouth, then closed it, understanding what she meant. It caused me to remember the conversation where they mentioned learning swordsmanship and magic. Oh, I understand. Thank you, Miss Elizabeth who was close to Luke's age, around the thirties, hid her rosy cheeks, 
feeling merry to be called Miss at this age. She then moved to the corner of the shop towards a vase, grabbing three different rods. The woman then brought them to the balcony and showed them to me. I looked confused at them. After all, I didn't understand the differences, as if reading my expression, or my mind at that. She effortlessly explained the details. These are the various models I have, and by that I mean the diverse materials used to craft them. Though I recommend this green one since you live by the river. Elizabeth winked at me, causing me to follow with a happy nod. In return, she kept going, pointing with her index finger at the different tools as they passed by our hands. This fishing rod is made of bamboo about 60 centimeters long. It is more flexible than these two made of wood, and also shorter. She then pointed at me. Who remained with brilliant eyes of expectation towards the tools, knowing that one of them would be mine today, and I couldn't wait for that. You're still young, so having something you can carry around and handle should be better than the other two, we replied in unison at her, ending up staring at each other, trading delighted smiles. I agree. The woman then pointed at the label where a price was visible, not that she waited for us to read it. With that said, It'll be a special price of 80 mana coins. Luke then opened a leather bag after removing it from the pocket and took three shiny coins out, placing them all in my left hand. I stared at them, going from 5 to 25 and lastly a 51. The higher the value the shinier they looked like. The cost was equivalent to the mana necessary to create them, and a number related to the amount spent was noticeable on it. The top one could see their worth and on the bottom the first king portrait. I can't help myself but say this every time I see it, they truly are very shiny. Despite my comment, the brilliance in them was faint enough to illuminate the hand inside a dark room, whereas currency of higher value would further irradiate the surrounding zone. Yet, my father smiled kindly at me, watching over the preceding trade. Soon I had a rod in my hand, once I questioned about the currency. My mother taught me they created it by the first king of the Lumen Kingdom orders mainly to avoid wasting natural resources like copper, silver, or even gold, as not everyone possessed a significant amount of mana. This ended up escalating through the entire human territory, as it had plenty of uses. Turning this currency into the greatest success since the forming of the country, it was impossible to make any attempt at falsification, as energy itself was something anyone could estimate by viewing its value. There were even some banks, and facilities that worked with money that used a mana length machine to peerlessly evaluate the high valued coins. Even if these had protection from a banker's job skill, which maintained their energy from coming out. The best part was that they also had a different apparatus that enabled people to trade their energy for money. Even if little, it was better than nothing. At the very least, it kept beggars from starving to death, but not quite enough for them to stop that lifestyle system. You have received the achievement, begin a merchant. A new achievement? Did Dad give me the money on purpose for this to happen? I stole a glimpse of his expression, only to find him smiling kindly at me. I guess not. He just looks happy for me buying things with him. Father probably doesn't think much about it. Interrupting my thoughts, Elizabeth spoke, stretching something towards me. Here you go, little miss. I placed some cloth around the hook so that you don't get hurt with it. I stared at it, and then at him as both of my hands were filled with the fishing rod. Thank you for everything. I'll be careful with it. Understanding the look on my face, Dad assisted with the edge and the hook and then he returned his gaze to the woman. By the way, Elizabeth, what would you suggest using as bait? She placed a finger on her lower lip, muttering a murmur before speaking. I'd say, get some from a fellow farmer or a fisherman, but I can also take that request as a commission. Dad nodded confidently thinking of various solutions, I'll see what I can do about it, and in case I fail, I'll return here. She extended her arms to the side. You're always welcome here, anything else you might need? Dad swayed his head to the sides, understanding that we had gotten all we came for, for now, we have everything, thank you for the help, Elizabeth. They traded warm smiles, and then the woman glanced at me, take care, little one. My eyes shifted the focus from my father to the woman and bid her farewell. Bye bye, and thank you for the rod, the woman from the general shop said happily while waving her hand. Take care, both of you. A while later, we got three boxes full of worms from a fellow acquaintance of Luke, a farmer. On the way back home, Dad decided to ask me something, 
putting my emotions on the line. Will you be okay with killing the worms to catch the fishes? I consented with a nod, not paying it much attention. Yes? Bugs don't bother me. I find them cute. Luke then followed my response by squirming his hand, mimicking, and giving life to his words. If you take the fishes out of the water, they'll meet their end too. My head swayed to the sides in disagreement, eventually lowering my gaze to the barren path toward home. I know, but they won't die without a purpose. I want to learn how to cook and make wonderful dishes for you and mum. For a while, we stood silent. From the look of it, I believe dad was brooding over something, but unsure. I remained looking forward to my mother's meal. I wonder what she's cooking for us. A bit of drool swam through the corner of my mouth as I thought about the mushroom stew she made sometimes. Are you excited to fish tomorrow? I slurped the saliva back inside before replying to the sudden question. Yes, a lot. I wonder if I'll be able to catch anything though. I shifted my gaze from Luke to the road ahead while thinking. I understand what dad meant, but after reading those books, I'll have to resolve myself. I breathed deeply feeling a tad anxious on the inside, there is a big need to kill things to become stronger at some point, I squeezed his hand tighter, better to get used to it now than later, otherwise, when I'm faced with a monster and hesitate to defeat it, it might not end so well, 12, chapter 6, year 5007 after the system, day 2 of the flowering season in the morning, a day after my birthday, these look good, hastily, Knowing today was the day I'd be able to go outside to try fishing. I dressed in some casual brown clothes since there was a chance to dirty them near the river. Once my body fit the last piece of clothing, my little bottom found itself falling on the bed, leaving my long hair exposed to the sunlight, beautifully shining with a light yellow blonde. Because of yesterday's excitement of going to the village briefly, I returned home only to have dinner and then headed to bed to rest. There had been some changes to which I decided to have a look at one of my skills. Notice, system consumed 2 mana. Status. Level, 1, experience, 0 100, health, 8 eighths, mana, 37 39, vitality, 8, intelligence, 0, wisdom, 13, status points, 10, fame, 800, disgrace, 400, points. Right, I was too excited before to keep attention to them before, but I'm assuming we use them on the things above, would it increase my mana further if I did that? I tilted my head to the left, then briefly to the right while crossing my arms. I could really use a lot of energy to read more books and to check status freely. After remembering blacking out from exhaustion, I gulped and reached a decision. Furthermore, I extended my arms a bit and clapped my hands against one another, voicing out firmly, I want all my points to be spent in wisdom. System, you have received the title, wisdom, a new title, how come? With the information automatically being switched to the status because of my actions, I gazed at it, becoming dumbfounded, notice, system consumed 2 mana, status, health, 8 eighths, mana, 65 69, vitality, 8. Intelligence, 1, Wisdom, 23, Status Points, 0, Fame, 800, Disgrace, 500, oh, my, that's so much mana. On second thought, I remembered my mother's words, I'm sure dad who knows about magic would have thousands, if not millions, more than me, I consented to my own ideas with a nod and a brief smile, having pride for my father, who was supposedly good enough that he was willing to go as far as to teach me about magic. I received the wisdom title for spending 10 points in wisdom, is that a good or a bad thing? Was there a chance to spend 10 points on every parameter, gaining a title for each one? Or had this been special in some way? There had also been a change related to disgrace having gained about a hundred of it, is disgrace bad? I wondered deeply about the subject as it sounded like it, but didn't seem to affect me in any way, with a soft tap. I looked for the information regarding these so-called titles, titles, reincarnated, wisdom, I'd love if I could get some information out of these, after drumming my index finger with my left hand on both multiple times like a maniac, nothing changed on the screen, doesn't work, I let out a soft yet frustrated sigh before resuming the waltz of my lips, might as well spend the mana I received, it was interesting that after spending these points, the mana had increased but also healed part of it. Notice, system consumed 2 mana. System library, 
World of Atana 1, 2, Fishing 1, 2, Baking 1, 2, Cooking 1, 2, Farming 1, 2. After hovering over the list, I noticed something unfamiliar. Farming? Was there a book with such a title? Excitedly, I took a glance at it, making a big smile filled with curiosity. Notice, system consumed 15 mana. Farming I, author, Farmer Alex, as a fellow human and now as an old grandpa who can't plow his fields anymore. I've decided to write my lifetime down regarding my farmer's job. I started as a very weak kid around my 10 years, and gradually, as I used to hoe to plow, my strength increased with time. I'm not sure of the reason. But perhaps the farming achievements I gained over time had something to do with it. I'd do a lot of hours every day of exercise from this profession and from time to time I'd get new titles, or the accomplishments grades would rank up. In the end, my status became enough for me to do my work a bit faster and consistently. I initially started with very few cheap things. I bought a hoe from an experienced farmer, tomato seeds from a traveling merchant, and also a large straw hat from a street seller's store because of the severe hours I spent under the sunlight, waking up early where the sun wasn't as intense was the way to reduce sunburns, it was also during this time where I began plowing my fields, then I'd sow everything and close the holes, watering everything once I had finished, at some point birds began pecking onto my fields, looking for the hidden seeds, to fight this, I made a scarecrow to deal with those fiends, to build one I used some wood, after I cut a tree, and some old cloth, it was pretty effective thinking back at it, I remember my strength increasing from chopping trees too. Later on, as I grew up, I ended marrying and having a very cute daughter. She asked me if we could have some plants, so at 40 years old I started harvesting some in a different field, it was then that I became stronger, it felt then at the age of 65 that I had mastered all the achievements of farming but perhaps there was more to it, the day I finished, I felt my strength increasing, sadly I took too long to understand the art of a farmer, I believe that future farmers, with or without the class, will not bother themselves reading this book, as most don't know how to do so, still, I hope my tale goes across so that everyone who tries it can have an easier time than I did, page 1 1, notice. You have unlocked strength in status. Seems like there are various things that help the status grow. I smiled adorably and heartily, thinking about the information displayed in the window, realizing that I had spent my points on parameters, yet, not all of them were out yet, hoping that such wouldn't turn out as a mistake later on. I'll ask mother to buy me a hoe and some seeds. I smiled briefly, having found a way to satisfy her request, committing myself to a world of fishing and farming. How hard could it be? My mutters left in a convincing tone to myself, so that I'd do them without wasting the efforts of the person who wrote them. Magic and swordsmanship lessons. Fishing and farming activities. A deep breath followed by the clenching of my left fist. You can do this Iris. After speaking to myself with some resilience, my chin rose a bit upwards, staring at the plains outside with a big farm. I should be able to get vegetables and fruits. There had been a lot I had learned already. If I sold the things that would grow in the fields, I could sell them or get someone to do them for me if I didn't have enough time. Then I could even follow the recipes of Xuxu and use my fresh ingredients. Strangely enough, everything seemed to match, or perhaps my own deductions and my pseudo long time planning were turning into a significant result. I'll do a bit of everything and hopefully get stronger that way. The achievements and every point should matter, I giggled joyfully at the entire thing, aiming my finger at the screen to change its contents. Of course, reading too, I was having so much fun that I no longer could stop myself from going to the next book. Notice, system consumed 15 mana. Farming too. Author, Farmer Alexandra. My grandpa died when I was 7 years old. A special ceremony took place for me, which also happens to every human child of that age. I spent my status points on parameters that I felt would help me continue his honorable job, mainly strength, as it was a tough profession. I wanted to be like him, so I took the job farmer. There were some people who called it a profession. In the end, that's what we do for the rest of our life, as changing to another resets everything we've achieved to that point. One important thing is that the nobles have a couple of things we do not, such as possessing a higher mana amount because of their ancient lineage. 
not to forget the blessing the goddess gave their ancestors, one that every one of them has, and that we peasants can never get, no matter what, unless, perhaps, if one could become a noble, but I've never seen that happen. I grew up following the advice from the past volume, and also from his daily teachings. I reached the peak at 30 and my mother at 50. I discovered some interesting things that allowed me to make things faster. I believe we could hasten them through future generations. One of them was sowing different seeds from the start and harvesting different plants. These two will contribute with achievements of their own. I believe the farmer's title requires all kinds of feats related to such a profession for it to appear. They give wonderful bonuses. By the age of 25, I ended up marrying a fisherman, who would complain about having to buy lots of worms and that was expensive in a long term. But thankfully to farming and plowing after harvesting, I started boxing a lot of worms that lived in my fields. This allowed my husband Felix to increase his fishing skills, earning achievements and money rapidly. Those squirming pinky things that lived in my fields were also bigger and fatter compared to the ones sold by traveling merchants that may have affected his fishing as well. I asked him to write a few notes as my grandpa did in order to help the future fishers of our Lumen kingdom. I felt like doing what others didn't, mainly to differ from the humans who aren't helpful to one another, sadly, because of the system, the royals, the nobles, and the church. They seclude from each other as they try to progress alone, believing only they can change this world. I appeal that my kindness can reach those who read this. I will pray every day to the goddess Aria, who saved us all from the recent war against the Boar tribe, that humans will start being friendlier to one another, especially the nobles. They mistreat us, peasants, way too much. I hope the farmers from this country learn how to read and write early on. That way, they'll be able to spend some time in the few libraries around the kingdom, improving themselves. There's a chance this book will fade in the future because of the church laws, but alas, I've registered it in the library's codex as law demands it, hoping it won't. I know little about it. But the elder mentioned something about it being an ancient machine that saves the tales inside the system. There was even a theory at some point that it was so the gods could leisure themselves with the creations we came up with. Or simply to pass their time seeing how much we have progressed. Page 1 1. Notice. You have unlocked age in status. It is a little sad to know the grandpa died. He sounded really kind in the first story. The sorrow took over me, causing my head to lean slightly restraining my shining eyes from pouring. I still remained far too sensitive, but it didn't seem like something that would change anytime soon. I'm very honored to be able to read your works. I can feel the love in it. From the story, I felt need to not waste the information provided in it, compromising deep within my heart to make use of it now more than ever. A tear fell, one filled with sadness and respect for those who were no longer part of this world. I moaned and readjusted myself thinking about the later part of the tale, it seems like I'll be able to get worms of my own. I remembered some nights when I was a baby, when my parents would go under the sheets and shake the bed. After some time of that happening, on one of those nights, I ended up hearing about the entire process and how it was necessary to make babies. This was one thing my mother mentioned, as she was thrilled with me, but wouldn't mind two or three kids more. Perhaps I could even find a way to make these worms. To my surprise, the fisherman author was this woman's husband, without proper dating. It turned out quite complicated to know when these tales happened, if they happened at all. The day before, during my birthday party, there was a man who taught me about the Lumen Kingdom calendar. He said there was a period between the before and after the system, a line in time that became divided by the gods who brought significant changes to the world of Artana. As such, years started being calculated from that point onwards, eventually dividing that space of time using numbers, and also four different seasons, each lasting for 90 days. They together produced a year. I got up groaning, turning around because of the sun burning the center of my back. Once I faced outside, I peeked at the gap between the curtains. Once I got outside, the beautiful clear blue sky looked down on me. As I smiled, my hair flew because of the soft breeze, which made me inhale deeply, feeling the freshness of the surrounding greenery. Its fragrance made my nostrils delighted and satisfied to be able to casually walk outside without having to worry about anything. Before fishing, there was one more story to wrap up before attempting fishing. Hopefully, it'd contain hints to help me succeed.
Notice, system consumed 15 mana. Fishing 2. I've been helping my wife at farming and ever since then, fishing, which required some strength, has become a tad easier. Thanks to this, I've observed my body agility and dexterity increase. I've been able to move a little faster and use my hands better at small works. Even things like penetrating the wire inside the hook's tiny ring wouldn't call it seeing better, but more like the accuracy improved. Of course, that it was only a tiny bit, but significant to know they changed. The amount of points that we require to make great changes are more than the ones we receive from achievements. Otherwise, there wouldn't be people trying to level up, and instead would just complete them since despite being really long, they do come to an end, believe it or not, after spending so much time fishing, I felt like even that became slightly faster, the number of fish caught increased, though it could have just been my imagination, there was also a chance that it was the influence of the excitement of having my diverse parameters increasing, I feel like catching different types, and doing it in various places has all been great to this progression. I've been using some worms from my wife's fields. This made fishing more profitable instead of what I used to do before I met her, which was buying boxes from random traveling merchants and farmers. After befriending a man of trades, who doesn't take a big tax to sell the things I catch, me and my wife ended up gaining a bit more money than usual. I'm currently 30 years old and I haven't mastered fishing, nor have I found all the achievements and titles of this profession. Yet, I completed some with a 100 100s in front of them. Only through mastering all the beginner ones of said job that will they go to the next grade. That's what a friend of mine taught me. But there's a chance that it could have more requirements. I believe their ranks go from beginner, intermediate, advanced, and not sure if it works like that to every single one. Or even if there are other grades, it is quite profound and long. Mastering an art is hardly possible with the lifespan we humans have even with the class skills that make this process easier. This is everything I was able to figure out as I spent 10 years of my life fishing. If in the future, I find something else, I may attempt a new book despite the high cost of registering them. I hope the future children of the Lumen Kingdom will have better luck than me. Page 1 1. Notice. You have unlocked agility and dexterity and status. Suddenly, before I could indulge in what I read, my ears heard a voice calling out for me. Iris, the food is ready. 13. Chapter 7 After the meal, I started running around crazily through the house, looking for things that could be useful for fishing. Through a long and meticulous search, my hands and eyes found a closed oval basket made of knotted straw, which was light to carry and slightly flexible. In the long run inside my mother's room, I discovered a similar straw hat, which I grabbed with my left hand, placing the container on the floor. This is a tad too big for my head. I giggled, failing multiple times to set it upright, ultimately stopping for a while, thinking of a way to make it work. A little later, I made an enormous ball of hair on top of my head as I had plenty to do so, placing all of it within the hat, filling the emptiness, and managing to hold it steady. Suddenly two hands grabbed my shoulders, spooking me and causing my heart to beat faster than usual. My body jumped a bit as a reaction, causing a little whine to escape between my small lips. Where do you think you're going, little miss? With teary eyes and a scared face, I replied in a soft tone while looking around. Tea to fish. Once my mother realized my frightened expression, her mature hand approached my cheek in order to pat it. Are you okay, dear? Did I scare you? Feeling a little calmer, I nodded in agreement, as my mind understood that there was nothing to worry about. Have you ever fished before? Mother questioned in what sounded a teasing tone, as she knew better. No, but I know what I need to do. Once Rosalind heard my cheerful reply, she remained confused, staring at me for a bit, and then resumed the questioning. You do? How so? Where could you possibly have gained such knowledge? I extended my hands in front of me with the palms upwards, as if holding on to something. Yes, mother. I've learned a bit from books. To that, she went into thought. Unsure, we have a few at home, but we don't have one about fishing, I believe. She tilted her head while placing the index finger under the chin, touching it with the tip, trying to reminisce about it. Maybe we do and I don't remember. Luke is the one who has the taste to read them. Interrupting her thoughts, I spoke cheerfully, 
Mum, I thought of a birthday present, I saw that whatever was bugging her disappeared as she focused the tenderness of her beautiful brown eyes on me, with a glint of what looked like excitement. And what would that be? We traded joyful smiles, as I couldn't hold back my happiness and words any longer, and Mum felt like she could finally get even with Dad, by giving me, their precious daughter, a present. I would like a farming hoe, a watering can, and seeds of all kinds, be they fruit, plants, or, who knows, even trees. With a more serious expression, she stared at me fiercely and dubiously at my words. Don't tell me you received a farming job since you said you just wanted to try fishing for fun. I waved my vertical index left hand finger to the sides, disagreeing with her while speaking loudly and energetically. No mother. To be fair, I haven't decided on one, nor have I figured anything about it. I saw her taking a deep breath, regaining her composure before speaking, as it felt like this subject in particular really mattered to her somehow. I don't understand why you would want to do those two things, then, they're pretty exhausting, just so you know, with such words, I lowered my head, making a sad expression, possibly making my mother feel troubled deep inside, I I can't, before I could say anything, she promptly responded, why you can dear, I just wanted to know why you wish to do it, that's all, with a more relieved expression, I regained the happiness and energy from moments ago. I want to earn as many achievements as I can, even if they take time and effort. She hit a right fist on her left open palm, finally understanding the motive behind it. Very well, just don't tell anyone you are trying to do that. Instead if anyone asks. Before my mother could continue, I interrupted her with a question. As something was amiss, why would I need to lie to others? I tilted my head innocently yet with a cautious mindset making her feel a mix of guilt and the strange need to justify herself. There's an organization that does achievement and title hunting because of their work. These workers are called adventurers by law. You can find such people in the guilds across the entire kingdom. However, they are not liked by the white robes, in other words, the priests who undergo the ordeals of the church. They just hate people like that since some achievements give disgrace and the very high ranking ones can measure our disgrace and fame. With a serious expression, she raised her hand to the air, lifting a single finger before continuing. Your father and I used to be adventurers for a few years, and we ended up killing some beasts and the monsters who wandered into the humans' territory. We consider such circumstances results necessary to clear quests that the guild posts. They have different grades based on the difficulty of the enemies. I smiled nervously, making her expression change into a kind of one. Quests. She started waving her hands as if using them to help with the clarification of my doubts. They are also called requests or missions from people who are in danger. A good example is peasants who get their fields attacked by hungry monsters. To prevent the worst, they ask adventurers to handle them with a radiant smile. Added to make sure she'd feel like explaining things in the future, too. Thank you, mother. That was easy to understand. I'm glad dear. She took a few steps towards the kitchen while talking as I followed her back. You don't know yet, but everyone usually has a class, and depending on it, they have benefits. I jumped a few times softly to catch up to mom as her long legs made the gap between us increase. Really? What's yours like? With a prideful smug. My mother turned around, replying happily while making a stance of sorts. I'm a swordsman, dear, and your father's a healer. As much as I wanted to congratulate both, I made a sort of awkward expression, throwing out my best words at her. Wow. That sounds amazing mum. I added with a hint of excitement at hearing about it, even though there wasn't much I knew about what the classes meant. My mother, realizing it, started laughing and then added more details. You see. A swordsman is one who wields a sword, the weapon we showed you. The mother heard a tiny inner sound from me, along with a slight nod, before resuming the explanation. You can think of it using certain skills with that blade to cut through, killing your enemies. I gulped down, becoming slightly nervous, doing my best to endure such words and their horrible meaning, nodding slightly in agreement. Sure, I understood from the recollection of the tales that in this world that much was normal and that at some point there may exist a need for me to get used to it. If you wish to become stronger, that'll be normal. To kill. A hint of sadness in her voice resounded in my ears. And before I could say anything, she took a step forward, hugging me. My face drowned between her big breasts, 
forcing the hat to fall on the floor, allowing my hair to roll. It stretched itself wherever it felt like all over my back, with a muffled tone, added, slightly suffocated from how close my mother's body was to me. I'll do what I can to reach your and dad's expectations, even if I have to kill. My words surprised Rosalind, who didn't expect to hear them. The inclination I slowly aimed for was to protect this new happiness that was offered to me by either the goddess or the system. These last years that passed were the happiest I had felt in my life. This included my old one, where I went through a lot of pain sufficient to damage my heart, causing traumas to be born. A profound wound from the time my stepmother and siblings bullied me. The solitude one felt through some years I couldn't possibly explain in words. Deep down, I understood from the stories I read that losing everything was possible, such were the words of John, the author, and strangely, they made my heart race. Rosalind knelt in front of me after pushing my body away from the embrace, yet her hands remained on my shoulders as she peered into my emeralds, reaching close to the same height as Mom was considerably taller. She then spoke with the most humble and kind tone possible pacifying my heart from many worries that dwelled within. No matter what this world brings you, my dear daughter, I and your father will never force you to do anything you don't want. I noticed her sorrowful smile, understanding that her words were heavy, and that she didn't have enough assurance to back them up. At any time, enemies living in the southern frontier could attempt to invade us. In the worst case, it could turn out that even I would need to defend myself, ending up killing a foe, even if by accident or worst case being murdered by one. With teary eyes and a broken smile, I nodded in agreement with a muffled sound from inside of me. A hand then caressed my left cheek and a different one, my hair. You truly have beautiful, vivid green eyes, dear. Another similar mutter left my lips, as I knew that for some reason or another, my parents would always lie to me regarding my eye color. It quite pained me, but I wasn't brave enough to contest it. Whenever I'd see myself in the mirror, clear icy blue eyes would show up on my reflection. My nature was that of a coward trying to become someone else. She picked the hat up, placing it on my head, finding it funny as it went all the way to my little nose. It seems like that hat might be too big for you, baby. We laughed cutely as two tears befell from my eyes, unable to hold them inside anymore. Don't worry mother, I lifted it, then made an enormous ball of hair before placing it on top again. My, oh my, this daughter of mine truly is smart. She smiled proudly, causing me to feel fulfilled and content inside. Unlike my former dad, who would despise and never find worth in me, little things like this helped my self-esteem improve gradually. I grabbed the hand that was on my cheek and started gaining some distance from my mother, pulling Rosalind along as I turned around to the exit. Dear, aren't you forgetting something? With an innocent expression, I faced her once more opening my mouth, then closing it, thinking for a bit, but not achieving the expected result. Ah, what did I miss? Rosalind, with a kind smile, used her free left hand to point at the rod in one of the corners of the living room, making me let go of her right one, to go grab it. Don't forget the boxes with worms. One should be enough. My agile legs took me there in no time. I grabbed everything necessary and then we went out after watching my mother placing a couple of things in the basket. Today sure is a great day to be outside. We traded glances and smiles while heading to the river. Once our feet landed near the river, my mother removed a piece of black cloth from the basket. Then she unfolded it many times, covering enough space for both of us to sit on it while placing the many things she brought in the free space. Then we took a seat on it for a while, avoiding our bottoms to get dirty. Iris regarding the status points that you should be able to spend, I felt nervous at her words, realizing I had used them already. I forgot to warn you earlier but don't use them in anything till we teach you what they're for. With a feeling of anxiety mixed with worry, I shouted, I may have already spent them. Surprise filled my mother's expression as expected, and with a similarly loud-pitched yell, she questioned me, what? It echoed in the plains and certainly, it also did in my eardrums, which rang loudly as an after-effect. What did you spend them on, Iris? I shrieked at the use of my name knowing that it was serious or that it normally was like that. I wanted more mana, so I spent everything in wisdom. My thumbs rubbed against one another, calming myself of the mistake I had done, even though back then, my mind was certain that had been the right choice. Oh, my.
you don't even know what class you're aiming for. Concerned, I abruptly questioned, is it that bad? Mother muttered for a while and then started explaining. Well, imagine you end up fighting something, without a balance of all status, which is interrupting her. Added, strength, vitality, agility, dexterity, intelligence, and wisdom. She nodded, then completed it for me. You're missing endurance, but that's the gist of it, notice. You have unlocked endurance in status. With a surprised expression, my mouth did a little mutter, happy to have learned all of them, without giving it further thought. My mother raised a finger in the air. Anyway, they contribute in different ways to our growth as human beings. So balancing them is what every human does, usually spending one to two points on each one. I tilted my head, believing that we all should go the way we'd like or perhaps feel right. As mom mentioned before, every class should give its own advantages. Everyone does. Why? Mother sighed, but she didn't look upset, making me think that possibly it wasn't the worst question ever. The only thing we get as we age is vitality, about one point per year, and we need a bit of everything in our daily lives. Reminiscing about my status, I added to the conversation what I knew, even if small. I noticed I had a lot of vitality from the get-go, but how would other statuses affect us? Of course baby, let's see. The blacksmith job for example needs the dexterity and strength to use his tool correctly, endurance to get less tired from working, agility to move his body properly, the intelligence to know what the class does, and the wisdom to properly use the knowledge he got. Rosalind gestured the different actions while aiming a finger, pointing at her own different body parts. She went as far as to mimic the smashing of a hammer as if she wielded an invisible one. That is really complicated. I shouted, a little overwhelmed, causing my mother to chuckle. It'll get easier with time. You are still young, so don't worry too much. You're right, I'll take my time to learn everything. I raised my fists in the air, showing my willingness. Good girl. Rosalind patted me as a reward while smiling happily. Another interesting aspect is that intelligence helps mage classes to earn that type of skills, magical ones. The excitement from her words resounded within me, causing my brain to crave more. Does that mean that someone who uses a sword would need something else? I tilted my head cutely as curiosity filled within me. My eyes sparked beautifully, resounding with the surrounding green grass and the tiny, still growing dandelions. Exactly baby, you're learning fast. Rosalind placed the hand at shoulder height, showing one finger, leaving the other four closed. It might sound confusing at first, but in this world, we're meant to gain skills by doing an infinite amount of things repeatedly, along with other methods such as self-discovery. I nodded heartily, which made my mother more willing to teach as they intended to do this lesson the following day, what else, and so a prolonged explanation went on, long enough for my mother to pull me to the cloth so we'd stay seated for a while, I and Luke will teach you the practical version tomorrow, but like the parameters we have, there are seven types that anyone can get, those who rely on strength, mainly the beasts, use their own type of martial arts, some of them are pretty tough, which means they have a lot of vitality and use ones related to the body, before continuing, my mother made a muscle form with her arms, making me laugh, if you see someone running for a long time without getting tired, they have a lot of endurance, which helps them get stamina skills to improve the reaction we have towards daily things or even combat, one would focus on agility, in other words, movement skills, my mother suddenly got up, encircling me a few times, and then hugging me from behind, finishing with a kiss on my cheek. The alchemist Vicent who you met has a lot of dexterity since it helps him get crafting ones, for people like your dad, they'd go for intelligence, for magical skills and wisdom, for support ones, since he is a healer, it means he can both attack and also assist others by regaining their health, that's interrupting me, who was in shock, she added, overwhelming, I know, but it doesn't matter too much, you'll get a bit of everything during your growth and the way you live will eventually become a result of it all. With her words, I felt some relief inside of me as my heart feared disappointing her, I then raised both arms, stretching them upwards as much as possible. Then we looked at each other and a smile appeared on her face as she understood that I, like any kid my age, wanted something more practical, therefore, she took the box with the worms along with the fishing rod closer to the river, holding my hand as we walked side by side. Twelve, 
Chapter 8 As soon as we reached the margin of the river, I stopped at a spot with two identical boulders in front of me, almost as tall as me. Hum. Why did you pick this spot, Iris? I grinned before explaining, feeling proud of this, and excited that she actually asked me. It looks like the perfect place to put my rod in the middle of these stones, giving me some stability, as well as allowing it to fish in my stead. From my response, Rosalind realized how ingenious I was. We were truly blessed with an amazing daughter. Ever since she started talking, her growth seems so fast-paced. I then woke my mother from the thought she was having is everything okay? Was it a bad idea, after all? She swayed my negativity away with a wave of her hand, almost like she was driving off something annoying. Not at all, dear. On the contrary, it's splendid. A joyful expression appeared on my face. I started helping my mother place the rod between the stones. Once we managed, Rosalind picked up the hook and intertwined it with a tight knot on the bamboo rod string. Afterward, she pulled the line closer to the water, wetting her feet on the margin letting out a moan from its coldness, scaring me in the process who believed she harmed her feet. Are you okay? Did you get hurt somewhere? She laughed at me, blushing awkwardly from her own reaction. It's just the cold water baby. She smiled kindly while toughening it up at the low temperature around her feet, calming my heart. Is it that cold? Like a curious cat, I jumped inside the river, allowing the legs to be submerged all the way to the knees, instantly regretting my decision feeling the chill, and letting out a little whine like a squished grape causing Rosalind to laugh at my childish behavior. Without waiting, I ran out of the water towards the dry section of the margin, allowing the sun to warm my legs for me. You're such a scared kitten. Upon hearing those words, I smiled faintly, realizing how sincere my mother was. I then looked at her, who seemed like she had more to say. Come a little closer. It is time for you to learn how to hook a worm. I gulped from that declaration and then took a few steps closer, staying on the opposite side of her. Each parallel to the identical large stones with the rod in the middle of them and us. Hold it from the top, carefully so you don't pierce it in the finger. I picked it up with two fingers, the thumb, and the index. I tightened the grip with my left hand for it to not slip while my mother opened the worm's container. Now choose the first sacrifice and pick it, then stab the maggot on the fishhook's sharp edge. Feeling incredulous, I looked at the interior of the box, noticing how many pink worms were squirming onto one another going in random directions. I could see one or two trying to climb out of it, and my mother would shake the recipient so they'd fall. This scene reminded me of those times when I had no way out of the old mansion trying to escape, but like a caged bird. There was never a breach for me to fly away. For ten years, since my birth, to be exact, I learned how to be cold as ice, for self-protection, but also to endure. I grew cautious and suspicious of those who called themselves part of my family, including the diverse servants. They would find distinct ways to bring harm to this young, noble lady. At some point I had reached my limit, allowing for books to be the only important thing in my world. That was, till I got reincarnated. Finding myself with loving parents who had actual expectations and amiable emotions towards me, their child. Not once had they yelled at me in a bad manner, much less mistreated me. Thanks to them, inside my heart, there was only gratitude and the will to reach out for their expectations to nurture this relationship, and to become the daughter of their dreams. I'll do it. With a mix of impassiveness, boldness, and a firm will, my right hand moved toward the box grabbing one of the rosy worms, lifting it from the container towards the fishing hook, and then with some carefulness, I attempted to pierce it, failing, after a few tries, as I fought my inner self, I finally impaled the maggot, causing a yellowish liquid mixed with a brown aspect to befall through the metal and a voice that accompanied me abruptly, system, you have received the achievement, animal slayer, notice, you have received one disgrace from defeating a worm, good job, Honey, now we can attempt the next step. My mother pointed towards the river two steps away from them, allowing me to let go of the hook she was holding, which made the string fall on the floor. Take a few steps to the side and watch how I do it. The future times it'll be you, so pay close attention to that. I consented with a gesture, and then Rosalind lifted the rod, waving it back then forth, allowing it to land a tad further from the margin. There just like your grandfather used to do. Rosalind shouted proudly of herself for the great throw while I clapped joyfully at my mother's dexterity. 
But at that, a question soon popped out to me, Grandfather, do I have one? She lowered her gaze and then, not feeling it to be proper, I rise connected and her rosy lips jigged. Ah. Not anymore. My dad and mother died from illness some time ago, an evil plague that even to these days consumes and haunts the lives of many. But he was a good fisherman. Oh. Before allowing myself to be saddened by it, still sheltered from having killed the worm, I added up. That throw was pretty amazing. Rosalind passed a finger on her nose with a cheeky expression, feeling flattered by me, cheering up too. It'll be the future you, my cute little daughter. I grinned eagerly. To reach that stage, I'll do my best to throw the hook like that one day. We traded smiles and then Rosalind went to sit in the black cloth behind the stones while I remained looking at the river, waiting for something to happen. At the water that was now tranquil. I saw my reflection and innocently approached my face towards it, I bit my bottom lip softly, feeling a rage inside due to the persistence of my parents in lying about my eyes color. I didn't understand, as any lie was better than that one, and there was absolutely no need for them to do that, it aggravated my heart, but there was nothing I could do, as they always told me the same thing, they're green, iris, green like the grass of the plains outside. If you'd like, you can sit with me. If a fish bites, you'll notice the rod being pulled, mother's words soothed me, and so I walked nearby with soft steps, towards the blonde woman who gestured me to approach her. Reminiscing quietly for a while, we looked at each other, and then I broke the silence. Hi mum, what class should I get and how do I check them? If you focus on what you want, a screen should appear dear, and the one you choose will dictate your future even though you can change them if you end up not liking it. Though it's not advisable as you start from zero. Is that so? I gazed at my hands as if seeing my future resting on them. I need to be careful about my choice. As soon as I reached a decision in my mind, I concentrated my hardest, causing a screen to pop up in front of me. Class decided, current. List plus, a word called none appeared. What does that mean? Mother giggled, you sound like me when I was about your age. She allowed her head to fall slightly backward, causing her long hair to touch the black cloth. That's normal, don't worry, it basically means that for now, you don't own one. What do I do to change that? I tilted my head curiously, hoping to have one soon, like my parents, both for myself and also to reach their expectations. You'll have to get some achievements, and depending on them, you will eventually get to unlock some of them, I muttered softly. Having reached the wall, is that so? Rosalind remained silent with that question as she understood it wasn't directed at her. I would like to grow stronger, perhaps use magic, it's something that sounds nice. A curious hint eluded mother's eyes as she questioned me, how come, I'm pretty sure you haven't even tried magic, since it requires a lot of training. With a shocked expression, I responded abruptly, but I've used the two skills I have, quickly without giving me a chance to say anything, Rosalind shouted while she sat on her knees, grabbing my shoulders, what? How would you already have two skills? That's not possible, despite her astonishment, I was being sincere therefore for once I didn't back down, mainly from the frustration of being lied to, so I didn't want to deceive either, I have two though, one that allows me to check a screen with lots of information called status, and another that lets me read books named System Library. To that information, Rosalind opened her lips and then closed them, thinking for a while, remembering that I spoke a few times about acquiring knowledge through reading. My daughter shouldn't have more than the innate skill personal data which allows us to check minor information about ourselves. Yet not only does she have a different one, but she also has another that allows her to read books. I haven't even heard of either. Just how strange is that? Is it possible she could have leveled up? No, that couldn't possibly be. But, ugh. I noticed her sigh, lowering her gaze, and then she raised her chin, fixing her shoulder posture, which lowered momentarily, staring back at me with a severe expression. Be honest with me, please. What level are you? Unsure and to avoid giving the wrong information, I checked it, mumbling lowly. Status skill open. Notice, system consumed 2 mana. Status. Level, 1, experience, 0 100, it hasn't changed since yesterday, I'm still level 1 with 0 experience, I shrugged, unknowingly what level would have mattered in acquiring skills. What? 
Then how did you get that skill? I tried to remember its origin but to be fair, there had not been an actual source for it. To be honest, I'm not really sure, perhaps they were born with me? I looked at her with innocent A's, knowing that I had those skills for a long time. But that was it, not to forget that I only got to know them properly quite recently, towards my words. I could tell she had become extra confused. My parents figured I was something special when I knew how to read, write, and even do simple math. It was something unusual, only possible with the blessing of the goddess. But for me to have both a good brain and two skills was something out of the ordinary. There was no reason for a higher being to do that towards a random peasant like me, as she did not do to nobles either. In conclusion, she couldn't figure out why I was like this, without knowing what to say. My mother muttered lowly enough for me to not be able to hear, could it possibly be because of her green eyes? Suddenly, I got up and pointed toward the boulders, Mom, look, the rod. I moved as fast as I could, grabbing it with both hands as she followed me. Once we reached it, Rosalind stood close by but didn't touch the tool, leaving it for me so I could grasp the sense of using it. Now you'll need to pull and lift it upwards softly to tire the fish out. If a small one you can just raise the rod all the way. I nodded, feeling the excitement running through my veins, a sort of adrenaline unknown to the old me. I'll try to bring it higher, it doesn't feel too strong of a pull, so it should be tiny. I replied, slightly unsure, placing a foot on the right stone and using some strength against it while attempting to extract the fish from the water. Pull, pull, almost there. With the cheering and excitement from my mother who could see what was happening beyond the boulders as they were about my height, I enforced all my capabilities into removing the fish out of the water, which was doing its best, struggling to remain submerged as it didn't want to leave its home. Ah! Go up! I yelled, pulling the rod, gripping it tightly, all the way up, making it fully vertical while hearing a loud splash. We watched as the river creature floated towards us at a fast pace and, unaware of the consequences, the fish flew against me, hitting my face, wetting it, then squirming a few times till it suffocated without oxygen. Ah, I gasped softly as a voice resounded in my mind despite still being in shock from being slapped by a fish system. You have received the achievement, beginner fisherman, notice. You have received one disgrace from defeating a fish. I passed my arm over my face, removing the wetness as the fish had become immobile. Then I faced her, who saw everything and was laughing at the situation, finding it extremely humorous. To that, I smiled faintly and then shifted my gaze toward the fish in front of me. From a joyful to an icy stare, and a low tone, peculiar words came out that made my mother place a hand softly on the top of my head sliding it softly through the golden lines. Thank you for providing me with achievements. I'll make sure to put you to good use, Mr. Fish. A wide smile appeared on Rosalind's face, whose eyes shone with an expectation to teach me a new art. Does that mean that my daughter wishes to learn how to cook? I raised one of my hands in the air, cheering up at her magnificent proposal. Yes, I'd be extremely happy to learn more things. With a kind smile and similar tone. My mother added resolutely, very well, you shall make marvelous meals for us. With those words, I clenched my fist, unsure how hard it would be, but nevertheless, I sought to do my best. Sure, hopefully, I'll get achievements from that too. She helped me remove the fish from the hook, you certainly will, even though it'll take long till you actually complete any. I nodded in agreement, remembering how difficult it was to complete some of them. Yes. I noticed how big the requirements actually are, I then noticed her pointing northwest, that is so Iris, also I'll drop by the village to get your gift, be a good girl and wait for me to return, alright? With a casual nod and a big smile, I reassured her, of course, mother, I'll be careful. I placed the poor thing inside the empty basket, if you see any monster, you know what to do, right? She looked seriously at me, waiting for the usual answer, yes. I'll lock myself inside the house and wait for you to come back. A smile filled with satisfaction filled her expression as she moved away. 12. Chapter 9 A few hours went by and I took a seat on the cloth, feeling tired thanks to fishing for a while. Thus, I sighted upon the sunset as it turned the river's clear blue light into an orange, purplish color. The river looks pretty deep. If I was a normal kid of my age, there was a possibility I could drown in it. I looked at it, gauging how profound it was, 
falling into my own thoughts, I proved to my parents that they could trust me, otherwise, mother wouldn't have left me here on my own. Who knows if, at this pace, they'll allow me to have fun with the kids from the village. With a soft motion, my eyes gazed at the sky watching it move as I lay down. The progression in this world is surely slow. From what my mother told me, beasts and monsters are pretty strong as they don't go through a baby phase like us humans, and some can use skills from the moment of their birth. This meant that they would fight one another, gaining levels from early on. The territory south of my house led to a forest where such beasts and monsters existed beyond the border. I got some new achievements after fishing for a while, but I have the feeling they will take a long time to complete as well. My eyes focused on the function causing a screen to appear, which I observed curiously and carefully. Achievements. Animal Slayer 6 one hundredths. Kill a set of creatures. Reward 100 disgrace once complete. Begin a fisherman 3 one hundredths. Fish a lot of creatures. Reward 100 disgrace once complete. Species fished 2 one hundredths. Fish different types. Reward 1 dexterity once complete. Begin a preserver 3 one hundredths. Preserve many pieces of food. Reward 1 intelligence once complete. This will definitely take a while to complete everything. I shouted and then smiled happily without feeling the rush of it, as it meant I'd have a lot of things to do from here onwards. I had preserved the fish inside long leaves that helped against the dryness every time I caught one along with some salt that mother brought along in a small box inside the basket. Suddenly I felt surprised, after hearing a shout from afar, which made me get up and look behind, finding my mother carrying a couple of tools and bags with her. Once she got closer, I spoke joyfully. Welcome back, she smirked at me, a little red on her cheeks from the exercise and visible stains from sweat through her white shirt, it's good to be back daughter, did you miss me, of course I did, she grinned gladly, are you ready to see what I brought you, her arms extended to the sides towards the many things she placed on the ground, yes, please show me, Rosalind began explaining to me what they were, so, my dearest daughter, embrace yourself, the first thing I got you is a shovel. You'll be able to make holes with this and even transport, for example, a plant from one place to the other without damaging the roots. If you dig deep enough, that is, she grabbed it and made a minor example with some of the grass, creating a small hole in it, and lifting the whole thing to a nearby area. That looks amazing. I took a few steps towards my mother receiving the tool and then I started trying it on my own a couple of times to get the hang of it. System, you have received the achievement, begin a digger, the next one I got you is called a hoe, you can do multiple things like, my mother grabbed it and started exemplifying the different forms to use it, shape or clear the soil, remove weeds, and harvest root crops. I placed the shovel near the hole she made, and then my hand grabbed the hoe, mimicking her by lifting it in the air, then letting the tip hit the ground, this is quite heavy, she laughed before adding some teasing words with a cheeky expression. Feeling like giving up? Quickly. I stared at her and nodded to the sides disagreeing. Having their will within me preserved to do the impossible, or at the very least what was possible to the current me. Very well. In that case, I have a piece of advice. She pointed at the ground, making a square with her finger, carefully spreading the dirty ground as it penetrated the earth removing the outer layer of the grass as necessary, and the few colored stones in the way. You should make the field in this form, in preference close to the water, so you can use this watering can and fill it in the river whenever you need. Furthermore, make a long line so you know its size, and also how you want to split it between the different seeds I brought you. My mother touched the bags while resuming her words. After clapping them a few times to push the dust and dirt away from them, I divided the seeds in these, there is some variety to them and not a big quantity. The owner of the shop told me you can use the ones your crops will harbor in the future, in case you'd like to expand the field then. If not then he'd willingly buy the extras. My head tilted slightly to the side, remembering the job conversation. If I decide to become a farmer, is that it? That, or if you really enjoy doing this in the long term. Since once you start, it'll end up being an investment. Her eyes looked at me, almost like they were shiny mana coins. Sure. I looked around and then began making an enormous square on the area, after checking the quantity of the seeds and all the types with her, receiving some advice as we went. Once I finished plowing the zone within the marked space, 
I pass my arm on my forehead, wiping it off as much as possible. A while later, her finger poked my back two times, grasping for my attention. It's getting late. You should continue tomorrow. I nodded in consent, feeling tired from it all. You can leave the tools here. No one ever comes this far from the village, so they should be safe. She pointed at a spot near the boulders where I placed them. We live far from there, after all. We traded smiles while heading back home. Once inside, I took a shower while my mother prepared the dinner, salting the fish once more to preserve them longer. On the following day, I woke up very early, stretching up my body, and clacking some joints. The pain from my sore body made me realize that I had a gruesome road ahead of me. I slept so well, I beamed happily in a relaxed mood before changing into easy-to-move clothes and going towards the kitchen. After looking for some time, I found a small box with butter inside, spreading it through two pieces of bread with a knife, gobbling them while alternating with some water from a clay jar that I poured into a wooden mug. My parents would often leave some water saved from the river that would normally last up to two three days. Its scent would often let us know if it was time to change it. Mom would usually work during the morning and then change places with Dad, leaving part of the afternoon and the night to take care of me. Dividing the time this way allowed my little self to never feel lonely, even if that sacrificed a part of their relationship. For the progenitors, however, was something they felt worthwhile doing. Having told me a few times about it, to what I appreciated deeply, having especially considered my tarnished past. Even then, I had told them that I could stay on my own if necessary, but due to the surrounding dangers, they quickly dismissed my words. A few hours later, I noticed Luke approaching me with a bench in his hand, whereas I was currently outside the house whilst my body despite tired worked in the field. You seem to be making some progress. I smiled kindly at him to match his expression adding an energetic greeting. Good morning dad. I placed the hoe vertically while resting both arms on top of it. Good morning daughter, you already seem like a farmer. He pointed at my face and the pieces of dirt that remained on it. Slowly I washed it off, returning briefly and freshened up. Still, you sure woke up early, he smiled at me, feeling surprised as it wasn't habitual for me to leave our house during the dawn. I couldn't help myself. Embarrassed, I giggled childishly. I wanted to speed this up to make an amazing field to show you both. My cheeks turned red while withstanding high anticipation of my father's words. Without uttering a word, he took a few steps closer to the field and placed a bench not too far from it taking a seat on it. His gaze then befell the field and then returned to me before speaking with a kind smile and a glint of seriousness towards his slightly furrowed eyebrows. You've done a great job. Iris, but don't overexert yourself. You're still young. There is time to try all sorts of things. All right. Remembering the wise John's words about getting stronger, I made the best serious expression possible to match my father, which ended up looking silly, startling him momentarily. It looked to him like I was almost pouting, even though that was not the intention. Thanks to that, Luke wasn't able to hold back, therefore he started bursting into laughter killing the entirety of our moods. This made me feel awkward, giving up on what I was attempting to do. Nonetheless, without the will to quit wholly on my stacked worries, I voiced out in a somewhat sad tone, is there a way to become strong enough to protect you too? From my question and the uncertainty of these words, and feelings, Luke sighed briefly and then inhaled deeply as he pondered deeply into it, contemplating their origin and purpose. After some time, he found a way to grasp their meaning. What do you want to protect us from that would require you to become powerful? To his surprise, my tone changed from a miserable one to a more convicted one, which gave strength and vocal power to my answer. Monsters. Beasts. Demons. In other words, humankind's enemies. I glared at him without ill intention to do as my hands clenched the wooden tip of the tool. There isn't much a single girl can manage against all those races. Even the strongest wizard in our Lumen Kingdom, or the most skilled martial artist, with a pause and a more stressed tone, he added, whilst his fingers intertwined with each other. Even the peerless sword master, famous for his great mastery, all of them would succumb in the face of an army. Because of the realization of his words, I looked low, feeling down, unable to compromise with what my father referred to. Young as I was, it depressed me that I couldn't achieve my dreams, but my eyes raised once more towards his, to which he interrupted me. 
you can still become relatively strong and help those in need, either as part of the guild as an adventurer, or who knows becoming part of a mercenary group, or even as a soldier by joining the army. As my mouth was about to open once more, his words continued, though I don't quite recommend them, as they're both dangerous and you could end up dead. A thought danced in his mind, a cautious and kind one it was. I hope she gives up on whatever's on her mind. I wouldn't want to see my daughter get hurt. After some time passed along with a summer breeze making the grass on the field move all in one direction, something within my stare changed, but even then, I don't want to remain weak. I could notice how dumbfounded he looked at my answer as his eyebrows raised, possibly thinking where my courage came from especially towards him. Since I started having a more coherent personality, from movement to conversation ability, it felt to Luke like I was always mindful towards him. At times, my poor dad dared even feel that I feared him. Facing a new side of his offspring, he couldn't help but be content on the inside, willing to go as far as possible to bring my wishes possible, as any dad would want to do if they could. Still, as the responsible and strict parent that he was, his words carried the severity and heavy weight of reality. I understand, Iris, however, that path is truly arduous and it will require a significant amount of hard work every day, and you might not even have the talent for it. Unease crawled inside of me, along with confusion. What do you mean? I tilted my head as half of his words were something I wanted to hear, but the latter part was just frustrating. Despite everyone being able to use mana and an element, not all of them have the mental capacity for it, and that includes the quality of the soul that we have since the beginning, from the very day we're born. Notice, you have unlocked soul in status. Realizing that something changed, I started wondering what it could be. What's that? He stared at me confused, scratching the back of his brown hair softly, reaching towards the back part of his neck, and in the front, it was long enough to reach his eyebrows. Usually, the length mother would leave the hair at, since she was done who cut it for us. A soul? Yes. I pointed at him as if aiming at that word in specific. He coughed once, before speaking. A usual sign of a great or simply long explanation. The research group at the Magical Institute believes it to be something that holds the information about who we are, usually entangled with our name, fame, and disgrace. These are three things distinguish its type, and also how powerful it is. But being honest with you, he smiled faintly at me, placing his chin on top of his hand as the elbow positioned itself against the top of his right leg. His lips then resumed the wording as both eyes blinked dubiously. It is but a belief. After all, there are many things that remain unexplained, things that only the goddess would have the answers for. With a worried tone, I began explaining a recent event unknown to my father. Disgrace sounds like a bad thing, and whenever a worm or a fish dies, I seem to get more of it. The church is affiliated with the goddess which spreads her religion. They worship Arya who states her love for animals and insects, as they are pure and devoid of ego. Those who adore that greater being, don't harm or eat them. Instead, they're two fruits who proportionate the same characteristics they could get from them. Notice, you have unlocked affiliation in status. But dad, why do humans hunt animals then? I looked at him innocently, like a little fluffy bunny. It is the taste dear. Those fruits have a horrible flavor that makes anyone want to throw up. Luke made a nauseous expression just remembering the taste of it, making me giggle childishly, finding it funny. I would like to finish the achievements I started, but is it a bad thing? I placed my index finger below the lip, pondering, causing my level of cuteness to spike. To what my further replied unaffected as we were in the middle of a serious topic. Just do what you wish. Neither I nor your mom worship the goddess, and even if we did, there's no priest without disgrace in the church. Sure, some of them have a lot less than an ordinary person, but it doesn't matter overall, and I don't really know what their uses might be. I stared at the ground, relieved, while exhaling some air, feeling calmer about it, especially since I didn't want someone important like a higher and famous being to be mad at me. I see, Dad's voice began causing our gazes to meet, and then I noticed him scratching his right cheek softly as if he was trying to compensate me with some advice while drilling some unease in his skin, almost as if he regretted hitting me with realism. If you want to become stronger, achievements should help a bit, even if they will take a very long time to finish. At those words, I felt joy swelling inside my heart, 
forcing me to burst with a high-pitched voice, a yell almost, I'll do my best to work hard on completing them. Certainly the more effort you put into them, the faster it'll be. Luke replied enthusiastically, making me attain a stronger will towards doing it all. What else should I do to become stronger? To that question, he made a grin, an unfamiliar one at that. Surprised momentarily, I stood quietly, waiting to see what would come out of him. After a prolonged wait, my body was all tensed up. Yet all he did was casually get up from the bench and stretch his arms upwards along with his back, which hurt due to lacking a place to rest it on. This created a soft sound of his joints snapping, causing my mouth to open slightly at how far louder it was compared to when I did it. Finally, after Luke returned to a more normal pose, his gaze fell on me as he declared boldly, you'll have to wait for your mother to return from work to find out. Feeling teased from the long wait, I opened my mouth to complain, closing it right after saying nothing, feeling upset on the inside. I then turned my back to him, who started laughing at me, understanding fully well what he had done. Ignoring him, I resumed working in the field having rested plentifully. 12. Chapter 10 Some time went by, allowing my mom to reach home finding us on the sofa, speaking to one another happily, noticing his wife, Luke let out a small shout calling for her while gesturing to come closer to us, upon shortening the distance, she raised her hand, waving it to the sides, very much like a hello, what have you two been up to, welcome back, we shouted in unison happily granting a smile to Rosalind's beautiful appearance. After that, I started speaking, unable to hold the excitement as my father promised to teach me a lot of things once my mother returned. I've been mostly handling the field today, still at the digging and plowing phase like dad called it, removing all the weeds and the grass out of the way. My mother's hand came for my hair, patting it softly as a compliment escaped her lips. Sounds like you've been working very hard, it makes me happy. I smiled happily rubbing my head on her hand, enjoying her gesture to its fullest as if I was a kitty. Yes, I've been doing my best. Suddenly, Luke got up and went to the kitchen without saying a word, returning swiftly. Rosalind, upon noticing what was in Luke's hand, let out a smile after muttering a few words. So that time has come. Exactly so. Today we shall test our beloved daughter's affinity for this world's various elements. Both of them looked at me who in turn remained silent confused with the new term but filled with curiosity to the brim nonetheless. I wanted to partake in whatever it was about, they chuckled, taken by my adorable face, and then started the ritual which had been passed down from the very beginning of the implementation of the system. Thus, they went to the kitchen and returned briefly, repeating this a few times as they brought glasses filled with water and positioned them on the wooden floor. First thing is for you to sit in the middle, as I did. They readjusted four cups of water in each cardinal point around me, making a circle of sorts. Rosalind then added a similar layer, creating an external circle around the first one, and once finished, my father added a third one. They explained to me that each one resembled an elemental tier, which started from basic to rare, and then to unique. The further from the center, the more distinct it turned out to be. The initial and secondary circle had both four glasses, leaving the last one with eight. Apparently, this meant that the world comprised possibly of 16 distinct elements. Since the number increased whenever a new discovery happened, as soon as everything was ready, Luke added some words with a soft and amiable tone. Neither of us expects this to go well on the first try, much less when you haven't trained in the control and knowledge of using mana, but it is something doable. I nodded happily, reassuring them it was all right. My father then took a lot of steps all the way to the furthest wall and exclaimed, so his voice crossed the entire room. First, you concentrate on expanding the surrounding mana wildly and then focus on keeping the flow going. The aura that it'll create will reach the different water cups, taking specific effects and depending on them, we'll know what affinity, one or more, you possibly have. Light blue mana started spreading through Luke's body as he made himself an example containing it within two centimeters of his skin, allowing a sort of barrier to become visible to me. My vivid green eyes started twinkling with interest but also with a pale yellow hue from the glow. After some seconds he got up and dispersed the aura, allowing the mana to return inside of his body, and then approached me. That will be the goal. Now close your eyes and concentrate on the darkness inside of you. Somewhere deep inside, you will find a stream, to that explanation, who felt vague for my mother, 
she added some words to guide me. You can even imagine the river we have nearby. Let its flow lead your way. Soon after I shut my vision, the familiar solitude and darkness embraced my mind, thanks to my past life. The time I spent alone concentrated on reading books and their multiple scenarios allowed me to grasp some control over their request. It didn't take long to imagine a blue light sprouting in the blackness. In fact, compared to my parents when they were younger, I was a tad faster in achieving it, surprising them a meager bit. Slowly, something inside appeared to sparkle gently. The sound of water running could echo in my mind as I created a small line. One. Two, then in total three small streams joined, creating a bigger one. On the outside of my conscience, the aura had manifested, flowing around, caressing the fresh cups that were filled almost to the top, with it connected to the four cups within the first circle. My mother smiled kindly, realizing I had the same affinity as her. The color became a vivid blue, pouring out more water than it was initially, even wetting the floor. Notice, you have unlocked an element in status system. You have received the title, Heritage. Seems like she inherited your element. They gazed at one another happily and then strangely, the water stopped flowing from the cup and instead, an icy chill started propagating in one of the cups from the second circle, surprising them greatly as neither possessed it. The surrounding area became colder causing them to feel nervous. System, you have received the title, Amalgam. T this is, Amalgam, the mutation into the ice element. My father shouted, unable to hold his excitement down. Having read about this title before in the book, once it made the entire cup solid after my parents' noises, I opened my eyes initially to see what the fuss was about. Upon noticing it, I smiled happily, proud that I did something as beautiful as that tiny ice. However, uncontrollably and enchanted I became, upon gazing closer onto its surface, leaning softly into it out of interest as if being pulled by it by fate, staring deeply into it. Slowly, I found my reflection in it, the miniature image in the clear eyes grew and, without a doubt, there they were, the strange light blue eyes coldly gazing back at me, as my emeralds matched the sapphires, an ominous menacing smirk was shown in it, followed by a brilliance that filled the cup in the third layer, the water inside it was devoured by darkness leaving nothing but emptiness going as far as to crack the glass. This caused my parents to fret in astonishment. Notice, your soul has reacted, you have unlocked soul bound in status, as the mana from my body dissipated from depletion for exhausting it on two distinct elements. I fainted, luckily being grabbed in time by my mother, who was close by, avoiding my body to fall on the cups. It was the only expensive set of twenty glassy cups they owned, a gift from a faraway friend. With a worried look, my father lifted me, carrying my body to the room along with Rosalind who followed him silently, worriedly. Once he placed me on the bed, the sheets followed through all the way to my chin. Luke then mana channeled a portion of his energy just in case. Notice, someone restored 69 mana. Everything's alright honey, I checked with my skill, she just exhausted her mana. With trembling hands, she whispered back softly in a thin voice. I'm glad. Her eyes then gazed at him and continued speaking, now in a clear, fearful, and still worried tone. That unique grey element. Was it truly the darkness one? He placed his hand on her shoulder, nodding. It is unexpected for her to receive that. It's not something she should have gotten. It makes no sense. The bloodline for that element perished long ago. Very rarely, the element mutates going up a tier. In this case, it was from water to ice, but I haven't heard of anyone receiving one outside their parents' lineage. With a sorrowful and disappointed expression, he looked at Rosalind. Yes, why couldn't it have been my light element? Luke punched his leg as he wanted to teach me how amazing it was to heal and support other people. If it was meant to be, then his own affinity should have been the one, but sadly, it was not. Noticing the sadness in Luke's eyes, his wife grabbed his harmed hand, caressing it softly whispering, what's not normal is on top of that, is that she received an extra one without losing the ice, the frozen glass didn't stop as the darkness happened, allowing my parents to know I gained both, unlike what happened with the waters of Inity, a rare blonde hair like mine, green eyes that only the saintess owns, and two of Inity's, one being hated by the church, she chuckled at the irony, relieving the heavy mood even if by a tiny bit, 
we'll keep it a secret to protect our child. With sweat falling from his forehead, Luke resumed his words. I'll train her the best I can in mana control, slowly to not make her tired of it, and when she has a good enough base, I'll try to teach the ice element the best I can. She stared at him with resolute eyes, knowing that I was more important to her than the church and the consequences such an organization could bring if my element became known. I understand, honey, I'll teach her everything I know about swordsmanship and prepare her physique, so it grows stronger. They approached their foreheads onto another one, closing the space between them, feeling the warmth of each other for a while. After a few minutes passed, they regained their composure letting out a long sigh, exasperating everything bad away. We got this Rosa. Yes, we'll be fine. They left the room while holding each other hands tightly, leaving me to rest. Upon closing the door of my room softly, they gave each other a firm hug and then began saving the used water containers in the kitchen. I'll leave this frozen cup to you. The wife extended it to the husband, who grabbed it and replied straight away. All right. His light element started warming the recipient, making the ice melt back to liquid. Not as effective compared to owning the fire affinity, but nonetheless, for something simple as this, it was plentiful. Sometimes I wouldn't mind having lots of affinities like our daughter. I barely use my water one. You became a swordsman because you didn't like to use it, but it is a good element to play in the river, and also if you ever feel thirsty, it is its uses surely, but from all the elements, it felt like one of the weakest. She complained due to handling it during her learning experience with the sword in the past, against other students who had better ones. I suppose the goddess didn't create all of them to be used in combat or you didn't find a useful way to apply them. They exchanged glances, and Luke quickly noticed the angry expression on his wife. The man then smiled nervously, adding other words to repair what he said, regretting it instantly. Well, you know, I'm sure you did what you could. With a humph sound, she took the leftover cup from his hand and left him in the living room. Luke smiled awkwardly at the situation he got himself into, and then followed through by entering the kitchen, embracing her from behind, and apologizing. Two hours passed, and the father went to the village to work. A bit later, my mother seated next to my bed on a chair she took from the kitchen, muttering and watching over me. To think Karis would be this blessed. She started patting my hair tenderly and being so smart for her age, I really couldn't ask for a better daughter, it almost sounds like a similar existence to the saintess, except if that was true, her element would have been the divine one, granted solely to those who have a direct contract with the goddess, like the heroes, my face remained towards the window with my back to her, I kept my eyes closed for a bit, listening to her continuous murmur, and then, out of curiosity, I dared opening my mouth, how strong is she? I turned my body around, facing her. Iris, how are you feeling? With a less pale face compared to when I fainted, my lips trembled promptly, still tired. I'm okay now. To that, she smiled kindly, warming up my heart, and showing how cared I was. I'm relieved to hear that, we were so worried about you. Embarrassed and without knowing what to reply to her, I added simple words of gratitude to convey my inner feelings. Thank you mum. It's good to feel taken care of. In a mix of surprise and happiness from the mature words, she opened her mouth and then closed it, opening it yet again after rethinking her words. The saintess is powerful, but not omnipotent. However, her existence is one of the reasons we humans haven't t perished from this world. I sighed at those words, realizing that not even a prestigious person like that was an ideal match for my ambitions. I told father earlier that my goal was to be strong enough to protect you too. But he said it's unlikely to reach that stage, since no matter how strong an individual is, they end up being nothing in front of an army. She placed her hand on my right cheek hesitantly. That's certainly true. But you have talent, so no matter what, don't give up on your dreams. I sighed once more feeling the caressing from her touch, smiling softly, and we decided to do our best to support you. After all, you are our precious daughter that we love so much. Tears ran down my eyes as I nodded at her, relieved from hearing such words, causing a beautiful smile filled with hope and happiness to surge, melting my mother, who went in awe. 11. Chapter 11 Year 5007 After the system, day 4 of the flowering season, through my room window, 
I could see the vast night skies filled with a tremendous amount of stars. Beautiful they were with their sparkles, whose shine aimed at our lowly selves. In its wide scope, it allowed me to look at any passing animal. After all, I could find nature on every side of our house. Such skies illuminated us with their celestial bodies along with the moon, who gleamed the most out of them all. At times, I noticed a shadow or a scarier silhouette, whereas my body would mingle deep within my bed, hiding under the sheets, but not before closing the black curtains in a rush. I would often hold my knees close to my chest while embracing them, becoming a little ball at the center of the bed. Yet, tonight, that wasn't the case. Today I had a fun day, as such. Excitement resided deep inside my heart, sheltering it of such peculiar details. There was a particular piece that I noticed from a certain conversation with my parents, a little fragment of information that had escaped me before, therefore, my mind focused on a certain cute, paltry word, job. Job decided, current. List plus, it truly does have a list to it, to think I didn't notice it before, without hesitation, as it was a common thing for me to do. My finger touched it, causing my eyes to focus on the beginning of the list, which to my surprise, it felt like it extended quite a lot. List, Baker, 05 Achievements Cleared. Chef, 05 Achievements Cleared. Fisher, 05 Achievements Cleared. Farmer, 05 Achievements Cleared. Rancher, 05 Achievements Cleared. Lumberjack, 05 Achievements Cleared. Hunter, 05 Achievements Cleared. Explorer, 05 Achievements Cleared. Miner. 05 Achievements Cleared Blacksmith, 05 Achievements Cleared Herbalist, 05 Achievements Cleared Alchemist, 05 Achievements Cleared Merchant, 05 Achievements Cleared Maid, 05 Achievements Cleared Butler, 05 Achievements Cleared Artist, 05 Achievements Cleared Performer, 05 Achievements Cleared Clerk 05 Achievements Cleared Scholar, 05 Achievements Cleared Researcher, 05 Achievements Cleared Secretary, 05 Achievements Cleared Librarian, 05 Achievements Cleared Cleric, 05 Achievements Cleared Page, 05 Achievements Cleared I was speechless as anyone would have been in my place, focused on the yellowish screen while passing my finger scrolling through the list. I read it one by one as I checked the multitude of jobs that the screen showed. To think there would be this many, I gulped, believing that an equal, if not a bigger amount of classes in a similar window like this one, would be in wait, without knowing what some of them were. Hastily, I tried to touch the first one hoping for my mother's words to come true. System, rancher is someone who owns an adequate amount of land to raise animals and works toward their needs along with a skill set that'll make such tasks better. Taking care of animals sounds like a lot of fun. I giggled as there was this one memory about me attempting to take a little chick home, due to how cute it was, and the little sounds it made while I patted its golden feathers softly. From what Dad told me, the hard ones like Scholar referred to those who studied to a certain degree. Such figures were later appointed towards diverse jobs like advisors or teachers of high-born, whilst researchers were those who sought to keep learning and mastering a specific subject. After touching a few more, my knowledge soon broadened towards the diverse jobs. Artist for one indicated various variations, such as sculpting different animals, to sing, dance and perform, out of all of them. It was the one that felt the most versatile and light-hearted. To my amazement, a cleric was the initiation of one who wished to become part of the white robes, also known as those who worked for the church where the religion of the goddess Arya belonged to. Deeply rooted in its core, the system even went as far as to indicate her heavenly name and title while I checked it. Page, on the other hand, was the start-up job towards those who aspired to partake in the military eventually reaching a knight or something with a greater status. If there was anything interesting in this world, it was that jobs evolved depending on the extra achievements that were cleared and on specific conditions related to them. This meant that a cleric could potentially raise to become a priest upon graduating his training. This included the ability to diverse services that the church acknowledged them as necessary. 
the system worked its way through, in order to adapt itself to the different races, and contained enough elasticity to accommodate the times and changes that happened throughout the world. Thus, it was common to realize that in the past, religion began with those who followed and one or two that led. Through the years, new cargoes and ranks appeared to fit new needs, and to establish the hierarchy within the religious power who grew infinitely thanks to the existence of not only the goddess but the saintess. Parents said jobs have a one-year cool-down before I can pick another one. The same doesn't happen to classes. Upon changing, I'd lose every skill I got from it. My dad told me that, since classes diverse a lot from one to another, there was no issue towards changing them. However jobs, the knowledge of doing something for a long time remained, even if the abilities from it vanished. After all, someone who was a merchant for five or ten years would still know how to trade and could use their vast knowledge and experience to continue such an occupation. Which one should I aim for? My finger waved up and down as the possibilities were countless, and by all means could draw a line towards my future. I wish above all to become strong enough to protect my parents, so there should exist something that would make that easier. I muttered for a while as many thoughts roamed my mind, and uncertainty reached its climax. I grew tired of the window, feeling like I wouldn't be able to get to a consensus right away. Not that it mattered too much as I didn't have any unlocked and it only needed to unlock five achievements or even to complete specific ones to get it. Mother told me that each job had tons of them. In other words, once I chose one, there'd be a long list of things to work for. Yes, it would last a lifetime. The screen disappeared as I thought about it and then remembered the other thing I wanted to have a look at. An ordeal that had lasted through the entire day, as I concentrated on another peculiar word, eventually touching the list option once more. My eyes gazed upon the new information while my heart remained full of curiosity, even going as far as to beat faster from anticipation and excitement. Class decided, current, list, basic grade, swordsman, 01 achievements cleared, piercer, 01 achievements cleared, crusher, 01 achievements cleared, fighter, 01 achievements cleared, enchanter, 01 achievements cleared. Apostle, 01 achievements cleared. Conductor, 01 achievements cleared. Archer, 01 achievements cleared. Natra, 01 achievements cleared. Oh, look, my finger pointed at it excitedly, noticing something amusing while opening my mouth and eyes wider in surprise. It's mother's class swordsman. I clapped happily while smiling brightly, realizing something important. It seems my mother didn't go beyond basic grade. Just how long did she remain as an adventurer? I tilted my head to the side while crossing my arms. Could it perhaps be hard to go beyond such a grade? Does that mean that dad's job is special? Knowing that I wouldn't get an answer without asking either of my parents, such a thought ended up in the corner of my mind. Already knowing what the first class was like, I touched the second one to get some information, as the name Piercer didn't amount to much. System. Piercer is a class for those who are keen to fight in mid-range and proficient with spears and lances. With a bit of confusion, my finger touched swordsman, and then after reading the information it displayed, I came to a more fruitful comprehension of the matter. So there are more weapons than just swords. That's good to know. I didn't know what that class weapon looked like, but compared to the close-range sword, it sounded like they were either long or had in any way a method to fight from a more lengthy position. At such a conclusion, I nodded, smirking rather satisfied. It seemed my thought process was plausible, even though I was planning to speak to my parents about them to make sure I wasn't wrong. However, that changed when my finger touched fighter class, and to my great surprise, enough to open my mouth wide, I realized the range was very close, and the weapon, as ludicrous as it was, was merely our hands, in other words, our fists. Wouldn't our hands simply get cut by a sword? Mercilessly as my own question was, it contained some sense in it, proving to the fact that it could very well be an arduous class to aim for, if not the hardest, as I was now, and thanks to my imagination and prior knowledge, from the fabled books of my past life, including the small talks about war and the system of this world with my parents, without a doubt, I wouldn't want to be close to a monster, much less use my own hands. My head swayed to the sides, agreeing with my heart that pulsated faster from such a tense scenario. I'm definitely not going for this one, even if I unlock it. Feeling my body hot, 
I wave my left hand, which sent some air towards my cheek, refreshing it slightly, as an itchiness began spreading at the top of my head. All right, need to be positive. I'm sure there are better classes than this. Once more, with some expectation, my eyes read the next one, and a finger followed right through. System, Enchanter is a class for those who are keen to fight mainly from long range and proficient with magical tools such as staff, orb, and even barehanded. If there was anyone close to me, they would have instantly noticed the smug on my face, along with two shining emeralds. It wasn't hard to understand how much I wanted to be able to use magic. It had been the thing I was most interested in my past life from the few books I read. From a great magician causing the fields to be watered by sudden rain, to one causing waves to drown his enemies, for better or worse, the books, despite looking ancient, they contained all sorts of fantastic stories. It was great how they were often loaded with unthinkable feats. That's how excited I felt about reading them back then, in a way, not believing in anything that was written in it but at the same time, a part of me hoping that they were true, and that I could be someone capable of it all in vain, as I never once used magic in my past life, without despairing and pushing such negativity away, I could tell that in this world, at least, learning magic was possible, and to that, I was one achievement away, one step further from obtaining one of my dreams. Is there a way to check what I need to unlock this class? I attempted to touch the achievement section but much to my demise, there was only a repetition of the class itself. I sighed, disappointed, seemingly that it wouldn't be as easy as I wanted it to be, and that was all right. Like my parents told me, I was young. With age, it would surely come as a possibility. They even told me I was going to be taught diverse things, one of them being magic, matter of time, be patient. Iris, I attempted to convince myself with a mutter, to bring relief to my heart that hurt from not being able to do what it wanted, eventually conceding to my own self and grabbing the chance to check the leftover classes, as there could be something else that I could like more. After a while of checking everything it felt quite interesting how Apostle was also a class that used magic. If there was something different from Enchant, was the weapons it used such as a wand, totems, spell books, barehanded and the addition of being able to support others. Dad said his class was Hila, a rare one. Does it possibly come from Apostle? Similarly to Jobs, classes were able to evolve. Having different grades were A plus to their rarity, and it directly influenced the things they could do, such as having extra skills. Reminded of the Saintess and how abnormal yet in a way powerful she was, Dad who compared himself to her the other day, told me the woman couldn't possibly win a war on her own. To be fair, none could, but at least, healing and support people was fantastic. To go through the same path, as my dad and her, it didn't feel unworthy of me. In fact, it was something I would strive for, if it wasn't for the fact my element didn't fit, and he made sure to warn me about it. The ice element, I wonder what class could use it the best. My quest of research continued and conductor which came after, brought me once again a diversified option. This one entitled on the usage of musical instruments to support those around you. To be fair, it sounded similar to Apostle with the main difference being the tools. Followed by the past principle, and also because I knew such tools were a lot more expensive than weapons, and my element was likely to be improper, my attention moved along to the following one, akin to the last classes. It also provided with a great range, and the usage of weapons called shortbow, longbow, crossbow, and arrows. This one doesn't sound bad, but it didn't mention anything about magic. As childish as I was, there was this goal in front of me that I just couldn't get rid of. To play with magic, it was the toy that appealed to me the most, and anything that didn't belong to it left within me an empty hole. The last one I checked was Natra. At first, I thought it was this amazing magical class related to nature, most people would have conceivably thought the same as me, seeing as the word was so similar. I even smiled faintly when I read it and thought I had it all figured out. However, its purpose was neither to fight nor to support, like all the others referred. Instead, this one mentioned utility and exploring, the weapons for it were any, meaning that it clearly lacked a crucial aspect to master, or simply of combat. At that, I sighed, and for a while my eyes remained still on the enchanter option, without a doubt, that had been the one that moved this young lady's heart the most, 
that fascinated me with the greatest intent. Before returning inside my sheets once more, I gazed outside one last time at the stars, having at the very least the starting class figured out. 10. Chapter 12 Year 5007 After the system, day 10 of the flowering season, a vast field of fresh grass laid before my emerald eyes, devoid of animals and people, but filled with insects who lived in it. I easily noticed a couple of small flowers here and there, snow in summer was their name, something my mother taught me, its appearance was that of white petals with a little sun in the center. Further on, a vast amount of tall trees lived to the far northern edge, whereas a forest extended all the way to the east side of Astia village and also to all the eastern way till it reached the mountains, a river passed in between the green and the grey, hiding its spring, your field is turning into a cute square shape. Once I heard a sudden voice, I turned around with a dubious expression while facing its source, my mum, you really think so? My eyes stole a glimpse of her plain white dress, which fitted her perfectly. She smiled gleefully at me while complimenting my actions. Of course, making a line between the diverse seeds was an ingenious idea, like that they should have enough space to grow large, especially for the big ones. Laughter escaped my lips and then I couldn't help myself but confess the origin of it. Father was the one who thought about it. Her arms crossed while she spoke in a lower tone as if thinking at the same time the words came out. Your dad reads a lot. The two of you are similar in that aspect. Yes, now I just need to put them in. I smiled faintly, placing a seed in each hole as the field was finally ready. As my hands managed the task, a voice resounded in my mind, which I choose to ignore. Having done so multiple times during the days that passed. System, you have received the achievement, beginner seeder. I really wish the system would stop sending messages to my mind. Angrily, I shouted, surprising my mother, who seemed stupefied about my behavior. That was a new side of me to her, one I didn't share so easily. You can ask the messages to be turned off, you'll still receive the things from it. Thanks to her advice, any hint of anger disappeared instantly. What? Really? My mother nodded at me while keeping a mature, charming expression and then I focused on turning the messages off in my mind, causing a sound like a click to occur. I think I did it, I'm not completely sure. She aimed a finger at the watering can. Once you water the fields, you'll know. I sighed before letting go of my next words. With these many achievements, it makes me wonder how humans don't get powerful enough to beat their enemies, that would be due to many reasons, especially since they take long to complete, are repetitive, barely give much. The enemies can also do it. And so on. Her mouth mumbled a bit more inwardly. I noticed the discontent in my mother's words as I related to her. Despite having barely started, that sounds tough. Yes, and our enemies can use a class since they are born, get more statuses than us per year of life, and are constantly at war. With a curious expression, I questioned. And? We're not? Well, she gazed southwest turning her body towards that direction as I remained facing north, sowing the field, thanks to the saintess's existence, low-level monsters stay away, and every year she makes a ceremony that spreads her divine powers in the frontiers, cleansing and protecting the land. My head turned around to face her with a big gleamy face. She sounds amazing. The cheerfulness of my voice made Rosalind match my direction as she pointed above with her right-handed index finger. That woman truly is. Thanks to her, and the goddess, we're able to be at peace. At least till war breaks through, then there's nothing the saintess can do about it. I knew the person was amazing. In fact, it was one of the conversation topics I had with my dad, but he also mentioned they didn't particularly aim towards their religion. However, when I questioned the reason why, he didn't seem willing to answer, possibly because of the friends he had. Without having much knowledge of the kingdom itself, and in order to get some, I attempted a question, is she the queen of this kingdom? No, but she's a unique, important being. Rosalind went silent for a while, as if gauging the diverse powers between the two. I'd say equally, if not more important than the royal family, simply because she's irreplaceable. I nodded and then stared south, aiming my finger toward the place where the enemies of humanity lived in. The reason I don't see many monsters, Despite us living so close to the southwest border, is it because of the ceremony? Without knowing what I could ask and what not, my mind attempted to at the very least repeat some information, 
hoping to get more about it. Yes, it started in the first season. The flowering one. She smiled, showing one finger with her hand, and then changed to four. It lasts almost for the entire year, however, its effect reduces as time goes by. Rosalind deducted two while adding the latter part. In the last two, the decaying and moon seasons, things get pretty harsh for the soldiers, but especially for the adventurers of the guild. The second is the ones doing the most hunting to protect us. Some even die. I felt her tone filled with sadness, to which she whispered, One reason I didn't go far with it, without knowing what to say. I started closing the holes, having finished placing the seeds inside of them. Make sure you tap on top of it, it'll make the soil harder for birds who may attempt to steal them. With their revolting expression, I turned to my mother, surprised in a bad way. Really? I don't want my seeds to be stolen. Is there something we could do to avoid that? I gazed at her with an adorable yet worried expression. Ah, my mother tilted her head slightly to the side while pondering, finding a simple solution that I might like. Perhaps we could make a scarecrow? A scarecrow? What's that? I questioned, half curious half confused by her suggestion, remembering to have read something about it. Basically a doll made of straw and some clothing that you can place in the middle of the field. Since it looks like a human. The birds will think twice before approaching it. With a cheerful expression, I responded with an energetic tone. That sounds like fun. We should make one. She smiled and then nodded slightly. Once you finish watering everything, I'll try to get the necessary materials. Yay, all right. My body closed all the holes one by one cheerfully, looking forward to the aftermath. Some time went by and I looked at my mother with an innocent expression. Hey, mum. I noticed her eyes widen and sparkle every so slightly in anticipation, filled with interest. What is it? Is there a way to organize the achievements by type or something similar? What do you mean? Can you give me an example? She extended her palm in front of me, aiming at the sky as if I needed to put something on it. Sure. Something like all the fishing titles bearing together, and the same as the farming ones, like the way I organized my field by seed types. Rosalind closed her hand understanding my request. Oh, yes, of course, the system of this world does its best to adapt to the user. You just have to think of the way you want them to be, and request it mentally. With some effort, I heard some clicking sounds, then focused on the achievements word, making the screen appear to check if things were orderly the way I wanted them to be. Achievements. Completed. Plus, beginner reader 5 one hundredths, read a set of books, reward 1 wisdom once complete, beginner merchant 4 one hundredths, make a set of trades, reward 1 intelligence once complete, animal slayer 28 one hundredths, kill a set of creatures, reward 200 disgrace once complete, beginner fisherman 13 one hundredths, fish a lot of creatures, reward 100 disgrace once complete, species fished 5 one hundredths, Fish different types. Reward 1 dexterity and 100 disgrace once complete. Beginner preserver 13 one hundredths. Preserve many pieces of food. Reward 1 intelligence once complete. Beginner digger 10 one hundredths. Dig holes with a tool. Reward 1 endurance once complete. Beginner plower 10 one hundredths. Plower farming field with a hoe. Reward 1 endurance once complete. Beginner cedar 10 one hundredths. Place seeds in their respective holes. Reward one fame once complete. Beginner waterer 10 one hundredths. Use watering can on hidden seeds. Reward one intelligence once complete. Swordsman 1 one hundredth. Practice hourly with a sword. Reward a class once complete. Mage 1 one hundredth. Practice hourly with mana. Reward a class once complete. My eyes scan through everything while looking at all the differences, checking my progress in the various areas. In these past few days, I was told that aside from specific classes, a lot of them could be obtained by completing specific achievements. This looks so much better. I smiled happily, very satisfied with the changes. Hey, mum, what happens when I complete swordsman and mage? Rosalind raised her right eyebrow before speaking. As I told you before, you will get them as a class. Ah, with an awkward expression. I rephrased it to coincide with my intention. I meant I don't want to choose from one. After all, you and dad are both teaching me. While Rosalind pondered on my words, I continued speaking. If I could help it, I'd like a class where I could use both things, but more towards magic since dad said I have a bit of a talent for it. I heard my mother mumbling indecisive and unsure. To be honest, 
I'm not really sure, but as long as you work hard, you might even get a class that no one has gotten before. A unique one. My head tilted to the side, as I didn't know this piece of information which didn't feel real. Is that possible? I noticed the quick change of emotions in my mother's expression, as in this one. She was completely certain. Of course, only the goddess knows the secrets of every possibility of the system, not to forget that there was once a human who became a hero. Rosalind shouted excitedly, remembering the tale that her parents told as a bedtime story. Once the enthusiasm died, she stared at me, since I didn't seem happy about it. What's wrong, dear? Rosalind approached me, placing a hand on the back of my head, patting the long hair all the way to the shoulders repeatedly, yet carefully. I don't know what a hero is. There hadn't been such a reference in my past world. The most famous titles were of the Grand Magus who made rain fall through an entire kingdom for a single minute, and of a certain man who sealed a monster into a box. There had even been a brilliant commander whose horse could fly, allowing her to command an army from the air. I figured those books to be completely fake, simple fables that people like me loved reading. You're right. My mother burst into laughter at her own incompetence, placing her left hand in front of her eyes while closing them briefly. As soon as she stopped, she removed it, shifting her gaze toward me, who remained puzzled. She then cleaned the tear that was eager to fall from the corner of her left eye. My bad dear, to summarize, a person entitled to that class, is someone who reached a portion of divinity. Someone capable of defeating powerful enemies, saving people, exceptional feats basically. I want to become a hero if it allows me to face an army on my own. Rosalind changed to a more serious expression before questioning the daughter, to protect us. Yes, who knows when a great number of enemies could charge at our home. I gripped my hands tightly on the tool. Well, that's not unreasonable, but even a hero is nowhere strong enough to fight against an army, perhaps out of a thousand foes. He'd defeat one, maybe two hundred soldiers. Her brown eyes looked above as my mother estimated a somewhat right value, based on the little knowledge she possessed on the subject. How big is an army mother? I questioned her, knowing the size of many of them in what came to fantasy stories. There was information about thousands of humans fighting one another as they carried different colored flags. But since the knowledge was from a different world, I needed to grasp the version in this one, and possibly reality. At the very least a hundred thousand, and that would be a small one. That's, my mouth became tongue-tied, as the number was just way too big for my head to process, making my mom giggle charmingly, it's okay Iris, after all, such affairs are for those who call themselves generals, war addicts, but also the ones who keep us safe with their tactics, I lowered my head, understanding that alone wasn't the way to go, pondering on her words, there is no class that can do the impossible, otherwise, everyone would get it, this was my realization, a simple one, that cornered me in the depths of despair, and the reality of powerlessness. I shrugged my shoulders, admitting defeat. Instead, I focused on what I could do, and that there was only one thing, getting more information and learn more about this world and the people that lived in it, if possible, even stretch a hand to help those in need. Who are they? Very high-ranking nobles, part of the most famous, prestigious families. A few of them passed down defensive tactics from generation to generation. I replied without thinking, as natural as possible because it felt like they were the ones along the same test to protect us. So they help us stay safe. Yes, if it wasn't for their knowledge and the same test, who knows what would be of us. We glanced at each other, trading smiles. Then I began a questionnaire. Can a peasant become a general? Because of the law, only nobles can. Then can a peasant rank up to one? Also, no because of the law. I made a displeased expression, feeling that path cut simply for not being born one, ending up going into deep thought while I finished watering the field. It would have been nice if I could put my knowledge into the few war books I read, however, they might not match and even be outdated. I sighed as the annoyance grew within me, if I somehow became a general, I would need to go far away, and I don't want to abandon my parents. I looked back at my mother who remained on a wooden bench observing the field. Yes, I definitely don't want to part with them. My legs took me closer to the river to refill the watering can. I need to find a way to be of help, to become useful. Once the container became full, I returned to the field. Upon arrival, my eyes glanced at her. If I join the guild, 
what benefits would it bring to us? With a bit of confusion, Rosalind thought about what I meant with the word us. On second thought, she took as it as if it meant family, smiling proudly with a content face towards me. Well, I and your father were once part of it, like a decade ago for a little while. To be fair, your dad more than me. I stopped watering and took a seat on the ground where some grass awaited, serving as a tiny cushion, hearing her out while my legs rested. It didn't take long for her to leave out a faint smile, realizing I got myself comfortable to listen, and then she proceeded. Depending on the age you join, you either work as a helper or as an adventurer. This allows kids to do a bunch of chores to earn money while they grow up to learn that profession. My eyes glittered as I became fond of those words and remained silent. Money sounded like the way to go. At 15 is when you're old enough to begin as a helper. Later on, after taking an exam, you may attempt to become a full-fledged adventurer. Independent of the results, everyone starts from rank F quests. The letter or in this case the grade will change as you accumulate points and so will the difficulty of the quests you may access. She noticed my interest in it, understanding that it was something I may want to do in the future. Towards this, the following words came with that expectation. Once you finish the training with the two of us, you may join the guild as a helper and earn your own commission there. You might even get tips if you do a good job. What are commissions and tips? I tilted my head softly causing a small part of my hair to be blown sideways by the wind, prompting my hand to readjust it above my ear. The first is the value that you always get from doing a quest, as they are called. The latter is like a bonus that the receptionists may or may not give to you. Sometimes clients themselves might give you a bonus too. I think I understand. I let out yawn before resuming my voice. Is there a reason you didn't go beyond the swordsman class? At those words, my mother looked down all the way to my feet and eventually lower to the grass. Let's just say that I wasn't talented enough, nor wished to live a life of countless killing to reach higher heights, as adventuring is mainly that. I gulped, waking up a bit more as the tiredness caused my body to relax, without knowing how to comfort her orally, as I wasn't sure of what talent she referred to. I got up and walked towards her, embracing her head in my arms while allowing my cheek to rest on top of it. 9. Chapter 13 Year 5007 After the system day 12 of the flowering season on the grass plain during the morning, are you ready for some more training in the ways of a magician? My father chuckled after mocking me, observing how I had a sleepy yet cute look splattered on my face. Why yes, briefly, after he continued with the bullying. Full of motivation, I see, he smiled opening a box next to him, and then he knelt on the grass. From within, he pulled out a small wooden cube, revived a bit from the curiosity about the different contents within the container, I spoke a little more cheered up. What's that for dad, to explain more of the mana training? From time to time, during the past days, we trained the way mana went in and out of my body. At those words, I made a boring look since it was a never-ending loop of monotonous energy flowing along with the necessary knowledge and control of it, to feel, to perceive, to imagine, were the three beginnings of every sentence, he would tell me, but that didn't come without other ones such as be patient, be calm, and be wise. This happened as he noticed changes in my emotions that provoked flaws whenever I used the clear blue wave. Yes, Dad, without further ado, Luke resumed yet another one of his long explanations that I so adored and loved to death. He would often repeat them to make sure I would never forget about them. Mana, as it is called by the wise from the capital and those who study it back in the magical institute led by the mightiest wizard, Ryan. It is like the flow of the river where you enjoy fishing. The better one controls it, the faster it will fall into your grasp. But today, I'll show you the next step, so you understand why this tough training is necessary for your growth as a future magician. With an interested and curious expression enormous eyes, and a wide mouth like I was about to consume the world, I questioned him hastily, shouting, are we doing magic? Yes, you could say that, but first a couple of rules about it, I did my best to contain a significant amount of excitement, along with a positive expression after nodding, from experiences, I knew that remaining silent in times like these would allow things to progress faster perking up, with mana being the normal thing and even considered the base of all beings, they considered calling it a tribute less magic on its own, you can't use it to damage things around, though, 
that information made me question him promptly, is it possible to become a mage just by possessing mana? People fight each other to reach their ideal. This allows the most talented to be considered magicians, leaving others in their dust. It is not just anyone that can reach that far, so no. I tilted my head, not understanding his reply, how so? Aren't we all the same? Humans. My father made a displeased expression, reminiscing about the past before continuing. Through his life experience, Luke had seen plenty of peasants dominated by highborn. He himself felt the need to ally with similar important people in order to not suffer the same treatment. Those who were powerless, low rank, and poor, went through abuse. It was one of the reasons to live in the outskirts of the kingdom far from the capital where nobility with such power lived. With a childish voice and concern, I questioned him, what's wrong, dad? Almost as if he woke up from a trance, he shrugged before replying, nothing is daughter. My head nodded in disbelief, not pursuing the matter, waiting solely for the answer my curiosity sought. People are born differently, even before they are part of a race. The quality of the soul, the size of it, already dictates their future partially and such does not change easily. Reminded about my status, I voiced out to him, interrupting his words and potential thoughts. Dad, I noticed my status screen had a sole choice in it, but when I tried to open it, there was nothing special inside. With a surprised expression, the father responded, What do you mean? We humans can't see that. With a nervous feeling growing inside of me, I faced him with shining eyes, but, in my skill, I see it along with other things. You mean that strange skill status you were born with shows the soul? In the past few days, the three of us spoke about the two skills I had, and they ended up allowing me to use them as long as I didn't allow my mana to reach zero. I got to learn then that it could hurt me, and that back then, that was the reason I fainted. Yes, I'd show you, but you two taught me no one can see each other's screen so. He regained his composure, calming down sullenly despite all the curiosity that grew within. I understand, tell me, what does it show exactly regarding the soul? Ah, status skill open. My father made a surprised expression as soon as he realized my mana appeared and then disappeared. I spent it to perform magic, which was one of the following steps he intended to show me at some point. Unlike the skill all humans are born with, name personal data, mine actually required some amount of energy to be given to the system. Possibly since mine showed more things than his, and it came with a voice that began with the word notice. However, unlike most active skills, he saw no magical circle, which intrigued him deep down. Notice, system consumed two mana. Status. Level, 1, experience, 0 100, health, 8 eighths, mana. 6769 strength 0 vitality 8 endurance 0 agility 0 dexterity 0 intelligence 0 wisdom 23 status points 0 class fame 800 disgrace 800 race human name iris 7 years old affiliation plus soul plus titles plus achievements plus skills plus Elements plus soul bound plus. Once I explained the status word by word to him till the soul aspect which caused his complexion to grow astonished, making mine turn confused in comparison. He then muttered my name, causing my gaze to focus intensively on him, who hugged me tightly out of nowhere, further causing my mind to become chaotic. What's wrong, Dad? You're scaring me. He let out a chuckle and then disconnected himself from me, gaining two heads of distance while he stared at me with a smile. Your soul quality is three times more than the minimum. He showed me that many fingers happily. What do you mean by that, Dad? His happiness persisted, as he was a tad satisfied with this discovery. Do you remember our conversation regarding talent? Yes? Not everyone was born with the same one, right? He shifted his hand to have only one finger aimed toward the sky. Exactly. Most people independent of their social standing have a low wisdom ratio with mana, like 1 to 1. In other words, while you have 6 to 9, they would have 23. As the last piece fitted inside my brain, I let out a surprised shout. Does that mean, I can learn magic? Yes, that's exactly what it means. And it also includes being able to get a magician type of class in the future. Not to forget you'll be able to use a few skills, though with a minor output as your talent is not the greatest, 
but already a bit higher than a lot of peasants, as soon as I was about to speak, he continued, changing his expression to a serious one, along with a severe and cold tone, you can even end up dying during a fight. Being able to use magic doesn't make one omnipotent, I gulped, understanding the risks and that once again, nothing is perfect in this world, nor convenient enough for humans to defeat everyone with one spell, exactly, and that's why whenever I have time to train you, we must do it with the best effort. Reminded about our last talk, I muttered something sad. If I do somehow surpass their strongest warrior, I'd still be no match against an army. I laughed while despairing gazing downwards, making a sorrowful expression that didn't go unnoticed by him. And you don't have to, dear, we're weak, but we're ten million humans, we won't go down without a fight. I gazed back at him half hoping and half confused. Wouldn't the enemies be a lot more than us? Only if all the races grouped together, which they don't. They too are enemies of one another. Thanks to that, we under the goddess area could persist till now. After I rubbed my chin for a while, thinking, I looked at him, who awaited me silently and patiently. If we're a kingdom of ten million, just how many beings are out there? We haven't explored too far thanks to the dangers, but the researchers believe we are at the very least, 10% of the entire world, can we even beat our enemies? My hands gripped against one another, feeling a tad nervous. To be honest with you, as a father, shouldn't be in a case like this. He made an awkward expression and added, we probably can't, why do you say that? I yelled, convicted with teary eyes, wanting to hold on to a trend of hope, which seemed to fade at every single moment that our conversation unfolded. If we were to beat them, my father patted my right cheek before resuming, wouldn't we have done so already? With tears almost falling, I shouted angrily, then, what's the point of training? I punched my knees with the lower part of my fist, it is for you to protect yourself and grow stronger, wasn't that the reason you wanted us to teach you? With a calmer voice after breathing deeply a few times, I corrected him, to protect the both of you. He picked up the wooden cube and then got up with a radiant smile. That's a great and beautiful goal, to become strong enough to keep your parents out of harm. I think you should focus solely on your dreams daughter, instead of worrying about what may or may not happen in the future, since in the end, that's what matters. I passed my white sleeve, wiping out the tears, I'll do what I can. Within me, I understood what he meant. Surely, it was not what I wanted to hear, but still. They were the words I needed to keep myself in check with reality. I smiled to push away the negative emotions, accepting the cold and harsh reality of his vast knowledge. I got to know then that I was just but another worm that crawled among millions of others. That's for the best. For now, back to some explanation regarding magic. He threw the cube into the air and created a pool of mana slightly above the ground. As the object fell on it, it trespassed falling on the grass. First rule of mana, since it is an energy, physical things will always go through it. I opened my mouth, surprised, as I hadn't tried to do this before. Second rule is, he projected his mana against my body, causing it to hit an invisible wall. This energy can only go through your body through a technique named mana channeling, and only those who have a magical class can learn it. Does that mean there are other ones? Yes. Melee and ranged classes. Each type, as we call it, has different elemental techniques that we can gain that suit those classifications. Is that what I'm going to learn? You will learn the bases for the ones I know. That way, once you gain a class, it'll be much easier to receive them. I understand. What other tricks are there? A different yet useful one would be an elemental barrier. Quickly, he made a defensive posture placing his palm in front of him. A blue mana circle appeared beneath him as a small amount of energy flowed from his body to the front of his palm. That was when I noticed a yellow elemental circle appearing in front of his fingers. It looked like a golden wall. This is one of them. You can try to punch it if you would like. I threw a blow with half of my strength, feeling the impact nullified as soon as it reached it to mounting to nothing but a fuzzy and warm sensation on my skin. Also using mana against it will only make the barrier become stronger since elements are naturally superior, so, against monsters who don't excel in magic, it could save your life. This does not mean that we absorb the enemy mana to ourselves, as that's not possible, it solely stays inside the skill we used. I understand. I responded simply, feeling the urge to learn all the different techniques, knowing that at some point they could be of use. Furthermore, 
I was very interested in discovering magic since my past life books had very interesting stories related to it, small whirlwinds to turn windmills for the production of bread, fireballs the size of buildings spreading destruction to everything around. I, who never got to gain it myself, spent my lifetime imagining using powers beyond reason and logic. At last, now I had a chance to take the first step toward it. Thank you for joining Patri another Discord. 10. Chapter 14. Hey Dad, using mana doesn't seem like a hard thing, but you also referred to elemental magic. What would the differences between the two ultimately be? He made a big smile at the great question, responding promptly, without a shred of hesitation. For starters, extending the mana from your body towards an object or outside your body doesn't require casting time. All it takes is the speed of it flowing to such places. A good usage would be to delay the impact of. For example, a fireball could be great since you might not have enough time to protect yourself with ice as it would require conversion, but you'd still need to run for your life as the fire would slowly absorb the mana. My head nodded after absorbing all the information, and elemental one, that one, you need to convert your mana to the element of your choice, aim the skill, and invoke it by its name, or mentally, but that's a lot harder. After checking the confused expression on my face, he began a practical example. First, I felt energy consistently gathering in his palm, from a light blue mana circle on his feet. Second, a golden elemental circle appeared in front of his hand, causing the surroundings to be gradually lightful and warmer. This is my element, the unique graded light. With these two steps, I've successfully turned my core blue mana into my golden affinity. Similar to the elemental barrier, but more intense. That looks amazing, Dad and warm too. We traded smiles. And then he resumed his words. Look at my hand and do your best to keep track of what will happen next, Iris. All right. As my gaze shifted to where my father referred, a few words came from the man's lips after it condensed enough mana on the circle. Something my eyes noticed was that its size would increase the more energy condensed in it. In comparison, causing the blue circle under him to reduce in size. Ray of light. A brilliant laser expanded from his hand towards the rock. I looked at the yellow elemental aura increasing and then shortly after, it ceased. My feet approached the target curiously and shouted, surprised. Huh? Nothing happened? Upon hearing those words, Luke giggled, knowing beforehand the consequences of his skill. Yes, some skills are effective towards some elements and not so much against others. Thus, light is pretty bad against earth with a confused expression, and a doubt originating from being taught the three grades, basic, rare, and unique. I voiced out a question, but isn't it a worse element than yours? There is no such thing as good or bad, just some are rarer than others, each with their own weaknesses and strengths. I suppose it depends on how well we can use them then. Yes, that's right. In this world, control, mastery, and talent are everything, can't wait to get some elemental skills, too. It is too early for that, especially since you need to improve your mana control a lot, and then, when I feel like it's good enough, we'll try out a couple of things. The system restricts most skills, therefore no matter how much one may try, the chance of acquiring class skills is zero. The ones you could learn are ice-related ones. So we can learn how to use mana and elements since birth, but gain skills only when the system unlocks. Yes. The system without sounding like a heretic has a couple of flaws for our race. A baby wouldn't possibly learn how to mingle with the energy within it enough to convert it to its element. Without the ceremony we did to you, they wouldn't know the affinity or affinities they have. At the same time, even if we taught you from the age of five, you still wouldn't get an ice skill, as the system only unseals their usage when we're seven years old. My father sighed as I went into thought. It's a good thing he explains things properly, despite everything sounding a tad complicated. I looked at my hand craving for an ability, as much as I'd like to learn good skills, it sounds like it may take a while. He then interrupted my mind with a heads up, it's a good thing you've gained mana control skill. Worse comes to worst and you get a magical class, it'll help you a lot. Which one should I get? The system will show you some and you'll be able to select the one you like most. They are also graded the same way elements are, but once again, it really depends on how well you master it. My father scratched his chin, and then he looked pensively at the ground. What's wrong, Dad? 
There are some important things in what comes to classes, don't tell me grades in this one actually means something different. Unlike the rarity of the elements I laughed lightly upon joking around, hoping for things to not become more complicated, they actually do, and the difference of the grade, in this case, is the number of skill branches one can learn. Ah, trees, why would the skills have layers of wood in them? These words caused him to burst with laughter, finding my words to be silly and causing me to be confused. Once he regained his composure, Luke smiled and then shifted his gaze which had strayed away for a bit. You can consider skill branches as different paths, but it's basically a group of skills belonging to a certain class, and each class tier will give you access to one more. The hero one, for example, has a blessing from the goddess Arya. Those that have a touch from the superior being usually have something special to them, not necessarily an additional skill branch. How many skill sets would a magician and swordsman classes provide? I asked that, seeing as those were the closest ones that I was most likely to unlock. Since being a farmer is a job, it provides a single set of skills. As for the initial classes like the two you mentioned, they also give one, but they're combat-oriented. So they would only give me access to one set. Yes, the class I have is called Healer, a rare type. It contains two sets of skills, one towards offensive, which is very specific about what it affects, mostly useful against the dark type of monsters and the second is towards supporting those around me, helping others. I remembered one of my talks with Rosalind. Mother told me about the Saintess. What kind of class does she have? and what skills, my father looked at the sky, recollecting the day he met her, it had been one of the coldest of the moon season, a snowy one where they requested the saintess to be positioned closer to the front lines in the south, but in a safe camp in its rear, as a monster horde caused countless soldiers to become injured, Luke, as an adventurer, was also hired to help those people, mainly because of his class, while being close to her, he could feel the gigantic gap between the two of them. As one who wielded a special existence to the kingdom itself, the golden elemental aura of hers shone beautifully grasping everyone's attention around as its intensity created a pillar of similar toned light above the saintess's head, which then befell those around, healing them greatly. A skill that no matter how much hard work Luke would go through, he could never get, as his class was of a way weaker grade. Full of respect as a fellow healer, the young man looked at her back, at the long green wavy hair that extended close to the floor, of a similar tone Dr. Graham symbol centered on the back of her white robe. And, of course, her presence regained the hopes of humanity. A woman capable of meddling with the surrounding temperature, simply for being there. A vast amount of mana dwelt inside of her, impressive enough for it to become a natural warm light of her divine element. A unique graded one given only to the ones directly serving the goddess Arya upon a contract. Some even entitled it as a blessed element. She was the owner of a special class inherited by her mother, who was the past saintess. A ceremony executed from ancient times since the system implementation. It allowed these women to serve a certain purpose in keeping humanity safe but more than anything, to anticipate the enemy invasions through visions and celestial messages. My father then spoke calmly as soon as he shifted the gaze back to me, who remained quiet, eagerly, yet patient, she's called the Saintess, as that is her class, a woman capable of wonders and miracles, towards that person, no wound or curse can hope to resist being treated and cleansed, her skills, I honestly have no clue, my father laughed with a defeated expression as that was one of the greatest secrets of the church, as I was about to question him, he added with a serious expression, but her power, if it was an offensive class, I'd say strong enough to make a difference in the front lines, certainly more than any human could ever hope, after a long wait, and lots of thoughts, I pondered something peculiar, voicing it out loud, couldn't she just be on the front lines healing everyone so our enemies would lose to that? My father's expression darkened, and bitter words followed. Krause the Pope, would never allow the church key figure out of his sight. Isn't he a devotee of the goddess? If that helped humanity do what must be done, wouldn't that be much better? At these words, he shrugged, responding cautiously. If I were in his shoes, I wouldn't do it either. Imagine the saintess got assassinated since she's powerless in combat. Not only would we lose her blessings but also our connection to the goddess Arya. If that were to happen, I can't possibly imagine the consequences that could bring to the entire kingdom. To those words, 
I gulped while lowering my uneasy expression. It made me understand that perhaps what I thought to be a reasonable tactic was actually not that brilliant. Perhaps it was a good thing I wasn't interested in attempting to become part of the army. Silence reigned within us for a bit and then my father broke it with a more warmful tone. I'll be heading to work now. Another time I promise we'll try out some more interesting stuff, as we've gone astray with the conversation, alright? A bright smile appeared on his expression while he caressed my cheek, adjusting my face by raising it, which allowed both our gazes to match. A lively tone then followed through my lips creating a radiant smile. Sure dad, I'll be looking forward to that. The man got up, leaving the box on the ground, and then headed home with enormous steps, breathing heavily to not be late. Meanwhile, I remained behind, appreciating the sunny day. My eyes eventually caught the sight of the cubes inside the square container, grabbing a handful, and taking them with me closer to the river. As much as I love my parents, I'm not quite interested in getting a weak class. I muttered a few words, filled with hidden determination. I need something. Power. A way out. I gazed down upon my reflection in the clear river water, focusing on the cold blue eyes that didn't match my own, then pocketed the different wooden cubes, leaving but a single one in my left hand. I placed it on the ground and focused my mana in an attempt to flow it through the target while keeping it stable, as my father showed. After many unsuccessful attempts, I picked and squeezed it tightly feeling upset, followed by a scream containing my fury, directed at myself while falling on my knees. How am I supposed to do anything useful if I can't even do something basic like this? Controlling mana was one of the most basic steps that required undertaking months of training, not something a beginner, no matter how talented they were, would learn out of nowhere. Even more so for a child who had no experience in control. Are you just going to stand there and remain the useless doll you were? I complained to myself, remembering the deep trauma that despite having improved after living with loving parents for seven years, it remained entangled in my scarred heart, almost like a bracelet of thorns around it. Isn't this the new chance you sought after all that pain and despair? Despite my words, I felt defeated. My tears joined the river, allowing for soft splashing sounds on the trembling surface. Time passed, and I returned to my room. Picking a peculiar rolled book that appeared on my bed a few years ago without a title to address it. One with white pages where everything written in it disappeared completely after a while, and always when I closed it, I used it as a diary to hide my deepest thoughts and emotions, which I didn't dare share with my parents. Not that I distrusted them, as it was just a self-defense mechanism and healing procedure towards the past my heart went through. Every once in a while, I would write, sometimes a few words and at other times a couple of pages. Today I wrote about how powerless I felt and how much changing it was important to me. Once I closed it, the book shone mysteriously in tones of black like the cover itself, returning the pages blank. At first, I found this to be suspicious, but after using it over and over, and seeing as nothing bad ever happened, I ended up treasuring it as part of myself. After all, if there was something in both worlds that I treasured the most, it was no more and no less than books. 10. Chapter 15 Year 5007 After the system day 12 of the flowering season after lunch, two wooden short swords clapped as they went against one another, a sound that spreaded on the plains where I was trained by mum during the afternoon. Every word and action of my mother reflected a consequent reaction of my behavior. I'll strike your left leg next. The sword in her right hand skillfully aimed towards where she mentioned in slow motion delayed enough for me to be able to co-op. Every time I blocked it, my mother attracted the practice weapon, aiming elsewhere in a pretty unhurried motion. Left shoulder now. With a beautiful arc, the sword fell from above to what my hands did my best to block, placing the sword horizontally above my head, receiving the attack's full impact. Panting sounds from me spread around, along with sweat that dropped ceaselessly. I felt my body tired and heavy having to move it in ways that I was not prepared or used to. Like a snail, my skinny arms would do their best to follow through with my mother's commands despite the wooden short sword weight being enough to hinder my bidding. Walking, running, and from time to time, jumping, different actions that she would force me to do, as every situation in actual combat could require it. Last strike for today at the right arm. 
With a bit more strength and speed my mother attempted to push through my limits further than in our past sessions, causing me to not be able to follow, receiving the impact on my body. Not only did it leave me bruised but partially numb, making me let out a painful moan. Noticing the damage, Rosalyn let her sword fall and went closer to check on me. Notice, system consumed to health. Oh, baby, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? She started massaging my arm while curving herself to match my height, checking up on me, and waiting for my reply. It hurts when you touch it. I'm sorry. Something in me figured you'd be ready to parry that. But you must have been more tired than I estimated you would be. Despite my prior laments, in the morning, I spent a moderate amount of time practicing my mana control after failing before in the river. Thus, my mother, who wasn't aware of it, ended up misjudging the daily dose. It's okay, mother, we're training, after all, I made a strong-willed expression, gazing at her with a weak and faint smile, enduring the pain, for better or worse, getting used to pain is something necessary for adventuring, although I'm not deliberately going out of my way to cause you some, Rosalind giggled, making me smile happily, returning some color to my light-toned skin appearance, she then caressed my rosy cheeks as my face was a bit like a tomato. You can go rest or do anything you want. For today, the training session is over. Sure thing. I smiled beautifully before turning around, placing my hand on the spot where my arm hurt, and walking back home. With me out of sight, Rosalind muttered to herself, I compromised with your father to turn you into a stronger version of me. After all, for a child, you're quite ambitious. She smiled with a fierce expression, lacking the usual motherly love. Going as far as to say, you want to protect two past adventurers. She picked both wooden swords and started cutting the air at a far greater speed than before, making the weapons flow through the air as swiftly as possible as they shone in blue. For my dear daughter, I can't allow myself to rust till I pass the little I know. She smiled charmingly, resuming her workout for a tad longer. A period later, after a relaxing and lengthy bath, I jumped on the bed. My gaze shifted between the four white blaine walls around and what they protected. With a bored expression, my eyes glanced towards the window attracted by the mellow sunset, radiating gently in tones of a darker yellow, almost orange. With the horizontal line of red below it, the sky adorned all that with patterns of black-looking clouds. In my past life, such a view was far from graspable as the mansion fences and surrounding tall trees kept everything hidden, including the sun. To me, the natural appearance of nature made my heart fuzzy and warm, encompassing it with the feeling of freedom, as I no longer was a locked bird inside its steel cage. I gripped both hands tightly while taking a deep breath with my eyes closed, soon as all the air left me, leaving my inwards with a lighter sensation. Then my mouth voiced in a soft tone, shifting the gaze towards the usual screen. Notice, system consumed 2 mana, status, fame, 800, disgrace, 960. A while passed with me looking at the status, giving me the chance to study its changes, with the amount of disgrace increase, did my affiliation with the goddess possibly change? As I focused on that, a secondary screen appeared next to it, affiliation, goddess area, positive. I guess gaining disgrace truly doesn't matter. Might as well go all out and get that fishing achievement complete. I smiled brightly with less worry, stacking motivation for the following day. Then passed my left hand on the smaller screen, making it disappear, tapping the soul option afterward. Soul, soul quality, tier 3. Soul size? I was hoping the size to appear after speaking with my further about it, but sadly only the deer appears. He mentioned that the beings of Adana have small souls and that gods have gigantic ones. I giggled cutely as I thought of something amusing. I wonder what would happen if a human would get one like that. Be it as it may, I haven't seen a way to increase its size, so for now, there's not much I can do about it. Without having received any new title, my finger ignored it, hovering over achievements and falling on them. Achievements. Completed. Plus, beginner reader 5 one hundredths, read a set of books, reward 1 wisdom once complete, beginner merchant 4 one hundredths, make a set of trades, reward 1 intelligence once complete, animal slayer 45 one hundredths, kill a set of creatures, reward 100 disgrace once complete, beginner fisherman 21 one hundredths, 
fish a lot of creatures. Reward 100 disgrace once complete. Species fished 5 one hundreds. Fish different types. Reward 1 dexterity once complete. Beginner preserver 13 one hundredths. Preserve many pieces of food. Reward 1 intelligence once complete. Beginner digger 20 one hundredths. Dig holes with a tool. Reward 1 endurance once complete. Beginner plower 10 one hundredths. Plower farming field with a hoe. Reward 1 endurance once complete. Beginner seeder 20 one hundredths. Place seeds in their respective holes. Reward 1 fame once complete. Beginner waterer 20 one hundredths. Use watering can on hidden seeds. Reward 1 wisdom once complete. Swordsman 6 one hundredths. Practice hourly with a sword. Reward a class once complete. Mage 4 one hundredths. Practice hourly with mana. Reward a class once complete. Beginner sprinter 2 one hundredths. Run hourly. Reward 1 endurance once complete. Beginner jumper 1 one hundredth. Jump hourly. Reward 1 agility once complete. Beginner lifter 1 one hundredth. Elevate weight hourly. Reward 1 strength once complete. Beginner harmed 2 one hundredths. Lose a certain amount of health. Reward 1 vitality once complete. They're still very far from being complete, but it has become quite the progress. My expression turned vivid with a mix of pride. Jumping is especially hard, the good thing was that each minute accumulated to its progress even if not done in succession. From time to time, I would do it out of fun. I wonder if there are easier ways to do these so-called achievements. Without being able to do anything about it, I went for the skills, tapping on that section. Skills. Active skills, status, system library, passive skills, mana control one tenth, swordsmanship one tenth. Seems like I haven't leveled either skill further. I received both after some training with my parents. They taught me that the skills would go higher with a lot of effort and, upon being maxed, they may or may not evolve further. My dad mentioned that a special requirement or a demonstration for the system to analyze, meaning something exceptional, would be required, like a feat. They also explained that one of the two skills would get stuck by the system's laws, as they represent different classes. Nonetheless, it would still allow me to be a magician with swordsmanship knowledge or even the other way around. Ultimately, being taught both allowed my body to grow. Having distinct qualities in what came to skills and achievements might even trigger a different class to appear. There is no such thing as a rightful path toward this world, as different people will gain diverse results. As such, becoming good at many things with a continuous will to improve was idealistic for my dream. After I rested for a while, my mother called me, making me move swiftly toward the kitchen. I'm here, mum. Hey dear, how's your arm? Just a little bruised, but doesn't hurt much anymore. I'm glad to hear that. I called you to teach you how to cook some fish. With an excited tone, I responded eagerly. Is it the ones I caught? Yes. That way you could even get more achievements, since the more things you do the best are. Of course, I'd be happy to learn. Though it could be a tad grotesque and bloody. I used to do it when I was a tad older with my mother but I interrupted the words with some of my own. You're the one who said I needed to get used to these things if I wanted to get stronger. My eyes gazed confidently at her with an attempt at a serious expression, which made Rosalind smile proudly. Right? Of course, you're absolutely right. Wash your hands and we'll start right away. After they became clean and dry, my mother started the explanation. So first what you have to do is with this knife scrape the fish scales like this. She grazed the scales by pushing them from tail to head multiple times underwater on both sides. By submerging the fish, you avoid these little things flying dirtying everything. Rosalind turned it around and placed the knife next to the table. Understanding what she meant, I got closer and did my best to copy my mother's actions. Once I finished, she added, now, with the big knife, slice the head off. With a disgusted expression, I gazed at the fish while thinking to myself. You can do this, Iris, you can do this. I stabbed it down a few times, growing displeased every time it hit it, causing blood to dirty the balcony. This is truly disgusting. I complained solely in my mind to not offend my mum, who went out of her way to teach me. I took a deep breath while lifting my dagger, looking at the fish whose head and body began falling apart. Focus on this spot. She showed me where using her index finger to point it out then removed it before the knife fell with an unusually indifferent tone. She ordered me, cut it mercilessly. 
My hand went down and we heard a heavy impact on the fish. A little blood gouged out as I successfully cut the spine in half. Good job daughter. Now with this smaller knife, cut the side fins and the one under like this. Like before, my mum demonstrated by cutting one of them. The knife went very close to the fish's skin, then the fins were cut by the base as she stretched them out. Her hand then placed the knife next to it and looked at me. At that, I began doing what she did, carefully. Now do a cut under the belly to remove the guts and little organs the fish has from here to there. She made a line with her index finger through the little creature, from the bladder to the belly. I followed the order promptly and did a cut, making blood and guts fall out of it. This is completely disgusting. I feel like puking. You can put them in this bag. Then once you take all of it out, wash the fish inside and outside. My head nodded with a pale face holding my own guts inside. Once you finish, do it with the rest of the fish you caught, so you get used to it. At those words, deep down, I despaired, almost regretting having fished them. 10. Chapter 16 Year 5007 After the system day 15 of the flowering season during the afternoon, the number of my possibilities keeps increasing. My eyes gazed at the achievement screen section, noticing a new type of progress. Hunter 1 100. Practice tracking and hunting. Reward 10 fame once complete. Farmer 15 100. Practice farming hourly with tools. Reward 10 fame once complete. Fisherman 13 100. Practice fishing hourly with a rod. Reward 10 fame once complete. Chef for 100. Practice cooking hourly with tools. Reward 10 fame once complete. Swordsman 8 100. Practice hourly with a sword. Reward a class once complete. Mage 6 100. Practice hourly with mana. Reward a class once complete. If I persist in reading, would it give me a job too? The reader 1. My hand reached out for my forehead, tapping it lightly at my silly thoughts, ending up bursting with laughter. I then thought of my skill, opening a familiar screen. Notice, system consumed 2 mana. System library. Lumberjack 1, 2. Did I have these before? I tilted my head cutely in doubt, trying to remember. I tapped the first volume, filled with curiosity. Notice, system consumed 15 mana. Lumberjack I. Author, Eric the Strong. This is the year 170, after the system implementation. There are no book records before they created the system. Such is the age of darkness where only gods possess the terrifying truth and the great black hole in history. I'm a commoner who earned the title strong after reaching 200 strength. A magnificent feat all on its own. Thanks to the fame I got from it, even among nobles. I used part of the money I received from a sponsor to write a piece of my story. I started as most peasants start, we spend our status points and aim for a job, though unlike a lot of them, my first investment was everything in strength and with time followed that through by becoming a lumberjack, one who cuts trees and turns them into logs, materials used by a builder or a carpenter. My wife was a farmer with relatively extensive fields. Since I was strong, I plowed her lands which granted me some extra parameters. Of course, that was not everything, since I killed roaming monsters who approached our fields. If I were to wait on guards, then a big chance would be that we lost a lot of crops. I learned axe art and axe mastery passive skills and used them almost every day of my life. At some point, I was cutting small trees with one chop, and well, monsters in half. Every time I'd level up, I spend all of my points on strength. As many years passed, by level 50, I reached 100 strength, earning the title strong. One day when I was out woodcutting, bandits assaulted my wife and son to the point of killing them both. When I found out, madness and rage overwhelmed me. I followed the footprints and blood trails I found towards the woods while carrying an axe in each hand. After I found them, I went crazy in rage and bloodlust. When I was done, a bloodbath with body parts, organs splattered, and broken bones surrounded me. I discovered later I received a title called Rampage, which allowed me to unlock a rare class named Bizaka. There was enough disgrace from killing humans and animals to do so. It turned out to be a pre-requirement to unlock it. Ever since that day, my fame skyrocketed among the peasants, and I dedicated the rest of my life to killing bandits. I was the first one to reach the Bezaka rank 4, but it seemed like there was more to it than I expected, but sadly by the time I almost mastered the class, I was too old to continue.
it seemed titles and achievements were one of the conditions to learn hidden classes, and another condition was to have a lot of fame and disgrace. Without higher amounts, we're bound to get stuck in the class level. I believe it might be possible to even become a hero other than being summoned by the almighty goddess Arya, or at least something grand like that. Or not, who knows, however, if the old man Sage John said the system is fair and works on laws, then I believe that chance exists. To help my fellow humans, I've also done my share of the beast and the monster slaying. The more variety that is guild the more achievements one will get. I hope the future generations will have a lot of powerful classes and turn the tides in wars to come. It is a very violent and unforgiving world. Page 11. Temporary emotions like anger and vengeance flowed close to my heart as I read his story. I'm very sorry for you and your family. If it happened to me, I'd the most likely do what he did, if not worse. My heart tingled hard, looking at the room ceiling and sighing. Even though compared to him I'm super weak, so I wouldn't be able to punish those evildoers. Reminded of the later part of his words, my mind kept working. This man knew the author of the world of Artana. I guess they had a relationship of sorts, and like him. He also suggested getting stronger due to the world being dangerous. At that I used my status, focusing my eyesight on specific parameters, the ones he mentioned a few times, fame, 800, disgrace, 1020, he revealed it would be wise to get this fame and disgrace as high as possible for better classes, I recollected my father's teachings and started wondering about the parameters differently, since some classes require very specific things, then there is a chance that the berserker was a hidden one, like mom mentioned. I suppose it's just like dad's healer one. My hand passed through the status, making it disappear, and then shifted my gaze towards the system library one. I'm not really sure, but I am very interested in the next volume, so let's read more of this strongman person. Lumberjack 2. Notice, system consumed 15 mana. Lumberjack 2. Author, Eric the Strong. This is the year 175, after the system implementation. The old man John already passed away. One of the most amazing human beings that ever existed. Before I die like him, I've decided to write about a very scary encounter that I experienced. If it wasn't for the wise people like him that planned amazing strategies to outdo other races in wars, we would have perished by now, even with the help of the heroes. Back then, in a request to my dear friend, I went to explore the territory between our kingdom in the north and the demon one. I found a lot of monsters, I killed a lot of them, and also ran from the strong fierce looking ones. After doing my best to survive, and eventually, after traveling for a long time, my feet reached upon a peculiar place with red sand, instead of the typical ground made of earth with bits of grass here and there, or even a yellow sand closer to the ocean on the west. From my trips, I figured it was a zone that covered the south path of the demon kingdom. It was then that I discovered the reason humans and demons didn't have many encounters from all the opposing forces from the different races that we humans know exist. The beast race, monster race, and demon race, none of them matter compared to what my eyes found. In the middle of our kingdoms, a certain creature owns a territory as large as humanity. This place reeked of his scent and marks, therefore the ground being red, a monster above all others, a red dragon. To our current knowledge, there's a chance that more creatures like this one exist throughout the world, and more races, too. Towards the center, I saw a gigantic turtle fighting the dreadful flying beast. It was a duel between two colossal monsters where each skill they used blasted in immense parts of the land, even though it was mostly sand. Ultimately, the dragon won the duel, I think. After the dragon left, an army of sandworms started digging below the gigantic turtle and drowned it under the ground. I don't know if it got devoured by the worms or if it was already dead by then. After my return to the kingdom, they diagnosed me with a rare disease. It seemed like those lands were incredibly rich with mana. The doctors named the illness mana disease, as my mana pool was too small and couldn't handle the exposure it received from those places. There's no cure for it, so sooner or later, I'll meet my friend John. It certainly wasn't much about learning more things about his lumberjack class, especially since he focused on the new class. I placed my finger, passing it softly in front of my lips and nose, doing my best to hold in the willingness to cry and the tears from falling. 
It sounded like he became a sort of explorer at a later age. Once I left my bed, I changed from a pajama to casual clothing. There are places that we humans can't walk into without suffering consequences. Mana disease. I wonder if there's a cure for it now. My hands folded the clothes I used to sleep placing the pieces carefully on top of the bed. A red dragon. Is there a race of dragons or does it belong to the monster race? How about that giant turtle he mentioned? Are those things even possible to exist? My feet walked out of the room towards the bathroom to the left. In my past life, I've read stories about fantasy creatures, but they didn't sound in the slightest close to these. After peeing I washed my hands, then rubbed my face with a bit of soap, removed the sleep crust, and fixed my tiny eyelashes with a few soft hits to them. Just how strong is a red dragon? Is it a unique monster or simply one of many? Is the world truly so vast that we're just little fluffy worms living in it? What if one of those giant monsters would drop by our lumen kingdom? Even with every human together, are we strong enough to stop them? I wonder if the colored sand comes from it being owned by a red dragon. Was it caused by a skill of sorts? I dried my face with a nearby towel and bits of the hair that got wet. If the dragon leaves that territory or maybe dies of age, in case they die from that, will the surrounding territory change back, allowing the demons to invade us? I wonder if King Luck and his generals even thought about any of this. My stomach growled, causing me to hasten to the kitchen to take breakfast, thinking about more possibilities related to the information I read, and becoming more and more worried about the dangers of this world. This caused my inner will to grow stronger but also for an inward desire to one day become powerful. After eating, I returned to my room, took a seat in front of the small wooden desk, grabbed a pencil, and wrote about all the worries that went through my mind in that peculiar black book. Once I finished, my heart felt a lot lighter and the usual cheerful expression returned. I peeked through the window to check out the weather. A sunny day. Guess I'll go water the fields before Dad wakes up for my lesson. Time passed by quickly as I handled my field. While I watered it, I noticed a couple of spots with tiny holes in them. Upon closer inspection, two of my fingers entered it to check if the seed was still inside. How dare they! With an enraged tone, my gaze surrounded the entire area, looking for culprits, but to no avail, as there was no one. I'll have to make a scarecrow with Mom before they return to attack my field again. I pouted and sighed, feeling unjustified by the thieves. It's a good thing I made some deep holes, otherwise the losses would have been bigger. A big smile filled my expression proudly, remembering my mother's advice back then. I wonder if Dad's awake yet. I turned around to my house, leaving my back in the river's direction. After some seconds of not noticing any movement from far away, I began fishing to pass the time and get food for us. 9. Chapter 17 Some time passed from when I started the fish hunting, granting me two new ones. After preserving them, I headed back home since my father was taking an unusual amount of time to come for our lesson, worrying me. As soon as my feet reached the entrance, I went into awe at the sight of the door open and that of my parents. Why are you two dressed so fancy? Is it because of Dad's secret job? I could see my mother in a long beige dress helping Dad with the buttons on his simple brown leather attire without sleeves, leaving the white shirt below to be seen all the way to the wrists. Usually, they would dress in more casual and cheaper clothing like most peasants. Today is the day the Saintess is passing by to do the cleansing ceremony. You know, the one we told you she does at the beginning of every year that helps monsters and beasts stay away? Oh. I didn't know it was today since the two of you never took me to see it before. Once my parents heard that, they laughed lightly as they were nervous about getting themselves ready. And then he resumed his wording, you're right and there is a reason for that. Every child underneath seven who isn't fully awakened could end up sick from being in the range of the saintess because of her enormous aura. My mother closed the last upper button making Luke choke from how tight the vest became. It caused his breath to become rough. Quickly Rosalyn opened it again, granting him some freedom, causing him to follow with coughing. Seems like you've gained a little weight, honey. My mom giggled, making me laugh a tad, and then she gazed at me with a serious expression splattered across her face. What are you waiting for? Go dress Iris, we have to get going. The startled me ran towards the kitchen, storing the fish and then washed my hands, sprinting to the bathroom to brush my hair till it became smooth like silk and straight all the way to my back. The next step was my clothing. 
Thus I rushed towards my closet, grabbing a similar wool beige dress as my mother's one. Its length went all the way to my knee, allowing both to run if necessary. As I was about to leave my room, I noticed something. My hair is stuck. Ah, after managing to pull it out of my dress, I had to hasten to the bathroom again, to pass it one last time with a brown hairbrush on it. Once everything seemed perfect in the small mirror on top of the sink, I returned to my parents. I think I'm ready. Their heads rotated to meet me, judging me with their gazes from top to bottom. They looked at each other with a smile, proud of the looks of their seed, nodding in agreement. Now that you have some control over your mana, you'll be able to experience their gap. At those words, I gulped and then smiled happily as they walked towards the exit, and then my mother glanced at me, pointing at the living room. Iris, don't forget the hat. Even if it is a bit too big for you, it'll keep you safe from the sun. All right, mum. This time around, my feet moved calmly towards it, picking it up and placing it on top of my head, which Rosa readjusted so it wouldn't fall easily. Once fixed, it covered my forehead and was a tad lower on the back. We then headed towards Estia while chatting. I've been thinking that you two are always hesitant about me going to the village. Is there a reason for that? Upon hearing my words, they traded guilty glances. And then my mother opened her mouth to give way to a soft justification while keeping her eyes directed at mine. You know your dad works in a potion shop during the afternoon shift while I do it in the morning. However, there's more to his job than that. She smiled faintly and then looked at Luke, who continued from that point onwards. I have, from a certain incident, obtained some connections to important people. As such, I work for them from time to time as a healer and as a doctor. Dad, are you like Vicent? I tilted my head cutely, reminding myself of the day of my birth, and the few meetings on the trips to the village with the parents, meeting the old man. Yes. To some extent, I've learned everything I know from him, so I can cure diseases and use my element slight properties to heal the wounds on the body, and seeing as neither of you are telling me who they are, it means I'm too young for that. I stole a glance at my dad, who nodded, leaving it at that. Rosalind then added some comforting words to me. We trust you, Iris, as you are our daughter, but it's for your own protection in this world. Sometimes the least you know the better. I radiated my happiness at them, gripping both their hands tightly, a signal of trust. Silence then reigned while we walked the rest of the way to the village. Eventually, we got to the center of Estia through the South Passage, a place with a beautiful garden and a fountain in the middle of it. I saw some people seating on the wooden benches, which are often freer than today. After some chatting and looking at the decorations, mostly colored cloth held from one tall pole to another. We then went to buy a rose and I got to choose its color. I made sure to pick the one I liked most and it turned out, it was a species that was scarce. After a little while, the bells of the only church in this village rang, signaling the arrival of the saintess and the pope. I could hear thunderstrikes which turned out to be drums that were only used for ceremonies like this one. Their sound came with a particular rhythm, blasting the wind fiercely into our eardrums. The different church underlings approached the main road, along with many army flags leading their way. Some emblems were colored roses imprinted on them. Such was her importance, the key figure of this kingdom. There was not too much protection when it came to keeping her from harm. Thus, it was normal to see soldiers from all the different noble factions surrounding her. I stood between my parents, near the fountain, as the many peasants gathered to see the many priests and the important key figures of the church passing through further south, as the thousands of them went by on their silky white robes, with a green octogram on their backs, I spoke in a lower tone as I pulled the white sleeve of my father's arm. Which one is the saintess, dad? After searching for the woman in question for a tad in silence, he approached my ear whispering in it that one in the middle with long green hair far in the back over there, he pointed at the woman with just a finger, so that no priest would take it as an offense in case someone noticed him. Soon my eyes matched the description in no time seeing a beautiful woman in her thirties, whose white robe was further adorned with golden and green stripes, causing a unique appearance compared to every other priest from the church. Next to her, I stole a glimpse of a very tall old man with a big cylindrical pearly hat, whose robe had similar lines to the one he accompanied, except they were not colored like the grass but golden ones. With a further whisper, my father presented to me who that person was as if reading my mind, that tall man is Kraus the Pope, 
the one we I told you about the other day, as some of them went through, leaving only their backs in my sight, I took notice of a mysterious symbol that intensified my curiosity. Dad, what's that on the men's back? It's a green octogram. It symbolizes the eight churches around the castle. They built all of them to match that pattern. With a low tone, regarding the consequences, as he whispered before, I pulled his sleeve once more for his face to approach. Isn't it like a magical circle of sorts? Yes, you could say that. There is even a rumor that the eight archbishops who stand below the Pope and the Saintess have access to a major rite called the Hero Ceremony. Though people mention the goddess is the one who does the summoning all on her own. How curious, indeed. Though I believe it's the Saintess who actually summons them. With her passing relatively close to us I asked, do I give her the flower now? Yes, you should. With all my strength. As we were a tad far, my arm threw a purple rose, which landed relatively close to the saintess. It hit an invisible wall of sorts causing a vibrant noise to propagate and her to hear it. She took some steps in its direction curious of the petal's tone, different from all the others that were scattered in the ground, mostly either white or green. Delicately, she picked it with brimming eyes, glancing momentarily at the source, finding a short-haired man along with me and a blonde woman. She took some steps toward us, and with each one, I felt an earthquake approaching. It felt like the world was falling on my shoulders, almost like the weight of gravity became more intense, pressuring every inch of me against the ground. Her presence shuddered my mind along with my inwards. Such was the natural force emitted by this woman, along with her warmth, that embraced us like waves coming from the bright sun itself. It was almost as if we stood under the sunlight during the harsh farming days in the hottest day of the year. It was then that something within me revolted, shaking, willing to burst out. My hand reached out for my heart which seemed to have a will of its own, wanting to gouge out of my body as if it didn't belong there, causing me to clutch the thin texture of my dress. In my mind, some odd words echoed unnaturally, eerily. Notice, soulbound has reacted. I choose to ignore what it was, since the saintess was about to arrive, yet, a man called out to her while bowing deeply, causing her movement to halt, ending up with her nodding lightly in his direction, but before going away, her green eyes, a lighter version of mine, glanced at us with a charming smile, waving at us as if grateful for the gift. The woman returned briefly, resuming the march as two paladins in lustrous full sets of white armor awaited her return in the designed position readying their weapons for any who may approach her with ill intent. That was amazing. Sweat dropped along with the tension in my body, alleviating to some extent with each step she took away from us. The same happened to my heart who slowly started to turn calm, and I think she liked it. My whimpered self muttered with an overwhelmed expression, making my parents agree. Afterward, I questioned them, observing the somewhat cheap yet fancy attires of every peasant around. So, what was the point of dressing up? I looked confused at them, making both laugh, in a way, it is to pay respects to the one who keeps us safe for practically the entire year, my eyes gazed towards the saintess back and her long green hair, who was far away now with a few children running after her while keeping a safe and modest distance, come girls, let's go have lunch at a close by restaurant, are we for real, of course, Iris, I know we don't take you to the village too often, but there are some good reasons for it, really? Is it dangerous or something? My parents traded glances, looking around carefully. We'll talk better about this subject at home. Let's focus on finding a place to eat for now, as everything seems to be full. A couple of hours later, we returned home after eating some expensive cow porridge, sitting on the sofa relaxing from all the walking. So what did you think of the one admired as the saintess? After thinking for a while about our brief meeting, I replied cheerfully and sincerely. She was beautiful and seemed friendly. My parents smiled at such words, making me feel like I had given the right answer. Suddenly, I remembered something which I had saved in the corner of my mind for when we got home. After getting up from the sofa, I took a few steps forward and turned to them before speaking while placing my hands on the back, holding each other. Hey dad, about me going to the village, what was the issue? We can go about this in many ways. He looked at me firmly while thinking of all the problems. First you're seven years old, basically a kid, even if you're a bit brighter than most your age. Second, there have been children kidnapped before, 
and others devoured by wild beasts and monsters when they venture too far outside as they play. Even if the villagers usually omit it through the work of wild animals, my throat gulped at the latter part, as I didn't expect to hear those words. Third, in contrary to the kids who live in Astia, we live far away, so walking there and returning all by yourself is even more dangerous as anyone could intercept you. I nodded slightly, scared and quiet, as, despite everything, I had enough maturity to understand the worries of my parents for my safety. It would be one thing if you had a class and knew how to use magic to defend yourself, but even then, you would still be weaker than adults, and a few of them are most likely the culprits behind it. My mother then added a few words of her own as she embraced my hands softly, warmly. They're called bandits, mean people who do a lot of evil things. The soldiers of the Lumen Kingdom and the Guild Adventurers are the ones that usually put a stop to them. But it's hard to find every single one of them, as there are just way too many groups. I feel a bit of nausea from Rosalind my dear mother words. Monsters. Beasts. Humans. I whispered the names of the races of those who could bring harm to my family. It is a great thing having the Saintess ritual to keep the other races away, but that doesn't mean they won't come by and attack us. In fact, that has happened a few times. My father raised his forearms in the air as he grew more serious. Exactly. Listen, Iris, it is for such a reason that we have guards patrolling the outskirts of the village. The pairs of people with iron plates you see from time to time by the gates. Doesn't that mean we are the ones closest to danger since we live nearby of the South Forest? In a way, yes, but your father and I are former adventurers so we can handle your protection. We live near the mountains, so compared to the middle of the South, we're far better, and sheltered. We're located southeast of the village, and also from the capital, which is in the center of the Lumen Kingdom. I guess that's the reason they go to work in turns, to always have someone to stay with me. No mind reverberates with warm thoughts, feeling sheltered by my dear family. Though it is true having you play with kids your age more often would be beneficial for you in many ways, so we'll try to take you there when we can. However, you're still forbidden from going there on your own. At that, I smiled, thinking of Elise and the other children I met in these past months. All right dad. I'll only walk around the house and maximum all the way to the river. I'm truly glad you're such a good listener. He got up and patted my hair softly, with a sorrowful and tender gaze. I'd be extremely sad if anything ever happened to you. Mother got up and smiled dryly, feeling the same way as him. Then got closer to me, caressing my right cheek with a tiny smooch. My parents are truly kind-hearted. I'm lucky to have been born here. 10. Chapter 18 Year 5007 After the system day 16 of the flowering season during the morning, are you ready to go, Iris? Yes. A joyful shout left my mouth whilst inside some casual brown clothes. All right, let's go visit the farms west of Astia village. That sounds pretty far, she giggled, looking at me with a delicate smile. Don't you want to ask for some straw for the scarecrow? Euphoria burst through me filling my veins with energy. I wished to make one for a while now, but my parents were often busy with either their work or hanging with their own friends. She took hold of my hand and we moved out of the house towards the northwest. Why are you taking the sword? I noticed it hooked on her waist belt. We're going around the village since it's faster and we might encounter a foe or not, just a precaution. Shouldn't we go through a steer even if it takes longer? That would be the wise decision but showing you what lies beyond our home will be a learning experience. And swordsmanship isn't the only thing I want to teach you. Really? What else? Mum? Survivalism. If you become an adventurer, that's what you'll need the most. Even more than the weapon? Yes, far more. My head tilted to the sides cutely while placing my left hand index finger on my lower lip, causing my mother to giggle and nod at me in agreement. This topic wasn't entirely vague to me as I read a book about it in my past life but never had the chance to put the knowledge into practice. We had a conversation while walking to the forest situated southwest of the village. Why is our house far better built than those who live in Astia? I stole a glimpse of the way she opened and closed her mouth a few times before speaking possibly thinking about the best way to explain it within the limits they set. Most of the houses I saw on the few trips had now to wood layer and a poor aspect. The shops, in comparison, had a better look to them, but even then, they were half stone, half wood. However, our house had bricks and clay on the exterior, 
they were more expensive than the normal materials used by most serfs. We are ultimately peasants, but thanks to your father's connections and deeds, our house isn't like those crook ones that you can see in the village. Unlike what many thought in the beginning when we moved here, we're serfs. Reason why we pay the rightful taxes to the church and the royal family, more precisely to the Lord who has these lands under his grasp. With such words, I went into thought before replying to her. It seems to be related to my father's secrets. Without wasting a second thought, as it seemed that she was willing to give more information, I threw another question at her. Who's that man, the one you called Lord? He's called Francis the head of a very prestigious noble family, entitled as the Red Rose. A funny expression appeared on my face before I replied in a soft, yet confused tone. The man is a part of a garden? My mother laughed it off, ignoring my question, following with her own remark. I suppose you can see it as a colored rose garden of sorts, though don't mention it in such a way near any noble. It could trigger them to harm you because they could see it as defamation. Rosalind sighed before she resumed her own venting towards this subject. As a servant, she too had struggled with them in the past, mainly due to her beauty and exotic appearance. Talking bad about their image can cause them to be very prideful. Uck, sound like the nobles of this world do not differ from my past life ones. Despite being held captive in my old mansion, my past father received some visits, like the precious daughter I was would often be called for betrayal proposals, or simply to make acquaintance with political figures for the future. Nonetheless, there was not a single engagement, as I was still too young back then. As such, the only nobles I met were the fathers and fellow children, they who represented their families through excellent etiquette and exquisite manners. We hear and obey? Words I used to hear often by the maids. Yet, to my question, my mother made a bewildered face. It was obvious how she found herself falling in accordance with such strange yet rightful words. They resulted in the designation of us being inferior. Words she had never expected me to come up with. We hear and obey my dear daughter, but do nothing that goes against what you think to be right. Even if such a law demanded me to do so, from my past education, it was normal for anyone with a higher rank to order those below as they saw fit. It was a blunt standard to show their superiority and it barely had any consequences. Atrocities were but a part of such an era in that world, and by all means, Artana was a similar place regarding that. My mother made a conflicted expression, biting her lower lip softly. Rage surged within at the harm some nobles could inflict upon me in the future. I, who was looking at her with a serious expression, tightened the grip on my right hand behind my back. She glanced over at me, finding but a beautiful smile. It's okay. No matter what, we can't change who we are, that's why for as long as I can, I will become strong enough to protect the two of you while pursuing my own happiness. Deep in my heart, I felt a big backlash from my past life, which pushed me to strive further towards such a goal. To no longer remain a clueless bird inside a cage, to no longer stay as an obsolete girl whose only worth was my bloodline, to no longer remain the broken doll of the library. If something like that were to happen, we could only count on your father's friends. They are powerful. I'm sure we'd find a way. It is one reason we came to live this far from the capital. To remain safe from evil and influential people. To keep you out of harm. You, our beloved daughter. My mother curved her body as she voiced out such lovely words. Pulling my hand closer, and with it my entire body, giving me a tight hug. Thank you. No matter what the cost. We'll keep you safe. A wintry smile contrasted with the not-so-light expression on my face, sunk in my mother's warmth, for I knew better from the dark and distressing years deeply rooted in my memories. A tighter embrace pulled me even closer, almost choking me from the lack of air and the difficulty that it became to breathe. But to that, I closed my eyes and accepted it wholeheartedly. As painful as it could be, she filled it with the pure form of maternal love, and to that, there was nothing but gratitude towards her who took care of me since the day I was born, for she was my mother, my guardian. Moments later, she relieved the tension of the grip, causing me to take a very deep breath. A loud compressed sound came out of my lips, recycling the lungs with the air that was scarce, almost died. Again, I giggled quietly, returning to a more innocent, childish face that resembled my original appearance better. Slowly, we both turned forward and my mother pointed in front with a refreshing smile. A few meters more and we'll arrive at the forest. Compared to many others, 
It is fairly smaller but will be a good start, so you don't feel overwhelmed. All right, I'll do my best to learn. A fierce yell left my throat, both to give out my determination but also to push the dark remnants away. The density looked vast, with tall enough trees to hide the sun. The entire ground was green, with some brown roots. Large branches with small white birds lived on top of them. Once we reached its entry, she began with a meticulous explanation. The first thing that you'll need in order to survive in the woods is clean water that you can drink. Look for signs of fresh water nearby like areas of green foliage that show it is nearby, and signs of wildlife like animal tracks. Unlike us, they have a keener sense of finding such locations, and they too require drinking to survive. So it is possible that just by following the animals, we can find what's necessary. As we walked further into the forest, she rose a finger to the air and added immediately. This doesn't mean that all sources of water will be safe to drink. In fact, the ones from the Magical Institute who research all kinds of things mentioned that there are some toxic ones. Somehow, by boiling it, we're able to purify the water even if by doing so we reduce the quantity inside of the pot. At those words. I thought on a way to heat water, reminded only of the pans back home. To boil the water inside the forest, we'd need to lose ourselves with at least a container. My mother nodded happily at how the experience of cooking completed my mind. Exactly, so preparing oneself as an adventurer will require some tools to be carried, and also learn how to make a fire from nature itself. From her reply I got the hint that at some point, learning how to make one would come as one of the experiences that she had prepared for me. In case it rains, collecting the rainwater is a useful method to gain water. You can use a piece of long cloth and tie its corners to the trees, making a squarish form. Then place a stone in the middle so the liquid flows easier to the container. What if I don't have a big one? I suppose you could use a small rag made of cotton to capture the morning dew on the grass. You can then wring it tightly by making many turns causing the water to fall off to the recipient. That is brilliant. My radiance crawled out from me as I learned new methods of survival. In case you have a small shovel or someone who can use the earth element with you, making a deep hole in the ground to find fresh water could be an option. Would any place work for that? Not at all. Rosalind smiled at the brilliant observation made by me before resuming her words. You should look for places with lots of green foliage. It'll increase the odd that way. All right. I'll keep that in mind. In case you are in the forest during the cold seasons like the decaying or even the moon one, you could melt snow to produce water. Once you learn how to create ice with your element, you can do that with your own power. My mind imagined a scenario where that could be possible. So, I create pieces of ice and melt them till they turn into water? Yes, in preference not too big ones as the icicles would take longer to melt. Understood. If it's ice or snow that you find and they have a grey aspect to it, it means they have salt inside, you can use that for cooking instead, that's truly interesting. My mother made a radiant smile, noticing my brilliant A's, who looked at her full of expectation while absorbing the knowledge. The adventurers usually teach some of this information to the supporters, but gaining it in advance along with some practical experience, will be an asset for the future. Yes, depending on what I learn, I could even use it from here onwards to help you too. Sounds like I should teach you about food next, so you become a full-fledged survivalist. Does that mean I could roam into forests to gather food while you two are at work? If you learn how to fight and the mostly how to survive, you'd be able to avoid getting caught easily by either kidnappers or other races. My mouth opened amazed, as my will became more solid into wanting to gain such knowledge, mainly for freedom, as it was one thing I sought for the longest time. By no means would I want to be stuck at home all day, every day. The ability to explore, to gain some independence, to go to the village and the meet and make friends, to play with them without worrying about this or that, to fish or farm, feeling zero constraints, the capacity to protect myself and even other people if necessary. Those were the newly found goals that slowly ingrained in me, replacing everything else. 7. Chapter 19 After a while went by, we did some attempts at finding water and tracks. Eventually, we found the little rabbit gnawing at some fresh spinach covered in dirt in its roots. The poor vegetable was still stuck inside the ground, defenseless and hopeless. As I started approaching the animal, my mother gripped my right arm while using her other free hand to cover my mouth. Our eyes traded a glance and I nodded at her serious expression. 
The released me and signaled me by placing a finger in front of her nose, to be quiet. Upon this gesture, I understood Rosalind's actions and whispered as low as possible while facing her, What's wrong? With an equal tone, the mother responded seriously, checking if it's a normal bunny that is harmless or a horned rabbit that can use magic. Ah! They can have horns? Ignoring me, she placed her right hand on the sword pommel while letting go of my arm. Her feet advanced towards the animal gaining a better view of its head. Upon closer inspection, she took normal steps back to the daughter with a relieved expression. Everything's fine, dear. Regarding your earlier question, yes, they can. There is a monster race of bunnies that can be very menacing as they strike in groups. And like us, they, too have different elements, making them capable of magical combat. Are they strong? I questioned, concerned, glancing over to the rabbit who didn't notice us, casually chewing its food. Remember what I taught you, every race that isn't human or animal is stronger. We must approach them with caution and with the intent to kill. Most of the time is best to simply escape, to not face a possible loss or ultimately death. At that, my expression became firmer, and so did the nod I gave her. Without the use of magic, catching a rabbit would be pretty hard without making a trap for it but I want to take that one with us later and teach you a different dish, so wait here, with the last whisper to this quiet conversation, I calmly answered, good luck, through cautious steps, Rosalind approached the prey, hiding her hand behind the torso as it started glowing in tones of blue, once the woman reached a range that made her confident about hitting the spell, she voiced out, aqua trap, as the arm rotated from the back to the front, the rabbit's eyes glanced over to the source of the voice staring at the human in fear. The moment the little animal readied its legs to jump away, a cage of water nullified its motion, leaving but the head out. From a bit further away from the two, I who saw the entire scene grew in admiration for my mother's talent with magic. Rosalind took large steps toward the bunny, placing her hand inside the water. Her fingers clutched around its neck, leaving it zero chance to get away. She then glanced back at me gesturing with her head for me to approach. Once close enough, I commented on something any kid of my age would do upon such fluffiness. It's so cute. Normally this would bring my mother a smile, but as we were into survivalist training, she coldly answered as her arm approached the creature to me. Grab its neck with both hands while I hold it for you. Feeling the menacing and iciness of such a tone, my expression became wary of what she wanted me to perform. Little to no avail, I, with a heavy and bumping heart, twisted the bunny's neck, tearing up in the middle of the process, its tail along with the legs moved in random patterns for a few seconds till they stopped, eternally, my mother took a folded small bag from within her pockets, leaving the rabbit in my hands, allowing me to take the entirety of its weight, this was something Rosalind chose to do, so I could mature a bit more, with a whimpering voice and a tear running down my cheek, I voiced out, it's dead, isn't it, yes, it is, I remained quiet, trembling, waiting for her to open the bag, which seemed to take an eternity. Then once she did, I quickly placed it inside, causing the hole to widen and the bunny to fall into its dark abyss. Don't cower, and don't fear my little girl as life only gets worse the more we partake in it. I muttered inaudible words due to crying, knowing fully well that the rest of the kills I had done were no different. But somehow, this one had been tougher to handle. Her hand passed by my hair briefly come we need to move. Despite the sadness my feet moved along, accepting to a little extent what transpired, allowing a few more tears to fall as we went deeper into the forest. A while passed, and Rosalind pointed at a peculiar bush with dark purple balls on its thin green branches. Look daughter, blackberries, this is one of the sweet things you can eat if you ever get lost, along with raspberries that are rosy and wild strawberries that are redder. Upon picking some into a different bag, my mother gave me one to try it, I made a faint smile at its mild sweetness, it's good, keep in mind that you should never eat any white looking ones, they're poisonous, oh, all right, noticing my change of mood ever since I killed the bunny to my short and dull answers, she thought to herself, might take a bit from her to recover from it, while I don't want my daughter to become a killing machine, I need her to be ingrained with some coldness, in case one day she needs it, especially if she becomes a helper in some years, after making me pick a full bag of blackberries, we moved through the forest, eventually finding the exit, for today, we'll call survival training a day, 
I was looking for mushrooms but couldn't find any, next time, I'll teach you more about them. Sure, noticing the displeased expression on Rosalind's face after my answer, I lowered my chin, taking a few steps forward onto the open plains. To this, she exasperated not saying anything as she too had gone through a similar behavior when her father taught her. Though in her case he had been a lot more aggressive about it, even going as far as to slap her due to how moody Rosa was at the time. With a natural approach to my mum, I gathered the courage to say a few words on her own, is it further ahead? The straw for the scarecrow, my chin rose to face her, who kept on smiling kindly back at me, yes dear. If we find a nice farmer who won't mind giving us some for free, we'll call this a very successful trip. After all, money doesn't grow on trees. Rosalind voiced it out in a teasing tone, winking at the end, making a faint smile pass by me who understood her words and the roles we as peasants played to some extent. A while went by, reaching the time of the day when the sun reached its peak, and the two of us remained behind one of the farmer's crook houses hiding in its shadow while eating some strawberries and drinking some water produced by her, so far we weren't too lucky, upon finishing such words, I took another strawberry with a happier expression, these fields are pretty vast, we're bound to find someone who won't mind giving us some, as a bit more time passed with the heat reducing, we moved out of the shadows into the light and resumed our search, not too long after, we were casually greeted by an old man. Good afternoon to you too. Hello, good afternoon. We replied in unison with a smile while sweating a bit from the forehead due to the long hair and the warm weather. You two don't look like farmers, are you perhaps lost? To this I explained my adventure from the moment I left my house till we reached this one, making the old man laugh loudly with a bit of coughing here and there. Well, by all means, you can have some of my straw for that scarecrow of yours, and in exchange, you'll have to make him wear this hat of mine, the old man went inside the house, grabbed one, returned, and placed it in my hand, my sister made it when she was younger and since my sibling is long gone, a new owner for it is just perfect, I smiled widely at the old man, who was very friendly to us, I'll make sure to treasure this gift, and if one day I happen to be able to repay this debt, I'll do my best, the old man glanced at Rosalind, noticing a proud expression painted on her face, and then returned her eyes to me, laughing lowly, overjoyed with my words that were unusual for someone of my age, that's a deal then, he shouted happily and went to a nearby cellar, grabbed some straw, and gave it to Rosalind, whose arms were long enough to better get a hold of it, don't forget our promise, little Iris, I hope to see you another day, sure Thomas, whenever I get a chance, I'll visit you again, this time around, we took the shortcut and went through the town's west entrance and left through the south one, heading home with cheerful expressions. My hands carried the bag that contained the berries and the rabbit, having accepted it within my heart, and looking forward to making something out of it for us. Through two of the books I read in the system library related to cooking, there was a bird and a bunny stew, one in each of both volumes, which in a way, it made me happy since I would shortly be able to put them into practice. As soon as we got to the entrance of the house, we placed the straw next to the door and went inside all the way to the bathroom, washing our faces and hands with the water in the bucket, refreshing ourselves and one another like children play. Soon as all good things come to an end, and at times rough things must start, we took the bunny out of the bloody bag, resisting the smell that came with it, the first thing is to place it on this wooden board so it doesn't slip. My body did as the steps that left my mother's lips. A bloody waltz was about to begin. Now you do a cut here. The woman pinched the rabbit's back hide, allowing me to cut it horizontally with a knife. Another one from here to there. But turn the edge upward. We don't want to open the stomach of it. I nodded, feeling slightly sick. But even then, I did as I was told. The best possible granting a proud sentiment to Rosalind. Now you take the fur off by using your index and middle fingers of both hands to create an opening like this. After the demonstration, I did my best to achieve it steadily, with a firm grasp, hook up under the skin and pull with your strongest hand all the way to the rear, keeping the head steady. After a lot of struggling and tries, taking into account extra tips as they occurred, I managed to skin the rabbit fully. Finally, 
my hands took out the fur off the rabbit's legs with slight cuts, doing a final slash and removing the feet one by one. All right now we have it fully skinned and need to open the belly to remove the parts that are bad for the meal. My mother pointed a direction, and I carefully did an incision around the pointed area slowly. Now you open this chest location while doing a cut from the ribcage down through its pelvis and then remove these parts with some signaling and pointing. My hands removed the innards, cleaning the carcass upon tips. Now we remove the poop while I save the heart, kidney, and liver. If they're red looking, they're good. If not, we throw them out, as it would mean the rabbit was sick. Sure. Last, we chopped the rabbit into different portions based on what they were. Two back legs, front legs, two belly lumps of meat, and three loin sections. To that, we peeled some potatoes which went towards the cauldron inside the oven along with a sample of salt, very cheap wine, and a few spoons of olive oil. 9. Chapter 20 Year 5007 After the system day 16 of the flowering season during the afternoon. What are you searching for? I questioned after watching her look inside what seemed like a rectangular box for a while, getting some old clothing for the scarecrow. Maybe this black set? She showed it to me, who nodded in agreement while wearing a cheerful smile. That along with the hat of Thomas, sounds like a perfect fit. After giving me the clothing, she closed the box after folding and storing the leftover rolled rags, then got up and stretched her legs after being in a kneeling position for a while, and moved towards the living room where other materials remained. Once we had everything, we moved outside near the field. Shoo, shoo, I yelled while running after a few birds who pecked at my field. These will drop by from time to time and it was becoming more frequent. Seems like they really like your field. Rosalind giggled, finding my behavior funny. They sure do. I even had to make the holes deeper so they wouldn't reach it easily. Make them too deep and moles or rabbits will eat them. Making a field can be tough, but luckily, I haven't seen either of the two around here. One of these days I'll start taming all those animals and teach them they can't touch the seeds. This time around. She burst into laughter, imaging the little me being followed by many tiny animals like their queen, similar to Hamelin playing the flute to his rats. I still remember that old chick you kidnapped when you were even younger, saying it was too cute, so you took it home without us knowing. To those words, my cheeks became rosy and filled with embarrassment, and then, with a low voice, I responded sincerely, well, having a pet to take care of sounded, still sounds like something I'd like. Would you take good care of it? If I had one I would. I yelled, convicted, making her smile briefly. What pet has my dear daughter dreamt of having? Maybe a tiny puppy? They're very cute and I heard they live a long time and are loyal. The words that popped from me made Rosalind go in or till the last word, causing her to be abnormally interested. That's the first time I hear a child mention they seek fidelity from their pet. One of the village kids mentioned how treacherous her cat was, so I figured I'd like to have someone who could be there for me, maybe a big dog who could keep me safe while the two of you are away. I see. My mother started setting the clothes on a cross-wooded branch with my help who smiled at her. Once we finished, Rosalind left momentarily to bring the hay that was left nearby the entrance of our home. When she returned, we stuffed the clothes the best possible with yellow-looking straws. As soon as we filled everything in, she started knotting everything with small cords, so the hay wouldn't come out in the future. Last, we filled a pillow-looking rag with hay and placed it on top of the body, making it the head section of the scarecrow, binding it like everything else. Together we made a deep hole in the middle of the field, and placed the bottom tip of the vertical wood inside of it, closing it while I held the figure in place. Once we cleared that step, I noticed Mom pass her arm through the forehead, wiping the sweat from the hard work and the heat outside. Think it is sturdy enough? To that question, I attempted to wave it from one side to the other with both hands, having difficulties shaking it. Once I felt enough struggle, my body stopped, and I looked at her. I think so. Just in case, my mother made an enormous pile of earth on top of it, cladding it with some water that she created with her own element turning it similar to clay, and molding a small mountain all the way to the feet. Once it dries, it'll become very solid and protect it from falling. Amazement filled my heart, causing me to add cheerfully as I radiated from happiness and delight. Mom, you're truly the best. Rosalind smiled at such words and after washing her hands through the same method as earlier, 
placed the hat on top of the scarecrow, covering half of the pillow, making both of us laugh. It looks just like you, Iris. Yes, the hat didn't fit me either. After laughing some more while looking at the scarecrow, proud of our hard work, I thought while touching the figure tenderly, this was a lot of work, I just hope it keeps the birds away. I believe the old man would be proud. After some time passed, Rosalind returned to the fields in a more casual outfit and noticed me watering the field. You're a hard worker. My head faced her briefly with a smile, returning the gaze to the field. Can't have them go on without water, especially since it has been nothing but sunny days. It's all right dear, it'll take a long while before you see something coming out of it. Really? I gazed at the field with disappointed eyes. I knew it wouldn't magically grow in some days, but, a sigh escaped my lips, resuming the watering. Yes, by the end of this season, you should have them fully grown and ready to be harvested. I'm looking forward to that. I rose my hands in the air excitedly, quickly regaining my motivation, allowing the watering can to fall on the ground. The mother, with a smile on her face, thought about the future. It'll be very cute to see her reaction when unexpected and diverse things grow in her field. She mixed some seeds into the labeled bags on purpose, so the daughter wouldn't know the outcome, causing her a surprise, now to wait patiently for the day. Also daughter, it took me a while, but I managed all the ingredients you asked for that ash cake you told me about. For real? My feet jumped energetically causing a bit of dirt to spread to the sides upon the impact of on the ground. Of course, after I took a few steps, my mother looked at the ground, noticing the prints my shoes made, smiling faintly at how small they were. Soon after, my gaze followed hers, understanding what her expression possibly meant. My hands joined hers while looking down at them and muttered some words, embarrassed. We could go bake it together if you would like to. In my mind, a mischievous thought went by, and surprised Dad when he returns with it. Ah! Let's go wash our hands in the river first. A long while passed, and she followed my instructions, as I had the sole access to the ash cake recipe from my skill. Eventually, we finished it and looked at the ashes inside the oven, where we had removed the cauldron, before enabling this step. Now we wait for a while as it cooks, we gazed at it in silence appreciating this older method of baking as the smell filled the kitchen, a mix of the leftover charcoal and the cake being baked. Haven't seen anyone using ashes this way before. The woman glanced at me, astonished, filled with curiosity. System library. Just where in the world did Iris get it? She crossed her arms, pondering further on the subject. Luke checked the village library but there wasn't anything related to green eyes or those two skills. Rosalind let out a sigh, surprising me, who made a slightly worried expression at her. What's wrong, Mum? The woman took a seat in one of the four kitchen chairs. Nothing is dear, just wish I had some answers to a couple of questions. If I can help, I will. You're a wonderful daughter, but sadly with this matter, you can't. I understand. My gaze returned to the fireplace surrounded by three tall walls of bricks all the way to the roof. In other words, the chimney. With the flame completely extinguished, I could still feel the heat in my hands, whose palms remained faced to the ashes, warming both up with a smile on my face as the cake baked by itself. Wish I could be more helpful to my parents. With great happiness, I grabbed her right hand, pulling it gently, closer to the warmth. To this, my mother smiled kindly, not saying anything, instead caressing my own with her thumb, rubbing it in a circular motion. The house compared to the outside was cold, causing this scene to be pretty comfortable. How's the training with your father progressing? Rosalind lifted her bottom from the chair and pulled the chair closer to the fireplace, pulling me closer to her embrace, making me fall on her lap, sitting on it. I then adjusted myself to seat properly on her legs. Hum, you see. Yes. It's been a slow learning phase, not a bad thing, but, but, we end up talking more than actual training. She chuckled before speaking, burrowing her face in my shoulder. That sounds like your father all right. My throat made an inward sound in agreement. In a way, you'll get to know a bit more about the Magical Institute and what your father knows about the world. Yes, no need to rush, dear. You'll definitely learn everything we know. I understand mum, I'll be patient. Good girl. Don't forget rushing usually causes progress to backfire. Take your time to feel the mana flowing within you and around the body. Yes, mom. She giggled, lifting her face from the shoulder, and then stood up, 
checking the progress of the ash cake, think it's done, not sure. Did your recipe tell you how much time it took, it didn't, guess we'll let it be a bit longer, and then I'll stab it with a thin stick to see if it's baked, if the wood comes with some liquid on it, it means more time is necessary. In awe, I replied, Mum, you sure are knowledgeable, in a couple of things, she smirked, placing a hand on top of my head. A while passed by, eventually having the cake cleaned from the ashes and fully baked. We placed it on top of the kitchen table with a clean cloth on top of it. Think Dad will like it? I, unsure of his reaction, looked down at my fingers touching the index onto one another, causing the mother to reply excitedly, and with the need to comfort and reassure me, she responded. I'm sure he'll love it. My heart felt glad and relieved deep inside. Slowly but surely, my awkwardness and tattered heart became more and more inclined toward my wish to be happy promising myself to go to any extent, to see it becoming real. 10. Chapter 21 Carried by a softened breeze, seven long years flew by, changing every so often throughout the four unique seasons of the vast world of Artana. In the eyes of time, an almighty existence all by itself, I was no longer the kid I used to be. In the palm of my hand, I had the freedom to do more than ever, and today I returned home from a trip to the village all by myself. I dare say, slowly, with calm steps, attempting to not alert the beast, I headed towards the entrance, but to no avail, sharper than me by far, it ran. Quickly I noticed him, but all my mouth could say was a sort of whimpering through some thin yells, little saint, oh, no, helplessly, I got jumped on by my two-year-old dog, falling with him on top of me on the grass, I rubbed the back of his head as he slobbered my face, yuck, not again. Despite it, I laughed it off, pushing him to the side with some strength, as he was considerably heavy. Upon success, I changed into a seating position and hugged his neck with both arms, rubbing my head on his cheek, and delivering the drool back to him. Unbidden, a memory came from two years ago. In the fields, I was laying down on the ground next to my seated mom after a small dose of training. This is pretty tough, I can't keep up at all, she chuckled brightly. You're still young after all. And that was the most significant truth, as a mere twelve-year-old. It was impossible to match her who had been doing this for a while longer than me. That and the gap between our bodies, mine was yet growing up, so I could only go at it steadily to not overburden myself. In a way, both magically and physically required me to tackle it slowly, though there was one thing that stood out from the rest. She confessed to me that the better the teacher, the faster our skills would develop but the excellent mentors were quite expensive and out of our budget, as the kind-hearted daughter that I was, my words assured her that it was fine taking it slowly, if there's something important in this world is to have an excellent base, I thought of my mother's words, who felt knowledgeable, yet as any youngster, my mind wanted more and faster, even if saying the other way around out of respect and love, thanks to my training with dad, I haven't had the chance to use my system library skill, a complaint escaped my mouth causing her to chuckle, the speed where Mana recovers is quite slow, aside from when we're sleeping, but perhaps in the future, you'll manage with a bigger pool, I smiled awkwardly filled with confusion by the term, pool, her finger drew a stick figure in the dirt along with a circle around it, so this is you, and this line around is the Mana you have, we call it a pool, in simpler words, your maximum energy amount that you can check in your little window, oh, my cheek was resting on the ground while staring at the drawing she made close to me. I understand now. Thank you. At that moment, I noticed her gaze go above and beyond me for a moment, returning to me with a big mischievous smile, causing me to wonder what she was up to. Yet, to no avail, as I was sure today was not my birthday, there was no saintess passing through, and any seasonal festivals were still far from happening. Thus my mind gave it a rest, deciding to wait for whatever it could be. A while later, as I was about to head to my room, mom's hands grabbed my shoulders. Young lady, where do you think you're going without a bath? My eyes rolled, hoping that it wouldn't come to this as all I wanted to do was fall on my bed and rest, but escaping her grasp turned out in failure. Yes, I muttered lowly, being directed by her to the bathroom where we bathed together. It was a fight about not falling asleep during the bubbles and the hot water that relaxed me, leaving my mom to handle most of the cleaning. 
Not that she minded, as I was her kid, and there were clear signs of fun in her expression. Even tickling me so I wouldn't fall asleep in the bathtub. It was especially hard since she had boiled the water in the fireplace, so it was relaxing like going to the spa as a heavenly sensation soothed my tiredness. You're looking like a princess now, the joy in her tone made me smile faintly as I turned around and headed straight to my bed, naked, need to get a pyjama before it gets cold. The first words that went through my mind after entering the room, were followed by strangeness on top of my bed, what, why is there a wooden box? I tiptoed all the way to it, confused as it was taking space that was meant for me, only to have my emerald eyes fall on its insides and a thin yell that resounded through the entire house, a puppy, a puppy, a puppy. I repeated it three times in annoying, low-pitched tones, almost capable of breaking the glass of my small window. It's so tiny and so white and brown, softly. I took it out of the box, placing it on top of my bed with the utmost care, along with a cloth that came with him. I can't believe it, the excitement within me was tremendous, keeping me awake when I was close to collapsing before. Times like these were when I realized how mysterious human beings could be. But despite my ecstatic mood, a sneeze escaped me, a clear warning of my body being without protection after a bath that was hotter than the temperature inside these walls. Without wanting to get sick, I walked backward to the closet without leaving my sight of the pup, who seemed to smell my bed comfortably. My hand went into the opened gap searching for clothes, a little harder than usual as I didn't want to let the tiny animal out of my sight as he could fall off. Ah, I'm so stupid, without time to waste. I placed him inside the box along with the cloth under him, making sure it was comfortable enough, then my hands lifted the container and placed it near the closet, I could have left it there, but my excitement was still more than what my heart could handle, thus, my next step was to get what I needed, eventually dressing up in a light pink, thin pyjama, now that his eyes took notice of me, he seemed quite eager to leave the box, and to my surprise, dad went inside meeting up with us while wearing a big smug on his face. Did you like him? Yes. Then it quickly resounded to me. Him? I took a peek after lifting the puppy in the air, consenting with a light nod grasping confirmation about the gender. The person who gave him to me mentioned he's two months old, so we don't need to worry about the milk from his mother. In those words, he took the chance to educate me further on the subject. How things really worked for not only animals but also adults something I already knew from their lustful and happy days when I was a baby. I understand. We traded serious glances before he resumed an excited smug. So, what will you be naming him? That is a good question. I patted him softly, taking notice that white was not his only color. It was close to 80% of it though, but around his eyes it was more of a brown tone and so were his ears. Through the torso, there were two circular spots of brown too, but a lighter type. Whenever I looked at him, he matched my own gaze as if taking notice of me. I swayed my head left and right, realizing that he followed me with his gaze, and then, as if having fun perhaps, he yelped very softly. A not even close sample of the real thing. Wow. My two emeralds remained in his brown eyes, the same color as the inside of a peanut. He barked, sort of. I shouted happily, causing him to do it again, and my father laughed at our behavior. You'll have to take great care of him now and don't let him out on sunny days. This type is more into the other three seasons, especially the cold ones. The good thing is that we live near the mountains, so unlike other places, even in the hottest season, he won't have much trouble adapting. My dad's words matched his fluffy layer of fur, a small one that was likely to grow in time. I'll name him Little Saint. That was what a pet from an old storybook was called, a dog who helped those in need during cold and dark times. Sure this pup was far off from such legend, but for me, it didn't matter. For the name sounded pretty cool, it has a nice ring to it. Dad crossed his arms, thinking how peculiarly marvelous it was. It seems my good naming sense went down the lineage. The three of us turned around to meet my mother, whose blonde hair remained inside a towel, and her body inside a bigger one causing a mischievous grin to appear on dad's face, and compared to other times, he sure held on to his feet, at least till she curved down to pat little saint, showing a great cleavage that would cause any man to gulp, and foam from their mouth, there had been that favorable time when I could carry my little puppy between my hands, but now, quicker, 
he'd been the one doing the carrying, perhaps even allowing me to mount him, or being dragged by his fierce strength. I giggled, provoking his loud bark to resound through the plains. Come on, let's go inside, my finger pointed at the entrance, causing him to head there. Through a lot of effort and patience, as he could be seriously stubborn sometimes, even more than me on moody days, I trained him alongside my dad, whom he respected more than me, possibly from the few times. He peed on my parents' bed, and my father punished him for it one day. After that, he'd only do it outside, a lesson learned through a hard method, but to his happiness and our own, it worked out. Today sure is cold, I crossed my arms, enduring the chill as we were currently in year 5014, day 5 of the moon season, the coldest and most dangerous of all of them, and also the seasonal time that dictated the end of another year. Once at the door, I rubbed each of his paws on the entrance carpet, avoiding dirtying the house that way, and with some hope for him to learn how to do it on his own at some point. All right boy, we're all set, my hand reached out for the door's handle, rotating it, and allowing passage to him, as much as this was a dog meant for family, he was not so much as a gentleman, going through the gap faster than I could follow. Slow little saint, slower, he was bound to end up crashing into someone again. But such was the life of owning a dog almost bigger than myself, not that he'd jump on random people from the guests we received over the years, but I had to keep him away from them, otherwise, he'd act rather aggressively, a guardian of our home, a very adamant one at that. Hey, mum. I waved at her, who turned around on my calling, reacting to the earthquake that approached her. Sit or no food for you today. At those words little saint placed his bottom on the wooden floor causing his rush to halt, yet sliding briefly in her direction, stopping almost at her feet. No food had been the punishment my dad used on him that one time, as glutton as this pet of mine was, it struck him deeply, rooted profoundly enough for him to act twice, even if in his little mind, he did what he did out of love and affection. With a slightly annoyed tone, Rosalind proceeded, hovering at me with some resentment toward the way I looked. What did I tell you about going out into the cold without a coat? As much as I had grown physically, mom's words still pierced my tiny self harshly, not to forget she was still a lot taller than me. From the multifarious residence, my eyes scrolled through a steer village, all women were shorter than her, and on top of that, the two of us were the only blonde women. Whenever I went there, conversations from the grown-ups, mainly my parents' acquaintances, usually began with, you must be Rosa's daughter. Such was the bonus of having a rare hair color. A lot of them were more like my dad with his brown style, but the majority persisted with black hair, and for this, there was a special reason. I'll be more careful, I whimpered at her, giving the right answer as a smile quickly surfaced on her face. Good, she signaled me with her right-handed index finger to approach, and at that, I did. Once in range, she scuffed the top of my shoulders and head with a few pats to throw the remains of snow out of my blonde hair causing it to fall on the little saint who remained at my side, behaving like an obedient dog. That was until he gazed at me, annoyed, shaking his body, and throwing the white particles everywhere around. Once his body stopped, he stared at me sideways, sticking out his tongue happily. Why you? This time it was I who attacked him, with a lot of rubs and friction through his torso sides, getting him to fight me back with his licking and obviously large amounts of drool. At the sight of us playing with one another, my mother sighed, wearing a weary yet kind smile. Without time for me to add anything, she headed toward the kitchen. A little while later, I groaned some words out, you win, you win, I surrender. I scorned my fate as the loser since the beast once again beat me in a wrestling match. Saint, the food is ready. The moment my mother yelled those words, I became non-existent to him, almost like he gained a pair of wings. He flew to the kitchen in a swift motion, and there he goes. I mumbled with a fatigued expression, waiting for the following calamity to happen. Not so fast. Rosalind squealed, and I could hear a metal plate hitting the wall, and this was why I told her to feed him outside. I too sighed in exasperation at how silly my family was. Didn't take me long to leave the cold floor, feeling amused about the entire situation. As my body rotated to the side, about to head out to my room. Mom's voice reached out for me. Did you sign up to become a helper? Yes. They asked me to head there tomorrow for my introduction to a potential team. 
My hand trembled with excitement as it closed into a fist. Reminded of the meeting, I rushed to add. I also met Elise there. She's becoming a helper in secret, so don't tell Vicent. A head peeked out through the kitchen entrance with an open mouth. That girl is? At that, I nodded, lifting a finger in the air, stopping it right in front of my nose. She hates alchemy and is tired of studying it with her grandfather, a certain truth that would break the old man's heart. Thus it was necessary to keep it a secret from him. Words and actions that my mum consented to rather quickly, understanding that it was not her place to divulge such information. That's quite a shame, she was pretty talented from Vicent's words. I muttered a sound while shrugging my shoulders, heading to my room, leaving a brief gap open since Little Saint enjoyed checking up on me, and by that, I truly meant it. Even while being asleep, he came every night to see if I was fine a behavior that surprised my parents, but that they welcomed with gratitude. Truly, a guardian of this house. Be that as it may, thanks to his nocturnal presence, I reduced my fear of the outside and the number of nightmares to practically non-existent. A seat, I found by the desk, checking up on my worn-out diary, the strange dark book shone whenever I closed it, erasing whatever information it had in it, a wooden pencil, possibly the greatest creation of this era allowed the production of ink and feathers to be reduced in diverse branches, and, of course, poorer people like me to afford some. I began drawing a bit on it, from diverse forms like squares, rectangles, and circles to stick figures. After some years of doing this, now and then, there had been no major improvement other than better control with the pencil so these forms actually looked like what I imagined, but more complex drawings like portraits were a realm way beyond my capabilities. Nonetheless, it was something I enjoyed, and with the amount of paper, an infinite one at that, I figured there were no issues since I didn't waste any money on it. Its value in art honor varied vastly, depending on where our goal was aimed at. To have a stable seasonal incoming, using a job like a farmer seemed to be enough to get along without significant issues, the exceptions being when adversity, like weather, caused damage to the fields, but most farmers still wouldn't earn enough to be able to have better lifestyles, just barely enough to survive. The mandatory taxes made sure peasants would remain serfs for the rest of their lives. Rowan, a friend of my family, a merchant who worked in Estia for as long as I could remember, had been selling my crops while deducting a 10% tax from the total profit to himself, a humble amount, as he was the one who handled the transportation of such merchandise. Part of the money ended up on clothing as I, like any kid, grew up tremendously, but compared to most girls, my growth spur had been one level higher, I glanced down at my chest and below, muttering softly, the charms of a young woman, didn't take over two seconds for my eyes to roll out these words, because of my hair, boys and even girls always had this suspicious glint in their eyes, as if I differed from them, from my conversations with Elise, one of the few friends I made, it turned out that the great goddess Arya was one who had black long hair, on top of that, the summon that she brought to our kingdom had equally colored features as her own most of the time. Because of that, the most prestigious color was black and dark brown. This did not exclude the green of the saintess who took over the church symbol, the octogram. There was not a single royal nor a noble family who partook with the blonde. This promoted our looks to be exclusively unique, especially the farthest away from the capital. Certainly, there must be families like us. In my mind, I hoped such words to be true. However, knowing and having heard of the fanaticism that occurred in the capital, there was a big chance that people didn't like them, and even went as far as to prosecute such individuals. I sighed at the rumors, causing frustration to outdo my control ruining but another drawing. Uck, I suck at this, with both hands. I closed it and picked the book that was next to it, The Tales of Adarnowit's title, by far the oldest gift I had, that wasn't given by my parents. In it were short stories of the ancient humans who roamed the Lumen Kingdom without paltry fame. In the first chapter, my two emeralds, like many other times before, tingled through it. There was just something about this story that made me love it and I couldn't quite put my finger on what exactly tales of Atana I. Amidst the darkness, there stood a knight drenched in red atop a mountain of corpses. Silently, as her gaze crossed the battlefield where the war had ended. Due to her pride and honor, she'd show no emotion. However, deep inside, she was crying for her fallen allies. 
Behind her were thousands who awaited for her command. They considered this woman a hero thanks to her many achievements in war. She had conquered many battlefields like this one for her king. No matter how tough things were, she'd always do her best to win with the least casualties. Yet many losses followed as the enemies were rather fierce. Many were her comrades whom she had bonded through metal and blood. The soldiers often saw her wearing a full red set of armor and a long white sword with a black scabbard. At times, they would say the sword was instead of a blue tone. Some even went as far as to write tales of it, of its many mysterious wonders. In the weapon beautiful metal shape, everyone could notice small, golden yet beautifully carved letters. Their meaning portrayed our savior, the goddess name. Our loom and kingdom ceremony demanded this sword to be handed down not to the noblest of us, but to the strongest swordsman in the kingdom. Such was the will of her holiness. In the past, this commander took the advice of a comrade in arms and asked for her armor to be made of crimson. Thank to this, he managed to disguise the blood of all the beings she slew. Though truth be told, red was not the only color that spurted in its beauty, as not all enemies bled the same. Every time the war would end, the words she'd say were, yet so many had to die again. When will this war ever end? The woman picked her sword from the corpse she had slain last, waved it making the blood fall from its edge, and stored it. With the utmost respect, she bowed her head and gave a prayer to Goddess Aria in the name of the dead. Once her posture went back to normal, she turned around, allowing the wind to blow the cape she had on. The woman then raised her arm in the air and an echo of victory chants rose like a turbulent wave of an earthquake shaking these lands. The peasant hero walked through them while her men raised their many flags and followed through. Amidst the darkness there stood a knight drenched in red, in front of a living army. This story always makes me cry. My left-handed index finger smoothly took the tear off the corner of my eye. There was a peculiar, interesting thing about this book. While it had a title like many others, it lacked an author. Once my feet took me to visit the library, but that was when its owner, an old man called Einstein, told me a permit was necessary. Thus, not only was I stuck with my system library skill, which had not given me new stories but my achievement too came to a halt. Once I become an adventurer, I'll read all of your books. I proclaimed back then, causing the old man to smile joyfully, to which he told me he'd patiently await my return. Other than adventuring, my dad explained that some entities sold permits, and this necessarily didn't go towards libraries alone. No. In fact, many institutes and associations existed throughout the kingdom, each with its own license. There were also educational systems for the high-born, schools we could call it, the name designated by the nobles, was magical institutes and battle academies. Any who partook in either had the authorization to enter some secluded areas of the kingdom. Once again, I sighed, displeased with how things worked around in this realm. It was thanks to so many unjust laws that humankind lacked progress in many areas, and through bureaucracy, even some and ones with advanced knowledge quickly met their limits to what they could change. The nobles aimed for more power. The royal family hoarded the rule of the kingdom, and the church competed with them at all levels. One would think going through so much despair would change their minds. I scorned all those factions, not willing to take part in any of them in the future. Especially since at 15 years I, like any other human, could receive a betrayal proposal for engagement and later a formal marriage at 18. Having excluded acceptance in my head, from the men of the robes, the nobles, and, of course, the royals. I'd potentially go for one with a humble birth if it came to that. Though for the time being, all I truly wanted was to start my life in this world. To one day be able to explore its vastness, and eventually, if allowed by this unwelcoming world, find my own happiness. 9. Chapter 22 Year 5014 After the system day 6 of the moon season, with a woolly coat surrounding my upper body, I left the house while allowing little saint to play around. At first, he used to chase me around halfway to the village, but thankfully he understood that he shouldn't go far from home. If it wasn't for the fact food awaits him, I'm sure he would have run off somewhere. I giggled at my silly thoughts, despite having some truth blended in them. Through the thick snow, I took large yet slow steps through it. One could never be too careful with its potential depth. During any other season walking for 20 minutes would have allowed me to get to the village's south entrance. However, Thanks to the terrain an extra 10 minutes was necessary. At the gate, 
two guards stood watching. Good morning, I waved at them with a smile. Morning, Tyson said in a low, indifferent tone. A man who had once scared the hell out of me when I was younger, as his flirting attempt to get my mom was by all means annoying, especially bad when he tried to grab my arm without questioning to which my innocent self responded by freezing his finger something that had been only possible because he let his guard down but thanks to that i managed to keep my distance from him this man was once a part of my parents adventuring party and was now one of the men guarding this village having a couple of guards per town was one of the benefits the residents received from the taxes they paid to the lumen family in other words the royals thus the lack of payment would also equal that these trained men would be mercilessly placed elsewhere as there were too many places that required some order. As for the one next to him, he was more interested in blowing some hot hair at his hands and rubbing them afterward. My eyes took a glimpse of the white mist that escaped his mouth. Today sure is cold, my feet took me through between the two of them. Tyler's quiet voice approached from behind in a soft tone. It sure is. A brief smile passed through my lips upon receiving his answer. He who back then melted the frozen fingers of his younger brother Tyson. As I moved closer to the center of Estia, my eyes stole glances at some of its villagers. All of them were wearing similar wool clothing, effective vestment against the cold. Beyond the center, where a garden and fountain were usually the first things visitors notice, there was a large house with two floors and a backyard with wooden walls surrounding it. Above the front door, I read its words, Adventurer's Guild, a small habit gained through routine. It helped my mind calm down before entering it at a fast pace, mainly because of the excitement within me. My feet smoothly took me to it, pushing the tall door with some effort. As it opened, distinct voices, beer clattering, laughter and screams approached my ears, this place is as lively as ever. I grabbed the pommel of my sword, seeking some comfort from it because of the loud pounding of my heart. With each step I took through the middle path toward the receptionist. The grassland within my eyes glittered with a hint of anxiety, I hope the party will accept me. What a slim looking kid, a man laughed, looking down on me while drinking some beer, causing the surrounding three to snort, here to carry our bags? Another one added in a mocking tone. Ignore them, Iris. Ignore them, I thought to myself, knowing they were way beyond my capabilities. After the training with my parents, I wasn't too far from what my mother could do with the sword, but without a class, the basics couldn't possibly handle her skills. Furthermore, after discussing my future with my parents, I agreed to hold back and wait for a better chance. The ones I had unlocked were clearly lacking in one way or another. Worse even was the gap between me and my father. Our elements were so distinct that I couldn't acquire any of his light skills or something similar that could work for mine. I sighed, moving onwards through the path, ignoring the voices and the typical annoying comments. It's nothing new. You'll be fine. Once again, I reassured myself, taking a deep breath. Welcome. How can I help you? A good-looking man in a black suit questioned. The clothing was similar to those who worked here, full black outfits, a little stylish, but not expensive ones, mainly good enough to distinguish them from the adventurers around who clearly didn't care much about attires, from leather suits to light armored sets, whatever worked to protect them from monsters was what they preferred, and ideally, clothing that could fend off the stenches and stains of alcohol. I came yesterday, my eyes looked around for the person I spoke with yesterday, to no success. For? He questioned calmly, making a docile smile, today's my first audition, as a helper, they asked me to come in the morning, we've got a few selected for today. I noticed the way he looked into a book, smoothly passing a few pages, hastily my voice opened to help him, Iris, my name is Iris, upon getting this tiny piece of information. He lifted the book, muttering a tiny sound, daughter of ex-adventurers, his eyes widened momentarily as he read my father's name loud enough for only us to hear, not so much surprised about my mother's one. Very well, you're to run a test today while we wait for the rest, he looked at me as if to make sure I understood, taking me for a child, both the parties that need helpers and the candidates, at his clarity, I consented with a nod having received a similar explanation on the day before. His eyes left my own, lowering all the way down to my waistline. I see you've come prepared. Without hesitation, I replied, yes. He faced towards the left, taking my gaze along with him, 
then his arm lifted and pointed at a door, you'll find the instructor on the other side, all right, thank you, good luck, he gave me a piece of paper, then gestured with his head for me to move on, at that, I smiled briefly, gripping my pommel once more while walking towards the backyard entrance, on the other side, I found a woman seated in a chair on my left, with a small desk in front of her, at her side, there was a very long table glued to the wall with many types of weapons resting on its solid looking surface, good morning instructor, I ended up yelling out of anxiety, upon taking notice of me, she signaled me with her index finger to approach, once I reached the table, her hand stretched out for me with the palm facing upwards, the document, I trembled, slightly confused, remembering afterward about the paper he gave me, delivering it to her shivering thanks to the nerves, Iris, 14, she mumbled the words that piqued her interest the most, it says here you haven't got a class, her eyes rose from the paper as she slammed it on the table, before I had the time to reply, she added with a half confused, half serious expression, you do realize you'll need one to become an adventurer, right, despite the cold outside, my cheeks were rosy, and embarrassment and anxiety took over me fairly easily, this is stressing me, my eyes closed, along with a deep breath, in an attempt to calm my heart down, I've unlocked a few choices, but they were all basic classes, she tapped the table with a finger, annoyance running over her face, so, I lowered my gaze, flustered at her moody and quick reply, I, I want a rare class like my father's one, she chuckled at my determination, Luke's a healer because he has the light element, her finger tapped the table once more, you realize, your ice element, despite being rare, it's not something that can heal others, the gaze from the instructor pierced my own with more intensity, you understand where I'm getting at, right, I nodded in agreement, yes, I seek a rare class that matches my element, do you now, she sighed, unsatisfied with my answer, thinking to herself that any class would be better than having none, but I didn't want to learn something just to drop it later if I didn't like it, it was especially bad since basic classes only came with one skill tree, and changing them would only cause me to look at the loss of the class skills I worked hard to get, from my parents' teachings, it would be a different story if my class evolved, but the chances for that to happen were extremely low, though I told them that if I didn't manage to get a rare class or higher till I became 15, I would go for one that I liked, after all, I wouldn't be accepted as an adventurer, as that was one of the minimum requirements, yes mom, I promise to do my best for the party despite that, I declared, holding a convicted glint in my verdant A's, her words came out as serious as the ruthless stare and cold tone, here says you've learned a bit of swordsmanship, how to use a shield, and a bit of magic, I learned what I could with my parents, a smile surfaced on my lips, talking about them always filled me with some confidence and warmth, very well, let's see what you can do. The paper entered a heavy looking book that rested on the table, with this chilly breeze, that was potentially for the best, it didn't take her long to get up, grabbing a long sword with her right hand as if its weight was non-existent, she's using that with only one hand, I made a dubious face as it looked heavier than my own, thus using both hands would have surely made it more comfortable to use and control, and yet, her swing came fast, passing close by my neck, my eyes narrowed at the weapon, leaving me speechless, you've officially died once, she snickered such words at me, making me feel out of place, however, I was used to losing, thus, it didn't take long for me to take her seriously, unsheathing my short sword and grabbing it with both hands, her next swing came, but this time slower towards my right shoulder, giving me time to react and think, is she testing me, I parried it, or at least that's the sensation my mind felt, my eyes followed with a delay at my sword, which flew out of my grasp, did you really think you could parry someone stronger than you? There was no end to the humiliation she threw at me, without giving her time to react, I dashed towards my weapon, picking it up, and locking my focus back to her for the following moment, she could have done something there, my thoughts were the truth, this woman was way beyond my grasp, and it felt like she was giving me a chance, I took a deep breath, fixing my posture, leaving as few openings as possible, to my surprise, she repeated the same strike, this time around I hit it, moving to the side, allowing it to go past me, causing my hands to tremble at the impact, yet, 
Right at that moment, her sword took a turn back at me, passing close to my neck once more. You've officially died four times, though it seems you do have a head between your shoulders, she grinned, turning around and placing her sword on the table. At her words, I felt relieved looking down at the place she was, realizing her feet didn't take a single step toward me, she's way stronger than my mother. I wondered about her strength, ability, and, and, of course, rank in this organization. It's not like you'll need to fight any creature as a helper, but it's exemplary that you can defend yourself. I nodded with a smile on my face, sheathing my sword in its rightful place. Without a class, I'm not expecting anything special from your magic. She took a seat on the side of the table, grabbing the document. In a year, depending on what you achieve, we'll further test you. I opened my mouth, surprised at such words. Does that mean I passed? Yes, though don't let it go to your head. Being a helper is not a simple job. She passed her thumb through her neck while adding some words. Pride and carelessness may very well cost your life. I gulped, gripping my hands to the point of them becoming fists. As she was about to add something else, the door opened and people came from it. Three of them were youths like me, and nine older ones spread in three lines in front of her. It looked like she was an officer and they were soldiers. Good morning instruct Rebecca. They yelled in unison. All of us, the newcomers, felt the respect in their tone. At ease, she promptly replied, hovering over the four of us youngsters. Each of these lines forms a party. They will take one or more helpers with them. At those words they turned around, facing us four who rested farther behind. The three of you, give me the papers. The children moved to her, delivering it along with the party's information causing her to study them for a bit. This girl is quite the catch, she smiled happily, in a way that I have never seen before. Who's she talking about? I looked at my friend Elise, who waved at me with a nervous smile, and then at the other girl next to her. Mario, you can take Elise, her element will come in hand for the subjugation quests. At her words, the tall man's eyebrow rose, as this meant she was useful enough to not even be tested. Elise took a step forward to meet the man. She too had realized who he was from his surprised expression. That will be all, upon Rebecca's words. The four of them left through the door. Now then, the other two kids, one's a natural and the other a swordsman, upon voicing their classes, each took a step forward on the respective one. We call bids on the boy, one of the party leaders added, noticing the sword at the youngster's waist. A different group voiced out. Then we'll take the girl. We could use her tracking skill. Rebecca moved to the side, looking at all of them from a different angle. I'll leave their guidance to you. They looked at each other briefly, taking the children to their respective groups. And rise, take the blondie with you. She applied to be an adventurer, so teach her about humanity's enemies. His sharp eyes looked at me. What's your class, kid? None yet. His eyes widened, surprised at me, staring back at Rebecca, doubting his ears. Take her. His shoulders waved up and down shrugging, not willing to contest the instructor, all right, tag along with us then. All of us but Rebecca headed onwards to the receptionist's balcony, as the last one to leave the backyard. I stopped briefly to thank the instructor who wished me good luck. Back then, when the incident happened to the guard, I expected my mother to punish me for hurting someone else, but in reality, when we were alone, she had told me, treat those who hurt you with pain if you must but don't forget to be kind to good people. Those words quickly became the basis of my standards throughout these years. They shaped part of me whenever I socialized with someone. From making friends to fighting with kids my age, a little tomboy with the appearance of an adorable girl. This was a piece of me I had yet to further develop due to my past, my emotional side, who had yet to face the enemies of humanity, of true evil, and how powerless I truly was. From my cold past to my conceivable bright future, within me, there was a firm choice to find a way toward my goal to become a respected figure and help my parents throughout their lives, for all the continuous great care they gave me. 9. Chapter 23 Thank you, Hugo. The receptionist from before retrieved his hands away from mine after handing me the helper's badge, a symbol that allowed me to use the diverse facilities of this place, like a pin with the letter H on it. I pressed it against my coat, and just like magic, it got stuck. A certain message reverberated in my mind. System, you have received the achievement, Adventurer's Helper. 
The five of us took a seat around one of the empty tables at the party leader's request. Let's begin with an introduction. I'm Rise, a fighter and the owner of this E-graded party. Once he finished, an explanation blabbered out of him, showing that only parties above F-graded could recruit helpers. Since this was a job that required expertise, surprising the two of us, the newcomers, he added that the mortality rate was highest in the lowest parade. But it didn't mean that it decreased the higher we went since missions would also become more formidable, especially for subjugation quests. It truly sounds like a terrible world, I complained in my mind, reminded of the stories I read in the system library skill. With that out of the way, he gazed at the one beside him, this one began by making a throaty sound, possibly from being silent till now, causing it to be rather dry, or some mucus was in the way of his voice. I'm Chris a swordsman, my eyes widened at him, causing a brief smile to pass on my lips. Clockwise it went getting Brooke to introduce himself while showing us his weapon, a long wooden spear with a metal tip at the end, a piercer, he added, that being his class. I'm Iris. I know a bit of swordsmanship and magic. I smiled nervously while being stared at by all of them. I see, Rise added before questioning me further, what's your element? Ice. I promptly answered, feeling embarrassed as the focus was still on me. And despite me trying to be fast, it just didn't look like they wanted to pass on to the next girl. Of course, those were just things on my mind. I know it's very hard to learn skills without a class, but did you manage any active one? It seemed that in this world there were passive skills that were always in effect and active ones that required spending mana to activate them. Under the table, I rotated my thumbs onto one another while replying with a soft voice, I've learned the skill freezing. His mouth opened feeling surprised by it, you must have worked super hard for it, a similar reaction spread through the four of them as, while not the most amazing thing, it was still something that didn't come out easily, unlike the skill everyone gets by getting a class, to get one solely on high effort and talent built on repetition was praiseworthy, but the real question remains, he gazed at me, determined, causing my face to become even redder, why yes, I shrieked nervously, receiving a small smile out of sympathy from the girl to my left. Most skills have different mastering stages, while the very first ones would cause for you to need to be at blank point range to be able to freeze someone. My head nodded, showing him I understood, knowing about it from my dad's long lessons. So, what can you do with it? I aimed my hand at him, causing his happy, curious face to turn into a more serious one, and then I lowered it to his mug of beer, freeze. They couldn't see a blue circle under my feet, since the table was on the way, but they sighted upon a lighter one on my hand, almost white. As this went on, the liquid began moving bit by bit, cooling down, and then I stopped to preserve my mana, which wasn't a lot as I was still level 1. Notice, system consumed 20 mana, without a second to waste, he grabbed it, oh my, it's quite cold. The men laughed at his words, and then he took a sip, by the goddess. This is the best tale ever. Quickly the other two had a glint of jealousy in their eyes, at the sensation Rise's tongue was having. Turning towards me while extending their cups with a pleading expression, they looked very much like little saint. Whenever I was about to give him a chicken leg with some juicy, tender meat around it, I'm no cooling service. I complained in my mind, unable to do so through my mouth. As I felt a hint of pity towards them, I sighed and grabbed the ales, causing less mana to be necessary because of no channeling distance. Once I finished, a hint of sweat dripped from my forehead, the system drained me, notice, system consumed 30 mana, it's done, I began blowing some hot hair at my hands, a side effect of not channeling it via distance, but at least it had consumed less energy, they glanced at each other, smiling happily, and then at the ale lifting it and gulping it all down, the three of them banged the table with their empty cups while stretching their bodies, with their heads leaning backward, with a satisfied smugness upon their lips. What a blessing, they murmured blissfully in unison, ignoring them. My eyes glanced at the mysterious girl who didn't have a chance to introduce herself because of the silliness of these men. What's your name? I smiled faintly at her, rubbing my hands against one another. I'm Tanya. I have the natural class. Mainly because I'm fond of tracking wild animals with my father and grandfather, they're proficient hunters and I'm also capable with a knife, Natura? I questioned with a hint of curiosity, 
as I had yet to meet someone with such a class. That class is the reason we took her in, Rise added softly, slowly recovering from the earlier drink. She'll receive the ability necessary to find paths that lead to our prey, be it beasts or monsters. Of course, some are quite intelligent, thus an exceptional, experienced tracker will be necessary. My eyes glanced at her, who had a smug filled with happiness planted on her face, while my mind pondered at the information I once read. I suppose that's what the system meant with Natcha having both utility and support. In a whispering tone, I called out for status skill as my ears paid attention to their conversation. Notice, system consumed two mana. Status. Level, 1, experience, 0 100, health, 16 16 mana. 2072 strength 1 vitality 16 endurance 3 agility 1 dexterity 0 intelligence 1 wisdom 24 status points 0 class job farmer beginner fame 1510 disgrace 3850 race human name iris 14 years old affiliation plus soul plus Titles plus, achievements plus, skills plus, job plus, elements plus, soul bound plus. If there's a job today, I glanced at the party leader in doubt. Then I'll only have one more freezing spell left. As if matching my worries, he added further, now that the introductions are over, let's discuss the formation we'll be using. His hand went below the table and soon retrieved some darkened stones, placing them on the brown surface. Uphill now. We've been at it as a triangle, his fat fingers made an equilateral form with a gesture. With Rise in the front, Chris, the swordsman, added, with Tania's skills, she'll be in front now leading our way, and Iris can stay at our rear with our food and tools. Basically, what a normal helper would go for. Rise looked into the two of us, receiving our consensus in the form of a nod. By the system laws, it is important to know that you'll solely go with us to earn money a commission for joining our quest as helpers. I kept my focus on his gaze, containing a hint of curiosity at what he was trying to convey. This means that the experience will go for the three of us adventurers. After all, the one who delivers the final blow receives the experience. I let my mouth open and then close, understanding what he meant by the system's laws. I didn't know there was a rule like that. That's fine, Tanya added with an unbothered expression. He looked at me. At what I also agreed, not wanting to become greedy for the rewards, nor get in their way. In addition, any goods we may collect from them will become money. And if you two do your job properly, a portion of it will become the tip. At that, Tania smiled, satisfied with his wording. It's a good thing to clarify the terms from the get-go. The young men nodded at her words. So, what's the mission? My initiation got hold of their gazes once more this time not feeling embarrassed by it as my interest and focus lay elsewhere. He took out the quest paper and placed it on top of the table. Most people in the guild don't know how to read, so let me explain the details. I pulled it, summarizing its contents. We need to hunt some orcs, who've been pestering the southeast territories. Rise whistled, amazed, causing a similar expression among the rest. Seems like the instructor wasn't wrong about you. Chris added with some respect in his tone, however, reminded of the woman in question. I responded sincerely, I don't feel like that after being overwhelmed by her swordsmanship. They burst into laughter at my words, causing me to feel confused. She's truly something else. I still remember the day our weapons clashed. Chris looked upward with a grin while gripping the pommel of his sword. I questioned curiously while staring deep into his eyes. Did Rebecca beat you too? The instructor defeated me with ease, but next time I'll beat her, our gazes matched, allowing me to notice the fiery glint on his expression. That's not a bad goal, I added, thinking about also making it mine, isn't the instructor in the rankings? Brooke added with a cool gleam to him, what are those? Tanya asked unsure, my eyes took a glimpse of his arms lowering, retrieving what looked like a piece of paper, a small one, yet of a different material. This is my adventurer card, he showed it to the two of us, me and Tanya, it is some information regarding us, as you can see, it included the name, age, adventurer rank, and points, these points increase as we complete the quests we complete, once there is enough, the rank changes, it starts from F, 
and it goes one level higher to E, where I'm at. Of course that there are a lot more above this one, each with its own respective missions and difficulties. We the helpers looked at each other with awkward faces, in a way with high expectations for the future. But of course, the two of us were naive for the adventurers that are in the top 100 of our kingdom. Those are the ones whose cards include numbering rankings along with the letters. For example, rank S with the number 1 would be the best one. That's amazing. The two of us shouted with astonishment, sharing a will of wanting to achieve higher, I guess that would be the peak. My mind wandered merrily, attempting to calculate how much money I'd get for my parents if I managed to reach that far. Amidst my thoughts, there was one that indulged some doubts. What am I supposed to do at the rear? You keep an eye on our surroundings and after we defeat some enemies, you collect the materials and bring them along. The leader explained with a soft smile. So. I'm a luggage carrier. They laughed at my reply. Well, yeah, but we'll also teach you the basics to become an adventurer. The same lessons others have instructed us with. Rises A's glanced at all of us as if seeking some sort of confirmation. At that my shoulders shrugged, not feeling discontent with his words. No matter how much I desired to become an adventurer, there were some steps to be taken, like everyone else. And I was not special, no, I was one of many one out of ten million others, and this was my first step toward the future. 8. Chapter 24 After getting our fill of drink and food, we took a stroll to one of the rooms of our guild. To my surprise, there was a floor underground with many storerooms. Chris told us parties could rent them. This allowed everyone to save their equipment and adventuring tools, but also to put great quantities of loot for receptionists to exchange for rewards. It was in one of these rooms where my back received a big bag to carry, officially speaking. I was now the luggage cart, and also their rear shield for the quests to come. Thus begins the newbie tradition. The men roared at us, raising their fists in the air, to which we mimicked. And so, we made our way outside, listening to Rise, who didn't take long to shift into a more serious side. From here onward, we'll be looking for prey. Then, the day we believe the two of you are ready. We'll set you up for a promotion. I nodded lightly, feeling confused about the first part. Do we get something from hunting random foes? Yes, Tanya. Everyone, no matter their race, has a soul stone inside of them. We can deliver these to the Adventurers Guild, not only for money but also for points. I let out a tiny shout by accident, surprised at his words. That was a piece of information I hadn't heard from my parents. What kind of creature will we track today? Boss Brook hit the top of his torso twice with his long spear while walking next to Rise, who thought of the possibilities. Our quest requires orcs, but those usually move in groups, and they're tough bastards. He glanced to the side over his left shoulder in our direction, quickly returning to the front after waving his head. They're definitely not ready to fight those. We could go for shroomies, Tanya added casually, noticing how they were having a hard time deciding. I've tracked some of them before with my dad. That's an F-ranked creature, Chris placed his hand on the pommel, smirking confidently at that choice. All right, let's go with that. With the party leader's confirmation, we went southwest, further than I've ever stepped my feet on. Beyond the place where I trained and learned how to survive with my mother, there was to my surprise, a small plain with an even denser forest awaiting us. After entering it, Rise's hand signaled us to halt. Let's set camp here. Brooke and Tanya go look around us and report if you find anything, as they began moving, the man next to the girl added, leave your bag with them, ah, right, she walked over to me, dropping it by my feet, good luck, I faintly smiled at her while waving my hand, leave it to me, Iris, as my eyes stuck on her back, a voice next to me came forth, Iris, wear this, it might come in hand, this is, my hands received what looked like a belt with leather pouches in an orb's shape. Potions. We buy them from the alchemists and merchants. Reminded of my dad's boss's job. I nodded, being a tad familiar with it. My hands then placed the belt that covered my waistline fully, leaving it up to my fingers to open one of the pockets which retrieved a potion. This red one heals our health slowly, and the blue one on the left side recovers mana. The best way to use them is to drink or to apply it directly to the wounds, Chris explained merrily, pointing out which was which, and what pockets they were in. 
he went as far as to gesture on how to open and close with the most efficiency. With his explanation, I understood these things were far from omnipotent and that, at best, they would heal wounds like cuts and bites. Sadly, worse things like losing a limb or even a part of our body like an arm were not enough. However, good ones, unlike these, could help with closing wounds, but not even the best potion of Vicent could replenish the blood lost, as the one in the rear. It becomes your role to support us in any way that you can. Rise stepped in, opened one bag, and retrieved a pouch that moved and made watery sounds. Once he removed the lid, he took a sip and handed it our way. Thank you. I smiled briefly, consuming a tad, refreshing my insides after a long walk. Despite being used to exercising to some extent with my mother, having to carry a fairly heavy bag was something my body was not used to. Thus, I felt more tired than usual. Not to disregard the mental fatigue from using my ice element for the ales. In the worst likely scenario of finding a ferocious enemy, your job is to drop everything and run straight to the guild to request help. So in a way. It's not an easy one as the smart enemies won't allow you to escape easily. At his words, I gulped, realizing that there was more to it than I initially thought. Rise is right, but don't let it get to your head, otherwise it'll exhaust you mentally. Now, regarding the rules of adventuring, at least our group ones, the leader placed some stones in a circle, preparing what looked like a fireplace. Shall I go find some wood? His eyes widened before they locked onto me. It seems like you know how to handle yourself. He smiled before focusing on the ground once more. Yes, my mother forced me to learn it. It was one of the requirements that my parents made so that I could join the guild. Tough fellows. The swordsman added, scratching his short, brown hair. But I respect that. Indeed, it's a lot better than starting from zero, and having to learn everything at once. I grinned alongside Chris. It also makes you less of a dead weight for the entire party. Despite the harsh words, my emotional side took it quite well, as I didn't feel any harm from them. If anything, my heart was grateful for Chris' honest side. I was here to learn and to help with everything I could. Leave it to me. I shouted some hyped words at them, causing a brief reassuring smile to spread across their faces. By the way, Iris, I rarely ask about this type of thing, but your appearance is quite distinctive, his eyes glanced over me from hair to neck. How so? My head tilted slightly to the left, causing my long hair to flow near my shoulder and arm. Well, you're blonde and your eye color is beautiful. His cheeks became rosy, feeling embarrassed by the way he described it. From the embarrassment, he swayed his face away from mine, quickly correcting himself. I, I meant that they're green, you know? He shouted without ill intention, making me giggle. Guess I wasn't the only one feeling nervous. I placed my hand over my heart, which beat fast, not only from his unexpected compliment but also from being in a new place. It hadn't been uncommon for this or that boy for the past years to confess themselves to me, or even to say pretty words. In fact, it wasn't only guys, but a few girls who had done so, too. After all, my physique was quite distinct as he had mentioned, and sometimes the further we are from the common folk, the more enticing we become to some people. Plus, I was quite cute, or so my mother would constantly tell me. Thank you. I smiled briefly, averting my gaze from him. Since you two are so lovey-dovey, how about you go fetch some wood? Not at all. We complained in unison at Rise, who laughed after mocking us. But yes, it'll become even colder soon, so let's find some for the fireplace. The swordsman began moving towards the woods halting after a few steps, taking a glimpse at me. All right, my eyes glared at the leader, whose laughter didn't seem to end any time soon, catching up with Chris. Don't take him wrong, he means no harm. I smiled at him, not feeling bad about anything. It did not differ from the conversations with the kids from the village, and this one, too, had been funny. None of them looked old. At most, the leader looked to be two, maybe three, years older than me. How long have you been an adventurer? We're second years, but we haven't been the most active party, otherwise, we could be higher in ranks. He took out a rope from his bag, pointing with his right index finger at the branches on the ground. Was there a reason? Well, Brooke had an incident a year ago. His gaze leaned downwards, fading from my sight along with the smile he once had. Should I question him further? 
my head swayed to the sides, knowing that getting into other people's personal lives was not something my mother taught me to do. If he's willing to tell me, all good, if not, it's fine too. I got hold of the third stick, pushing the subject away, not that one. He placed a hand on top of mine, removing it from the wood, it's wet, it'll be hard to burn, right? I moved mine away from his, latching onto a distinct branch, this time an old looking one. Once my hand lifted it, I showed it to him with a smile, to which he consented with a brief thumbs up. So, what is the wood for? Upon my sudden question, his eyes widened, and his right eyebrow raised. Then he smiled before opening his lips, it has many uses. Making a fireplace is a bad idea. You're right, Iris, but we won't survive the night without it. I muttered an almost inaudible sound, thinking to myself, do they really want to sleep in this place? My eyes looked around, finding a dark looking forest, whose trees were naked of leaves and fruits. It was plain cold, the way that snow bargained the territory of the entire place, leaving only a couple of things out there to be noticed, big ones like rocks, be it as it may, not everything was bad since it was like watching black and white, and unless our enemies would burrow themselves under the fluffy texture, we would notice them. Haven't seen any monster yet. My voice came out with a hint of disappointment as the places my mother took me were harsh to survive but devoid of enemies though there were a few times she thought a foe was close by, only to mistake it for wild animals, despite their many races, they were abundant, and they lived among all, only to be murdered and consumed, from the number of animals I murdered in the last years, a sigh left my mouth as they hadn't contributed to the famous experience gauge, nor did they help with leveling up, at least they filled the bellies of my family, a brief smile passed through my tiny lips, justifying my heart of all its sins. It's rare to see newbies happy, they're usually more scared, unless they're scarier than my mother. I think I'll be fine. We exchanged serious looks, ending up laughing at each other. That's scary, ah, uh, I nodded a few times faking my arms to tremble. Usually the scary one is the father, his eyes gazed upon the nearest tree, to the very top of it. Speaking of personal experience, I giggled, causing him to face me, you could say that. Is your dad also a swordsman? He grabbed the pommel, staring down at it, smiling. He's actually just a humble farmer. Oh. I rose my hands surprised. Don't tell me it's your mum. Laughed to left his mouth. Not at all. She helps him. Regarding swordsmanship, everything I know was self-learned. That to say, that I know little. The class doesn't give knowledge. It gives skills that help with combat. Not so much as how to become a better swordsman, though. I see. Since I was not interested in the classes my parents possessed, I hadn't inquired either about their details, so for me, this was a learning experience, but it originated some questions. With no guidance from the system classes, how are we supposed to master them? If I had asked him instead, using them would be what he would tell me, the white robes dictated that God's creation was made to be smoothly used and adapted to us. Thus, it all came down to self-discovery and curiosity, both of which had been my learning tools. Think we have enough, Iris. He began tying up the branches into a single thicker one. Sure, worst case we can look for a few more if necessary. Need help with your share? No, I'm good, thank you. We sorted everything up and returned to the camp. 7. Chapter 25 Each took a flock of wooden dry sticks back on our backs, held by a rope that kept them tight and together. It didn't take too long for us to return, slightly more time than for us to go out and explore, mainly because of the weight that came with us on our shoulders, we hadn't gone far per se, it was important to stick close to the camp in case we got ourselves into trouble, or the other members did. Sticking to each other was likely going to increase our odds of survival, not that they were too low as long as we were careful with our choices, or so they had told me. Welcome back, the leader opened his arms welcoming us. Looks like the harvest was bountiful. I nodded at his observation, placing my pilot head further away from the fireplace that was now lit up, taking a peek and noticing the surrounding snow being dissolved gradually, the earth was visible around the rocks that protected the crispy branches Rise had used, perhaps he had dug some of it away so that the water from the melted snow wouldn't extinguish the flame. Around the bright core nested five brown sleeping bags. This made me aware of their resolution to spend the night outside, 
thanks to the moon season, we'd be sleeping on top of a cushion made by nature itself. In a way, it would be better than the ruthless painful surface of the ground composed of unbalanced earth and diverse sized pebbles. My eyes caught sight of Chris, who looked around with an eyebrow raised. Rise, shouldn't they have returned by now? Hum. He looked to the path where they moved to not too long ago, pondering on the matter. They shouldn't have gone too far, I added softly, feeling my muscles tensing up from the nervousness that spread from the surrounding men. Chris began walking towards the way they had gone and then I saw Rise's hand falling onto his shoulder, stopping his figure from taking another step. Let's wait a bit more, Brooke is with her. At the very least, one of them would have made it back if things were bad. They traded serious glances for a bit, leading to Chris taking a seat near the tree, grabbing onto his sword preparing for the worst. Realizing that things were becoming worse, I positioned myself at the rear, in the direction of home, in case they decided to escape. Everything was better than dying here, even if I had to abandon Tania and Brooke. My mother had made sure I understood that much. My hand followed through by adding two of the sticks I'd brought to the fire, making sure that the tracker and her bodyguard would see the light in this vast darkness of the moon season. To give them a chance to return, to not lose themselves in these dreadful white plains which happened to be the perfect place for a graveyard. I felt their gazes falling on me, but neither uttered a word. Thus, in my eyes, they saw the blaze playing with the branches at the way the flame nibbled at the wood, turning it to red and yellower tones. And I must admit that watching over the fireplace brought some calm to my heart. A strange feeling that kept my feet on the ground, disabling my emotions from becoming a burden. Be cold like ice in every situation, I muttered the ruthless words my mother had told me during times of need. They had guided my fragile, awkward self years ago, and surely, they would keep me on track for the following ones, or so hopeful my heart remained. They'll return, I told the two of them convicted, unwilling to accept losing these new companions, expecting that they hadn't gone too far from the frontier, whereas the protection of the Saintess wouldn't reach, especially now during the moon season when it was at its weakest. They better, Chris added unhappily, turning his gaze to the side, to the opposite side of where I remained. My shoulder shrugged at that and a sigh escaped my mouth, allowing the tiny cloud of mist to be swallowed by the flames, blowing a portion of them gently with the little strength it had. Enemies, enemies. The scout shouts arrived at us from afar and with them the noise of stomping. I glanced over at the two men close by, noticing their nervous expressions and the way they stood up, unsheathing their weapons. Take cover there. We'll pincer them from the sides. Without muttering a word. Rise ran as fast as he could, standing in front of Chris, leaving me and the fire as the top vertice of the triangle. They remained behind a tall and fat tree, each on their own as they waited for the scouts to arrive. Enemies, enemies behind. I saw Tania and Brooke jumping in between the two of them, right into the center of our formation. What the hell is happening? The leader shouted, monitoring the source of the continuous sounds of what appeared to be a charge that was coming in our direction. Brooke patted the shoulder of Tania and they turned around to the noise, preparing their weapons. Whatever it was, they were keen to fight it. From the rear I kept looking, anticipating as the ground shook, causing my heart to tremble with exhilaration, causing me to bite my tongue to calm down. And from the dark, brown figures charged at us with four muscled legs, long and dangerous looking fangs on each side of their mouths. The tusk boars, monsters capable of running over fiends, large enough to outdo two or three humans in a ramming contest, with red eyes that glared into our bodies, exuding our courage and thinning out every layer of our inner strengths. Their skin looked thick, covered partially by fur that extended from the top of their heads to their long yet thin tails. Prepare for the impact, Brooke blurted, aiming the tip of the spear at the closest one. In the worst case, he'd take the full impact in exchange for taking the life of one of them with him, or so the young man hoped, clenching his teeth, readying out every ounce of his strength. I understood then as the monstrous animal charged that we'd all die here if no one came with something more. I aimed my hands at the ground between the trees and exuded my freezing skill on the snow. From my experience, trial, and error, 
I learned that changing water to my element consumed less mana, even less if it was snow. The brilliant color of my blue circle made my teammates aware that I was about to do something. But their gazes remained on the monsters who intended to run us over, trusting me with whatever was about to happen. Notice, system consumed 20 mana. I fell on my knees after spending my leftover mana. Had I not wasted it on their beer, the power would have allowed me to do more. Aim lower. Vale's lip. Brooke changed his posture according to his words, understanding foremost what I had done. The rest quickly realized what had changed, and they were thankful for having me with them. I crawled behind the nearest tree, hiding, struggling to not lose consciousness because of the lack of mana which directly affected my mind. Meanwhile, the first beast went through and as it was, its feet slid erratically, tripping, and even twisting its hocks, meeting with the sharp tip of Brook who didn't allow this chance to be wasted hitting the incoming mouth with a piercing skill. And the wailing from the damaged creature echoed through the nudity of the forest, infuriating its kin. Blinded by fury, the rest came along. Four more through the fallen body, their size bigger than us humans, their raw power ampler than we could hope for. Shit, it's stuck. Despite his struggles in pulling out the spear, the rest of the creatures came all the way. Accidentally, one of them even went against the deceased boar, clashing with it. Unable to withstand the impact a yell left the young man. Brooke then fell on his ass from the collision, being hit by the front section of the big corpse, having his weapon completely impaled, and impossible to take out alone. I could say the same about his legs, which remained underneath the large corpse. Watch out! The girl next to him yelled, jumping in with her knife cutting slightly lower than the beast's size, failing the bullseye. Thus, the wild boar resisted and shook its head to her side, forcing the small metal to fly out of her hand, leaving three fingers numb and her soft yell to follow. The two beasts took over Chris and Rise, each attacking a single one of my allies. Their strength imperiled their lives, and without a numerical advantage, the odds began running out. You were supposed to look for shroomies. Brooke complained, mind filled with despair at the beast, whose mouth increased in size to get a chomp at him. Upon his bold and defiant response, Tania's eyes became watered as she did her best to find something to hold the beast down, fretting everywhere she looked. The leader's voice echoed, realizing the situation was only growing worse by the second, grabbing the beast's attention to him. Run guys, run to the village. As much as Brooke wanted to go with them, the creature didn't allow it. It chomped his shoulder, pressing its weight onto his chest, and he yelled loudly in pain for everyone to hear, I'm coming. Despite many struggles to go to his encounter, my mind didn't listen to me, my commands over my body were null and all I could do was suffer silently as the wild boars killed my companion, the screams followed, and the roars of the creatures did, too. Eventually, I realized I was behind to serve as food for them perhaps a dessert, and my body shook at the continuous sounds of their mouths chomping down, gnawing with their fangs and crude teeth on Brooke's flesh, tearing muscles and bones apart like they were not sturdy at all. I clenched my fists and teeth, understanding finally what an adventurer was all about, and why it wasn't a remarking jobs for one to have. After all, we humans were the weakest of all the beings in this world, Artana. It felt simpler to just allow the saintess blessing to defend the kingdom. She didn't need adventurers or knights. The goddess had blessed her after all. How? How could this have happened? Was the question I struggled to understand. Weren't they experienced adventurers? And in my confusion, I recollected their ranks and our conversations. The fireplace and the scouting during the dark, and the piles of hints propagated eventually leading to an incident that had happened long ago with their other party. Had there been more deaths? I panicked, clenching my palms with the curved nails of my fingertips. If there was desperation in my life, it had been nothing till my next thought. Will they eat me next? I gulped those words down in an attempt to bury them so low that they wouldn't come out to the surface and become true, causing me to close my mouth and nose with both hands so they wouldn't hear my breathing. The cracking of bones made my eyes look higher into the night, and I pushed the back of my head against the trunk of the tree that kept me hidden. The pain from doing so kept me steady, panting, and feeling like my heart would fly out of my mouth at any given moment. Once I heard the footsteps going away, a twisted smile surfaced on my face. I felt relieved that the danger was going away, 
leaving my defenseless self behind with all my might. I hoped it to be like that and the will to run away was excessively grand. I did what I could to not move. Instead, I remembered the days, the ones when my family mistreated me, the ones from my past life. They helped me to remain frozen and I began recollecting my mother Rosalind's lessons. Still unstable. I took out my sword, placing it carefully between my legs. I used it to get on my knees, and then, with its support, I stood somewhat firm. Like a cane, I used it to take me to the darkened camp. The fire was no longer in effect. Its brilliance disappeared along with Brooke's life. I didn't feign ignorance at the rest of his body, at the parts that remained scattered along with some tattered clothing. I'm sorry Brooke. A tear slid down to my cheek in the greenery inside my twinkling eyes. I saved that scene, a deadly memory of my future if I didn't become a better adventurer. I don't want an adventure that will lead to my death, that thought was my newly gained resolution. I had heard his suffering, the pain of being ripped to pieces, understanding why my father didn't want me to become an adventurer, and why my mother hadn't been at it for long during her prime. Every piece fitted the harsh and arduous lessons provided by them. The many warnings about putting my life at risk. The countless scenarios that my mother drilled into me. I'm so weak, and that marked the designation of who I was as a whole. I got hold of my things, lifting them in the air, hearing the drops falling from the now wet ground. My hand quickly dropped them and I left through the route we had taken. I learned that bringing things with a scent of blood only triggered predators to chase after my trail. Thus I ran holding on to the clean sword with my left hand. Through the cold and snowy night, I escaped with my life intact, to tell the tale of Brooke to any who might want to listen. 9. Chapter 26 With a bang, I opened the guild's door, and I saw how people's eyes were directed almost instantly at me, just like they were expecting someone. As I took some steps inside, the staff on the side approached me cautiously. Miss, swords must be kept inside there. I glanced at him. Hearing him spouting the words, realizing that my hand was still gripping it, frozen even. It stuck, I rotated my wrist, placing my palm on the ceiling, allowing him to see the icy areas from my sweat. His left hand fell on my shoulder as he pointed to a location, telling me to tag along. We stopped by a fireplace, one of three in the guild altogether, despite being far from one another. They made up a triangle to warm up this entire floor. Once the connection melted, my weapon fell to the ground, doing a clacking sound a few times. I felt the burnt on my palm that the ice left, leaving a shape of intact skin in the part where the sword was. I glanced at the vivid meat, and it reminded me of Brooke. His remnants haunted my mind, and I yelled and wept loudly. Silence reigned, and I found my hand healed up thanks to a fellow in the guild. Seated next to me was Tania with shallow, red eyes. Her mind was likely regretting tracking the clues she had found. They had cost Chris an arm and broke his life, but I didn't utter a word. There was no way for her to know what trail that one belonged to. It was a risky task, and they decided to do it during the night. Brooke stepped on snow. He cracked a branch beneath it. Tania finally spoke, and we heard her whimpering words, understanding that the creature heard the noise. Walking on snow is dangerous. Even more so during the night, an older man spoke across the table, taking a sip of his drink. There was no sign of sadness in his voice. A hint of disappointment perhaps. It was not by chance that the quests for low-level adventurers were the easiest, but they, too, could pose a risk to one's life. A group of task bores came. Just how far were you guys in? South from here by the frontier. The old man took another sip after widening his eyes in surprise. From his words, Tania's fingers curled, holding her anger and frustration for a job wrongly done. Out of all of us, she was likely the one feeling the worst. Rise was further away, staying by the side of Chris, whose shoulder was being bandaged. There was no coming back from losing that arm, at least not if it was lost to a beast. Potions could heal wounds, but only powerful magic could glue an arm to a shoulder. My father had explained the knowledge of such arts and it was normal for it to change in the future. New inventions were things humans were likely to bring out, more often if it wasn't for the closure of information to most people, as we belong to the lowest social class, as miserable as this situation was, it was likely that this party was over, the instructor would make sure of it once the news reached her ears. I grabbed Tania's hands with my own, 
You did what you could. She nodded slightly, but her saddened expression didn't change. All I could do was spark a tiny light of hope. The spoon in front of us landed on a warm soup. Adventurers die all the time. It's a horrible job. The man declared, showing us his teeth. Well 80% of them as some were missing. Most yellow along with a few black ones with holes. My gaze slipped away from his bold smile, appreciating the words that he gave, but the truth was that we had been too weak and slow to save everyone. If there was a divinity of misfortune, he or she had certainly touched Brooke that moment, right before his feet landed on the snow. Aria, I named her name, the goddess who overlooked humans. However, I shook my head to the sides slowly and only twice. If there were more entities like her, then she wouldn't have been the culprit. I sighed, realizing that the gods were not at fault, and neither was luck. It laid all but in one person, himself. Poor Brooke. Pity remained stuck in my mind along with all the scary noises that I recollected from that moment. My stomach growled, not from hunger, but from sickness. I had held on throwing up far too many times now and I was at my limit, and the moment my body tried to get up, I felt Tania's hands sheltering themselves in mine. She wasn't satisfied yet. Breathe Iris, breathe, and I did, deeply, inhaling whatever smell was around, painting in my mind the diverse scents, replacing many atrocities. The smell of branches burning, the aroma of the man's mushroom soup, I rested my cheek on the table and then continued, the smell of the dust and wood and I finally realized the most important thing. I was human and my life was short. This was the beginning of my path, to be strong enough to protect my parents, what I took as the ultimate goal. However, it was clearly far from my reach, and knowing that made it rather painful. My soul properties were not bad, but it wasn't significant enough to cause a meaningful change. If I had the right amount of power to save Brooke's life, or even to slay the five creatures that came through, that would have been a dream come true. We were weak, and I stumbled upon the condolences that the staff from the guild gave to Chris with his dominant hand lost. His future was bleak, as if receiving some sort of confirmation. He got up and glanced at us briefly, walking hastily to the exit with his head down. Chris. I mumbled in a trembling, soft voice, without wanting him to actually hear me. There were no words that could cheer him up, and if there were any, I didn't know them. My heart tightened, leaving everything that had happened, feeling like nothing but a nuisance. It pissed me off how careless we had been, at the way I didn't tell them what to do, the things my experienced parents taught me. But I wasn't the leader. I scorned such words in my mind, finding a justification for the passiveness within me. I. I shrouded myself in the secrecy of my heart, ugly as it was whenever pain came at me, it resented everything, hiding such emotions from my family and friends, bottling all of it inside, couldn't wait to get back home and write my feelings in the black book, just like magic, it eased my mind whenever I vented in it. And I wrote a lot these past years, even more so whenever something happened between me and the teens from the village, the disputes we had the plays and conversations, the bonds, the good and the bad. And like a drug, my hand shook, wanting to head back home, fill a page, maybe two or three, and watch as all the pain went away. The vibrations got sheltered by Tania's embrace as her fingers rubbed softly on my own. It must have been her way of taking care of me, retribution for my actions and words. Thank you, and I held on to it without looking at her. I heard her mutter softly, but I don't think there were any words. It was more like a plain sound of conformity, yet it was a good enough answer for both of us. The guild staff dissolved the party, causing both of me and Tania to lose our place in it. And now I had to wait for a new one to take me in. The following day I would have news. So instead of staying there, my feet took me home. As usual, Little Saint approached me, but with his keen nose, he did not jump on me. He halted and waited, and I kneed in front of him and hugged his large neck. My eyes focused on the waving of his tail, it was slower than usual. I could tell my pet wanted to play, that little saint was holding back, but it was all I really needed at that moment and that was what I received, grateful for his presence and kindness. It didn't take long for me to speak with my parents about what happened, to receive their comfort, but also their rigidness, their warnings were not in vain, I made sure to tell them that, but I had trained for this all my life. I still didn't want to let it end there, but there was no way that I would accept my death.
To be fair, I didn't think anyone would ever pursue it. At night, before bed, I lighted up my hand with tones of light blue, and below it was the open book. Between my fingers, one of the few pencils I had left, and with it, I wrote, Day 6 of the Moon Season, Year 5014. I, Iris, lost my first companion. His name was Brooke, a tall boy who wielded a spear. I didn't get to know him well enough, since everything happened too fast. But he seemed nice and I could tell the other two, Chris and Rise liked him a lot, possibly like a brother. The two of them were the ones who shed the most tears, especially Chris, who lost his arm, and even his future as an adventurer. The lady from the staff told me there weren't many one-handed adventurers, it was quite an arduous feat to achieve. Indirectly, I believe that she was telling me he would retire that day, or in the near future, it was just like that, I saw the sad way he spoke with the staff and the way he left without telling us girls anything, not even me, I thought he would have told me something, anything, I don't know why I had that expectation, but, my eyes rose from the paper momentarily and I glanced over at my room window before continuing to write, the moon is yellow today and huge e e e, I'm still not okay, not after what I saw and heard, and I couldn't express myself to my mother, I wasn't able to tell her how much her training saved me from the animals, I killed back then, the blood, and everything that came with it, all the way to cooking, if it wasn't for that, I think, I would have been too shocked to move, or maybe I would have run and gotten caught, instead of waiting for a chance, she made me tough, now, more than ever, I'm grateful to have her as my mother. A tear slid down my eye onto the book, one after another, a soft rain hitting the pages, causing the book to shine, absorbing not only the letters but also the wetness. Why are you so magical? I questioned it in my thoughts, realizing, like many times before, that it wouldn't reply to me, and like in the past, this time around, there was no answer either. Tightly, I held onto the pencil and added my last words for the night, no matter what. I will not give up, I'll fight, become stronger, and next time, next time for sure, I'll make a difference, and I closed it, placing the book under my bed, the sole place that my mother never checked, good night, and I closed my eyes, hoping to sleep peacefully, that night, I had a nightmare, 10, chapter 27, the moment my eyelids opened, a very bright and yellow moon stood there, its closeness made me wonder if the tips of my fingers could touch it, the moonlight was peculiarly intense, aimed at something below which my eyes quickly followed. It astonished me how the ray of light became whiter the lower it went. Only when my sight reached the bottom that I perceived a silhouette, it appeared to be a girl. The most astonishing detail was how her incredible long hair floated upwards, leaving her bare pale and beautiful naked back reflecting the moonlight. For instances I swore she was the moon. However the more I approached, the clearer it became that they were two different entities, henceforth, I kept observing her through day and night as time passed by in rapid succession, other figures passed by, young and old, men and women alike, some with peculiar appearances that were clearly not human, but all of them had something in common, they evaded her encounter with disdain in their eyes, the darkness was her only friend, wherever she went, it followed, under the sun, it became her shadow, and below the veil of the nocturnal sky, it turned into something more, she looked distinct from my friends, her eyes were icy blue, and her hair was white, silky smooth, and long, very much with an enviable quality, and in a way, she resembled me, for my friends, I too was different, possessing an unnatural blonde color, that turned out to be alright after a while since my mother also had it, thanks to her, I didn't feel alone or unloved, and through some effort, I managed to befriend a few villagers, but the girl in front of me was all alone, making me want to say something to change that, to do whatever I could to help her feel better. Yet my feet didn't move, for I had seen the shadow move behind her before, and the unknown scared me. I was and still am a coward. Even in my dreams I only run. So, I gripped my hands, clenched them tightly onto my skin, and I dared to make a difference. This was, after all, a dream. Nothing could potentially go wrong or so I thought. Thus, with a step forward, one after the other, 
I approached both during the night sky where the moon poorly shone like before the shadow became a humanoid figure, and its arms blocking my path from reaching her out of my way. My hand shone in tones of blue preparing to freeze it if necessary. Suddenly as it felt threatened a screech followed, piercing my eardrums, causing my head to hurt. Freeze. I shouted as loudly as possibly touching the darkness itself. I froze the humanoid from top to bottom turning it into an ice sculpture. Stay there quiet, will you? The scary silhouette didn't give me any kind of answer, it couldn't. I went to the girl encounter, facing her. Hello I'm Iris. To my disappointment she didn't utter a word almost like she wasn't even seeing me, who was clearly in front of her. Hey. I'm talking to you. A little forcefully I shook her shoulders and I heard this entire space make a heart beating sound. What the? My eyes looked above and to the sides. The sky was dyed in blood and it covered some letters. Slowly they descended from the sky. Golden were they tone like the tales of Adana book. I felt the girl tremble and when our gazes met tears escaped the corners of her eyes. I could tell then that she could finally see me. You mustn't she coughed and I felt myself being pulled. My vision turning upside down and then further back something projected me. Once I managed to get up, there it was the half black and half blue figure in between us. Its hand caressing the girl whose eyes looked haze once again. So it's your fault, my legs rushed at it, hand shining far brighter than before and it left an aura of darkness attempting to consume me, but I dodged to the side and then with a dash, my arms embraced the figure that opposed me, freezing it. Please don't get in my way. I mean no harm. Black drops fell through its dark sockets shaking its head wanting to talk, to oppose me to the very end, willing to do anything it could, but to no avail. In my dreams, I was far stronger than ever, apparently capable of unleashing powers I hadn't even dream of. Quickly, before it released itself again, I turned to the girl next to me, and shook her a bit more violent than before. Wake up, wake up, to my surprise. A black aura expanded from her pushing me away. From within, a book shone causing me to recollect the one under my bed, but this one was far different, magnificent even, from the details of the cover, to the red letters I couldn't read. I'll freeze you too. And as soon as I said that, a malicious aura expanded from it, to a level far more intense than everything I had ever felt. I shook my head to the sides, that wasn't right not was it? I grinned at the despair, remembering the saintess who made my very inwards tremble. Now that had been true power, this one lacked in comparison. And when I thought the magical book would attack me, its aura went upward, pushing the golden letters away from the girl. The dark figure broke off from the ice with the help of such evil aura but it didn't chase after me. Its face looked above at the glorious golden symbols that I couldn't decipher by myself. I had failed to wake up the girl but against the two of them it was too much of an ordeal. Thus, I aimed what little power left in me and shot it upwards. The golden symbols shone and faded successively, causing them to resist my skill. The darkened silhouette stared at me and wailed with all its might causing my ears to bleed, forcing me to place my hands on top of them, causing me to yell in fear and pain. I didn't understand what was going on but it looked like the light itself was hurting the trio. But the white-haired girl didn't move nor did anything about it. It made me curious of the reason why. Was she alive? Why didn't she care about any of this? The dream started to feel like something more. If it was me, unable to do much more with my mana, I placed my hands on the light without thinking twice, intending to help her. But the moment I touched it, my hands ignited from the harm. I too wailed in despair feeling the blaze that wasn't meant for a human being, understanding the pain from the dark silhouette. Thus, I suffered, waking up from it, forcefully. Ah! I gasped for breath, looking down at my hands, cooling them off with my freezing. That had been the only thing I could think of amidst my drowsy state, and as far as logic went, it felt like a righteous action. Why? My confused self couldn't understand this heat and the way the temperature didn't drop no matter how much mana I spent. Because of my screams, my parents hurriedly barged in, shouting, What's wrong? My hands burn. I yelled back, lifting my hands in the air, showing them my hands surrounded by a blue aura. Confused, my father approached me, close enough to grab one of my hands, halt your magic. Upon his request, I stopped, feeling a burning sensation propagating yet again, followed by a lesser pain and his yellow aura illuminated the room, slowly becoming something more, heal, 
That was when my hand started to incinerate further for the first seconds, but the pain slowly disappeared, leaving my hands in a pleasant state. I extended my other hand to him, so he repeated the process, and thank goodness, he did. I don't get it. What happened Iris? My mother questioned me, half-dressed. She must have picked any clothes that were close by before coming to my room. I think I had a dream. Didn't I? I tilted my head to the left, trying to remember, but only a fog remained in its place. I. Ah. Uh, my mouth ran out of words. There were no traces of what I had gone through, not even of the pain I had just felt. Everything was mysteriously gone. Maybe you had a nightmare where you hurt your hands. Dad did his best to subdue my confused state. It was normal to have bad dreams, especially after horrible things happened. I'm sorry. My dad's hand reached out for the top of my head, patting it for a bit, softly. Then he kissed my forehead and wished me good night. My mother followed through and pulled the sheets up to my chin, passing softly on my hands, caressing them briefly, understanding that they were in good condition. She added a smile, wishing me better dreams. I nodded softly and then allowed myself to try again, clenching my fingers on the sheets, scared of what the dreamland had in wait. It wasn't until the afternoon of the following day, the ninth of the moon season, that the adventurers, a few from the more experienced ones, brought back what they could find of Brooke's body along with the gear we had lost there. They were nice enough to deliver the bags without seeking a commission out of it, meaning that the guild staff had handled this matter yesterday. From a small cart pulled by a vigorous man, we could see a white sheet covering what was inside. A woman, whose appearance looked slightly older than my mother, ran over to the cart in tears, quickly removing the lair, still not believing the story we had indirectly told her via the guild. Once she picked up the rest of what could be considered numb and analyzed it properly, that she fell on her knees, embracing the deteriorated meat. Watching her like that made me revoke the emotions of yesterday, the painful ones of hearing his last moments, that was the detail I hadn't told the guild, I couldn't, and in a way, that made me relieved, knowing that his mother wouldn't get to know about it, believing her son died as a proud member of the guild, Rise stood close by to her, he must have known his mother, I didn't hear anyone say anything, aside from the sounds the woman did, the silence was profound and impactful, almost cutting some of the air around, making us breathe as carefully as possible, my son, my poor son, the woman mumbled some words, lifting her chin, and looking up to the sky, took her a long while before adding something more, may the goddess area look over him, may his soul live on, many added in echo, mainly the few wearing white robes, the fellow priests part of the church of Astia village, a place I had never set my feet on, his soul, dad had told me about it, but from their words, it felt like they had a different perspective on what it was, yet, I didn't have the guts to question them now, not now at least, I took a deep breath, regaining some of my calmness and restoring my sanity, the priests took the body out of the cart, carefully placing it on the ground, mom, cremation or burial, her sorrowful eyes glanced over at the priest, and whimpering, glass breaking words followed, there's nothing to bury, the man held onto her thoughtfulness with open arms, picking every piece of him and making a pile, there wasn't much of a ceremony for a low born like us, but that was fine, to the villagers, it still had meaning, and it would ease the heart of Brooke's mother and even my own. Once it was done, they lit up a stick with fire magic and burnt the remnants from four different spots. May his soul find rest in the goddess's sanctuary, he declared finally, leaving the mother's heart with some hope, reducing her pain if only by a tiny bit. If Arya was a proper goddess, she would have saved him. I scorned her in my mind. The helplessness within me made me drive my emotions to anything else, to someone else, to her. Whilst that was not okay, she had become my scapegoat, and it helped me come to terms with my lack of power. After all, if she was a goddess and didn't bother to save him, how could I? I turned around, escaping from the smell of rotten burnt pork, the intense smell that propagated like a disease, and the smoke that would soon bring more tears out of my eyes. I was done crying. Thus I moved away from the cemetery, all the way to the faraway fountain in the center of the village where I took a seat and stared at the water running mysteriously by itself. Why were we born into this world? I pondered deeply whether there was an answer to my question, couldn't we live in a world just for humans?
I leaned my head forward and then shook it to the sides. That's not it. I recollected the war books humans had fought amongst themselves many times for territories and the like. The world belongs to the strongest side. That's it, isn't it? I grinned in a twisted manner at my conclusion. And because Brooke was weak, he died. My mouth returned to normal and my emeralds dimmed. He and I, grains of the same bag, such was an old saying from my own world. It meant that we were both humans and since our race had the least power in the system, it made both of us innately powerless. How will I protect my family if I can't even protect my companions? My right leg began shaking up and down as I became more and more anxious. My eyes caught a glimpse of my left hand. If only I had a teacher, I was in need of an expert for the ice element. There were ways to expand and improve my freezing skill, but my father didn't own such knowledge. Thus, my growth had halted, I still felt proud of what I had already achieved, a magical ability without as much as possessing a class. This meant that independent of the class I decided on, I'd keep it with me. If only I had managed to turn that entire area into ice. The chances were likely that as long as the creatures didn't have a mobility skill, they would have slipped on the icy ground, allowing my teammates to kill them. One of them had even died thanks to it, they are not invincible. I thought to myself, a bit more exalted. After all, if one died, others could too, but it needed preparation, and I needed tons more mana. However, my inner thinking turned into hope, a tiny light at the end of the tunnel that I had yet to walk through. I gripped my fingers on my knee, making the relentless shivering stop. The next time I'll do better. I recollected Brooke, deciding to get back to those creatures the next time we met. 8. Chapter 28 Year 5014 Day 9 of the moon season I heard what happened. We exchanged glances, how are you feeling? I feigned a smile, sensing the chilly wind breathing on my face, causing me to recollect the resentment of that day. I'm a lot better. How's your party tagging along? She kept staring at me for a bit longer, her way of making sure I was alright. Elise had become a good friend in the past years, and despite not ending up part of her adventuring group, our bond remained as tight. Yet, I really wanted to partake in a quest with her. One of the dreams we had since our younger days. I had been the biggest influence on her decision of quitting alchemy. She, too, wanted to explore the world alongside me, and in a way, that was all it took for her to join the guild. Calmly my eyes stole a glance at Joan playing around with Little Saint, or perhaps, the one being played. It was smarter than what the young man thought. This boy was the son of Rowan, the merchant friend of my parents, the responsible person for selling the goods from my small fields. Nevertheless, thanks to the snow, there was nothing for me to do in that regard. The leftover seeds were either frozen or buried below the whiteness of the typical greenery scenery I noticed during warmer seasons, and I wanted to help my parents in every way possible. Sure I could have taken a smaller job like the kids of my age do, but there was just something about exploring this secret world that kept me from such ordinary employment. It was potentially the consequence of living a life chained in a mansion. Consequently, I had taken this chance to be a helper and to do my best to promote to an adventurer. Oddly enough, the success rate was pretty high. It didn't take more than a season to reach such status. Nonetheless, I was currently in a predicament. Thanks to the awful starting point, it had been three days since I last heard from the guild. There were some plans for tomorrow, but they hadn't told me what they were about. Hopefully, I'll be part of a new team soon. I smiled eagerly at going back into action, not that I had much of it last time, if possible, a better one this time. The boy sat on the snow, eavesdropping on our conversation, crossing his legs and arms as little saint placed his head on top of my lap. Tired from running around, and of course receiving yet another dose of my patting, throughout its fluffy hair. Nothing like being an enormous ball of fur. Such was the abnormal coat my pet had during the cold seasons, and because of its body size, it often warmed my feet, which felt great, agreed Joan. Elise added, hoping for the best for my sake, we'll see how it goes. The three of us mumbled practically at the same time, is your grandfather still mad at you? At my question, Elise rolled her eyes, yes, I giggled at that, I'm sure he'll forgive you at some point. Ugh, that old man is so stubborn, 
She covered her face with her palm hiding whichever pain haunted her ever since that fateful day. The boy smiled, I'd be pretty upset if I had spent years teaching someone only for them to end up doing something entirely different. Yes, yes. Mr. Merchant to be. He rose his left hand, pointing at her with the index finger, unlike you, I'm almost done getting my merchant license. I laughed at their friendly banter, enjoying my time with both. Of all the kids in the village, these two were the ones I spent more time with. They had never set foot in my house but were at least allowed to be in the plains. My dad was awfully strict about having guests. When there were some, I wasn't allowed to leave my room or utter a sound. For my safety, it was important that I remained in the dark and that certain people didn't know about my existence. Even the staff at the guild were cautious once they realized I was his daughter. Yet, when I innocently questioned one of them about it, they simply told me he was famous for saving someone. Still, that hadn't been enough to uncover the truth. Perhaps it was better like that, but there were times when I felt like bursting through my room just to see what it was all about. However, I wouldn't be able to face my father's anger if that happened. I didn't want to suffer again. In the same manner as in my past life, just the possibility made me nervous to no end. Year 5014, Day 10 of the Moon Season. Let's do our best Tania, we exchanged a hug, giving peace to one another before walking outside the guild hall. Similar to the last time we camped near the creature's territory, except this time a tad further away, with a more spacious area for us to not be caught off guard as easily. Thank you for bringing wood, you're very welcome, Benjamin, I added with a faint smile toward our new party leader. To my side, a slender arm found itself around my neck. The instructor told us what happened, it was an unlucky incident. I kept quiet, hearing Bella's words filled with irony toward us, the two newcomers. I've finished tracking. Oh? Her arm left as she found a new shoulder to rest on. Tanya's one. The newcomer did her best to not say anything bad to Bella despite feeling uncomfortable about it, furrowing her eyebrows. Instead, she brushed it off, extending her arms to the side. I found a pack of shroomies 200 meters ahead. She pointed southwest, towards the place where our companion passed away. Very good. Any clue about the said tusk boars? He contracted his eyes, knowing we'd want to get back at them if there was a chance. Nothing for now, Tania pointed upward at the snowing. For a tracker, snow-covered footprints and trails ruined and twisted any paths, making it harder to foresee any traps. Understood. Go to the fire. Keep it under watch. I accompanied the girl, going as far as to sit next to her. What are they like? She gazed at me with doubt, raising her right eyebrow. What do you mean, the shroomies? I rested my cheek on top of my knees, focusing my peaceful eyes on her. Oh. Her mouth opened wide. They're big colored mushrooms, as tall as our knees. Dangerous ones reach about our waistline. I opened my mouth. Surprised, the frontier beyond it were the restricted limits imputed by my parents when I was younger. Everywhere else almost was fine for me to explore, aside from going too far onto the mountains in the east. Golems lived there, and they were neutral to us. Or so the saying went, the creatures who guard humanity, smashers of fiends till flat they become. Yet everyone I had questioned about it didn't know much about them. Creatures made of stone gave birth to curiosity within me. Willing to learn more about the different races and their uniqueness, the possibilities of meeting them, and perhaps even befriending one. Except the vile creatures who took down Brooke. Yes, that's where I drew the line, setting my boundaries on the pretext of having lost someone. I couldn't allow them to go undefeated, not for vengeance, but for justice. What they had done to us, to him and Chris, was not right, and my heart ached for those sinful acts. Shrooms. Eh? I finally added after a long time in silence, thinking that potentially we were not too different from said creatures. After all, we too were on a mission to exterminate living beings. However, I didn't feel bad about it, not yet at least. I had yet to kill one of them with my own hands, to feel their warm blood flow towards my body, drenching it and changing my skin tone to a filthier red. Only then would I know if that was enough to sense guilt or a more distinct emotion. MHM. You look tired. Go rest. I'll keep watching. Tania consented my way with a soft nod, reaching out for a sleeping bag, a bedroll, as it was called, some made of leather, and more comfortable ones made of more expensive materials. 
Mine was cheap, one that I almost lost during that chaotic night. But despite its price, I had earned nothing as a helper, and I didn't have money left to buy another. It would be tough to sleep on the floor, I sighed, calmly looking at the surrounding darkness of the night, hoping that no enemy would approach. Thanks to the guild and in a way, since an adventurer died, a party went ahead to retrieve our things. Such would not be viable if a creature had taken them before the adventurers arrived. Luckily for me and Tania, that hadn't been the case. Once again, I stood at the rear of the party, and this time around our scouter did things by herself. She was no longer inclined to go through seeing someone die and in a way. I still felt like a coward, relieved within me to be the one positioned in the safest location. Unlike the rest of them, I had already died one time, losing everything, even if what I lost hadn't been special, yet it still had been my life, and that had some worth, if there's any fighting. They need to save energy. And with such a thought, I pulled some of their burdens onto my shoulders, the night went on with no one dying and I more than the rest, spent the most time being vigilant of enemies, so that my teammates could rest. After all, I was the luggage carrier during the daytime. We left the camp on the first daylight, are you okay? Yes, just a bit sleepy. I quickly lied, to leave Tania's mind devoid of worries about my health and fatigue. It was just an extra turn keeping watch. Or was it too? The time for the night to pass was long and at times, it felt eternal. The chilly breeze had kept me awake, and the fireplace on my back allowed me to resist the constant breeze. I got a quick hold of my white fur jacket, crossing my arms brushing some of the snow off them. My clothing too had been the greatest of help during times like these. Lead the way Tania, Benjamin declared, pointing in the last time we were here direction. Thus we followed her. Through the naked trees, we moved, dazzled by the unknown and white of the vast plains. Few were the bushes that remained green and intact, barely providing us with any camouflage. It was easy for my allies to keep an eye on any fiend hiding on top of the trees as they had no verdure for coverage. The bad thing was that anything could see us approaching. It didn't take long for us to find the Shroomies group. What are they doing? I remained still, staring at them with an open mouth, dumbfounded about the culmination before me. The mushrooms had tiny legs that led to the cap, but they seemed to lack eyes. Instead in the center of the top of the hat, there was sunlight going in, almost as if they were channeling it somewhere. A whisper came, keeping us all edgy. We must defeat them now whilst they recover. Tania didn't add an explanation when she referred to the group as we, for my job was to remain here, and theirs to move and attack. Our formation needed me to stay behind in case something bad happened, to check if more enemies would join the battle or any other thing that I'd need to alert them about. Move out, Benjamin signaled by waving his hand, and they held on to their diverse weapons. As my group was about to engage them from the east, on the opposite side, a familiar sound approached, the dreadful stomping of the tusk boars, but more than that screams, coming from four green-like creatures that I had heard stories about, goblins. All of us froze at such a commotion and the way the green fellows ran towards the shroomies. By no means were these plains safe, often a bloody, chaotic, and savage festival where plenty of distinct races often met and despaired. After all, they were enemies of one another, a battlefield beyond the protection of the saintess where even the strong die. Newcomers stay here and keep our rear safe no matter what. Jaeger and Bella followed Benjamin's lead, dashing toward the shroomies. One of the small creatures noticed the humans approaching, following through by using the screech skill, alerting his surrounding allies. Further ahead, more of its kin poured from their hiding spots, a few goblins below the snow and others behind the trees. In total, a group of six kept their distance from my allies, and in a way, continued to wait out for the tusk boars, so they hunt in large numbers. It made me realize that despite their low intelligence and mana, they were far from being dumb. They were actually leading them into a trap, far better than us back then who were caught by those charging fat creatures. Their weapons were a lot more rudimentary than ours, plain-looking sticks, sharpened in the tips, barely any clothes on them despite the cold season. Yet it didn't look to me like they suffered from it, perhaps from a young age. They were bathed in icy water, or forced to stand out in the cold, increasing their natural resistance. An abrupt howling breeze hit my face, forcing my hair to flow onto my back. I rose my palm, aiming it at my allies. 
This time around I'd use my ice skill to make a difference, in any way that I could. I'll watch the surroundings. I nodded in her direction, consenting to Tania's wise decision so I could keep focused. Thus, she vanished into the trees and bushes further behind me, keeping herself ready for any who might attempt to get to the supporter, me. I kept calm, looking at the situation and pondering where my little mana would be best spent. 72, I whispered to myself, knowing there must be something that I could do with it. And then, from observing the way the goblins ran away with their small legs, taking the narrowest possible paths, an idea surged within me, causing me to smile faintly. Without the order of the leader, I decided then to choose my own way, to pave the battlefield through the little ability I had, the start of a new style, my own. I did my best to keep myself steady, controlling the magical circle to appear in front of the goblins. I aimed it towards the pathway that looked like they'd run over as that was the direction to the rest of them. Once my mana finished converting to my ice element, I released the skill, freeze, notice, system consumed 70 mana, attack them. A yell burst with almighty strength from my lungs, and my allies noticed the light blue magical circle approaching our enemies far ahead, illuminating one of their paths, close their way out. Benjamin ordered, causing the trio to change plans and aim from the goblins instead. The light, too, was perceived by our enemies, but we left them with no choice. Someone had ruined their plan, and they didn't know what I had done further ahead, between being smashed by the tusk paws, or running into a trap. They kept going, yelling, alerting the rest of them, the ones ahead. Everything quickly became a mess, but the best part was the way it made my hand shiver from the excitement that ran across the fiery blood in my veins. Get them. A smile from cheek to cheek surfaced on my face, gaining a bit of confidence from not missing the spell. I shrouded away the mist of doubts about the outcome of my action the moment I saw everything happen. Like dominoes, by the type that were alive, with eyes, noses, mouths, and with a soul inside being crushed onto one another, goblins being smashed against the nearby trees, slipping without being able to get away in time, their bodies puked green liquid. A different type of colored blood than mine, stickier and repulsive nonetheless, the beasts that hurt themselves from the sharp and cold branches and weapons roared in despair, they were about to fall prey to the hands of the backup who awaited them when my allies started pressuring with their presence and sharpened weapons. It was chaotic for the goblins side as they attempted to dodge the enormous animals, whenever they tried to escape, my allies would kill them. The only way out was straight ahead with this or that tree in the way. But for that, they needed to run all the way to the backup, but the icy ground made sure that didn't come easy. Jaeger, a warrior with two small axes, one in each hand, made an abnormally great leap towards one beast that went out of the path. The animal noticed him too late, allowing the brave warrior to pierce the beast's eyes, piercing them all the way to the brain. One down. He shouted convicted, increasing Bella's and Benjamin's morale. The two of them followed his example, using their swords to slice through the fallen goblins. It was easy since they remained on the coldness, slipping without being able to get a hold of their balance. To think she could do this, he grinned, feeling that I had been an excellent addition to the party. Brother, right, backstep, he shouted, his skill unsure if he could dodge that attack on time, causing a surge of mana to cover him from the feet to the knees. And then, before the enemy goblin reached him, he jumped back avoiding the attack quick slash. This time, the mana covered his arms, giving him the energy required to cross his sword on the opponent's throat, decapitating him in a blink of an eye. As the blood gushed out from the headless body in a vertical fountain style, Benjamin fell to his knees. Jaeger on it. The bulky young man rushed to his companion's side, throwing the hand axes to two distinct goblins that attempted to approach. I got you. He lifted his body placing Benjamin over his shoulders, carrying him to me, noticing this, I took out my sword, Tania they need us, I heard the bushes on my rear to shake, causing me to point the tip to it, pulling the sword to my waist to pierce if necessary, I'm here, what's wrong, I noticed Tania's hand lifting one of the branches as she made her way to me, glimpsing to my posture, thinking that I was ready to attack her, we need to help them, I lowered my guard in her presence, pointing in their way, her eyes soon fell on the shroomies, understanding that they were still busy with their recovering endeavors. Let's hurry, she ran without waiting for my consent, 
and I followed after her. We needed to be fast, to avoid getting caught between the tusk boards, the goblins, and the shroomies. We ran for our lives, looking at Jaeger's outline physique, the muscles that made its torso shape clear. Benjamin by no means looked light, at least not like me or Tanya. I had heard of such skills, quick slash and others that began with the quick word meant they excelled in the use of the body muscles exhausting them. This made me think he was quite brave about using it when he did, without knowing if rendering his legs wouldn't cause his doom. But their trust in each other, their teamwork, had made it possible. Here, I quickly sheathed my sword, getting hold of Benjamin's arm, leaving the other one for Jaeger to handle. Together, we took him back to the camp. None of us died, not even got hurt. To me, that was the most important, and we had even killed a few of them. We won. I thought happily giving some peace to my last party experience, it was a shame that things went the way they did, we hadn't defeated all of them, far from it, however, our escape ended up with a positive result, three of my party members had gained experience, and for an adventurer to become stronger, that was a must, thank you guys, we felt his weight becoming lighter, his legs were starting to work again, we got you, I smiled briefly, improving the pace with his renewed self. The camp was close now and all of us wanted to get away as fast as possible. Tania stood behind, something to do with our trails, perhaps her family had taught her to cover our tracks. Knowing her, it would surely be a useful task so that the goblins wouldn't find us easily. If they'd come for revenge, we'd need to survive and fight back. The problem was the number. They weren't as dumb as I had expected. Their hunting tactic had been quite interesting. I believe they would have made it a great killing on a few of those boars had we not meddled. But I suppose, after looking back at it, we had been caught by surprise, unlike the goblins who lured the enemy's initiative. My mother had told me something similar, that often the first to land the first attack is bound to win the duel. We arrived safely at the camp, each taking a seat in their own corner, with their backs against a distinct tree. All of our breaths was fierce, our hearts too heated violently. Iris. I stole a glimpse from Benjamin, he who took a deep breath before speaking further. I didn't expect you to do that. It was amazing. I got to know then that I had been truly amazing. And for someone with not that much self-esteem that had meant the world to me, and I failed to hide the happiness I felt with his words. All of them saw my joyful smile. It had been my ace in a hole. Jaeger raised his thumb toward me. A man that didn't seem to talk much, unless necessary. That wasn't half bad, Bella added, with a somewhat indifferent tone, feeling the gazes of her favorite people stolen by me. I'm glad I could help. And deep down I truly was, more than even thinking of taking revenge. That was when I realized I wanted to defeat those beasts, not because they had harmed my initial companions, but because I wanted to do it, to know that it was possible. My goal was still to get strong enough to protect my family. Therefore, growing in whatever way possible to match that outcome made me fulfilled, it was fine if I became a party support, if I learned skills to be useful to them. If they could grow further stronger with my help, reducing the number of enemies against humanity, we can do this, I left a long sigh of relief towards the sky, watching it become a little cloud from how cold it was, everything's arranged. Tanya's voice came from behind, I was expecting her to return safely. I trusted she'd do a good job in whatever task they had given her. I'll patrol, without waiting for anyone's permission. Jaeger got up, taking Benjamin's sword with him into the woods. He had lost both of his axes, securing the leader's life. He could always buy new ones, but the same couldn't be said about anyone's life. Bella got up and went closer to me, grab the chance to rest kid. I nodded at her words, allowing exhaustion to overwhelm me. Falling asleep. Nine. Chapter 29 Year 5014, Day 10 of the Moon Season Way further to the north, inside a church, a green-haired woman was in bed asleep, and like any other day, she was being haunted by a nightmare, people dying, all social classes alike. In total a gigantic amount, about three million people within the Lumen Kingdom were being massacred by an army with green flags. A vast, fierce and violent one of countless, black armored enemies. She woke up yelling causing a priest who guarded the door outside to barge inside doing the same. Saintess, I heard a scream. Is there an intruder? Are you okay? Worriedly, his eyes hovered from one side of the room to the other, landing on her bed before she found in herself the strength to say anything. She let out a man, 
sitting on bed, looking around, quickly she understood everything had just been a very bad dream. After some panting, she became calmer, ending up looking at the source of the voice. She saw the man inspecting the entirety of her room from the floor to the ceiling. Once her breathing became normal, she declared fearfully, I had a premonition. I understand Saint S. I'll wait for you outside. Coldness with a hint of relief left his lips. He understood that the issue was out of his boundaries, but that she was safe, and for this man, that's what mattered the most, comprehending that there was no enemy. He closed the door on his back. Thanks to this she regained her privacy, allowing her to change clothes more comfortably, from a brown pajama to a long white cloth robe, making her look like a religious figure. I sure hope it was a nightmare and not a premonition, otherwise. May the goddess drop by her realm to save us all. A fearful expression lived on her face, understanding that if what she saw was real, the kingdom may very well come to an end. The two of them headed to the Pope's office. Once they arrived, the priest opened the door after knocking twice, shouting loudly, Your Holiness, it seems something unexpected has happened. They barged in startling the Pope who didn't have much time to get himself ready. He left the chair standing high and might as he was incredibly tall and thin. What has transpired priest? Yes, the saintess woke up from one of those special dreams and the man bowed in her direction, looking at her expectantly without knowing what it was about. I had an awful premonition, I saw our kingdom being destroyed. The woman looked at the golden floor with both hands still trembling. A lumen kingdom will who? Just who is the culprit? Worriedly, the man yelled holding his white hat to not fall from his aggressive behavior. Krause. Her shout pierced both men's ears, causing both to breathe deeply, halting their emotions as if they were now made of stone. I'm sorry Saint S. He followed his words with a light bow. Good. Her green eyes glanced at her guardian, causing him to bow as if understanding her gaze. Once her light emeralds returned to the Pope, she declared promptly, You're not allowed to bring shame to our goddess, Krause. Yes, of course. His back straightened up, allowing his great height to overshadow the table and chair behind him. From what I could see, she crossed both arms, hiding her hands under her armpits. I believe it to be an invasion by fiends wearing black armor. Her guardian took two steps to the side, looking at the nearest window which was directed to north. Once he realized no one was close enough to eavesdrop, he commented, If the same test dream turns out to be the real thing, then it could be the army of the demon race. The goddess holy book mentions their dark red armor. That's quite possible. The old man then placed a hand on his chin, adding a distinct suggestion. It may be the beasts from the south. It wouldn't be a surprise, as they've tried to invade us multiple times over the centuries. Yes, Koto, wait outside and make sure no one approaches. At once, Saint S. The woman took calm steps, sitting in the chair and then her finger poked the table a few times, causing Krause to sit on the other side of the table. Once the Pope heard the door close, he swiftly resumed the topic. Since our kingdom is in the center of a lot of territories, protecting it is truly arduous, he sighed harshly, thinking about plenty of scenarios. Perhaps even the kingdom located to the east, past the mountains. Their forces have been increasing for the past years. I believe the ogres wouldn't attempt to cross the mountains. Fighting the Gillums would bring them no benefit. They sighed, feeling their roles to be tough. As it is, we'll need to investigate and inform the king. I'll see into it. He added briefly, feeling his life shortening by the second thanks to the dreadful news. Year 5014, day 90 of the moon season. Inside a grand room, a long exquisite and beautifully crafted stone table hosting ten seats with well-wooden sculptured chairs, four on each side through its length. The two almighty figures of the kingdom sat on each side of its width, His Majesty the Ruler and Her Holiness the Saintess. To the sides of both, the eight chairs were the place for the current heads of the most famous and powerful noble families to be, though currently, one wasn't present. The king guards could see the elegance of the carved large rows on the back of these eight seats. It was a delicate detail to show their prestige. After all, each family head held the sovereignty of one-eighth of the territory of the kingdom. Such households received the title of a colored rose, having each successor own five colored rings, resembling their importance throughout the kingdom. But they did not make these rings ordinary. Each held two skills imbued to them, 
One of them was that they adjusted themselves to the finger of the wielder. The other was that when the time came to select the next knight, the ring would shine. That way, the family successor could find the ring wearer. A magical trail appeared showing where they had to go to find them, similar to a compass. I thank you all for attending my estimated reunion. Everyone bowed their heads. Your Highness's gratitude is wasted upon us, Ryu, the head of the Blue Rose household, declared. You may lift your heads. Today I have unhappy news to share with the seven of you. His palms turned to the ceiling, as he spread both arms, looking at the ceiling. May the goddess save us as she has before. His gaze fell onto the leader of the royal guards. Upon understanding what the king meant, Sylvia and the guard next to her opened both doors. Two armored bishops entered, each with a green octogram on the back of their white robes and shields followed by a young woman with long green hair and similar toned eyes. Around her, an aura made of mana emanated, giving a sense of tranquility and warmth that burst into the room. Welcome serenity. Today, formalities will be on hold. At those words, she smiled elegantly, as you wish. With the help of one of her personal guards, she took the sole seat which was faced toward the king. Such was the importance she resembled to the kingdom, and those who believed in her. I'm grateful that you came so promptly, of course, it is a grave matter, however, in her mind, annoyance roamed wildly, Krause wouldn't shut up for a month if I hadn't come here, I hope his eminence is doing well, King Lark Luman added out of sympathy, yes, your highness, somehow, despite his age, his health seems to get better as the days go by, she sighed lightly, placing her chin on top of her palm and resting her elbow on top of the table, completely turning the formalities upside down as if they didn't matter in the slightest. That almost sounds like a bad thing Saint S, the head of the Black Rose Charles added, containing his share of amusement. Not at all, a faint smile passed on her lips, ignoring the provocation. Charles was a handsome black-haired man with brown eyes, known by many for his persistence towards the Saint S. However, she had ignored him for years, knowing quite well he was a womanizer. Nonetheless, he was a capable man of great political strength. Someone that even she had to be wary of. If the saintess wasn't who she was, for sure, he'd have her kidnapped by now. The king laughed at their bickering. You two are always so humorous. Thank you for your kind words. Your Highness, Charles added, smiling charmingly without removing his gaze from her. I'm assuming that the saintess being with us means the goddess has sent her a vision? That is so Alfred. Sadly for everyone here, the premonition has been happening more often lately. Almost every citizen knew Alfred for possessing the strongest swordsmanship in the entire kingdom. Throughout his lifetime, he had lost only once, and upon the rules of the duel, he ended up marrying his opponent. He was a man who estimated honor above all else, even above his family members. Do we know who's the attacker? Your Highness? I've brought the saintess here today to know more about it myself, thus summoning all of you. Everyone's eyes struck the saintess. If she was a normal woman, she would have fallen under the pressure, but instead, she simply began explaining everything about her nightmares. My first vision showed a war where our kingdom ultimately got decimated. The attackers were a large army of black armored fiends carrying green flags. A dark-skinned woman added rather interested. Green flags? Is there even an army that uses them? She was the best archer in the kingdom, one who fought for her freedom. In her younger days, she had gone against arranged marriages. Iliane's parents, back then, almost dishonored her, ultimately failing to beat her conviction. I believe that there was once a tale about green flags. To the south, no? The king questioned as he looked at the saintess, rubbing the tip of his white short beard. Yes. I had some of the wisest members of the church research the records, did they find anything? Iliane quickly asked, feeling worried. Yes, we found something of relevance but everyone looked at the saintess with extra attention. Her free hand poked one of her nails a few times on the table before quenching their curiosity. In one of the records, there were traces of an invasion by a level 100 goblin king. This was almost 200 years ago, prior to the 499th hero summoning ritual. A wave of nervousness filled the room for a bit, causing Charles to break the silence with a question. Did it invade alone? Since by itself at such a level, it would be already extremely powerful to deal with alone. The Saintess's head swayed to the sides, disagreeing with such words. He invaded together with its army, causing great destruction. That's 
a nightmare, the king replied, wiping his sweat with an embroidered handkerchief. Back then, two heroes were summoned and trained for some years before our enemy moved. A tanned man who was observing the saintess soon started speaking as he had a question to make. Pardon the interruption, O oh saintess, does that mean the goddess hasn't relayed one of her divine messages? That is so Ryo, the saintess replied with a hint of sadness in her eyes. Upon hearing that his confirmation was right, he crossed his arms and went into deep thought, believing that there was a chance that it was the same goblin. Even his level could be higher for all we know, as we are now. His eyes passed those around him as if to confirm something, and then he went back into thought. Goblins, despite not being the smartest race, they learn from their mistakes, it wouldn't be abnormal for him to wait this long to rise a new and stronger army as well, if on top of the heads, we gather the strongest adventurers and organize the military correctly. His gaze rested on the saintess, we also have her vision, it should give us some time to plan things properly. His hand stopped Madeir in the king's direction. Your Highness, I have a plan I'd like to discuss. I understand Ryu, but I want to ask a few more things before we go into the next phase of the reunion. As you wish, my liege, he replied in a temperate and thoughtful tone. Ryu was a black-haired man with rare dark blue eyes. He was known for his vast knowledge of the arts of war, one of the youngest generals in Lumen's history and one of the best. He received enough achievements to stand where he was now. Yes, one piece of the information I wanted to add to this conversation is the date of the invasion. The surrounding aura became warmer, causing a few of them to sweat. The invasion will start in one of the warm seasons in three years. There's not much time left then. We must organize ourselves, put our soldiers into shape. Exactly, your highness. The earliest we start the least casualties we'll have, stated Alfred of the White Rose. Zylf a man known for his quietness during reunions, opened his mouth, an eccentric fellow with a bizarre sense of fashion, possessing half red and white hair, famous for his money and power, infamous for his tastes in both genders, especially young men, your highness, he received the immediate attention of everyone around him, yes, I believe it is in everyone's interests to not evacuate those who are currently living on the outskirts of our walls in the south, a woman smashed her fist, making a loud bang noise on the stone table. This action caused Sylvia, the leader of the royal guards, to move at an abnormal speed. In no time at all, her sword could be seen glued to Angelica's neck. What is the meaning of this? The king questioned, upset, there is no way we're going to abandon our citizens, how could he even think about it? They could feel her anger across the room as she directed her glare at the man who incited it. Worst yet, their gazes could see the wrath in the form of veins popping out from her muscled body. Angelica was one of the few nobles known for her kind heart. She never belittled peasants or looked down on people. Her amiable personality saw every human as they truly were, no matter what. But they also knew her for having an extremely muscular body and possessing great strength. There were very few men who could beat her in arm wrestling. That's enough, the king added swiftly realizing it was just another one of her emotional outbursts that had happened every once in a while. At his words, Sylvia sheathed her sword and returned to the door. A ginger-haired man joined the conversation. I agree with Angelica. I'm also in opposition to abandoning the southern territories, the head of the Red Rose family added, having most of his lands there. Thus, the one with the most to lose, he adjusted his crown, feeling the sweat from the Saintess's aura, nothing's decided yet. He was feeling exhausted, dehydrated even. Worse yet was that he knew the discussion wasn't going his way. Seeing as they were nervous and angry, the king took a decision. Before we continue, let's take a break to calm down and enjoy lunch together. Call the servants outside and tell them to bring the food, Sir Rudolph, as you command. Your Highness. 8. Chapter 30. Year 5015. Day 50 of the flowering season. Almost two seasons later, the guild called me to take the promotion. Today would finally be the day when I could stop being a helper and instead become an adventurer. The utmost freedom I sought, along with one of the guild cards, which exempted me from paying some taxes and having access to certain places. As I walked near the village fountain, I felt a hand touching the back of my right shoulder. Now you're it. An unfamiliar cute tone followed by an adorable giggle caused me to turn around smiling. Once our eyes met, 
It felt like the time between us stopped. It was one of those very rare times when I could match the voice properties to the physique of the person, and by all means, this girl was the cutest I had ever seen. A black-haired teen, whose curls extended throughout her long white dress with similarly toned roses engraved on the bottom part, her clothing yelled the word wealth, as it was simply outstanding. It was easily the most beautiful dress I had ever put my eyes on. The leaves that were blown by the refreshing breeze passed between us, gently hitting the ground. Are you okay? She asked, blinking her eyes, fanning me with her long eyelashes, and extending her hand to my cheek, sheltering it softly. Ah yes. The embarrassment turned my cheeks rosy, having never experienced such kindness from a stranger before, nor allowing it. But this girl had taken me by surprise in an unforeseen way at that, I met. A yell flowed out of me, warning the surrounding players that I entered their little game of chase. It had been a while since my last time as I had been busy working as a helper, but the money had been a great help to my parents. It was especially useful to buy food for my pet, who seemed to have a black hole instead of a stomach. My hands went out after her, only to be outrun by her unforeseen speed. How come I can't catch her? She's not that older. Confusion engraved inside of me as she dodged my every attempt as if her feet were light as plums. Yet, her legs were fast like those of a horse. For someone that looked to be my age, she sure outshined everyone else, and that increased my sudden interest in her. The surrounding kids started chanting for me to catch her when none of them could. They yelled my name, clapping, and raising their voices in excitement whenever I got close to her. What started as a little game had now my full attention and motivation in it. Having a hard time, Iris? She teased me, smiling happily like this was her best day ever, like she had never had fun like this, and it was rather contagious. She irradiated a cute charm to everyone else. It made all this feel strangely blissful just for spending time with her. However, the bit of pride within me wanted to catch her at least once. Thus, I sneaked a magical circle below her feet, freezing the ground right before she landed, and causing her to slip before she fell. My hands got hold of hers, bringing her enough stability to not completely fall, yet dirtying the bottom of her dress. I finally got you. My lowly voice reached her ears, taking sight of how surprised she was. Her gaze soon lowered, finding out what trick I had pulled on her. That's cheating, she giggled. There are no rules, I laughed at her as we got showered with praise from the surrounding kids. After playing with them for a bit, I ended up taking a stroll through the village with Alicia, holding each other hands as we went. We had become best friends in no time at all after chasing each other. Of course, I had only caught her a single time, but it had made me thrilled. I didn't expect to find an ice mage in such a remote village. To find? Yes, I'm not from here. Oh. In this small village, Everyone knew each other, it was strange that I had never seen Alicia, but I had been so lost in this new friendship that I didn't realize it earlier, what a shame, my saddened eyes brought her to a halt, hey, it'll be fine, without giving me a chance to contest, she removed one of her five white rings and placed it on my middle one, what's this, I looked at its glow and the way it adjusted perfectly to the width of my finger, it's a gift, she smiled faintly, pulling me in with her kindness. It's so pretty. It was pure white, with a rose on top, similar to the ones adorned in her dress contained. This is part of my family heirloom. We give it to potential knights, but in this case, it's just so we can meet again. I swayed my head to the sides. I'm sorry. I can't keep something so important. As I attempted to take it out, her hands quickly rested on top of mine. It's all right, Iris. Please accept it. It'd make me happy to see you again someday. As I was about to insist, her arms embraced my body, leaving me with no option but to concede. Go now, we'll meet back in the fountain once you finish your business at the guild. She let go of me, causing me to nod in agreement. I'll be there as soon as I can. I smiled widely to show her everything was fine between us. We split ways there, and I found my way to the adventurer's home. After passing through the typical gruesome stairs of fellow members, I reached the receptionist area. Hello. How can I help you today? Hi Leonor. I smiled happily since she was my favorite worker in this association. You seem to be in high spirits today. Is it because of your promotion? I saw her grinning mischievously, fully understanding that she knew what I was there for. That too. But I also made a new friend, 
My emeralds glinted joyfully for any to see. That's amazing. She smiled happily without pursuing the subject. Thank you, you're very welcome. It makes me glad you're having a good time in Astia. At those words we exchanged smiles, knowing it to not be the best place ever. Having a lot of impertinent fellows, yet, it was mainly a pleasant village to live in and be part of. Regarding the promotion, she checked some papers on the table. The guild master has acknowledged your ability despite you lacking a class. I remained dumbfounded at her words. It was hard to pass without the full requirements, causing me to work with a lot of parties to this very day. I had stacked positive reports about my cooperation with many parties, learning what I could from them. Follow me. She lifted a wooden blockade between two blocks, allowing me to pass to her side. Then, we entered a room with a bookshelf, two large sofas, and a table between them. She told me to sit on one of them as her finger and eyes searched through the bookshelf. Once she found it, she brought a thick and heavy book and placed it on top of the table. It's so strange. It looked almost fully brown, covered by grey at its edges along with a peculiar stone handprint in the middle. Place your hand on the mark. I followed her instruction, placing my hand on top of it. Once it finishes registering you, a card will appear. You can present it in many territories and the guards will let you pass, and any guild base can update your rank in it as you complete quests. Oh, so it shows my name and my rank? I questioned, to make sure I had missed no details about it. Yes, pretty much, and also where you've registered. I'll be back soon. Wait for me here, alright? Yes, ma'am. I raised my free hand in the air. A few moments after, a light appeared above my hand and a white card came into sight. As I'm about to take my hand off to grab it, the entire process repeats. Excitedly, I got hold of both cards, turning the first one around. Name, Iris, age, 15, registered at Aria Village, rank, F. As I'm about to check the second Leonore entered, startling me, causing me to save the second one before reading it in my pocket. She closed the door, then turned to me. Is it done? Ah, yes, I give her my card. There, there, Leonore patted me briefly before looking at the card. No need to be scared, Iris. Yes, ma'am. She smiled at my words. Okay, the card looks perfect. Here you go. I got hold of it with both hands. Thank you. I'll cherish it on our side. It's complete. From this day onwards, you can just drop by and talk to one of us. We're the ones who handle all the quests and deliver them to the adventurers based on their ranks. Okay, I will. I saved it in my other pocket, getting up from the sofa, and then we left together. We came to the positions before everything started, once more having a counter between us. I'd like to receive my first quest if possible, eager to get to work, I smiled. This girl is a mix of swordsmanship and magic, but she's alone, so I need to find something easy. She went through papers, making different facial expressions upon reading their content. I took a quick glance around me, evaluating the extensive building, which contained many tables with long benches of the same lengths. There was an enormous hall between the front doors and the receptionists. I'll be right back, Leonore, take your time. On the sides, there were counters where mainly adventurers bought food and drinks. I approached one and got myself three sizable pieces of bread with ham and cheese in there for later. The woman placed them inside a black cloth bag that was then given to me, thanks to my card. They put the price on my tab since I didn't have money with me. With this system, every time an adventurer finishes their quest, part of the reward gets deducted to pay off any debt. I returned to the receptionist's area. Finding Leonor, Iris, I'd like you to take this quest. She handed it to me and asked, Do you know how to read? Yes, I do. Let's see. Quest. Rank. F. A farmer has sighted a group of slimes between 10 to 20 to the east farm of Astia. They have been eating the crops and if left alone, they may end up hurting someone. Reward. 2 points and 5 mana coins per slime guild. Leonor, what are these points in the reward? Oh. They are the values I mentioned before to rank up an adventurer via their card. I see. I took my card out, noticing there wasn't anything related to it in it. You're very welcome. Don't forget to get an ally or two to help you out. Oh, and you must bring the soul stones as proof to get points. We'll then trade it for points and we'll pay you for their grades properly. She waves goodbye as she finishes talking. Can I bring any other soul stones I find aside from slimes? Yes. 
Of course, we'll exchange them for points and money. We have a device that checks their soul wavelength, so it's always the correct reward. All right, I nodded happily and then waved goodbye. See you later, Leonor, and thank you. Be careful Iris, make sure to only go for the blue ones, okay? I left the Adventurer's Guild with a radiant face, heading towards the fountain to meet Alicia. Upon reaching it, I found an older man slapping her, causing me to approach and eavesdrop on their conversation wanting to help her if it somehow got out of hand. I told you many times to not play with these peasants, how many times do I have to repeat myself? Alicia was crying with her head lowered. I'm sorry father, lowly mumbling followed as tears rained. Look at your dress, it's so dirty, do you have no dignity? Another man approached them, a man dressed in black attire. Master, your wife has called for you, she was finished shopping. The man politely bowed, it's time to go. He grabbed Alicia's hand, pulling her towards the carriage. The moment he started moving away, his arm got stuck. He turned around and asked the daughter, Why aren't you moving? His face turned even redder, filled with anger. I. Alicia grabbed her dress tight, promised I'd wait for my friend Iris. Did you not understand what I said earlier? He lifted his arm in the air to slap her again. As I saw what was unfolding, I stepped in close to them. Hello Lady Alicia. I'm truly sorry for the wait. Happy to see me, she replied. Welcome back, Lady Iris. She smiled nervously at me, holding back her tears. I've just finished my business in the Adventurer's Guild, I said in a composed, proper tone. Her father thought about what kind of business I could have in the Adventurer's Guild. I then flawlessly bowed slightly towards her, lifting my casual dress properly, and then turned to her father, repeating the gesture. In my past life, they forced me to learn noble etiquette, which was quite similar to the one in this world. I tested this with my mother, as she taught it to me when we weren't training. She said I was extremely good at it and a fast learner at that, so we spent little time on it. It made me glad it hadn't been for naught. Alicia bowed properly by picking up her skirt dress and lifting it slightly, bowing in my direction. Her father mistook me for a noble because of my trained courtesy and elegant yet childish tone. However, my attire wasn't the best, but it was still on a level slightly above what most kids wore. The guild business also helped with it. He then, feeling a little calmer, added, Seems like you learned something after all. We'll be waiting in the coach. Have a good day, Lady Iris. Have a good day, my lord. Don't take long Alicia. The trip back to Lumina waits. Yes, father. The butler smiled kindly at me, doing a brief bow before leaving, almost as if he was thanking me. I repaid him with a cute smile. Without having the chance to look at my friend, she grabbed my hands. I'm sorry you had to see that, Iris. It's okay, my lady. I teased her. Her body loosened a bit, laughing along with me. How did the trip to the Adventurer's Guild go? I took out my Adventurer's card and showed it to her. Her eyes became shiny as she took a hold of it, reading the information to herself. This girl is so easy to read, I thought staring at her radiance. I had thought of this, but the truth was that I had failed to notice how important she was. I'm so proud of you. I hope you can become a famous adventurer. I'll do my best to become strong. Upon hearing my words, her expression changed. I must go, but I hope to see you again someday. Perhaps one day I'll come for that ring and make you one of my knights. She smiled with a serious glint in her eyes. A knight? I'm an adventurer, though, I clarified. Yes for now, but we never know in the future. I don't know if in the future I'll want to be a knight though, I replied, feeling awkward about that proposition of hers. She hugged me and whispered in my ear, even if you don't, you're a friend I don't want to lose, and this way we'll surely meet again. Sounds like a plan. I really have to go, dear friend, I'll see you someday. She ran off, waving briefly before going, take care, Alicia. I waved her goodbye thinking about her proposition, a knight. Perhaps that could be fun too. A bit later, inside a moving white carriage with rose patterns, a woman's voice sprouted, You seem happy, my dear daughter? Alicia looked at the woman in front of her and replied with a smile, Yes mother, very. Did anything fun happen? She questioned curiously, noticing something about her amiss. She focused on her daughter's face, passing the right hand softly on it. Noticing a swelled cheek, her arm returned to her chest as the gaze befell the husband. Without giving a chance for anyone to do anything, 
she released a bloodthirsty or a worse than an enraged beast towards everyone around, making the carriage shake in pressure, and the horses shriek in despair. Alfred, did you hit Alicia? Her heart consumed with rage caused her menacing eyes to glare at him. The husband looked at her, slightly shivering from the pressure. Someone has to educate our daughter? She was playing with peasants. The further replied coldly, without giving in to the aura. Sweat was dripping from everyone inside the carriage. The butler next to the child pitied Alicia in his mind, monstrous parents handling a kid. Hang in there young lady, it'll be over soon. She looked back at Alicia and stretched the right hand once more slowly toward the hair. As the hand approached, the girl felt more and more pressure, shaking fiercely from it. In her eyes, it felt like a beast was about to devour her. To this, the child's arms rose in the air, defending herself. However, the moment her hand touched the daughter's hair, the aura vanished, and words came out of the mother. Well, your dad is right. It would bring shame to our family if someone important saw you with them, Alicia. Her arms lowered down to the lap as she looked at the mother in the face. I. She reminded herself of Iris wanting to become strong, gripping both hands onto each other strongly. I understand mother, I'll be more careful in the future. Inside the mother's mind, an unexpected thought went by. I didn't expect her to be so unfazed after that. Seems like she's grown up, upon meeting that new girl. Perhaps, in Alicia's eyes, the reflection of a faint smile on her mother's lips went through. So, Alicia, you haven't replied to my question. I'm very curious where one of the five heirlooms has run off to, upon hearing that comment, the husband and butler looked simultaneously at Alicia's hand, I gave it to someone I estimated worthy of wearing it, she declared to her parents, having grasped some confidence, the father, upon remembering the girl with the exquisite hair color, turned his face back to the window, the mother, noticing his behavior, realized she had finally made friends with a fellow noble, I made a friend. Her name is Iris, she's 15 years old and today she became an adventurer, a noble passing that exam at such a young age, they're usually lazy and spoiled kids, the butler thought, confused, sounds like this Iris friend of yours has some potential, but, Alicia, upon hearing those words, expressed a confused face, her mother, realizing the cheek was already red decided to leave it at that. After all, she knew that no noble girl would take such an exam at such a young age. Noble kids at such an age already had everything they wished for. What is your friend like? She's fun, friendly, kind, and strong-minded. Alicia smiled as she finished talking on Lady Iris. What's her family name? I didn't have time to ask father. Very well. Also, you could improve your greeting to her level. The one presented by the girl was flawless. Upon hearing that, her mother thought, confused, is she really a noble? Peasants don't learn at to catch praiseworthy of my husband's daughter. Tell me about the appearance of your friend. Ah, well, she's beautiful, with green eyes and blonde hair. Blonde hair? I can count the people I've seen with such hair with one hand, not to forget that such eye color is even rarer. Robert. Yes, my lady? I want you to find out which family Iris belongs to. I wish to meet her. As you wish, though it might take a while. That is fine, she declared effortlessly, looking through the wagon window. 8. Chapter 31. A Goblin Shaman's Perspective. As the night passed, far to the south, the ravaging howls of terror continued shaking the land of this cruel world, Artana. The unison of the heartless voices sang in honor of their goddess, Blood, Blood, Blood. Ten children, two survivors. The shaman, the oldest magician in the Green Kingdom, extended his wooden staff, pointing at all the newborns. The gobagos, you shall do anything to survive. The cheers went on, fight, fight, fight. He struck the bottom of his weapon on the ground, creating silence. In such a place, power meant everything. Winter earned the right of the ceremony. Unlike humans, these fellows made their children fight to have the right to go through the system ceremony which acted differently according to each race. Green creatures, grotesque, vile, fierce fighters, and heartless warriors, such were the goblins around, who started stepping the floor, clapping, making a heavy tune, bringing pressure to the younger ones. The children remained around an enormous bonfire, picking the diverse weapons on the floor, and attacking one another sharply. One of them went for a long stick, using it to push a foe into the bonfire, burning him. He pushed him further deep into the fire to make sure it died, 
stopping only when he heard the message from the system, granting him experience and the Kinslayer title. Goblin fried. A big goblin yelled, rolling on the dirty ground laughing, increasing the amusement around. On the other side of the bonfire, the smell of burned meat and blood entrained the nose nostrils of the shy goblin children, causing fear and panic to enter their brains. They quickly picked a weapon at random and jumped against one another, a dagger hitting the elbow of one, and a different one hitting the eye of the other. The one-eyed once started running away from the goblin who hurt him, colliding against another one behind him. Due to the impact, the young one was pushed onto a sword that awaited in front of him, causing his death. The feet smacked on the floor, causing it to vibrate like a minor earthquake, getting fiercer and louder as the goblins died. The older ones ran started yelling, kill, 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 kill. He pulled the sword out of the corpse and took a step on the deceased body, using it as a step to jump higher, slashing at the neck of the one-eyed goblin who fell because of the collision, making his head roll on the floor causing blood to spur on the ground. Without time to waste. He climbed on the new corpse, running towards the goblin, who was dumbfounded, looking at him with a dagger in his left hand. They struck one another, briefly clashing weapons, the one wielding the dagger moaned in pain as blood poured out of his shoulder, the one wielding the sword kicked the opponent's stomach and then lifted his weapon upwards to slash the one in front, however, fear reigned over his opponent, causing him to thrust the dagger deep into his foe's chest. Blood came out of his mouth as he lost the strength to hold the sword, causing it to fall by itself. The weapon ruthlessly sliced the right hand of the goblin, whose dagger became stuck in the opponent's body, ending up screaming from pain, Handless one, handless one, handless one. A goblin warrior yelled repeatedly, exhilarated by the clash between the children in front of him, a moment earlier. On the other side of the bonfire, the goblin who fried one of them used the same tactic to push another with a long stick. It forced the enemy to take a few steps toward a different opponent, causing them to fight. Without wasting much time, the stick wearer turned around, checking on every opponent. He then noticed the screams of the handless one, running at him, picking a nearby sword on the way. Once the goblin got closer, he stabbed it in the back of the enemy's neck, putting an end to his pain. He looked around once again, finding two leftover foes. Checking how far he was from them, his hand got hold of a dagger removed it from the corpse, and then threw it with all his strength at the back of one of them. Because of the lack of precision and strength, the dagger curved, hitting the foot of one of them, making him scream in pain, raising both arms. This allowed the other one to slash his arms and then his neck. The blood squeezed out from the opened neck, spraying into the surroundings. The remaining two goblins glanced fiercely, madly, ecstatic at each other, preparing for the last duel. The sound of a particular staff with bells echoed throughout the surroundings, causing everyone to grow quiet. The goddess Luna has offered us a goblin with an actual brain, and another who knows when to take his chances. Upon hearing those words, everyone around the two survivors started laughing, clapping in honor of their feats. In the name of the goddess Luna, mother of us all, who keeps an eye on the goblin tribe, we welcome you two to the family. The shaman smacked the staff two times on the floor and a party to celebrate went on. A while later, the old one with the staff moved closer to the monarch, who was watching the festival. He bowed, hearing its almighty voice from above. When the time comes, I shall name the one who pushed the goblin into the fire. He might become a great leader one day, as you command almighty goblin king, Thrag. Soon we will destroy those filthy humans, he thought as his fiery eyes looked into the thousands of goblins in front of him. Soon. Six. Chapter 32 By the time I got home, I had finished eating the bread from the base stand. It had been good, but clearly, it needed a drink. Beer and wine were the two things people drank the most back at the Adventurer's Guild. I had tried both but didn't find them to be that great. Plus they made people grow fat and sluggish like my father. There was nothing interesting for someone a tad younger to drink. And no, water was not enough to satisfy an old desire for a sweet juice I once had tasted if only sugar didn't cost so much. I arrived in my room without issues, not finding my dog throughout the way. It was likely that my mother had taken Little Saint to wander around. I should do the slime quest tomorrow. My hands grasped the paper Leonor had given me with the information. I'll do my best. Quickly, I folded the paper into a small piece, storing it in my pocket once more. 
and when I did, I felt the touch of something else, removing it. This is, the second card had some information on it, name, Aurora, age, 8, registered at Aria Village, rank, F, Aurora, who's that? Words escaped my lips as I felt disoriented, sensing something within me shattering, giving room for a voice to resound in my mind, a warning from my status skill. Notice, Soulbound has reacted, a Neri aura expanded from me, devoiding my entire room of light, making everything pitch black. What's going on? I can't see anything, uncomfortably. My body shook from fear, feeling a distinct, abnormal magical pressure than the one of the Saintess. Notice, due to Soulbound, my eyes were forcefully shut and I collapsed. Light filled my mind, a long distant memory unraveled itself before me and with my unconscious eyes, I dared to glance at it, a door to my past, I felt my eyes furrow, yet I stretched out my arm towards it, I knew that was something I needed to see, thus, I went for it, turning the handle, and forced it open with all my might, the green brightness eluded my eyes briefly, and then the scene played before me, slowly, that's, I shed a single tear upon the greenery before me, the familiar isolated wired garden surrounded by dark fences and tall walls, leaving at its center the grandest mansion I had ever witnessed. And laying on top of the grass, I saw a different version of myself. The iris from back then was playing with the ragged and antique dolls, enjoying the one thing that accompanied her life, a colorful imagination that allowed her to live in places that weren't allowed. My eyes dimmed at the following scene, my birth where my mother had died leaving my father with a grudge so hard that if I hadn't had a single use, political marriage at the age of 16, he would have killed me with his bare hands. And the baby grew into a skinned young girl, deprived of nourishment by the maids her father had assigned to take care of her. He couldn't find it within himself to do any of it, not even to look at her, that unsightly cancer that murdered his lover. But alas, with time passing, his heart too, found a new light a fellow widow with two young kids, older than Iris, perhaps by the pain both felt, or something else, he ended up remarrying with her, her old husband had died during a war against the kingdom of Baltimore, one of the military heroes, leaving the widow with a substantial fortune, the following scene brought more tears to my kind self, the dusty walls filled with books of all shapes and colors, each holding a selection of words that would fill the girl's brain from that day onwards. The one place where none dared step into, created solely due to her deceased mother's whim, the forbidden library. The girl's personality was closed, lacking nourishment, kindness, and any hint of love, retaining but an empty heart. However, her mind was colorful and bright, the stories she would read became her own tales at times, fables of brave people and heroic deeds, against monsters and demons through different perils, at others, romantic affairs, and plots of impossible lovers, sometimes happy endings and, at others, tragic ones. With the time passing fast inside my subconscious, I took brief glimpses of the girl smiling faintly, the magician of the court, every so often she imagined using these super amazing magic spells herself. One of the rare things that made her eyes sparkle and the lips turn into a hint of happiness. There had even been a story her ears once caught from the maids chit-chatting about an extremely venerable ancient sorceress, capable of showering the kingdom with rain. Such was her grandiose power, but not a single soul knew of her name. I wished to be just like her. My emeralds caught the image of the faded picture on the page, a woman whose white hair reached the very bottom of the floor, and in her hand a staff made of bones, with the top having the shape of a human skull. The first time I saw that image, I had closed the book, and from time to time, I'd go back to see it again. Eventually, I grew used to the eerie way it looked, and at some point, I got to like its peculiar appearance, it may have been due to. The scene changed making my wandering halt inside the mansion, the mistress mistreated Iris, with the help of her children, verbally and physically, without ever damaging her face, so the husband didn't notice, I wonder how we should torment Iris this time, the vile woman glanced at her younger ones, my dear children, Marie and Joan, any suggestions, Jonah asked with an evil grin inside her own room, the young lady who had a bitter smile and a twisted vile face, had a peculiar thought, voicing it out loud, extending her arm delicately in the tea way. Esteemed mother, perhaps we should lock her in a room and starve her to see how many days she can last? 
The mother laughed happily upon hearing her daughter's comment. The boy chuckled evilly, looking at the young lady. That sounds like a splendid idea, dear sister. However, let's make sure to not overdo it, otherwise, dad might notice. Possibly so, my dear son. Let's attempt a two day starving for now and we'll see how she handles it. The three of them smiled and laughed happily upon reaching the decision. Nearby, my eyes caught a glimpse of a maid who was serving tea to them, shivering in fear towards the wickedness of such conversation, promising herself to stay away. Even now it still makes me angry, I scorn the four of them. No. My anguish went to all of them, every single one who mistreated me, remembering the coldness that accumulated within that told me for years, as if to relieve me from my anger. A new scene unfolded, an unfamiliar one at that, the attic. Why would I go there? I don't remember that. My old me walked to an abandoned place untouched for decades, perhaps even longer. The door was clearly rusted and dirty. It had made her skinny arms have some trouble opening it up, but in a way, it was like a new adventure, the reason why she hadn't given up and succeeded. Everything inside was full of objects and around them plenty of webs with tiny spiders. The air in there felt heavy, which made Iris think it was due to the accumulation of dust and the strange odors that reached out for her nose. It was quite vast. Only God would know how many things were there. Nonetheless, she explored such a place, soon finding something tall and white. Inside, the attic was dark and hard to see as it had no windows. The only light was the one coming from the open door that she had left open. She wondered what was that white thing, the only object that had a cover. It was certainly suspicious. Due to curiosity, her feet moved closer to it, and extended her arm. Realizing it by the touch, Iris could tell it was like the blankets used in her bed when she slept, thus, decided to pull it off. As the linen fell, her expression grew fearful, having the mind screaming for the girl to run, but the body did not listen, freezing. A bit of time went by without anything bad happening, allowing the calmness and common sense to return. Silly me getting scared by a reflection, she had said as it was only a tall mirror, far bigger than her. Due to the obscurity inside the attic, Iris thought there was a girl in front of her at first glance, but now she was reassured that it was just a copy of herself, but then it happened, as if to betray the reassurance she had placed in herself. The image of the lips moved and words echoed through the room, can you help me, I'm trapped inside this mirror, the air felt even heavier for Iris as she ran out of breath her heartbeat pounding so hard that it reverberated through the attic, and the anxiety dominated the delicate lady. The voice resurged and asked with a fragile, sorrowful tone, Hey, I'm stuck in here, can you please help me? Please. Iris kept on shivering, feet paralyzed in that spot, eyes glued to the image, giving time for the reflection to continue her monologue, I'm sick of living here in this small place surrounded by darkness, who is the old me talking to? My emeralds caught both of them and the strange scene unfolding before me, a strange memory, by all means, one where the old me was shocked, and the one in the mirror sad. Iris clenched her fists as hard as she could, piercing the nails in her hand to control the different emotions. Ugh. The reflection stared at her behavior attentively, taking note of every action. Blood came out of her skin, painting the floor with tiny drops, moaning softly from its pain. Yet. The coldness in her heart allowed her to hold everything in as much as possible, despite fluttering. W who are you? Why are you there? The reflection's eyes blinked, answering, I am, I'm here because I was locked inside this mirror a long time ago. The clean light blue eyes trembled, showing off a teary expression, to that Tyrus replied confused, I'm sorry, but I couldn't hear your name and locked. Why would someone do that to you? Once more the reflection spoke, if you didn't hear it. Then you won't be able to till I'm out of here. My name, too, is sealed within these chains. The girl's hands grabbed onto one another, feeling bad within herself. Oh, poor girl. As for why I got sealed well, I killed someone very important a while ago. The first king of Ludruka, the founder of it. Iris remembered the name of the current kingdom and thought out loud, Ludruka. There's no kingdom with such a name. The girl inside the mirror heard it, punching the mirror, surprising Iris and proceeding to shout, what, just how long am I trapped here, tears fell from the reflection blue eyes as she fell on her knees, the sole detail that was different from Iris's figure, the girl in the attic, feeling pity for the one trapped in the mirror, 
attempted to console her, hey it's okay, everything will be okay, what can I do to get you out of there? Iris's reflection stopped crying upon hearing that, I no longer have a physical body, so I need an individual that fulfills three conditions. What are they? Iris asked innocently, without expecting anything in return, except perhaps a friend and, of course, granting the girl some freedom, and, if possible, even happiness. First someone willing to do a soul bond contract with me, second someone that has enough magical potential, and third Iris, a little sad, interrupted the girl and pointed out hastily. I'm not really sure what a soul bond contract thing is, but I've never used magic. The reflection stared and waited for her to finish patiently. I'm Iris, also only 10 years old, so I don't know if I'm someone who can help you get out of there. Don't worry, Iris, since you can see me. Your potential is the real thing. Really? I can use magic? The innocent girl asked, hopeful, smiling as she had never done before. If you wish to take me out of here, Iris, then yes. Both girls heard a sound, steps approaching, someone coming up the attic stairs. Ah, so, this is where the little bitch was. Joe and her stepbrother shouted angrily, holding on to a long knife. What are... As Iris was about to finish saying the question, Joan jumped on her. No. Stop, let me go. Iris did her best to stop his lustful self, despite being overwhelmed by him. A young, fit man. Compared to her adopted brother, she was an underfed skinny girl. He started cutting off her clothes, hurting parts of Iris's skin in the mix, blinded by the lust of wanting to abuse her. The shouts from the assaulted girl echoed through the attic, and suddenly... The reflection's voice reached her ears alone, causing her eyes to gaze up to the mirror as she was laying down, with her back glued on the cold wooden floor. Iris, touch this glass wall fast with your hand, and make the contract with me. Iris struggled, kicking his brother's leg, making his own leg slip to the side, causing him to lose balance. His arm waved, and the knife pierced Iris's chest. She started coughing blood, some of it tainting Joan's face, frightening his deluded self making him back away from her, cowering from his actions. Iris took the chance to use her remaining energy as a red liquid kept pouring from the chest wound, coloring the floor, paving away. With the utmost sacrifice, her arms crawled upon the blooded river, allowing a desperate expression to paint the girl's face, persisting through an almighty pain, unlike anything she had felt before. But her sacrifice was not in vain. Her left hand reached out, touching the mirror and the light eluded from doing so. And then suddenly, despite her consciousness faltering, she heard a whisper close to her ear. From today onwards, your soul is mine, Iris. The suffering girl, stared at the mirror, smiling softly, for she had made a friend, if only for a brief moment. The girl then declared nonchalantly, pushing her long hair back with one hand. My name is... As she was about to tell Iris her name, the poor girl's heart stopped beating from the blood loss and she died. My subconscious faded, and my eyes opened, granting me the ability to see my present life. I understand now. I took a deep breath, closing my eyes to my past, embracing the obscurity that dwelled around me. Aurora, is that your name? I attempted to converse without knowing if I truly spoke, as I could not hear my voice inside this darkness. Suddenly, upon my invocation, beautiful lightful particles began leaving my chest one after another, and then it clashed, dark and light, one at the other, a ferocious war between the two elements. Notice, due to soul bound, the system seal is breaking, is that a good or a bad thing? If something is sealed, it generally means that it's bad, no? Unless, my memory showed me the girl trapped inside the mirror and I recalled her words, the sorrow that came with them, the despair of being locked, and the same emotions I had endured throughout my entire life. Without putting too much thought into it, I decided then she must be trying to set herself free from that awful prison. Status skill, I know you can hear me, I want to help the trapped girl inside of me, please, notice, the entity consumed all your mana, my consciousness faded thanks to mana exhaustion as it had happened to me before, entity, time to destroy this seal. Suddenly, the darkness burst out from within hitting the ring of light surrounding my body with a pincer attack, consuming it entirely. Notice, seal removal concluded. Notice, the contract between two souls can now terminate. Laughter echoed through my room. Notice, 
the entity devoured the curse, you won't escape me, Iris, notice, the entity cursed the soul contract, turning it unchangeable by any means, system, you have received the titles, soul bound, and reincarnated, notice, you have received three skills, unidentified, item inspection, and material evaluation, system working, an error has occurred, the same individual cannot have two titles of the same type, an error has occurred, the same individual cannot receive two extra skills from the reincarnated title, looking for a solution, success, merging titles, success, title reincarnated plus has emerged, merging skills, success, unique skill appraisal has emerged, notice, entity has used a skill against you, notice, no longer under the effects of the dark element, status updated, 8, chapter 33, my weary senses awakened slowly upon a strange lullaby and a soft patting throughout my hair, you have the eyes of God, the lips of a rose, it took no time at all for our gazes to meet and when they did, my mouth opened briefly but no words came out, you're awake, her unbothered tone gave sense and calmness to my confusion. Why you, Aurora the one you saved from the mirror in your past life, didn't I release your memory? I got up from the floor, receiving her help to sit on the bed close to us. She looked just like me if it wasn't for her blue eyes, clearer ones than the sky tone on a clear sunny day. Aurora, she muttered a sound upon being called, Aurora. I embraced her in my arms causing her to be slightly surprised yet dared not to utter a word. Instead. Her arms took me in, sheltering my body, I'm so glad you're okay now, it took quite the effort to free myself from that cursed system, so that's what happened, our bodies distanced from one another, allowing me to have a proper look at her once more, why do you look so much like me, it's thanks to my transformation skill, quickly, she changed into a floating book, that's amazing, what else can you transform in, excitement took over me feeling blissful for this new type of magic that I had never seen anyone use, clapping twice, doing tiny jumping with my bottom on the bed like a little kid, she reverted back to a human being, can't communicate in a grimoire form and this one feels better overall, thank you for showing me, a smile escaped my lips, one that she didn't mimic, you can't chat because the grimoire doesn't have a mouth, I guess, her head tilted to the side, crossing her arms, I could see at least, uck, her reply came out in a cold tone despising being a magical book, to have one thing but not the other, it's so strange, laughter escaped through my lips innocently, unaware of her emotions, to think you'd keep your name from your past life Iris, her expressionless gaze pierced me, true, I was surprised myself, but it feels best like this, also, your name is very pretty Aurora, it sounds lightful, I irradiated my happiness towards her, thank you, her gaze fell on the space between the two of us, it's ironic you say that as I have the unique dark element, that element, does that mean, that you were the one who had it back then when I did the test with my parents, yes, when you activated yours, mine got activated too, thanks to that, ever since then, I've been eating the light from that stupid seal, her hand shone, passing it through her hair, straightening it magically, apparently not only do I get sealed in our past life, but I also received the same treatment in this world by the system, and it even cursed me too, I rub my fingers onto each other, feeling awkward and sorry about her, the seal is gone isn't it, yes, and the curse, I absorbed it with my dark element and it became a skill, a skill, what does it do, I don't know, she sighed, I really do wonder what it does, without wanting to bother her, I repeated to myself in a lower voice entangled in my own curiosity, would you like to see it? Her dull expression struck me as if making me a favor. Sure, please show me. She extended her left arm to the side of the bed and shouted, Mirror, it's the one from back then. I'm surprised it even kept its appearance. An antique mirror bigger than ourselves about 2 meters tall and 40 centimeters in width. Since it's a skill and his glass maybe it reflects magic, I took out my shoe and surrounded it with a bit of mana. Notice, 10 mana has been deducted. Before allowing the effect to subside, I threw it at the glass without much force, avoiding it to possibly break. The moment it collided, the shoe disappeared, and then, I felt something hitting the back of my head. Ouch. Quickly, I caressed the pain spot with my slender fingers, looking at the source of the damage. What the? Notice, 1 health has been deducted, behind me. There was my shoe immobile. Cursed. 
Mira, Aurora declared with a cold tone along with an eerie expression, looking at it while shivering slightly. How curious, unsatisfied. I threw my shoe again to understand what happened, this time ducking the moment it hit the glass, losing a bit more mana. To our surprise, nothing happened other than the object landing successfully on the floor upon losing its momentum. Without spending mana, I attempted with many objects, noticing that nothing happened and also how resilient the glass was. So strange, it's not working anymore. I stole a glance at Aurora's way but at that, she shrugged her shoulders feeling as clueless about it as I did. Have you tried to go inside? I don't want to. I've had my share of it. Her tone was the coldest yet. For her, my question only made a collection of all the horrors of being locked inside of it. You're right. I'm sorry. Would you like to try it? Though you could get stuck inside. So I don't suggest it. Her sorrowful expression eluded me to give it a try. Knowing that she was next to me gave me the strength and will to go forth with the unthinkable, I'll do it for her to show her that everything is alright now, my conviction to make a difference was grandiose, big enough to get out of bed and move closer to it, I'll try to support her, and do my best to open her heart, I recollected the long time I spent with my parents, these past 15 years that had helped me improve in some manners, I smiled innocently at her, since the curse is gone, I hope something interesting to happen, and without giving it a second thought, my hand fell on the glass, going as far as to put some strength into it, then I tried it with both and even pushed it becoming a bit red on my cheeks, it doesn't work Aurora, upon hearing me out, she left the bed in a hurry, confused, and then, once next to me, her nail lightly tapped on it, realizing that it was now devoid of magic, empty just like a normal mirror, why doesn't it work, did the dimension perish just like that, she muttered, feeling relieved about it, breathing deeply to calm herself down, mind if I try something else, I asked her politely with a kind smile, go ahead, and be at ease, you're like, a sister, yes, family, her icy eyes gazed down at my feet, muttering that last word one last time, clenching her fingers almost tripping her wrists with her long and sharp nails, like, why don't you become my real sister, I mean, we even have the same appearance, Iris, do you mean like twins, she leaned her head forward, allowing the hair to cover part of her face, taking an interest in the idea, yes, we are very hard to distinguish disregarding there, and then I realized what my parents had always told me, my eyes are green, yes, her hand passed through her hair, pushing it all the way back, fixing her curved posture, my reflection was no longer one whose eyes were melancholic, they were of a beautiful green like the outside grass similar to the saintess's hair, if your parents accept, that'll be fine, I'll convince them if I have to, my voice cheered her up, this time around, I attempted to inject some of my mana directly into the mirror, yet, nothing happened once more, ceasing my curiosity as I had no other experiment, I took a quick look at my status, looking for any changes caused by releasing Aurora from wherever she was sealed in, skills, active skills, status, system library, freezing four tenths, passive skills, mana control three tenths, swordsmanship two tenths, unique skill, appraisal, extra skill, unidentified, unique skill appraisal, unidentified skill, what are these things? The first one I don't know, but the second one I also received from the soul bound that connects us, do you know what it does? I don't, I see, we looked at the skills together, making me aware that she was able to see my own screen, we usually can't share the status, might be due to our souls being connected, does that mean that they are one? My head tilted slightly to the side as my eyes brimmed with curiosity, <laughs> partly, really, yes, upon the contract, before you died it connected our souls for all eternity, her arms spread as her hands waved gracefully through the air, showing me how prolonged such a distance could be, oh, I voiced lowly, not expecting her explanation, however, I hadn't known there was a price to take upon releasing her from the mirror, as I was about to ask her more information about this peculiar oath, the door of my room opened, giving way to my mother, I'm back, she stared dumbfounded at us, citing the differences between us, quickly finding the right one, me with green eyes, what in the world is this, why there's a copy of you, her shouts rain down like thunders splitting trees in half, it's okay mother, she's my friend, and apparently, transform back, please, upon my request, she returned to being a floating grimoire, 
at that mom approached us, grabbing her, going as far as to open, scrolling through her many pages, there empty, her gaze returned to me before continuing. What's the meaning of this? Yes, it's a magical book that can copy my look. Upon feeling it shaking, her hands let go of it, allowing it to float back to the top of the bed gaining some distance and transforming back into human form. And then with an annoyed expression, she complained, it's truly annoying how I can't speak in that form. A magical weapon? My mother murmured unsure of what she was, I've been reincarnated as a grimoire. She pulled her hair behind the shoulders, freeing her cute face, reincarnated, my mother pondered for a while, not believing her ears, it was common knowledge that humans went through the cycle of life and death, however, they were able to reincarnate once more on their own race, not as a book like this figure had. I quit, my mother swayed her head to the sides, not understanding how this was possible, but, her eyes took a serious gaze at the girl, who are you? My name is Aurora. I met Iris in our past life. Her gaze raised as if remembering things from back then, a different world. Could it be? We stared at Rosalind's expression. There was something peculiar about it, almost as if she was reaching a sudden realization. When Iris was younger and the dark element appeared, was it yours? Yes, Iris. Her glance wavered as if she was collecting the necessary strength to ask one of us something. Mum? I questioned innocently keeping my calm self. This situation was bound to happen, I knew that, however, it was still nerve-wracking, but showing such emotion would just cause my parents to be in an uproar and I couldn't allow that to happen, did you? She gulped dryly before focusing her gaze on me, I had some memories but, I leaned my head a bit, disappointed with myself, scared about the reaction they could have had back then. Some of them were sealed by the system, giving her a hard time. I looked at Aurora slightly dumbfounded, she was taking my side without me asking her to, that explains how you learned everything so fast. I consented with a nod, approaching them, telling my mother about my past life, everything but the way I met Aurora. I had the urge to save her ominous words about she having killed the king of a certain kingdom. My mother hugged me very tightly, embracing Aurora in it, the three of us remained still in her motherly love. It had saved me many times and I hoped the same would go for my newly gained twin. Our conversation quickly deepened. We spoke of an ancient contract that persisted even to this very day. Of my death being entangled with her life. If either of us met our end, the other would too. But in exchange, my mother didn't have to worry about this new figure. Unlike other humans, at the very least this one was innately a trusting ally as neither of us wished to die. All right girls. Let's go eat something as we chat some more, at her words I smiled, getting hold of Aurora's hand, and pulling her to me, I don't need to do human things, I'm ultimately, a book, she frowned at her own words, disgusted for calling herself that, how about sleeping, I asked wondering about what it was like for her during the grim eye side of the transformation, I can shut down a bit but it's something different than sleeping, it's more like fixing myself, I suppose. Her strange term made me wonder if it had something to do with getting damaged and similar to us humans, the way it allowed us to recover some health. I see. Mom got up and said, well keep us company at the very least. Fine, let's go. Amidst our conversation, my mom attempted to give us an opportunity. Well, you both have received a new chance to live happily. I know for a fact that my little Iris has. Her gaze quickly fell on my twin. So feel free to grab that chance too. Perhaps one day at a time, that's how I started, softly, I added some warm hopeful words, finishing with a smile full of happiness. I know sister, I copied your memories. You can copy memories? Mother asked surprised, making some of the breadcrumbs fly to the table. Ah, not anymore, I was able to when I was sealed inside Iris, does that mean, you possess the knowledge of what I taught her? Yes, she averted the gaze from us speaking in a cold manner. We did our best to not mind it. After all, everyone had a past, and hers could have been complicated. How about swordsmanship? I questioned her curiously. I have, but I don't have the skill or the feel for it. Is that so? Hastily, I took on a big bite of the bread, causing the butter to drip onto the table. Don't be in such a rush baby. Mother passed a cloth on it, cleaning up my little mess. Yes, I'm sorry, I spoke with my mouth full causing her to flick my forehead, 
narrowing my eyes to my cute small nose. I gulped it all down my throat. I still haven't received any new books, the ones in your skill. Yes, I frowned carving for more. Did you finish all the ones you had to read? Yes. System library. I had a quick look throughout the list, noticing Aurora's finger touching my screen, but unlike mine, hers went through, can only see. Her murmur reached my ears, she, too, was grabbing this carefree chance to learn more about this new world where she was now stuck alongside me. System library, world of Atana 1, 2, fishing 1, 2, baking 1, 2, cooking 1, 2, farming 1, 2, lumberjack 1, 2, hunting 1, 2, maid 1, 2, butler 1, 2, minor 1, 2, world of Atana, fishing, baking. Aurora started reading from my screen uninterested in them. I'll let you read them soon, briefly smiled at her, feeling mesmerized to share these books with her. I already know these, she reminded me once again of something that I wasn't quite used to. Oh right, then, I wondered a bit thinking about what I could say that would make her happy, whenever I get new ones. Fine, she added briefly, not sounding as cold as usual, perhaps this was of her interest. With some luck, she, too was a fellow bookworm. Suddenly, she twisted her fingers causing a loud snap. Have you tried to use your skill in books? Aurora figured there could be a similar way to copy things as she had done with my memories. I didn't think of that. Having finished eating, I left the table and ran to my room where I had my old birthday gift. Once I grabbed the book from inside the box I used my skill on it, hoping to bring a new change. 8. Chapter 34 After exhausting my mana, the screen in front of me appeared with newer information, allowing my eyes to glimmer in shades of happiness. System library, world of Atana 1, 2, 3, fishing 1, 2, baking 1, 2, cooking 1, 2, farming 1, 2, lumberjack 1, 2, hunting 1, 2, maid 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, butler 1, 2, 3, 4, minor 1, 2, tales of Atana 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It actually worked. The book that had been gifted by Elise's mother along with its ten tales was now on the last place of the list, and the ones that I already had seemed to gain more volumes to them. This made my heart race, bursting with an unfathomable amount of happiness, for books were priceless little gems. My legs took me out of the room, my pulsating heart ecstatic. It took me no time to sneak upon Aurora hugging her from behind, did it work? Yes, thank you so much, I smiled gratefully, rubbing my cheek on hers, you're welcome. After talking about all kinds of things with my sister and mother, the two of us returned to the room and took a seat on the bed, as I held on her hand a message resonated within me, notice, do you wish to make a contract with that weapon, a contract? Hastily. I wondered about the fact our souls were already bound, yet my skill status didn't seem to acknowledge that as sufficient. Notice, a contract between a being and an item, depending on the grade of the grimoire, it'll grant benefits to both, not sure she'd be happy with such a contract. I glanced at her, who was staring at the mirror in a brown dress she wore shortly after returning to my room. What's wrong? Hum, I gulped. Would you like to make a contract with me? Don't we have one already? Her icy eyes fell on me, one between our souls. I looked away, placing a finger under my chin, compiling the information given by my status skill. This one is different. It's a contract between us, who we are. I took a quick breath unwilling to call her a weapon, but having to, between Grimo Ire and human. Her gaze returned to the mirror, taking her time to think about it. She didn't have many expressions, to be fair. I had yet to see her smile or do anything other than be cold, but I knew about the memory of that garden, the way she had been locked in it for a long time. I didn't know how long that had been, but certainly, being alone in such a place would make a person change. For once, I couldn't possibly be alone for longer than I felt needed, especially now with my very few friends and my lovely parents. A sigh escaped her lips, her expression looked tattered almost as if she had a discussion with her inner self, possibly calculating the pros and cons. If I die, you'll die, and the other way around also applies, her words caused me to frown, understanding the overwhelming weight that they carried. I understand, she turned to me, averting her gaze, be sure to not mistreat me, sister, of course, I promise, 
you're my twin after all. And in her mind gratitude roamed within, only because you were the one who saved me, Iris. She smiled briefly at me, causing my heart to encompass a tremendous amount of bliss. Status skill, how do I make a contract? Notice. Write your name on the first page of the Grimo Eye with the tip of your finger imbued with your element. That's interesting. What is? Her tilted self, looked at me unaware of the instructions I received. I'll show you, but I need you to revert and come here. I spread my hands to her which caused her to transform, floating, and then docking on my palms. I-R-I-S, letter by letter, I muttered as I signed it. For the first time in forever, a screen of my status opened by itself. Notice, Soulbound has reacted. The two souls have further assimilated to a total ratio of 2%. System, the title contract has been received. Soulbound, Master Core, Subdomain, Soul Assimilation Rate, 2%. Upon the new information, I realized then that my soul was the most important aspect. Going as far as to regard my twin soul as an extra that I seem to be absorbing, or something comparable. Ugh, not again. My eyes closed causing me to faint on the sheets. A memory of Aurora resounded in my mind. My eyes took a glimpse of a lonesome girl exploring an incredibly large and beautiful garden. A complete fantasy by itself. The grass was always so fresh, and soft. I could notice the time passing, but I was not aware of how fast it went. As much as she loathed it, speaking ill of the mirror a while ago, I could see her relaxed face on top of the lustrous green, making me want to lay down next to her. The soil had no fishes, nor bugs. The only life form other than her were the very plants and flowers that adorned the view. They remained in a blossomed state, divine beauties, each of them. It was clear just how perfectly nourished they were, causing me some confusion as there was not a hint of rain in that place. Thanks to having become a farmer to make some money and complete some achievements, I had some knowledge of how impossible that scene was. I am. I heard the hint of sorrow in the girl's voice. She didn't seem to know who she was. I thought to myself how that was feasible. Was it even possible for us to forget who we once were? This place puts me at ease. Yet why is it that I can't help but not be content to stay in it? The way she spoke alone made my heart ache. I wanted to give her a hug, to tell her I'm here, but sadly, this was but a memory. I glimpsed at the long walks she had, never finding a pattern of flowers that looked the same, no matter the direction she went. Staying in the same spot for a good portion of time didn't amount to much either. There were many things the girl attempted to do, but nothing ever changed aside from her. It's so brilliant. The blue aura around her kept growing despite her being unable to use magic inside this dimension. I can feel it. A tremendous pressure piled up inside of me wishing to be used. She befriended many flowers, talking with them, singing, even playing, always seeking a way out of this place. The exit to this maze. Why am I lost in this garden? I heard her madness take shape. The white dress she was in fitted her pale self. It reflected the infinite sunlight beautifully. I don't remember the night, she murmured, causing me to understand that there had been a time she had been outside. The long-forgotten sense of being hungry of being tired, and of being sleepy, day by day without ever stopping looking for a crack, a rupture, a hidden door, or something to get me out. Poor girl, my heart pitied her as it had never done so for anyone before. My past life had been awful, but hers. A lot worse, no doubt. Who am I? Why am I here? Why can't I leave? Her many screams filled the place, echoing, disappearing. She scratched her head, ripping some of her silky smooth white hairs. Stop sealing my memories, my very existence from the outside world. Please, stop hurting yourself, I told her in my mind, crying in vain. After walking for who knows how long, she found a golden rose, bending the knee by its side, smelling it, so fragrant, so nostalgic. Strangely it made her at peace, causing her icy blue eyes to sparkle with admiration, consumed by the very essence of that flower. I wouldn't mind becoming a little flower like you, you know? At that moment, she scratched the top of her head, and then reached out to it, attempting to pluck it out of the earth, upon contact with the stem where thorns patiently awaited to be touched. Her finger skin ripped, causing blood to drip, turning the green into red. I forgot beautiful roses have thorns, silly me. She smiled in pain. A strong breeze flew through the garden passing by the rose, bringing many kinds of petals and making them fly. The petals circulated around her in a twisting way, 
like a little tornado making them float randomly. It's so beautiful like a festival of fireworks. The rose was shaken by the wind, causing it to nod like humans would in agreement. This time around, her fingertips approached the petals, sensing a heartbeat like no other from it. Surprised, her hand left in a rush, wondering what was this sensation all about. I've never seen anything like you before. She took a quick glimpse at every other flower, finding nothing but heartlessness. This one was vivid, mysteriously so. All of them have friends and family yet you seem lonely like me. Maybe there's a chance we could be friends. At that moment I saw her finger tremble, healing. What is that flower? My confusion remained as Aurora's expression became bewildered, jumping off the grass in shock. My finger? The skin was intact and smooth as the rest of the hand soft like silk as if nothing had happened in the first place. You who gave me pain and also who comforted me through healing, will you tell me the way out of this place? A wind blew against the rose and this time it nodded in a different direction resembling a human saying no by swaying its head. Ah, the poor girl burst into tears. What have I done to deserve such an excruciating suffocating life? The golden rose became heavier and heavier with every single drip. When don't you let me go no matter what? It gave no response like past times. Not that it did in the first place, but her delusional self thought so. If taking your life will free me that is what I shall do. A strong warm breeze went against her like a warning. The tears that had fallen from Aurora were now descending between the petals through the stem down to the very roots as if the golden rose was shedding her own tears. Her hands approached the rose's body, plucking it from the earth suffocating the rose. Her hands became bloody, and slowly the flower lost its color, becoming grayer and grayer withering away. This time a new flower did not grow back in its place. Her hands sheltered the top of her head. I remember. I remember. No. Please no, don't stop it. The fragments were filthy and vile, too much for an innocent lost soul to conceive. Madness echoed every inch of her ill brain, corrupting its every cell with the truth of her past. The protection she was receiving from this dimension had worn off as its guardian died and now the girl looked dead, expressionless like a marionette whose strings had been cut. What once was a beautiful land devoid of sin, was now being plunged by a wave of pure and almighty darkness. In the soaring heights, daylight faded at every pacing second, and far away from the path Aurora had taken, a neary white smile took shape in its very blackened sky. The night was coming to consume it all. Noticing this she started to beg for forgiveness. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. The yells didn't amount to much. Fear in another way, caused her legs to run in the opposite direction, towards the leftover fading light. I saw the way she tripped and dragged her skin, advancing no matter what pain came to her, the tears distorted her vision similar to looking through a glass lens that didn't suit the person's eyes, the things she saw became my own, temporarily so. Far away after running for a long time, something picked her sight, there was a mirror, and she approached it, on the other side of the mirror, there was a blonde girl. I saw how badly she tried to go to my encounter, me from back then, now. Knowing that there was something that evil corroding the garden, I too, in her place, would have done my best to escape, but the mirror did not allow her physical body to go through. The curse was meant to keep her from running away, feeding the vile presence within with her anguish till the day it had grow strong enough to consume the poor girl's soul. So she thought very hard, feeling the magic returning to her body. What can I do to escape? Every forbidden spell ran over her vast mind at a quick pace. It was thanks to the vast amount of information that filled her brain as memories burst like grand explosions in it. Soul bound. If that doesn't work, I'll die in this place. She took quick glances at the darkness that slowly made its way here, taking its time to consume the very seal. I don't have much time left. I must make a contract with this girl and save my soul. Everything is better than the darkness behind me, even becoming her slave. Her hands turned into fists and she bumped onto the glass, vowing to herself, in exchange, I'll only ask one favor from her, to be able to avenge myself, to kill the god of light, the sage, and the hero, a far darker depravation than the entire night behind the girl, took on the shape of a maleficent expression on her beautiful face. I will destroy everyone in this world that treated me as a monster, devouring everything but this girl. Expectantly, she looked at me with eyes full of hope causing the glass to shine. Can you help me? I'm trapped inside this mirror, 
and the old me looked at her innocently, causing this memory to fast forward to its conclusion, the few bits that I hadn't fully recovered. I saw her pass through the mirror, leaving her physical self behind to be destroyed. The darkness of that place turned everything black fulfilling its mission. The night consumed the place, bringing a swift end to that small flowery world. On the other side, she knelt, whispering in my ear. From today onwards your soul is my Naris and my soul is yours, related to the question that remained unanswered. My name is Aurora the woman that will destroy this world. Thus her hands reached out to the air, causing an ominous power to surround them. Death to those of this house. But Iris, it spread like blight through the entire mansion killing my stepmother, stepbrother, stepsister, maids, butlers, and of course my father. And then she saw my eyes close, feeling my life extinguishing. But. I just came out of that prison, she stretched her hands to me, and upon touching me, my body sucked her soul and mirrored deep into my core, for thousands of years, Aurora's soul walked through this dimension, but now, she was finally free. 7. Chapter 35, A chilly sensation flowed down my eyes, leaving a watery sensation on its path, it felt no different than a tiny snail crawling atop my skin, yet it was distinct, it felt colder and lighter. My hands trembled from the cold as they reached out for my cheeks finding what felt to be the remnant of tears. Why is it so dark? The curtains were open, allowing me to glimpse outside, finding out that it was night time. Did I sleep through the afternoon? My body ached, and my head felt like a fruit cracking from within after falling from a branch. Unlike me, Aurora was nowhere to be found, but I could hear the voices of my parents in unison with her own. Slowly, I reached out for my forehead caressing off its pain as I did my best to stand. Shaky steps took me outside the room, guiding me to the bathroom where I sat on the toilet. With a quick jump, I managed to lower my trousers along with my underwear. A stream flowed, relieving my inwards and weirdly enough decreasing a bit of my pain. Ah, this sensation couldn't possibly be less than living in heaven. I had so much pee in me that the sound of it coming out was similar to frying chicken with oil in a pan. After washing myself, I left wondering what to do today. Luckily for us, my parents had allowed Aurora to live with us without any issues. Given the reasoning that our souls were connected was probably enough reason for them to not even think twice, more yet given the fact that she was a mysterious entity with possibly some power. Good morning dad. Hello, he waved hurriedly entering the bathroom. It seemed he had been waiting for me to finish. In a few steps, I returned to my room, meeting my fellow roommate, Aurora. Her gaze left the window falling on me. What would you like to do today? Wise. Question. Her words were terribly calm as if she herself was a lake that remained still and everything that lived in it was dead. But in my heart, I couldn't be happier with her presence, having gained a new family member. Yes, that sounds like a plan. What does? The vividness in her eyes returned as she acquired my presence once more. Sharing information. Let's start with my side, as soon as she said that she changed forms. I approached her confused, taking hold of it. Notice, Grimo Eye compatibility with unique skill appraisal is 100%. Do you wish to register a new spell? Sure. I felt a piece of me subside and pass on the page. The appraisal was its title and below an intricate circle took form. Inside the complex circular lines and triangular shapes, a black and inked lotus flower appeared. Notice, the Grimo Eye can now answer your questions in exchange for tremendous amounts of mana. Status, how do I know if I have enough mana? Notice, with insufficient amounts, the chant will not proceed. I understand, my skill was pretty amazing in the way it explained my skills to some extent, though there were a lot of other things that it didn't tell me a single word about. Thus, I started to wonder what kind of doubts this so-called spell could do for me. Yet, unsure if we even had enough mana I closed the book, permitting Aurora to return to a more human-like shape. Unexpected, she muttered satisfied with the outcome of this irregular situation. It's the first time I hear my skill say such a long word, I giggled, knowing it wouldn't be for naught. Ever since the days when I fainted from lack of mana, I took my safety with a lot more carefulness. She moved next to me and caused a familiar panel to appear. Entity, Aurora, Contract. Weapon, Grimoire, Grade, Trash, Rank, Zero, Durability, Ten Tenths, Mana Container, Ten Tenths, Soul Container, Zero Slash, Class, Speciality, 
All these new values made me open my mouth in shock, this is my information, I don't have a status skill like you, but I can still share a bit of me, without being able to hold myself back, I shouted, there are so many things, the only things I know what they are, aside from the self-explanatory ones, she scoffed at her own words, at that I said nothing, analyzing all these peculiar numbers and letters, so, I did become her master, I lacked a sense of superiority over others, but it still reassured me that I was the one above, as naive as I often was, there was this strange sense of familiarity towards Aurora, it felt like our relationship was sheltered by something I couldn't quite put my fingers on, if I get damaged, I lose durability whereas you'd lose health, I nodded at her words, showing that I could keep up with her explanation, container here is the ability for me to receive your mana and keep it saved, that's nice, there hadn't been a single time where I could say I had enough mana to survive in the wild, but it was also true that no matter what I did, it would take a long time before I could increase my parameters through achievements, or harder yet, by slaughtering humanity's enemies and acquiring experience points to level up, eventually gaining new points, though, by the looks of it, the amount it could store was so low that it felt useless, knock sounds on my door caused us to become aware of someone opening it slowly, dad, hey, I wanted to let you know that I spoke with Vicent during the night, his eyes fell on Aurora before continuing, so that you can move through the village as a normal girl. The story is that you were very ill since the day you were born having received no element. I understand, before allowing my dad to go on, I voiced in protest, why there? But he interrupted me, following with a serious, cold tone, the church would hunt her if they knew what she has. The Pope and the Saintess, she muttered with a dark expression as if the subject made her grief showing awareness of their existence, exactly, he yawned feeling somewhat relaxed and suffering with a lack of the usual dose of rest, causing his consciousness to almost fade, I need to go work, we'll talk later, have a good day dad, we traded smiles while Aurora stood still, possibly pondering on one of these topics, oh right, I gave her the adventurer's card with her name, I'm not sure if it'll have any use for you but it's yours, right, she placed it on the table knowing there was no way to kill monsters on her own, as a grimoire, she was quite limited compared to the deeds that once happened in her life, as much as I don't like this, I can't do much as I am now, her eyes glanced in my direction, sadly, swiftly with pity in my tone, I responded, wishing to be able to do more for her, but unable to, after remembering something and searching for it in the usual place. I stole a glimpse at her figure, were you my magical diary? Yes, so, I hid in embarrassment for the words I had written in it had been personal and intimate, of course, she had copied my memories, but I still couldn't cope with it, are you worried about what I know? I swayed my head to the sides, I'm on your side, I looked innocently at her, expectantly and caressed by those words, they meant a lot to someone like me who had suffered at the hands of what should have been a good and very wealthy family, I'm as you saw a trash graded weapon in this world, but at least, you should be able to grow stronger, feeling the unease and worry in her tone, I gripped the fingers of my feet, I won't abandon you, she faced the window, becoming enveloped by its light, I am not a good person, she added and bothered as if those words meant nothing to her, I don't mind, she, too, attempted to save me, if she had been successful, Aurora would have been my first friend, I who sought people's warmth the most, couldn't possibly deny her existence in all this, I owed her just like she owed me, and I believed with all my heart that if our roles were reversed, she would have done the same for me, very well, let's work hard for you to get a good class, I couldn't believe what my ears had heard, after all, I had been trying my hardest to be helpful to other parties as a helper, in exchange, I learned what a few monsters were like, how they acted, and how to outdo them, I had worked so hard that I almost cried when I received the promotion, and now my twin wanted me to help me get what my dad had attained, how, I'll gather some information while you focus on those quests, she pointed at her card, I'd need to make a party and, elegantly, she interrupted me, solo, but the guild rules, she picked up her card, I'll team up with you, but you can't fight, true, but you can, she smirked briefly before pointing at me, knowing the minimum party for any quest had to be two members, your level one with zero experience, I doubt the system would reward someone that has done nothing with a good class, if it was me, 
I would only give something useful to those who worked very hard by themselves. Yes, but, you're not a child Iris. You're not allowed to whine either. My eyes widened at her sermon yet I couldn't bring myself to utter a single word back. I know your worries, but I've also learned about your conviction and dreams. I nodded lightly at her words. As much as I wanted to contest them, they were right. Bad things had happened, people died and were injured while I stood on the back watching, mostly safe from harm. I had grown condescending and without realizing it, became a supporting tool to others, not even a relevant side character. My main focus had been on surviving ever since the first accident with my party members, a chortle left my despaired self, I, I could have done more, she faced me, causing her shadow to fall on me as if undergoing some sort of possession, and then, her arms extended to the sides, reaching out for my cheeks, and embracing them with her soft hands, you can become more, so much more, my eyes glittered, relieved of hearing such words. She had a strange way to captivate an immeasurable charisma and level of persuasion that enticed me in ways that I couldn't fathom to be possible. 7. Chapter 36 After the restless breeze accompanied me with the white touch of the once yellow dandelions throughout the greenery and barren roads, I arrived at Astia village's south entrance during the afternoon. Without waiting for the smoldering ground to warm my feet more than it should, my slim body hastened through the crowd of villagers. Some men in white cloth with green hexagrams were up on their backs, carrying long manufactured sticks, potentially wooden staffs, weapons of long-range casting, capable of turning their spells stronger and more accurate. Upon an unfortunate encounter with a foe, even to serve them as a shield against an attack, there were those with some finer leather clothes. Those whose eyes were golden sought the many profits from the people's trades, merchants, their purpose in life. Keen men with a talent for the numbers, some better than others, yet all very opportunistic, but what often piqued my curiosity was the one in a hundred passerby individuals who had masks as black as the night, leaving only their eyes uncovered. Those were good at losing their trackers and keeping themselves out of common sight. I, too, had attempted to chase one of them but hadn't taken me long to lose sight of their nimble movements. Such men were a rarity who'd be a more frequent tight cat during the night. It was due to that, that I dared not go out during such times through the village. Kidnappers existed, and there was a chance such men were behind the missing children. I grew up with some of the kids, but truth be told that the same number that I used to know was far from the same amount that remained. Initially, I thought they had moved away to a different village, perhaps even taken by their parents who wished for a chance of making their fortune in the great capital. But thanks to the severe warnings of my father, I withstood reasons to stay away from such men, always believing the worst. At least as long as no close friend got taken, or my sister, for that matter. I bite my tongue, thinking about them. I can't do much as I am now. There was hope in my sister's words. I could only wish no bad thing would happen before I obtain power, and if I didn't manage, then being able to find a way to get rid of the kidnappings wouldn't be bad either. A lot of goals for my young self. Such thoughts often roamed the endless sea inside my brain. Humans who were used to killing their own race were likely the toughest foes I could find. I dared not attempt to try my luck with them. Assassins, thieves, and all kinds of evildoers outclassed all my hopes. The madness of this world could easily trample anyone's goodwill. This, too, had been a great lesson from my father. He had seen despicable narcissists and vile nobles trampling over the peasants. Yet that was just the tip of the iceberg. Certainly, there were more secrets to humanity than the ones we knew. There was further chaos to pass through my emeralds, but for the time being, I stood true to myself. I made my way to the Adventurers Guild, through the center of the roads, waving to the people I knew. Many of them were not villagers I was acquainted with. Sometimes the gesture of saying good morning or doing a small wave at them with my left hand was enough to receive a similar one in return. There's good in others, despite the bad and sad things of our world, and I enjoyed delving into their kindness. Even with poverty, the taxes to the Pope and to the royal family, the citizens didn't rebel. Families who have more mouths than the ones they can feed, send a few to the church's orphanages. There they have to serve the men in white cloth, to become one of them and to spread the divine word, or, they're sent to the military barracks, where they are trained from a young age to turn into great soldiers. However, due to their birth origin, that's all they ever become. 
The blood in this kingdom dictated one's future possibilities for many generations, and it is no different for me. Born a peasant, dying as one, a sigh escaped my lips as I took a glimpse of the guild's entrance. As soon as I went through the entrance, the now familiar scent of booze entered my nostrils. It didn't bring thirst upon my throat. My mother often told me we needed to keep our minds sharp and Dale gave us a temporary sense of fake satisfaction and dullness. She had a drunkard master in the past, known by many as a sword master. Yet, there was one peculiar thing about him that distinguished him from the rest. He rarely accepted a new student, and more often than not, these individuals were hand-picked by his own measurements. Master Ray the Fallen Noble, I had engraved his title and name in my mind. Important information such as this was by no means a trivial concept. Sometimes knowing this kind of info could one day allow me to know who I'm up against. Thus, falling back, or if possible, completely avoiding my opponent, it was quite the same for the beasts and the monsters of Artana. This world had a lot of dangerous species. Knowing them by eyesight and name alone increased the odds of survival out there in the wild. Knowledge, while not the main factor of survivability, was still the one that could help an adventurer in many ways. For once, getting to know the surrounding terrain, especially during the moon season when the snow could trick with hidden depths. Or if it was necessary to make a fire, one should do so in open spaces with full visibility for any approaching foes but above all, to know the instinctive methods humanity foes use to hunt my weak kin. Took me thirty calm steps to reach the reception. Good morning. Good morning. How may I be of help? As soon as the man's words faltered, I placed the cards on top of the table. I'm here to form my party. My fingers spread the cards, showing that they were two and not one like it appeared to be, due to them being piled up. Just a moment, he retrieved them and checked their information. After taking some notes, he stole a glimpse in my way. Party name? Unknown, I added briefly, causing a guy from the table behind to chortle. He followed such self-amusement with the typical bully commentary, unknown indeed. The trio laughed at his words, knowing I was no one in this guild. Not a worthy adventurer, nor famous, nor anything in this line of work. Don't mind the ale for life party. He smiled briefly at me to not discourage my own. I've registered the party. As per the rules, no quest higher than F can be taken until the rank improves. Yes, thank you. I'd like one. In that case, your party can start with this one. He slid both cards along with a piece of paper my way and I got hold of them without hesitation, storing them inside the pocket of my jacket. After stealing a glance at the laughing men, who had red cheeks and yellow teeth, I made my way to the nearby farm where my first solo quest awaited. In this place, I became aware of a cushion of flies floating on top of a huge piece of poo, alerting me that animals likely lived nearby. Despite looking at my surroundings for a while, there were only chickens trapped within wooden fences, certainly not big creatures enough to do that kind of crap. Disregarding the smell, I went on, finding a familiar face from older times. Hello, Thomas. Are you? His hand shook as it held on his cane, possibly remembering my rare golden hair. That little miss? The scarecrow girl? I gleamed tenderly at him. How time flies. How have you been? Good and you? Growing older, he laughed, glancing over at Wes due to the commotion. A party came earlier for my request. I followed his sight, finding a group of possible adventurers in the distance. I've also come to help. His bewildered expression faced me. You've become an... And as he was about to finish his sentence, I showed him my card. You've truly grown up, little Iris. If I was still young, I'd burn those fiends with a torch. I heard they are very resistant to most things. He placed a second hand on the cane, as if exhausted from standing still. You've not heard wrong. Not at all. Those pieces of poo melt everything they come in contact with. They sound dangerous. They are. His eyes hovered over my waistline, especially since they managed to render metal completely useless. At his words, I gripped my mother's sword, holding it by the pommel, meaning I may not have much of a way to deal with them. Mages have it the easiest with all their elemental powers, I saw it with my own eyes, the way they reduced those nasty things with huge fireballs, though his excitement died briefly after. What's wrong Thomas? Well, the adventurers also turned the fields into ash back then. I'm sorry to hear that. Yes. It was almost better to leave them be, since they didn't eat everything. I averted my gaze from him, knowing that there had been other stories like his. The adventurers wouldn't be punished for damaging personal belongings, 
such was part of the contract the requester made with the guild, yet, it made me upset at how incompetent they had been, I looked at the location where the fight was going on, hoping to make a change, go on then, I stole a glimpse at him, believing he was looking at my determined self and cheering for me, I'll be back, hastily, I dashed to their encounter, noticing how they were all fighting by themselves quite spread from each other, what are they doing, the archer seemed to be having some trouble, running away from three slimes, I made my way to him, taking on my sword, as he got almost surrounded, one of the monsters stretched itself toward him, however, I managed to block its attack just in time, thank you, his eyes must have looked at me, not knowing me, who are you, Iris, I gave him a brief answer, feeling rather overwhelmed by the situation at hand, yet, as if taking this fight as a joke, he kept on talking, I'm Helios from the Hawk Party, what are you doing here alone, but before I could answer, the internal stream coming from the slime propagated to the tentacle, causing me to force my sword left then with all my strength right, forcing it to disconnect, annoying, I picked up the scent of burning behind me, causing me to steal a glimpse at him burning his arrow, just in case I moved a bit to the right, unknowingly if he accidentally hit me instead, he shot and pierced the slime setting it ablaze, its fluid self shook and made strange forms that weren't their usual seemingly one of round balls, innocently rolling through the ground and devouring everything that came in contact with them. Without wanting to give the monster an option to recover, I sliced it along with the flames from above, splitting it into two equal parts. System, you have received the title, Monster Slayer and Slime Slayer, notice, you have received 10 points of experience and 10 fame status updated, hey, that kill was mine, with the other slime approaching me, I had no time to apologize for stealing it accidentally, my bad, you can have the soul stone, add my words, he clicked his tongue, dashing to his party as if telling me to handle the rest on my own as punishment, seriously, I had just saved his life, and he acted so selfishly toward me in exchange, however, thanks to his running, one of the slimes went after him, allowing me to have a duel with the remaining one. Once again, I followed the same pattern, discovering that they'd halt their movements to stretch a part of themselves. As it did so, I parried the attack, pushing it away from me, taking a step closer, and slashing it in half. But there was no message like before, causing me to doubt its death. I jumped backward once, then twice, receiving a momentary chance to rub my sword on the greenery below watching over what I thought to be its corpse slowly gluing back anew, so annoying, I complained in my mind how unjust its regenerative abilities were, being able to heal its whole self, and worse yet, having suffered no damage whatsoever from my attack, the latter I couldn't prove, but its form didn't change, and it didn't look like it minded my attack, certainly even as a helper, there were some monster that I had heard about but never got to meddle, a linger of regret withstood within my heart for not having researched things properly, yet, in a fortunate way, the old man Thomas's words came to mind, allowing me to remember the fireball magic along with the way the archer had ignited his arrow, will it work? After waiting for the slime to try his luck once more, I blocked its upcoming stretching attack, freeze, its stretched part slowly turned more solid and white, allowing my hand to glue to the already made ice, Using less mana in the process, I used a lot of my energy to freeze even part of its body. Then, before he managed to melt it, I used my sword to slash through it, starting from the frozen layer for its particles to pierce the slime insides. Notice, system consumed 50 mana. You have received 10 points of experience and 10 fame. Status updated. I did it. I did it. For anyone else that may have seen me celebrating over killing these small fries, it may have looked silly and pitiful, but I was genuinely happy about succeeding, whereas before I was too scared to even try. She was right. I coveted Aurora's words about myself, and the way she declared I could become more and better if I gave it my all. I stole a glimpse at the party's way, realizing that Helios was pointing my way. Two of his members shook their heads to the side, moving even further away from me. Good job Iris, you've managed to make even more friends, I thought to myself in an old habit of talking to myself.
realizing that the party had put me on their blacklist. But I knew that the young man had overreacted and the price of the resources he had spent would be close to the soul stone value. I told myself these things to alleviate the pressure crushing me. Other people's feelings were often the cause of my anxiety as I was often misunderstood by my awkward self, but it also felt like they did it on purpose. Since young my friends weren't many, I needed one hand to count those who my heart trusted. There had been a lot of kids who grew up with me, which I became acquainted with, but age turned out relationships into a wider distance. The religion which propagated through the entire kingdom of Lumen made me a rare specimen. People were naturally not in favor of those who were different than what their goddess favored, but I, too, was a human being, and their actions and words hurt me. Age had made many of them aware of my blonde hair and eyes, they were jealous of my emeralds, yet couldn't care less about the rest. I thought to myself that I was quite cute, but all they cared about was for black-haired girls and boys, despite my best effort to come to terms with them. Their parents made sure to teach their kids that I was some sort of otherworldly creature. I'm just a human being like you. These had been the words I had used in one of my conversations with one of them, which led to them saying that I was too different. Thus as years passed, I closed myself to outsiders, keeping the few bonds I managed to get, and sheltering them without going too deep into either of them. Joe and Elise had been two of them, and Alice the third. I looked at my hand, realizing that there were at least two more fingers than the number of my successful friendships. I'm so pitiful. My complaints shook in my mind. More than anyone else, I desperately tried to make friends due to that horrible past life. Did I try too hard? Some things were hard to know. At times, I felt the higher beings had cursed me, especially her, the sovereign of humanity, the goddess Arya. Time and time again I felt myself distancing from her godliness feeling that a part of my unfortunate life was thanks to her doings. She could have given us happiness, I wished it for me and my family. My mother too had been discriminated against before, it was thanks to her stories that I withstood my ground without crumbling into pieces, learning that sometimes struggling through life was a must. A smile filled with despair formed on my face, life is so unfair. Truly, how I hated this part of living. With a melancholic expression and a long sigh, I grabbed the two soul stones and took them with me back to the adventurer guild. I looked at the party location, noticing the fight getting fiercer. The movements of the slimes became a bit more concentrated. Further behind them, there was a red ball, bigger in size, and with a circle below, transforming mana into an element. That looks like trouble. I held myself back after Helios complained about me stealing the kill. Their group of four was composed of two male archers, both with a leather set and quivers on their backs. A lady wielding a dagger, and a short figure covered in a black robe and her holding a club. The big slime waved slightly creating a red magical circle that would convert mana into elemental energy. And briefly after, a huge fireball followed. In a matter of seconds, the group dispersed further, especially the archers who dared not stay in the way of the upcoming projectile. The girl who was in front got struck by it, causing a yell filled with pain to roar through the land. The fireball upon collision dispersed to the sides, burning the surrounding greenery. The clear-looking creatures kept on attacking, forcing the survivors to retreat. I noticed how fast they ran away as the red monster kept channeling more energy, possibly preparing another projectile. If only I had helped, a bitter smile surfaced on my expression, knowing they deserved to be punished for their rude behavior. It didn't bother me someone had just died in front of my eyes, if anything, I just hoped it had been Helios. What will happen now? My gaze kept on the burning ground, realizing the woman's body hadn't been completely reduced to ashes. What is it doing? The red monster cancelled its channeling, moving closer to the girl, passing through the flames without a care in the world. Is it immune to fire? It made me realize the fire arrows against it were likely useless causing that monster to be quite nasty to deal with for that party. It's eating her. The way the creature shone beautifully and golden made me wonder what it received for eating the girl's soul stone. But I didn't dare to stay behind, unwilling to put myself in more danger. My mana was not enough to deal with that thing. Worse yet, it was not alone. I had heard the stories of fellow adventurers at the guild, the way a golden aura surrounded them every time they leveled up. It felt rather surprising how these monsters increased their levels not by killing but by consuming soul stones. I need to get more mana, 
For someone like me who wanted magic to be my main aspect, the parameters I currently possessed were rather lacking. Carefully, I made my way back to the guild. With levels, I'll receive status points. Then I'll spend them in wisdom to increase the max amount of magical energy my body can withstand. My head swayed in a calm manner, symbolizing myself agreeing with this little plan of mine. 9. Chapter 37 It didn't take long for me to return to the receptionist, even less to hear about the party reporting about the red slime. The quest I had among their own which was the same, ended up ranking up from the easiest tier F to one above, E. I ended up placing my hands inside my pockets, returning two pieces of paper that had practically the same information related to that mission. I had received one before and then another one after making the party. Of course, both were now outdated, for the danger had increased considerably for rookie adventurers and the helpers who joined low-tiered parties. It also reflected the reason why someone so easily met its end. It's impossible to prepare for every situation. The time I spent as a helper gave me some knowledge and experience. Many were the times when someone ended up hurt or dying. The reason I persisted despite it all, was the willingness to help humanity reduce the number of enemies, and I could also come to earn a lot of money after ranking up some. If I get enough experience points, each level up indicated we would get one status point every time, therefore, the 10 initial points I was born with were quite the bonus. I'd need at least 10 more levels to get another decent dose of what I had. Maybe with some levels, I'll unlock a rare class, I thought to myself, hoping such to come true, other than my father's class. It was then that without doing anything, a familiar yet strange message popped up. Notice, you've killed a chicken, you've gained five disgrace. What? My mouth opened in disbelief causing a few individuals to turn momentarily their attention to me. I turned my back to such gazes, placing the soul stones on top of the reception along with the paper the receptionist had given me. The man looked into it, adding with a serene, gentle expression, Your party also participated. Any injured? None. Splendid. His fingers got hold of the soul stones, taking them to a nearby device that looked like a balance but far bigger. He rested the soul stones on top of it. After a bit he returned with mana coins in his hand. Those two were level one. They were tough. I added with an honest face. Notice. You've killed a fish. You've gained one disgrace. It'll be easier once your party gets more members. Teamwork does wonders. At that. I smiled, reminded how everyone was so obsessed with doing the last kill to receive the experience necessary to level up. Like that group going as far as to hinder each other, and to be fair, one level didn't seem game changing. After all, it wasn't one point that could do the difference alone. At least five more levels for another freezing dose, with my current mana, using my skill twice seemed to be my best, but that only worked on weak slimes and only in duels. I took both coins with a total value of 10. The quest information had said 2 points for the adventurer card along with 5 per soul stone. It's certainly not much, I complained in my mind, promising to myself to climb the ladder in hopes of better payments. See you tomorrow. Take care, miss. I pondered what was going on with animals dying despite not doing anything to cause their deaths. Could it be? Reminded of my twin and the way she had told me our souls had merged upon an ancient oath. If it meant Aurora was killing animals, then she was likely feeding my family. But what made me wonder the most was if she somehow killed a monster. Could I obtain part of the experience, or even all of it? Certainly, a book wouldn't have the need to hog a value it didn't use. Sadly, I knew she had no combat capabilities, much less skills that could help her to solo anyone. As I passed through the main avenue, my feet halted by a promise from younger but not forgotten times, a wish that had been struck within me for as long as I got to learn about the existence of this place. With a slender touch, I pushed the door forward, allowing my thin self to go through the open pathway. Almost immediately, the scent prickled my nose in a happy manner. The library of my father's had been big, yet smaller than this one. Only with access, the elderly voice reached me from the side. Einstein, I added briefly halting by him and his table, I smirked at his words, while a young boy passed by my side leaving the library, like me in the past, he, too, had been blocked, the old man's eyes widened at my appearance, opening his mouth surprised, Iris, I took my card out of the pocket, coveting his gaze to hover over it, 
you weren't lying. Took me a while longer than I hoped, compared to other helpers. I had a harder time due to lacking a class, but my father too had persisted to find a distinct class during his youth, had taken him a few years to achieve it. He had since young heard stories of the almighty healers of the kingdom and wished to be just like one of them, and to me, that made me very proud of being his daughter. Access allowed, he gleamed happily with far more wrinkles than before, his eyebrows and hair were far whiter than what I remembered. My dad's friend Vincent was quite an old man, but this one seemed older, below his nose there was no moustache or beard, it seemed that despite his age, he took care of himself to a certain extent. Thank you. I dashed toward the shelves which were filled with books, unable to hold the excitement within me, happiness overflowed from my heart pouring to any who could feel it, however, to my surprise, there was no one else beyond the reception point. I turned around, gazing at the old man who had likely followed my movement with his eyes, as if reading my mind he declared unbothered, very few spend their time amidst books. Why, not many learn how to read? The information I had gathered from my system library skill was meant for my fellow humans, yet they didn't seem willing to acquire it. One's incompetence was reflected in the ineptitude to learn how to read and write, and this was likely thanks to the nobility and religion who kept the information off limits to most peasants. Thus, without the option to be taught, in order to become able to, they didn't even try to find any means to acquire such a precious ability. After all, it was still possible to earn money in many jobs that didn't involve such knowledge. Even adventurers were known to be the type to fight their way through and find out the dangers head on. So disappointing, I complained to myself unwilling to give it a rest. It pissed me off, but at the same time, it came as a lesson for some things regarding humanity as a whole. The way the members of the guild seem to be selfish and act rashly without thinking twice during combat. This could very well be a consequence of never having used their brains to learn better tactics. Possibly the smartest ones ended up becoming the party leaders and getting things done differently. I just hoped for the kingdom army to not be as useless. This could also imply that those who excelled were potentially the ones with a powerful class or ability that set them apart from the rest. What kind of books are there? A bit of everything. Are you looking for anything in particular? I mumbled a sound giving it some thought. Reading with a goal in mind could turn out to be helpful. I stole a quick glimpse at the nearest shelf, finding mostly brown covers, and pages very yellow. Are there books related to classes, and how to obtain them? This library only contains certain information. He walked past me getting hold of a big but thin book with a brown cover. I approached him, taking hold of the object as if it was very precious, a part of me even, certain information. He coughed a few times while returning to his seat. There are books that only people with certain degrees have access to. In this library, I raised my left eyebrow hoping to take a peek at such secretive literature. Somewhere in the capital, perhaps deep inside the eight main churches, or within a secret chamber from the royal castle. His smirk made me dubious, causing me to wonder if this information was real. How would you know that? My grandfather was a scholar at the capital but even he only heard the rumors of their existence. I guess it wouldn't be strange for secret books to exist, but if they were real, then it was something worth searching for. Who knows what things could be hiding in them and what consequences such knowledge could bring. Perhaps a love story between a royal and a peasant, or something more eccentric and less on the spicy side. I took the book with me and headed for one of the empty tables, taking a seat, opening the book, and checking its contents. A Basic Guide to Humanity Classes Author John the Fifteenth. In accordance with the Pope's John the Fifteenth request, the following information has been dictated as a means of instruction to future generations. The goddess Aria, overseer of the realm of humanity, declared fame to be the reflection of her favor and humans' good deeds towards her cause imperative for her will to be followed, only then can humanity attain salvation, and find this world to prosper to destroy those who oppose her, the following classes are advisable as they are humanity's first step, the basic grade requires nothing out of the ordinary to obtain, swordsman, who controls the sword, shall protect his liege with swift and accurate motions, only the noblest tetacat shall reflect the peerless mastery of swordsmanship, this is the list I can see for myself. The disappointment caused me to flip the pages, one after another, passing through the contents that I had learned about. Natra. 
As I read the last one of the basic grades from the screen I had invoked next to me, I checked if there was anything else of interest. My eyes widened at the content which was related to something I didn't quite know. There have been records throughout the centuries of humanity attempting a considerable amount of fame. In some cases, they were awarded with distinct classes. Some were even able to evolve their basic grade into rare. Fame is seen as a fragment of the soul and such may be a requirement for the growth of a human being, nothing else. Other than a ripped last page, I sighed displeased as new information had been flowing inside my brain, interesting content at that, which had occupied my full concentration capacity. It took me a lot to gain access to this place, my mind felt weary at the books missing a portion who had taken it out. And why would they do that? Quickly, I pushed the open pages against my chest, and taking a deep breath, maybe I can find a complete copy. I returned the book to the spot Einstein had removed it from. With careful steps and gestures, I looked from shelf after shelf, opening copies after copies. Damn it! Thirteen books remained atop the table, all with the last page missing. How dare they do this? I gripped my left hand willing to hit the table with all my strength, potentially hurting myself more than the wooden object. What's wrong Iris? With pleading eyes about to cry I looked at him. After so much effort, I ended up finding ripped books. I pointed a finger at what I meant causing him to check, the church censorship. His words were brief, implying who the culprit was. The what? I landed the base of my knuckle on the table without strength causing little to no sound to propagate. I ended up giving up on my wrath. He took a seat by the table where I was previously, caressing each book before closing them. I'm not confident about the details, not to forget that those who know things they shouldn't end up disappearing. Hastily, I released my grip, looking around a tad paranoid. This kingdom religion has a great power. If it wasn't for the goddess wish, it may have very well been ruled by the saintess. You mean Arya didn't want her to be a queen? Exactly so, the task of the saintess lies elsewhere. Where? Per history books. He glanced at a certain shelf causing my gaze to follow. She's the symbol of protection and peace. He got up, picking a heavy looking book with a green octogram on the cover, opening it and passing some pages, showing me that he knew this literature piece quite well. Perhaps his father, an academic, had made him learn it thoroughly. His finger eventually halted in an image causing me some surprise as I had never seen a picture inside a book in this world before. It looked exactly like the cover but with a description below. The eight main churches that surround the Lumen Kingdom castle where the royal family resides. Did they make eight because of the symbol or is there a special reason? At my words he smiled briefly finding them entertaining. Every century there is a very unique event. Do you mean the hero summoning? Yes. It's a quite famous ceremony upheld by the saintess herself. Will it be soon? He placed his hand below his head rubbing the chin. Should be. 7. Chapter 38 Hidden in the mountains, further to the east of Iris's house, there stood a girl just like her sitting on her knees on the grey-looking ground. In front of Aurora, there remained a circle made of blood. In its center, a chicken was dead, missing its head. Both remained still and silent like the night. Her hands were smeared in the red and the entrails of the poor animal. Aurora had taken a copy of her twin memories, of all the legends and peculiar tales Iris had heard since birth. Fifteen years of information had been digested by the eccentric mind of the grim O.I. mysterious entity. Thus, there were certain things that she wished to test, with hopes of finding a way to make herself stronger, but more than anything to free herself from the prison called Grimoire. I sacrifice this flesh and blood. Her hands fell atop the circle, causing it to shine. Heed my call porter of my true name, she wasn't sure if it would work. Her soul had been stuck in the mirror for far too long. Perhaps she was all there was of her past, of a forgotten origin. And to her surprise, the circle shone further, and the meat became shrouded by a black smoke. Its smell was foul like the blurry bizarre horned face that appeared in the grey mist. Who are you? She asked, confused, for what had appeared was far from what her heart desired. It laughed weirdly, delivering a quick sense of eerie to any who might listen, but Aurora remained unfazed. If anything, curiosity brimmed in her icy pupils, not that the creature could see her, for it saw something peculiar, what appeared to be a talking book, or even someone speaking while hiding behind the object, a demon. It added finally, causing a joint of wheels to rotate together inside the girl's mind. She grinned coldly, 
feeling satisfied. There was something out of the ordinary right in her grasp, the thing she most lacked, information, precise data which she could use to calculate her next move. A demon from the north. Yes, it laughed, and the smoke disappeared, leaving no trace whatsoever of the offering, nor of their talk. She grinned, not too disappointed with the outcome, I'll need a bigger animal, from afar. On the other side of the river, a loud bark reached out for her. Not you silly. She disregarded her little sister's big dog as an offering. Despite the mysterious aura that surrounded her emotions and reasoning, it didn't seem that she wanted Iris to suffer. Silently, without making much of a sound, her feet reached out for the river where she washed her hands. The fish, some bigger than others, came to bite her fingers. There was no pain to be felt, as that body wasn't as real as the one Iris had. Instead, she remained expressionlessly looking at them. Soon, her palms turned to each other, and she descended them deeper into the water, allowing them to be caressed further. Once they came to bite her too close, her fingers closed on each other, getting hold of a fairly sized fish who failed to escape her simple cage. She took it out of the water and watched over it silently till it stopped making a scene. Once there was not an extra breathe to be had, she crossed the river and fed it to the dog. Unlike what it did to Iris, it didn't protest nor show any sign of denial. It did what Aurora told him to do without complaining by barking or by sitting on the ground in a lazy way. The animal must have felt something out of the ordinary that it didn't with Iris. It also didn't dare play or jump on Aurora as it did to its favorite twin from the very beginning. Respect was all it had, and that was something that surpassed even an ounce of fear of Luke. Let's go then, she added, as if believing the dog would understand, or possibly kill some of her loneliness. Perhaps both of them missed their owner, Iris, who was on an adventure all on her own. As much as there was a danger to it, Aurora firmly believed that there was a great gain, and to ease some of her master's burden, she was out here seeking information through unconventional methods. This had been the seventh thing she had tried while Iris developed herself through questing. Aurora had decided to keep a low profile, leaving the library for the twin to check. Eventually, Iris would be able to search for more information in that place, hopefully finding something of worth. Meanwhile, she would try to find ways to become useful, to understand her new self. After all, it was not every day that people found themselves to be a floating book of sorts, especially Aurora. She had not always been a grimoire. This individual had once been far more than what many wished to be. But who was she? Why was she sealed? Had she really killed a king who created the mirror? What magic was used? Was it a skill? And above all, what was Aurora's goal? It didn't take long for the little saint to make its way with the fish. After a bite or two. It had left it by the river. You're more into meat. Aurora assumed based on the chicken head. It had taken a lot more time chewing on it than the latter. I get it. I too like it more, especially young lamb. She made her way towards the nearest ranch, leaving the pet behind. Iris had taught it to stay by the house, to keep their home safe, and to bark at whoever was a stranger. Even Aurora didn't seem to dare change that one order, for her new parents seemed to have been quite good to her master. Those who do good deserve great things to happen to them. In the meantime, her feet dragged her across the darkened north woods. The dawn was starting to enshroud everything on her path, but such did not halt her pace. She started to mutter certain names as she recollected some memories, looking at the sides, at the shadows that may have looked like silhouettes. Fafia, Demo, the list was excessively lengthy. For a human, it would have rendered their voice to a certain extent after a while. It would even dry their throats to the point of making them thirsty enough to drink from a pool of dirty mud. It almost looked like she was trying to reach out for their attention. If they were dead, perhaps it was a way to bring peace to them, to show them that they hadn't been forgotten. If they once had something to do with Aurora's past, then, after being locked for thousands of years, it was likely that they were gone for good. That may include their souls, which were possibly gone into oblivion or whichever chaos such things belong to. An outsider might have looked at Aurora's way, willing to bet their lives on which emotion her eyes held. Were the sapphires in her sockets those that reflected sadness? Was it pain? Were they grieving alongside the mumbling of the names? Perhaps if someone was there to ask her, we could get to learn of an astounding amount of despair and pain, of how tragic one's life in a magical world could turn out to be, of what hell looked like when faced directly, reflected in one's very pupils. 
but what was beyond her sky blue windows in her deepest sealed memories? Certainly, not even gods would dare to take a peek. 8. Chapter 39 What are humans to gods? Toys? Marble pieces on top of a gaming board being moved by divine fingers? Below the vast and clear sky, in a lustrous white chamber, the green long haired woman known by all of humanity, stood kneeling with her forehead touching the very cold floor, praying to a statue sculpted in Arya's known elegant image. The summoned by the goddess had spread their visual opinion of her. Thus, many artists has made their living beautifying such standards into the finest level of craftsmanship. This was one of the most sacred places for the saintess. It was meticulously purified by salt, which was believed to repel all sorts of evil and known to annoy some types of insects. Will you not answer my prayers? The woman's voice shattered the surroundings in melancholy for the goddess had not granted her a single celestial message ever since her birth. Am I just not worthy in your eyes, my beloved Arya? Her passionate tone, exuded doubts which she dared not indulge in longer than a fraction of a second. It must be all in the goddess plan. Her words were a reflection of the Pope's teachings of a profound training by her mother, the past saintess. She believed that there was a reason that kept the higher being from communicating with her, perhaps simply not being able to. Her eyes looked at her personal data skill, an inferior version of RS1, focusing on two pieces of information, name, serenity, class, saintess. She took a deep breath, knowing that as long as her class didn't change, her path had not been wrong, her choices had been righteous, and more than anything, the goddess had not abandoned her. For the last millennium, the records of Arya activity had lessened to an intricate and severe extent worrying the church. For someone who had studied the divine subject as much as serenity, it was still something out of her league. The gap in knowledge between a lower and a higher being was that wide. This was the reason why the divine messages from Arya were so important. They held precious information that could twist humanity's fate toward a more fortunate, victorious path. Her face rose from the cold floor, leaving it wet. It was not easy to be the saintess to withhold power beyond reason, and to use it solely with humanity's salvation in mind. All this while remaining true to her goddess, faith, too, was a source of power. A tremendous one, which caused the masses to enlist in the army managed by the church. The time for war is near, her determined eyes showed the savagery that awaited her unholy enemies. She knew that depending on the Pope's will, humanity's foes would get their bodies burnt down to ashes. The man was known for being ruthless, to take the path of murder whenever necessary, to judge people personally as if being one of the goddess fingers, the index one, he had imagined once to mercilessly point at someone and call them guilty, often based on his whim, he made humans suffer for free if deemed necessary, power was often a double-edged weapon, used wrong, could cause a simple sharp knife to leave deep wounds on one's skin, used right could captivate men and women alike to bid their wills to the owner of said weapon. Many were those who were sacrificed and punished by the Pope's will, but unlike his predecessors, he had gone to greater lengths. He went as far as to obtain an army and great political power within the kingdom. The man was cunning enough to get his way. This happened thanks to him obtaining a glimpse of a chaotic future, the invasion and annihilation of humanity which forced the peasants to be afraid. While there were no celestial messages, the saintess's ability to predict a piece of the future was still working. This allowed her importance to remain on top of the population. The royal family worked alongside the church since the very beginning. They were known by the citizens as the Pulardid lineage, carrying a certain blessing from the goddess. Their magical power and soul dear were directly reflected in such purity, being higher than the norm. But even then, they didn't join the wars, especially not on the front line. They were far too important pieces to be lost against the enemies of humanity, or so they saw themselves in such a manner. Unlike most people, Serenity grew with a different view of the world. This came to be ever since a certain unholy event happened, which turned her whole life upside down. It made her grow faster than the past women who had her class. Every day, her prayers included all of humanity, but also an extra name at the end. Please help me protect my fellow humans and... Her whisper, as always, was low enough to not reach the entrance of this holy chamber. Certain sins were not so easily forgiven by the church, the saintess knew of this better than most, 
as she had lost someone very important. The glitter in her eyes was valiant enough to shake the souls of those who dared to pry into the green glass which reflected her soul. To this young woman, the salvation of humanity was her major goal. Almost nothing else mattered and, similarly to the Pope, she was willing to do everything in her grasp to conclude her goddess wish. After all, this was her mission since birth. May Arya become even greater. With her back turned to the statue, she headed off from the room. 7. Chapter 40 In the following day after lunch, I went straight to the library to relax from yesterday's event. Half of the table in front of me remained illuminated by the sunlight. Once again, I was all alone in the same place where Einstein worked in, but I was happy, a place filled with books, excluding this place, there was only one other house I could call home, a tale of four seasons, I smiled at the title, it sounded light warming, with a slender touch of fingers, I got the book opened. It offered little to no resistance. Thus, word by word, I began to read. Once upon a time, the world was a dull and empty place with nothing but rocks and a red glowing liquid that we came to entitle as lava. It was always either too hot or too cold, to the point that nothing could grow in it. But then four divine beings descended to the planet. This will be it, Luna the goddess of order stated. Finding this world to be righteous for their endeavor, it could host the greatest of challenges. The god of chaos added amused, licking the tip of his middle finger, but at this rate, nothing will grow. Then we should add seasons to motivate the planet to bring change. And then the god of evil entered the conversation. It can be harsh to motivate its residents to live. The other two narrowed their gazes, knowing he was right. We can divide it in four seasons. Each can become to our liking, and even receive a name from us. Thus, each gave one, and our goddess, Arya, came to name the best season of all to our race, but alas that was not the only creation they made. Four types of spirits were summoned to give way for their wishes, each possessing a personality resembling the nature of how each season should be like. Thus, four clans of fairies came to be the first inhabitants of this world. With it, flowers came to bloom, animals came to life beauty arose, and humans came to celebrate it every time. She called it flowering, the phase of the year where fruits are ripped, the residents the most healthy, where the rivers are the most fish, the time to mate, to expand one's kin, to show Arya that we are alive and wish to stay like that. Truly, our goddess is the kindest, the protector of humanity. Suddenly, a book slipped from the shelf and landed on the floor near me, catching me off guard, causing me to close the book I'm reading. What the, with a quick gaze, I checked my surroundings, and then peeked above the table, only to find a familiar object resting on the wooden floor. I passed my hand on top of my heart, hearing its loud and fast beats, like a drum as it reverberated throughout my body. I leaned lower to catch the object, placing it on top of the table, above the one that was already there. Then I got up and looked at the hole whence it fell. There should have been something there. But nothing. All the books were organized, each having its place on the shelf. Yet to my surprise, a book had fallen, and I couldn't quite understand from where or even the method. How odd, was it on top of another? I returned to my seat, content with my assumption. Then I adjusted my rear to the wood of the chair and took a deep breath before continuing my journey. You truly are a scared cat. To myself, I complained in a simple undermined thought. The cowardly side of me didn't seem willing to let go of me, a part of me hoped it didn't, for it kept me safe from doing mistakes like losing my life again, yet, another side of me didn't like it, it loathed such a weakness, to the point of wanting to remove it forcefully, if possible, it kept me from living, from looking as prideful and confident as my sister, she was the pinnacle of the role model I pursued to achieve, one day even surpass, still, I was far from even reaching her. If I could compare Aurora to the sky above, then she'd be the stars above the clouds that I could see, and I but a mere chick that hatched from its egg not too long ago, was still growing to the extent of learning how to use my wings. At least she believes in me. I smiled with the little confidence I had in me. Her words I embraced with all of my heart, living and reliving them in my mind like the best compliment I had ever heard. You can become so much more. I wished to know more about her, the past that she dared not boast about, much less mention a single detail about, but that could have been my fault for not asking her anything. I couldn't help not asking given how sad her past life seemed to be, the how she got sealed in the mirror, the reason behind why she killed the ruler of a country, a king of all people. 
truly, a story worth writing a book about, the girl who slayed a evil monarch, causing her to be trapped in a mirror for all eternity. Due to my likeness for my sister, I presume the ruler had to be a nasty one. I hoped for such to be true, however, the tale wouldn't have a bad ending, since Aurora didn't remain sealed forever. At that my fingers twitched a little creepily, because I saved her, it was my feet alone, from the few accomplishments I had on my personal list, this was the one I was most proud of. To have saved her allowed me to acquire a sister that I could treasure and live with. I picked the tale of four seasons and spent the rest of the day reading it, eventually finishing it. Written by an admirer, such was my conclusion, without a doubt. It was written by one of Arya's followers. They undermine every other god when the races beneath them are superior. I faced and with little strength, unable to resist the discontent growing within me. How futile all of this adoration was if everyone could end up killed at any opportune moment, a matter of time, till all the races come on our way, till the human kingdom falls and everyone meets their fated death. All because no one moved, everything thanks to those prosperous nobles and priests willingly hide the truth from its residents. The nerve, it annoyed me incessantly, all of it, and everything bursted a piece of me that I didn't know I had. I hit the top of the table causing the books to shake slightly momentarily. If I was stronger, perhaps they would have float for a bit. Something within me kept changing ever since my encounter with Aurora, almost as if the world revealed itself before me, but that was not right and I knew it. She hadn't had a saying in this. It was all thanks to my efforts to become an adventurer and gaining access to a pile of information. Even more so now with this library, my favorite thing could easily become the one I hated the most if every single book was written by one of her followers. With a hint of disdain, I took the tale of four seasons with me, placing it whence I removed it from, returning to the table with short steps. How about you? Will you also betray my expectations? With an icy gaze, I fixated its cover finding no title to it, instead, an author's name remained at the bottom. William III, I knew by now that this meant a third volume, but if it was in front of a name, it meant the times in which they repeated this name through generations. Thus, this man was the third of his family's legacy. What do you have to show me? The first page after the cover was of a dirty yellow and contents blank, it made me willing to rip it off as it contributed to nothing but I held my hatred in for books were precious and rare. Once again, I took a deep breath, then another, before finally flipping the page carefully to not damage its contents, much less being pain to the object. I used to have a deep caring for such tiny items, however, such willingness had grown within me as my sister was one, a special grimoire. This made me even more aware not to hurt them, perhaps the day would come where I'd meet another one. Likely not but a girl can dream. I waved my head to the sides to halt my thoughts, attempting to find some hidden concentration to go through another book despite being tired from reading. It's harder to get it going in this world, perhaps it was the fault of my parameters, how it made me not have a good and lasting focus, how the letters and numbers rambled by themselves, they waltz like the nobles do in their fancy grand parties. I sighed, let's see. There can only be as much despair as there can be hope until you tilt one side of the balance. Gods are such entities, if they so wish, they can retrieve one of the two and make you meet an uncalled fate. Go against one and you'll have to pray to another to balance the outcome. Even to this day, it is quite rare to find individuals who manage to provoke one of the four enlightened beings, but can someone really change the world without going against them? Abruptly, I jumped out of the chair as Einstein's voice reached out for me. Iris, the library is closing, I'm coming. In a flash, I closed the book, rereading the author's name. He didn't sound like a follower of Arya and if he was, something distinguished his words from the rest. They didn't sugarcoat the truth and even enabled the reader to think beyond what's supposed to be right, to avoid being set in a single meaning. Once I passed through the entrance, the old man's voice reached out for me from behind. Did you have a good time? Yes. I think I found something interesting to read next time. Oh? I'm truly glad this small library befits your taste. At his elegant words I smiled, his speech far more beautiful than any I could hope to pull. I'll be sure to come visit again soon. You're going back to questing, aren't you? Yes. I promised my parents to help them with money. At my words he rubbed his chin, if you'd like. You could take my place in the library when I retire. 
that'd be an honor, my gaze lowered at his feet and then at my own, and then swiftly I looked at him in the eyes, but I have a promise I must fulfill at all costs, is that so, hum, I shrugged at his words, I'll be praying for your safe travels, young lady, I could tell how saddened his tone sounded, however, despite wanting to have a peaceful life, the one he had, I wanted more, far more, thank you, see you soon Einstein, I waved him goodbye, unwilling to spend another second near him as his proposal caused my heart to ache, with hasty steps, I made my way home to rest, 10, chapter 41, next, year 5015, day 70 of the flowering season, a few days later, from my last trip to the library, I went to the guild, I wanted to get more experience, to hopefully gain my first level, to become closer to have more mana. I had tried to use appraisal alongside my dear sister but alas the chant never came. At the bulletin board, there were distinct letters, these matched the ones in the adventurer's cards, allowing us to know the batch we could choose from. Thus, below each one, pieces of paper remained there pinned to the large wood board, the section I looked at, were those below the letter F, for that was the rank of my card, and of course my party. For the longest time, I had allowed the receptionists to choose my quests, and even now, I didn't want to differ from that. What I wanted from this was to be able to see what else was there, to quench the thirst of my curiosity, as Einstein had once told me to do. After talking to my parents about his offer, they were as delighted as they were surprised, they took him for someone who distanced himself from others, but perhaps, age had brought him loneliness, dad had told me his wife had already passed away so him wanting to retire was perhaps a way for him to bid his farewell to life, it was quite common for an adult of certain elderly age to extinguish the remnant of their life force, especially since they would start getting sick, worse yet, without having someone to take care of them, nor money to suffice, they'd end up suffering till death came to embrace them for eternal rest, or as the priests had once said, till the soul reaches the goddess caring hands, a horrible world, I sighed slightly displeased, unwilling to go through such fate myself, still, I knew it was a matter of decades till the same end reached out for me, I better survive till then, my hand slapped the nearest paper, causing the attention of an adventurer next to me to fall on the bulletin board, that one might be too hard for a new adventurer, I removed my fingers from it, reading its contents, rank D quest, slay the kobolds that have been causing trouble near the south road of Astia village, I skimmed through the rest. You may be right. Thank you. Recurrent events will lead a group of beasts to be organized, which leads to eminent danger. Thank you for the advice, sir. Tiago's my name, a rank C adventurer. He winked at me, smiling happily at his achievements. I'm without delay he decided to interrupt me, leaving me speechless. Iris from the unknown party. What? I took a step back, finding it strange for him to know me when we never crossed paths. You're the talk of the guild being the only blonde woman in it. Young, yet gorgeous at that, the tension of my muscles relaxed, understanding that I may have stood up more than what I wanted. My appearance strikes again, I sighed, avoiding his gaze. Some better than others, his hand passed in front of me, pulling the nail effortlessly from the paper, causing the thin fabric to float briefly. Meanwhile, the metal remained in the middle of two of his biggest fingers. With a clean motion, he got hold of the piece, showing it to me. This one isn't too dangerous and gets you some money. Thanks. I'll give it a try. As I got hold of it, his fingers slipped by, skillfully avoiding mine, yet close enough to make it look as if they had. With his back quickly turned to me, he added effortlessly, You can find what you need in East of Astia Village, but don't explore too far. I'll keep that in mind and you're wrong. Huh? He turned his face around, halting his pace to know where he messed up. What do you mean by that? I'm not the only blonde of this guild, without waiting for his reply, I passed by his side all the way to the reception, I could feel the tingling sensation of a nervous wave that had made me speak too much, but I couldn't help attempt to reach his level in some manner, even if I had acted awkwardly at his helpfulness, my personality was not set, and many were the times I contested others, sometimes even without proper arguments, the anxious moments where I felt my appearance to be indulged by their taste, automatically made my words turn into small daggers, for better or for worse, I stabbed even the innocent with them, ruthlessly at times, when all I truly wanted was to befriend them, nonetheless, 
I couldn't help myself to feel some distrust, even when they didn't show a reason for it, or do anything that deserved it. Potentially, it was a curse ingrained in my brain, the so-called trauma of my past life that I believed to be solved, but it wasn't. It still tormented me through intricate methods. At the reception after waiting for my turn, I showed the quest paper. Good morning, I'd like to go for this one. Understood. I'll assign your party to it and since it's a collectible type of quest, it'll be exclusive to your group. Really? Thank you. With that, I walked away, heading back home, ignoring the many gazes of the surrounding adventurers. The problem of living near the south border was that it had a decent amount of them, people that were inclined to increase their fame and power at all costs. To reach the highest rank, to become the number one in the entire kingdom. Such goals were shared by all of us, or better said, most of us, who didn't have ulterior motives. F, E, D, C4 ranks and distance. That guy must be super strong. Tiago, was it? I didn't check the quests of other ranks to avoid feeling bad about myself. After all, I was and still am quite the feeble young lady. Just wait, mom and dad. I'll make you proud. For these past days, ever since the slime quest, I hadn't seen my sister anywhere, yet. I knew she was alright. The multiple messages from my status kept on alerting me of her deeds, of the increasing disgrace upon me. Mostly fishes and chickens were being killed by her hands. It made me wonder what she was doing with them. However, my mother had told me Aurora had been feeding Little Saint, and as big as he was, a lot of food was necessary to keep his stomach satisfied. I hope they're safe. My heart trembled at the thought of anything bad happening to either of them. My dear family members. Even now she must be gathering information. In that department, both of us were doing our best to figure out this intricate world. Least to say, its secrets were hard to get a glimpse of. It was especially tough given my recent discovery, the censorship the church did to the books and possibly all the information hidden in the kingdom. To rip a book's page that had pissed me to an unthinkable extent. One mustn't ruin another person's hard work, if only one copy was still intact. At that moment, my hand rested on the door handle when a voice emerged from my back, surprising me. Copies of what? The sudden familiar tone caused my heart to skip a beat. It was her, the one entity that made my mind race. My core quickly throbbed in delight, the sole being whom I could have expectations for without having them betrayed. Thanks to our contract, Aurora, my beloved twin sister, with a merry expression, I hastily turned to her, finding my pet to be sitting next to her awfully quiet and, worse yet, strangely still, at will. Her words caused my dog to jump on me, causing me to collapse, not expecting him to do that out of a sudden. At least, not after his unusually stern behavior, he licked my cheek, reminding me how he truly was. This showed that Aurora had disciplined him thruly, more so than what I and my parents ever managed to do. Truly remarkable. Just how outstanding was this peculiar reflection of me? While I am bad at many things, she's amazing at many of them. It almost feels like our connection is truly set by the mirror laws, where my left is her right, and her talent is my flaw. Hey, hey, hold up. I complained, but there was nothing I could do other than rub his fur and enjoy this delightful moment of love. It was not until he made sure he filled every inch of my face with his saliva, that he sat and rested his head on my legs as if super proud of his masterpiece. It reminded me of the paintings of that crippling mansion. Perhaps I was one of them and he was painting on me with his delicate fluids as if it was ink. After passing my arm on my face, wiping most of it, that I gave Aurora the answer she sought. I found a book about classes, but sadly, the last page or pages were ripped. Is that so? She crossed her arms, resting her chin in her right hand. Einstein, the library man, told me it was likely the censorship of the church, meaning that book possibly had a clue about them. Interesting. So what do the pages say? I looked at her, extremely confused. She who earnestly expected me to know the answer to her question. Yet, there was no way for me to know what was no longer there. I don't know. The pages are missing. So they're also missing when you copied the book with your skill? That's too bad. Her reply shocked every single fiber of my body. It was such a simple thing to try, yet I had failed. I'm sorry sister. I didn't think about using my skill. Her hand reached out for the top of my hair, patting it gently. You'll grow in no time. First, you must master what you already have. She was right, and I knew. Her words had once been the ones stated by my mother, 
One of the memories Aurora must have copied from me. Plainly superb. How she knew exactly what to say and especially when. Was this charisma or something far more fundamental? Whatever it was, it charmed me enough to look up to her, to be more like her. Deep down, a hint of jealousy for her innate talents emerged within me. Yet, I didn't have a clue about the effort she had gone through to attain them. I smiled innocently, infatuated by her behavior. Undoubtedly, this made her the older sister. Even if in this world I sort of appeared first. Right, I got a new quest. Need a hand? It is something you can help with. I took out the quest from my pocket, a piece folded in many equal parts. To that, Aurora quick unfolded it, absorbing a grasp of its contents, nodding swiftly in favor. You're right. Let's go. After I ate my lunch, Aurora dressed herself in a long coat with a hood covering the entirety of her head, leaving but part of her face revealed. We walked side by side back to Estia village. Then to the east side of it, where a gate remained closed with two men guarding it. In the end, we came to understand the village had a small feeble wall that minimally protected the villagers. The south entrance leads to my home and to the forest where beasts and monsters fight for supremacy. East, however, leads to a forest where some magical beasts reside, more often than not in peace. Halt. Who goes there? Their rigid tones caused us to stop on our feet, briefly making our hands enter our pockets to remove the guild cards. We're here on a quest. Ignoring my words, the guard checked our identification, one at a time, as if making sure of something. These two are newbies. The guards traded glances, ending up with slight nods, as one man opened the gate. The other, while holding our cards, warned us. The forest isn't too dangerous as long as you don't fight horned rabbits, especially those with more than one horn. Further deeper, there's some ruins and that place is certain death for adventurers. You're forbidden from entering it. Thank you for letting us know. With a soft motion, he returned the guards back to us. He turned his hand into a fist, reaching its shoulder height, and pointing out with his thumb at the gate behind him for us to pass. After going through, they closed it, telling us to yell when we return. Thanks to the horned rabbits causing problems in the past, they ended up having to open and close the entrance every time. But at least casualties had reduced. 5. 